MPD, that's the Metropolitan Police Department of D.C., the main cops here in D.C., are coming in from the east, and they've essentially tried to close off the south towards the White House, the east towards Capitol Hill. You can see fire burning in the distance. I think that's probably another burning car or SUV. We saw some of that last night. And they're going to force everybody west. They're going to force egress into west and northwest in the city. And my God. We're going to end up in a place we don't want to be here if we're not careful, Katie. So, ah, damn it. Ah. Derek, I'm, uh, just move out of the there as quickly as you can. I hit in the side with either, I don't think it was rubber balls. I've had that before, rubber bullets or something. I don't want to be, like, overly dramatic about it. I know what it was. You're cutting out as your friend and as Brian said a moment ago, as somebody yeah. who knows your parents as well, I want you to get to a safe place. Get out of there. Thankfully, Garrett later tweeted that he is fine, but he has some souvenir wealth on his side. Oh, well, cities are reeling after being rocked by destruction. As groups of looters vandalized and set fire to stores, retailers like Target, Walmart, and CVS have closed down some of their stores and adjusted their hours after several were damaged. But with the mayhem came moments of solidarity. In New York, members of the NYPD took a knee with protesters. These moving scenes here also took place elsewhere in the United States, including in Spokane and Santa Cruz. Here's Miguel Almaguer. The nation erupted into scenes of chaos, violence, oh my God. Oh. and widespread destruction into the early morning hours. Dozens of American cities up in flames after some protests turned into riots, often followed by looting as a nation simmering with unrest unraveled. How long can you be peaceful? when your people are dying. In Los Angeles, hours before a curfew was ordered, the city became a war zone. After attempting to breach television studios, large groups torched police cruisers as officers fired back with rubber bullets. Before nightfall, the looting began. Department stores, jewelers, and high-end apparel shops trashed by unruly mobs. The mayor calling on the governor to dispatch the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots in 1992. Strikingly similar scenes and issues of injustice, 28 years apart. We've seen this before in Los Angeles. When the violence escalates, no one wins. After nights of protest and violence, the state of emergency in Los Angeles mirrored by pockets of anarchy nationwide described as all hell breaking loose in Seattle when police lost control of downtown, crowds destroyed, then took over their vehicles. This video capturing one man removing a high-powered police rifle before a plainclothes security guard disarmed the man, clearing the magazine. But there was also troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, why so many poured into the streets. We can't peacefully protest in the streets without getting tear gas thrown at us for what? With demonstrators out in force again today, a violent takedown in Philadelphia, where a footlocker was looted after more than a dozen officers were injured there last night. With tear gas choking the streets of Miami, police battled protesters to keep control of their headquarters. With banks burned, highways shut down, and City Hall on fire in Nashville, there was more than a thousand arrests. In Salt Lake City, police have identified this man, who may have fired arrows into a crowd from a crossbow, before he was mobbed by a nearby group. In Tallahassee, Florida, someone drove through a protest after their pickup truck was surrounded by a crowd. The National Guard is moving into Chicago after clashes between protesters and police. In this city, we care for each other. This is a time for us to unite. A nation on edge and up in smoke, as many plead for peace in the wake of yet another violent night. Miguel Almaguer reporting. Thank you. As fiery protests raged this weekend in Washington, D.C., Secret Service and rushed President House Trump itself. to a White House to bunker you, on Friday night. A senior administration out. official tells NBC News that the president spent nearly an well, hour inside an the complex designed for emergencies arrest, like terror attacks. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more from D.C. 
days of national outrage at the president's doorstep. More protests near the White House. More than 60 Secret Service officers and agents injured this weekend. The president assigning blame to a militant anti-fascist movement. The United States of America will be designated Antifa as a terrorist organization. A bold but questionable claim, since federal law does not allow for U.S. organizations to be classified as terror groups. Legal experts say the president crossed a line. That is a dangerous authority and power. It is not an authority that exists under current law, and it should not. But as a political matter, the president branded this new adversary. The violence and vandalism is being led by Antifa and other radical left-wing groups. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said tactics separate Antifa from peaceful protesters. Using military-style tactics, using Molotov cocktails, using fireworks, using gasoline, uh, using bricks and, and paving stones to attack. In a statement, Attorney General William Barr points out that criminal conduct, not a specific militant group, can be charged with homegrown terrorism. The violence instigated and carried out by Antifa and other similar groups in connection with the rioting is domestic terrorism and will be treated accordingly. The White House also wants action from the FBI. The president wants to know what the FBI has been doing to surveil, to disrupt, to take down, to prosecute Antifa. Well, those are not constructive tweets. Republican Senator Tim Scott said he spoke with the president and encouraged him to avoid contentious tweets. Mr. President, it is helpful when you lead with compassion. But, but, Mr. President, it helps us when you focus on the death, the unjustified, in my opinion, the criminal death of George Floyd. Senior officials say while the president has offered active duty military police to state and local governments in crisis, right now the president does not intend to put state-led National Guard units under federal control. That keeps governors in charge. And the federal government can provide law enforcement help with agencies like ATF and FBI. Philip? All right, Kelly, thank you. The response from the apparent Democratic nominee standing in stark contrast to the heated rhetoric from the president. Joe Biden posting a picture of himself kneeling with a protester in Wilmington, Delaware, writing, quote, We're a nation in pain right now, but we must not allow this pain to destroy us. As president, I will help lead this conversation, and more importantly, I will listen. A former vice president is expected to meet with community leaders later today. All right, let's get a check of our weather on this first day of June with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. Good to see you both. Good morning, everyone. We're off to a very cool start across the Northeast and abnormal temperatures, but we're going to warm up quickly going into the rest of the week. Look right now, Ohio Valley to the Great Lakes. We're sitting in the upper 40s with freeze alerts still in place for northern New England. Daytime highs are still below average uh, this afternoon, where we're about 10 to 15 degrees below average across the northeast. But things are going to start to warm up, even for Texas, all the way to Louisiana. We're expecting storms today back in the lower 90s. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Columbus today, partly cloudy skies, daytime highs are still in the mid 70s and you can see that cooler air making its way east. This will be short lived as you can see the warmth starting to build up across New Orleans all the way to Montgomery. Pretty slow start to the weather week, but we're also watching the tropics. Talk about that coming up. A few 90s in the south too. Yeah, it's about that time. Thanks, Janessa. Pope Francis spoke to hundreds at the Vatican for the first time in months. The Pope was met with cheers as he delivered his Sunday address. He said he hoped the world could come together at the end of the coronavirus pandemic, more united, and that people are more important than the economy. Two Atlanta police officers are out of a job this morning and three others placed on desk duty after they were accused of using excessive force during a protest arrest. This incident happened on Saturday. Body cam video shows the officers, investigators Martin Gardner and Ivory Street are both veterans of the department, tasing and pulling two black college students out of a car. An officer at the scene said that they signaled that car to stop because another officer was in the road and the driver didn't comply. The officer also alleges that the driver reached for something in or near his pocket and that the passenger also did not comply with orders. The mayor of Atlanta and the chief of police terminated the two officers after reviewing the body camera footage. The mayor says those charges against the students will be dropped. 
Former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick has set up a fund offering to help pay for defenses of those arrested in the Minneapolis protests. Kaepernick is accepting donations through his Know Your Rights Camp charity, and he tweeted the link to donate on Friday, adding, we must protect our freedom fighters. NBA legend Michael Jordan is speaking out about the ongoing and widespread protests in the wake of the death of George Floyd as well. In a statement released by his manager and spokeswoman, Jordan says, quote, I see and feel everyone's pain, outrage and frustration. I stand with those who are calling out the ingrained racism and violence in this country happening to people in our country. We have had enough. The six-time NBA champion also called for peaceful protests, saying in part, we need to continue peaceful expressions against injustice and demand accountability. The anger and outrage over the death of George Floyd has sent shockwaves around the world. Protesters in London and Berlin flooded the streets as racial injustice, the calls for racial justice reached beyond U.S. soil. NBC's Kelly Kobe is in Seoul, South Korea with the latest. Hi, Kelly. Good morning. Philip, good morning to you. Yeah, those images, those dramatic images of burning cars and riot police on the streets of so many U.S. cities appeared on front pages around the world over the weekend, and demonstrations were organized in countries that are some of the U.S.'s closest allies, including in Britain, where thousands of people showed up uh, at Trafalgar Square on Sunday, marching, uh, chanting things like no justice, no peace, holding placards uh, with signs in solidarity with the protesters in the United States. At one point, they marched to the U.S. Embassy, which was surrounded by police officers for protection. Uh, there were, it was mostly peaceful. About 23 people were arrested, some of them for breaching lockdown rules. But again, as I said, mostly peaceful there. Slightly different scene in Brazil, though, where there was another demonstration sparked by the events in the United States. Protesters demonstrating it against the treatment of blacks in Rio's favelas in their working class neighborhoods using some of the same slogans like Black Lives Matter. At one point, tear gas uh, was fired at the protesters and some shouted, I can't breathe, those tragic final words of George Floyd. Calmer scenes in different cities in Germany over the weekend, but again, more protests there in solidarity uh, with these protesters in the United States. And this is not ending, Philip. There are more uh, demonstrations planned for London in the coming days. Philip? All right. Kelly Kobea reporting for us this morning. Kelly, thank you. Leading the news, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley have made history after successfully docking at the International Space Station just 19 hours after blasting off from Kennedy Space Center. The SpaceX Dragon capsule pulled up to the station and docked automatically without assistance. It's the first time a privately built and owned spacecraft has delivered a crew to the orbiting lab. It is also the first launch of American astronauts from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. Aggressive thunderstorms tore through northern India on Friday night, leaving the iconic Taj Mahal with visible damage. The main mausoleum was impacted, marble and sandstone were affected, and the garden was also heavily damaged, with many trees uprooted. City officials say the uprooting of the trees and the damage to the property during the storm led to the deaths of three people, including a child. This morning, we are remembering a giant in the art world. The artist known as Christo has died, and, he and his work were larger than life. He was most famous for his monumental works and used miles of fabric to drape landmarks and nature. Among his most well-known, this installation in New York Central Park in 2005. Christo was 84 years old. Good morning, everyone. Let's bring you some positive news as we start off the month of June. Look at this. This is our outlook for most of the nation. We're going to be above average temperature wise. So the heat going to start to build and the official start to summer only 20 days away. Uh, now, what we're seeing here across uh, precipitation wise, we're going to see cooler air making its way in from Texas, and that's going to allow for a few storms to really spark up by mid month. But the good news, it's going to be warm, guys. Appreciate it, Janessa. Like that. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, America faces another crisis, the repeated cycle of racial inequality and police brutality. NBC's Lester Holt reflects on the emotions many are feeling as we hope and pray for peace in the time ahead. Pick your emotion. Chances are it was represented in these jumbled images from America's streets. Rage, 
hate, disappointment, emptiness, hopelessness, and so much fear. It's hard to comprehend that this was about a singular event. No peace! No matter how horrific. No peace! This explosion of raw passion seeming to come from a place far deeper. A primal scream from a country that may just be fed up. Begging for life to be better. Fed up with lockdowns and layoffs, COVID and incivility, racism and power abused. A perfect storm of unmitigated pain. A wound too deep, a racial history too deep for mere gestures to heal. Yet are they a start? A police chief kneeling with citizens in California, other law enforcement in Kansas City and Camden, New Jersey in their own moments of solidarity with protesters. Most of us have not taken to the streets, even as we may privately hold some of the emotions these pictures speak to. These will be the images that will archive this moment in our history. But let these two, the quiet peacemakers, the neighbors, the businesses picking up the pieces, already physically reclaiming and maybe improving all that was lost. That is what we hope for. Lester, thank you. Public outcry and protests over the death of George Floyd have prompted the music industry to take a united stand in the Black Lives Matter movement. Tomorrow, the music industry will observe Blackout Tuesday, touted as a day for unity with black employees, artists, and fans. Uh, record labels like Warner Music Group, Sony Music, Columbia Records, Def Jam Recording, and more all set to take part. Several of the labels and industry leaders have released statements on social media announcing their participation in other measures that they'll be taking to fight uh, against racial injustice and we know artists and musicians have a lot of influence over our, our culture and uh, yes. let's hope that uh, their message of peaceful protests uh takes heat. And resonates. And in a time like this, we do look to uh, not only these leaders of our uh, communities, but also our entertainment leaders uh, for them to talk about these yeah. issues. Again, that Blackout Tuesday is set for tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching early today on this Monday. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, a nation on the brink. Another night of protests in many cities under curfew just one week after the death of George Floyd while in the custody of Minneapolis police. Two Atlanta officers have been fired after they were accused of using unnecessary force when they arrested two college students during protests. To the terrifying scene in Minneapolis where a tanker truck came barreling toward a group of peaceful protesters. The aftermath and what later happened to the driver. The past few days have shaken the nation to our core, impacting every American, young and old, from coast to coast, as demonstrations, peaceful and destructive, show no signs of slowing down. And it was one week ago today that George Floyd lost his life while in the hands of Minneapolis police officers. And the warning that these massive protests may lead to a coronavirus surge. It is Monday, June 1st. Early today starts right now. Good morning. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Koff, and we continue to follow breaking news. More than a dozen cities imposed curfews overnight as protests continued over the death of George Floyd. Moments after the curfew went into effect in Atlanta, police started firing tear gas. The New York Times reports that the last time curfews were used at this scale was in 1968 in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Two police officers in Atlanta, meanwhile, have been fired after being accused of using excessive force. Video showing them tasing and pulling two college students from a car can be seen here. An officer said the driver didn't comply with orders to stop. In New York, three people have been arrested by the FBI and charged with throwing Molotov cocktails at NYPD vehicles. But there was a lighter moment in Queens in a show of solidarity. That's just one of the many examples of peaceful protests that we have seen during this unrest. 
A peaceful moment turned dangerous in Minneapolis. A truck came barreling through a group of people who were sitting on a closed interstate. Fortunately, it doesn't seem any protesters were injured. Many of them swarmed the truck driver who was arrested and an investigation is now underway. NBC's Morgan Chesky joins us now from Minnesota with the latest on the protests there. Morgan, good morning. And good morning from a surprisingly quiet Minneapolis. We are here in a street where dozens of protesters were facing off against law enforcement earlier, uh, but little by little they began to dissipate. And right now the only thing we're seeing is this barrier of law enforcement about 50 yards uh, away from me right now. And the clear mark of the National Guard presence are those Humvees. A thousand National Guardsmen arriving in Minneapolis yesterday, uh, really increasing the size of the law enforcement footprint. And that's been one of the biggest differences we've seen with the enforcement of that curfew that lasts from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. And with that in place, uh, there has been a significant reduction in the damage that we've seen in just block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. A countless number of businesses damages, others gutted and burned. It will be a a long road of recovery for this city. However, there are still thousands that feel that justice has yet to be served because Derek Chauvin, uh, the police officer who was seen kneeling on the neck of George Floyd, he was arrested. He was charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. However, three other officers connected to the death of George Floyd are not in police custody as of right now. There has been so much tension in this city uh, over the past several days. We know that the FBI tipped off the Minnesota National Guard that there was a credible lethal threat. And because of that alone, National Guardsmen were carrying their rifles, ammunition at the ready, just in case something should happen. However, as we stand here today, a relatively quiet night and morning in Minneapolis. We do know 150 protesters were arrested not too far away from where I'm standing. And so this is a hopeful sign of what's to come for this city that has seen so much damage here over the nearly the past week. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan, thank you. The NYPD says around 700 New York protesters have been arrested over the course of four days of protests in response to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Officials say Sunday's demonstrations were mostly peaceful until the final hours of the night. That's when confrontations between protesters and police erupted. Multiple arrests were made and several officers were hurt. NBC's Ron Allen has more on the unrest in the Big Apple. Across New York with thousands of protesters demanding justice, clashing with police on the streets. Multiple incidents caught on video igniting outrage. A police vehicle accelerating through a crowd. A woman shoved to the ground, unclear why. I wasn't aggressive towards the police officer. And even if I was, he should have had the self-restraint to not hurt the people he's supposed to be protecting. Here, a police officer is seen pulling down a protester's mask and spraying mace. There's tremendous stress uh, on everyone. I've seen those videos, and those videos are truly disturbing. Uh, and some of the videos, frankly, are inexplicable. Now, with the state's governor ordering the attorney general to investigate, New York's mayor and police chief are pushing back, insisting overall police have shown restraint while under attack from violent elements within the crowds. Those police vehicles only move forward because they were attacked. There are protests and there are mobs. And I saw a kin closer to a mob. A protest does not involve surrounding and ambushing a marked police car and putting my officers and my detectives' lives at risk. So far, at least 30 officers injured, some 350 arrests Saturday night, including three suspects accused of targeting police with firebombs. Decades of simmering anger exploding in a city with a long history of deadly confrontations. Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, that echo what happened to George Floyd at the hands of police. New York's mayor claims reforms like ending stop and frisk, the widespread roundup of countless young black men, and comprehensive de-escalation training for every officer has improved policing, while admitting the confrontation show NYPD still has work to do. I saw a tremendous amount of restraint. But I also saw things that need to be done better. Clearly, I saw some moments yesterday that were disturbing in terms of the way police handled things. More protests are planned, including this one just getting underway here in Times Square. And while many major cities have imposed curfews to try and bring down the size of the crowds, New York's mayor says that's not necessary here. All right, Ron Allen reporting for us in the Big Apple. Ron, thank you.
As fiery protests raged this weekend in Washington, D.C., Secret and Service rushed House President himself. Trump to a White to House you. bunker Friday night. A senior administration official tells NBC News that the president spent nearly an hour inside the complex designed for emergencies like terror attacks. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us now with the latest. And Tracy, the president is blaming an extremist group for the violence in D.C. Yeah, Philip, not only blaming them, but also tweeting that he wants to declare Antifa a terrorist group. And there are some experts who question whether the government can do that with a domestic group that has First Amendment rights. All of this as demonstrations, protests continue in Washington, including right across the street from the White House in Lafayette Park. Uh, There there was one small building in that area that was set afire overnight. Uh, We also saw tear gas that was used to try to disperse the crowds after the mayor declared an 11 p.m. curfew uh, with those demonstrations continuing. This was the third straight night of demonstrations and violence in the nation's capital. And NBC's own Garrett Hake got caught right in the middle of it. We're going to end up in a place we don't want to be here if we're not careful, Katie. So, ah, damn it. Ah. Garrett, I'm, uh, just move out of the there as quickly side. as you can. I hit the side with either, I don't think it was rubber balls. I've had that before, rubber bullets or something. I don't want to be like overly dramatic about it. I know what it was. You're cutting out as your friend and as Brian said a moment ago, as somebody yeah. who knows your parents as well, I want you to get to a safe place. Get out of there. So Garrett is okay. He uh, messaged later that uh, he was okay and he thanked his crew. Uh, But it was a pretty rough scene there, as you could see for a while. In fact, D.C. ended up calling in the National Guard. Also, U.S. Marshals and Drug Enforcement agents were called in to try to clear the streets. Philip? Very, very disturbing scenes there. We are glad Garrett is okay. Tracy, thank you. The response from the apparent Democratic nominee standing in stark contrast to the heated rhetoric from the president. Joe Biden posting a picture of himself kneeling with a protester in Wilmington, Delaware, writing, quote, We are a nation in pain right now, but we must not allow this pain to destroy us. As president, I will help lead this conversation, and more importantly, I will listen. The former vice president is expected to meet with community leaders later today. Turning now to California, where Los Angeles is under a countywide curfew right now. National Guard troops arrived to help restore order after a weekend of violent protests and looting. Meanwhile, shops were burglarized in Santa Monica on Sunday afternoon, and that's where we find NBC's Gotti Schwartz. Gotti? Here in Santa Monica, it's been a really long night of police chasing down what appear to be looters. You've got uh, some of them that are being arrested over here. And then down here, uh, this is a police uh, paddy wagon, basically, that is going to be loading up people into the back, uh, taking them to jail uh, a little bit later. And it's something that we've seen over and over again. In fact, just a little while ago, they were filling city buses with so many people uh, that had been arrested. And the reason why so many uh, police officers are out here is I want to show you Uh, what's been going on. It's uh, very dark out here in Santa Monica. This entire area is now under mandatory curfew, but you've got storefronts that have been vandalized and looted throughout the day. There was about two or three hours earlier where it was absolute pandemonium out here. Police uh, were not on scene. They were dealing with uh, some some agitators that were engaging with them, and they were uh, surrounding a protest, a very peaceful protest over by the Santa Monica Pier, and this was happening. They were, uh, there were some other people, some complete separate group of people that were smashing into storefronts, stealing everything they could. And this block by block, what we saw over the course of about an hour to two hours. Back to you. All right, Gotti, thank you for that report. All right, let's pivot a little bit and get a check of your Monday weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to June. And we are talking about freeze alerts across northern New England this morning. So off to a pretty cool start across the northeast. Things will try to warm up this afternoon, but we're still below average. Back in the 70s from Detroit all the way into the Hartford area, upper 60s this afternoon. But the heat will continue to build from the southwest where we're dealing with some heat alerts. And this will expand all the way into Dallas to New Orleans today. Hey, you're back in the 90s. That's a look at the big weather story today. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. 
So Detroit this afternoon, you're going to see a little bit of sunshine peeking through those clouds and uh, kind of stormy conditions still affecting Tampa. 92 today, even San Antonio watching those storms this afternoon. Very quiet start to the uh, week, but we're watching the tropics as well, guys. At All this right. point, no news is good news, right? Yes. I would think, right? All right. Janessa, thank you so much. We need a breather a little bit. <laughs> we sure do. All right. Coming up next, how the music industry is amplifying its support for the Black Lives Matter movement. All right, before we go, though, in the wake of the nationwide protest, there are several and retailers have announced store closures. Target is one of them. They are based in Minneapolis. They say that more than 200 stores are either temporarily closing or reducing hours. CVS has also announced closures across 20 states. And, uh, of course, Walmart also. Some stores there that were damaged over the weekend will be closed. Rather than rioting, people in Atlanta gathered to shower a powerful moment of silence. Massive crowds came together in solidarity to take a moment to peacefully honor the lives of African Americans everywhere and the Black Lives Matter initiative. And in Oakland, California, police officers joined protesters in taking a knee, calling for justice for George Floyd and showing their support. Meanwhile, companies big and small also showing solidarity, voicing their support for the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole. And now the music industry is taking a stand. Tomorrow, the industry will observe Blackout Tuesday, touted as a day for unity with black employees, artists and fans all coming together. Record labels like Warner Music Group, Sony Music, Columbia Records, Def Jam Recording and more all set to take part. Several of the labels and industry leaders releasing statements on social media announcing their participation and other measures they'll be taking to fight racial injustice. Pope Francis spoke to hundreds at the Vatican for the first time in months. The pontiff was met with cheers as he delivered his Sunday address. He said he hoped the world would come out of the coronavirus pandemic more united and that people are more important than the economy. The anger and outrage over the death of George Floyd has sent shockwaves around the world. Protesters in London and Berlin flooded the streets as calls for racial justice reached beyond U.S. soil. NBC's Kelly Kobayea joining us now from Seoul, South Korea with the very latest. Kelly, good morning. Philip, good morning to you. Yeah, those images are appearing on front pages around the world. Leaders are talking about it, tweeting about it, and people are organizing demonstrations to show their support for these protesters in the United States. In London, for example, thousands turned out on Sunday at Trafalgar Square in London, uh, chanting, no justice, no peace. They were carrying placards, marched to the U.S. Embassy, in fact, where officers were surrounding the building in order to protect it. Now, the demonstration was largely peaceful, but about 23 people were arrested there, some for breaching the lockdown rules still in place in the U.K., uh, but most of those arrests have not been specified. Uh, the causes for those arrests have not been specified by Scotland Yard. A different scene in Brazil where there were also protests in support of, uh, of these demonstrators in the U.S. In, in the case of Brazil, uh, people were not only uh, showing their solidarity with people in the U.S., but also demonstrating against the treatment of blacks in working class Rio, uh, using the same slogans, really, Black Lives Matter. At one point, police firing tear gas into the crowd, and some shouted, I can't breathe, those tragic last words of George Floyd. Peaceful demonstrations in Germany as well over the weekend in a couple of cities. Again, a show of support for the protesters in the United States. Uh, U.S.'s adversaries are also weighing in on this, though. China, Iran, Russia all talking about this and using it basically as a talking point uh, to show that uh, the U.S. Uh, can't really criticize how they treat their pe people uh, during protests in their countries. Philip? It is truly a global movement now. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Our June weather outlook is in. And look at this. This is some bright news across the Pacific Northwest to the central U.S., even the Northeast. We're going to see warmer than average temperatures. Now, summer is just 20 days away, and so the heat and humidity will continue to build. The outlook for June is going to be slightly wetter for the Midwest. I'm headed to Seattle, where we're going to see drier than average uh, precipitation-wise. Okay. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. 
As we grapple with the unrest across our country, there is new concern about the spread of coronavirus among those mass gatherings, especially in communities already hard hit by the pandemic. Here's Blaine Alexander. America is locked in battle, waging war against novel coronavirus while fighting a disease that has plagued the country for centuries. Black people are just tired of having to protest for the same thing year after year after year. It's just like consistent and nothing's changed. With more than 1.7 million confirmed COVID-19 cases in the U.S., the numbers continue to rise. But so do the crowds, protesters gathering from city to city, doing exactly what health officials have spent months urging them not to do. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. We have two crises that are sandwiched on top of one another. All of it leaving little room for social distancing. Now health officials are bracing for a possible spike in cases. These protests are almost an incubator for coronavirus for a few reasons. Number one, people are in contact with a lot of other people in very close quarters. And number two, they're in contact for a good deal of time, which means that virus can spread back and forth. On top of that, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming and spitting. The growing unrest is complicating efforts to control the virus. In L.A., testing centers were closed over the weekend as protests raged. The volunteers who staff these centers still do not feel safe coming back to them. Hands up! It's a harsh reality. Thousands pleading, value black lives. The very group COVID-19 is hitting the hardest. If you were out protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week. Because there's still a pandemic in America that's killing black and brown people at higher numbers. How much of a risk is it for people who are out there, even those who are wearing masks? This is a huge risk, whether you wear a mask or not. Even though it does give you a little bit of protection, it doesn't give you full protection. But many say they're left with little choice. I can go home, clean myself up, go get tested, make sure I take proper precautions and do that. But police brutality, I don't know. I don't know what I can't do to not be harassed. As we look among the crowd, many of the people that I've talked to say they share that feeling. Yes, they say they are concerned about that pandemic. In fact, some people have put on masks trying to protect themselves. But they say that it's equally important that they're here raising their voices in this moment. All right, Blaine Alexander reporting for us. Blaine, thanks. And thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is tough these days. Please, though, stay safe out there. And don't forget to tune in to the Today Show later on this morning. They'll have continuing coverage on those nationwide protests. We'll see you tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A fifth day of protests now coast to coast following the death of George Floyd. Last night, fires raged right outside the White House in Lafayette Park as Secret Service and the National Guard, among others, surrounded protesters. Terrifying moments as a tanker truck speeds through a crowd of protesters on the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis. That driver now in custody. And extraordinary moments of solidarity in the Bay Area and in New York as police kneel down with protesters. It's Monday, June 1st. Early Today starts right now. With that, we say good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. Fire and anger continues to burn across the country over the death of George Floyd. Washington, D.C. is now feeling the heat. Multiple fires burning overnight very close to the White House after a curfew went into effect. And demonstrations turned chaotic in Los Angeles. Multiple police cars were destroyed. Authorities say hundreds of people were taken into custody. And this disturbing moment interrupted some protests in Minneapolis. A truck came barreling through a group of people who were sitting on a closed interstate. Fortunately, it doesn't seem any protesters were injured. Uh, Many of them swarmed the truck. NBC affiliate KTTC identified this man, Bogdan Vichirko, as that semi-truck driver who was arrested. He was charged with assault. Meanwhile, in Atlanta, two police officers have been fired after being accused of using excessive force. Video here shows them tasing and pulling two college students from a car. An officer said the drivers didn't comply with orders to stop. The outrage sparked by the death of George Floyd has now spread to dozens of cities. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has this report. 
the nation erupted into scenes of chaos, violence, oh my God. and widespread destruction into the early morning hours. Dozens of American cities up in flames after some protests turned into riots, often followed by looting as a nation simmering with unrest unraveled. How long can you be peaceful when your people are dying? In Los Angeles, hours before a curfew was ordered, the city became a war zone. After attempting to breach television studios, large groups torched police cruisers as officers fired back with rubber bullets. Before nightfall, the looting began. Department stores, jewelers, and high-end apparel shops trashed by unruly mobs. The mayor calling on the governor to dispatch the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots in 1992. Strikingly similar scenes and issues of injustice, 28 years apart. We've seen this before in Los Angeles. When the violence escalates, no one wins. After nights of protest and violence, the state of emergency in Los Angeles mirrored by pockets of anarchy nationwide. Described as all hell breaking loose in Seattle, when police lost control of downtown, crowds destroyed, then took over their vehicles. This video capturing one man removing a high-powered police rifle before a plainclothes security guard disarmed the man, clearing the magazine. But there was also troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, why so many poured into the streets. We can't peacefully protest in the streets without getting tear gas thrown at us for what? With demonstrators out in force again today, a violent takedown in Philadelphia, where a footlocker was looted after more than a dozen officers were injured there last night. With tear gas choking the streets of Miami, police battled protesters to keep control of their headquarters. With banks burned, highways shut down, and City Hall on fire in Nashville, there was more than a thousand arrests. In Salt Lake City, police have identified this man, who may have fired arrows into a crowd from a crossbow before he was mobbed by a nearby group. In Tallahassee, Florida, someone drove through a protest after their pickup truck was surrounded by a crowd. The National Guard is moving into Chicago after clashes between protesters and police. In this city, we care for each other. This is a time for us to unite. A nation on edge and up in smoke, as many plead for peace in the wake of yet another violent night. Those images are powerful. Our thanks to Miguel for that report. As fiery protests raged this weekend in Washington, D.C., Secret Service rushed White President House Trump itself. to a White House bunker on Friday night. A senior administration official tells NBC News that the president spent nearly an hour inside the complex designed for emergencies like terror attacks. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Potts, joining us now with the latest. Tracy, the president is blaming an extremist group for the violence in D.C. Yeah, not only does he want to call them out, but he wants to declare them uh, a terrorist group, Antifa, uh, a leftist but domestic group. And constitutional experts are questioning whether the federal government actually has the authority uh, to declare a homegrown group uh, a terrorist organization. That label is typically for foreign uh, organizations. Meantime, all of this is happening as violence and demonstrations continue to rage right the outside the White White House just across the street in Lafayette Park, a uh, small building went up in flames. Uh, not only were police, but others called in to try to calm the situation in the nation's capital. And that included our own Garrett Hake, NBC correspondent, who got caught up in the protests. We're going to end up in a place we don't want to be here if we're not careful, Katie. So, ah, damn it. Ah. Garrett, I'm, uh, just move out of the there side. as quickly as you can. I hit in the side with either, I don't think it was rubber balls. I've had that before, rubber bullets or something. I don't want to be like overly dramatic about it. I know what it was. You're cutting out as your friend and as Brian said a moment ago, as somebody yeah. who knows your parents as well. I want you to get to a safe place. Get out of there. 
Okay, Garrett is okay. Um, he messaged later that he was fine. He thanked his crew. He thanked his security team, which we have on hand to uh, to protect our folks who are out there in the thick of it. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was not only police, D.C. police, but the National Guard has been called in to assist. Of course, right there at the White House, uh, there was the Secret Service. U.S. Marshals have been called in in D.C. Uh, to try to calm things down and drug enforcement agents as well. Philo? We're living in some surreal times. Tracy, thank you. All right, let's turn now to Minneapolis, the epicenter of this crisis. The governor is taking drastic measures to keep protesters off the streets. Police and the National Guard have been ordered to crack down on anyone ignoring the curfew. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has the story. In the largest public safety operation in Minnesota's history, local and state police and 4,000 members of the National Guard took a stand. Aggressively using tear gas, pepper spray, and drawn weapons in a desperate attempt to squelch days of escalating chaos. This time, no major fires or injuries. I want to thank everyone who participated in our ability to restore trust to our streets. It was incredibly complex. It was incredibly difficult. The tactics were the strictest yet. Here, police shoot a paint canister at someone on their front porch. Get in, get in, get in, get in. Journalists like NBC's Ali Velshi. Get back, get back, get back, get back. Your head, your head. He's head. And Morgan Chesky were in the middle of it. They have tripled the amount of law enforcement here in Minneapolis. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Law enforcement authorities here acknowledge they did not have an adequate plan to confront large-scale violent protests earlier in the week. What took so long to get on the same page? A good question. I think resources. Uh, I think uh, we're all kind of asking that question. I think now we know what we need. Uh, we know that we need a unified command. A peaceful protest at the state capitol and a growing makeshift memorial for George Floyd. Demonstrators are demanding more charges for the other three fired officers involved after the one who knelt on his neck was charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter on Friday. Now, new security video of what happened moments earlier appears to show a struggle in the backseat of a police vehicle. Michael Holliday came here from Houston. He says he's protesting peacefully, but that he understands why the anger runs so deep. Sometimes violence is needed. It got your attention, right? He does not consider himself an outside agitator. Imagine if it was your child. How would you feel? Imagine if it was your son on the ground screaming, I can't breathe. Help me. Please. If it was you, what would you want somebody to do? Would you want the community to come stand up with you? Or would you want them to go home and go to sleep? All right, our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that report. Let's take a turn now and talk about the weather. We'll get a look at our week ahead with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Hi, Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to June, and I'm still talking about freeze alerts that are impacting northern New England this morning, but most of us across the Great Lakes to the northeast are sitting in the upper 40s, so kind of a chill. Make sure you have a coat handy as you're stepping outside. Today, we're still below average, upper 60s to lower 70s, but that change, it's going to come quickly. It's going to slide in from the southwest all the way to the upper Midwest, where we're going to watch some storms developing today. The daytime highs, they are sitting in the upper 80s to lower 90s. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Cleveland this afternoon, you're going to lose the cloud coverage and finally sitting that sunshine, lower 70s, watching these storms going to develop across the deep south to uh, Tampa, 92 today. Very quiet weather pattern. Enjoy this, guys. I still do not believe it's June 1st. Just like that. Mm -hmm. Janessa, thank you. Weirdest year ever, though. Yeah. <laughs> Former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick has set up a fund offering to help pay for the defenses of those arrested in the Minneapolis protests. Kaepernick is accepting donations through his Know Your Rights Camp charity, which says it's partnered with top defense lawyers in Minneapolis to provide legal resources. He tweeted the link to donate on Friday, adding, quote, we must protect our freedom fighters. 
An NBA legend Michael Jordan is speaking out about the ongoing and widespread protests in the wake of the death of George Floyd. In a statement released by his manager and spokeswoman, Jordan says, I, feel, I see and feel everyone's pain, outrage and frustration. I stand with those who are calling out the ingrained racism and violence toward people in our country. We have had enough. The six-time NBA champion also called for peaceful protests, saying in part, we need to continue peaceful expressions against injustice and demand accountability. Well, crowds in Atlanta gathered to share a powerful moment of silence rather than rioting. This happened in other cities as well. Massive groups peacefully honoring the Black Lives Matter initiative and some even holding nine minutes of silence for George Floyd. Over in Oakland, California, police officers joined protesters in taking a knee, calling for justice for George Floyd and showing their support. The anger and outrage over the death of George Floyd has sent shockwaves around the world. Protesters in London and Berlin flooded the streets as calls for racial justice reached beyond U.S. soil. NBC's Kelly Kobaya is in Seoul with the latest. Kelly, good morning. Philip, good morning to you. Those images of rioting, cars on fire, or riot police and cars on fire around the United States have made front page headlines around the world, uh, but also have sparked a lot of protests in support, in solidarity uh, with the demonstrators in the United States. In London, for example, thousands turned out on Sunday at Trafalgar Square. You could hear them chanting, uh, no justice, no peace, for example. They were holding placards in support of the protesters in the U.S. They marched to the U.S. Embassy uh, shouting these slogans, the embassy surrounded by police officers to protect it. There were about 23 arrests during that protest. Now, all of this was happening in violation, essentially, of lockdown rules. Some people were arrested uh, for breaching those lockdown rules. Unclear what the other arrests, what, what charges were involved in the other arrests. Scotland Yard not commenting at this point. But that was a mostly peaceful protest. And compare that with what happened in Brazil, where, again, this incident with George Floyd, the death uh, of George Floyd has really uh, hit a nerve with people there. They were using the same slogan, Black Lives Matter, coming out to protest in Rio, protesting the way the black people uh, in Rio are treated by police. At one point, tear gas was fired into the crowd. Some people screaming, I can't breathe. That same uh, phrase, those tragic words uh, voiced by George Floyd in the moments before he died. Also protests in Berlin, but once again, uh, very peaceful over the weekend. This isn't something that's going away. The world is talking about it. World leaders are talking about it. More protests are planned in the days ahead. Philip. All right. Thank you, Kelly, for that. Leading the news, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley made history after successfully docking at the International Space Station just 19 hours after blasting off from Kennedy Space Center. The SpaceX Dragon capsule pulled up to the station and docked automatically without assistance. It is the first time a privately built and owned spacecraft has delivered a crew to the orbiting lab. It was also the first launch of American astronauts from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. Best thing I saw all weekend. I was going to say it was incredible to watch. There was. So Let's get to Wall Street now. Still reeling from the pandemic and massive unemployment now facing massive and highly destructive protests from coast to coast. Joining us live from London, CNBC's Karen Cho. And Karen, Karen how are the markets reacting to all of this new baggage added on? Despite extraordinary scenes over the weekend of protests around the killing of George Floyd, Wall Street seems largely immune at this stage. Don't forget there's been so much bad news to weather around coronavirus. The investors at this point are happy to hear that the U.S.-China trade relationship remains intact, so we're focusing on that. But keep in mind there will be a hit to some businesses that had planned to reopen on the back of lockdown. So major retailers from the likes of, of what you're seeing from Whole Foods to Target, Apple have all altered their opening hours because of curfews. Also, online deliveries have been impacted as the likes of back. Amazon tries to ensure its employees oh, no. get home safely. So there is a hit and we'll have more bad jobs data to weather no. later this week as the non-farm no. payrolls report is expected to show the unemployment rate surging to 19.8%. But employers are taking a stand and the likes of Apple has sent a memo to its employees condemning the events that have occurred, acknowledging the racial injustice in the US and the criminal justice system. And then the likes of Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, saying he's called for the creation of a better, more just world for everyone. 
everyone. Back to you in the studio. All right, we appreciate it, Karen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It looks like June, it's gonna play nice. Look at this above average temperatures for most of the nation. We are gonna watch a few storms that are gonna pop up mid month, causing wet conditions across the Ohio Valley and the deep south, but dry across the Pacific Northwest. Yes. Like that heat, thanks, Janessa. There are new developments in the investigation into the death of George Floyd. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison has been named as the new lead prosecutor in the case. The Floyd family had been asked for has been asking for Ellison's oversight. This case has, of course, inspired dozens of protests. And for more on this, we're joined now by NBC's Jay Gray in Minneapolis. Jay, good morning. What are yeah, you seeing there? Philip, look, large pockets of this city are either boarded up or burned out, as you can see behind us here, including this area where George Floyd was killed exactly a week ago today. Now, look, overnight for the first time, there seemed to be a sense of calm across this community, even as the outrage continues across the country to intensify. Overnight, waves of frustration and at times fury. Across the country, tense confrontations between protesters and police, at times escalating out of control. This crowd in Boston burning a patrol car and at one point tossing a tear gas canister back at police. In New York, a line of officers slowly walking back hundreds of protesters. In Washington, flames raging in a park just across from the White House, looters breaking into a row of shops in Los Angeles, and in Birmingham, Alabama, a crowd turns its anger to a Confederate monument. In Minneapolis, the city that's been the flashpoint for the outrage and violence since George Floyd's death, an overwhelming show of force. Dozens of protesters refusing to empty the streets at curfew are arrested. The National Guard locking down what, for the first time in a week, are mostly quiet streets here. Though earlier, this tanker barrels into a crowd of thousands, many jumping onto and some into the cab. Somehow, no one was injured. The driver arrested. I think the incident just underscores um, still the volatile situation we have out there. A situation that has millions on edge right now. Yeah, you know, protesters insist that they'll continue their peaceful demonstrations here while the police, sheriff's deputies and the National Guard promise they're going to keep it that way. Philip, Corey. All right, Jay, thank you so much. Please stay safe out there. We'd like to bring you a lighter note now, and this one out of Queens, New York, a show of solidarity among all the protests. Keep that me! Keep that me! Keep that me! Keep that me! This is one of many examples of peaceful protests that we have seen during this unrest. Not all protesters are violent and neither are all police officers. Absolutely. Respect, empathy and understanding. Please be safe out there. Thanks for waking up with us. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Chaos in the nation's capital as protesters became even more emboldened outside the White House and around the nation. In cities from coast to coast, there were peaceful protests and moments of pure mayhem as people overran stores and businesses with looting and destruction. As we kick off the month of June, we'll look at where America stands right now and where we're headed. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. Breaking news this morning, anger and outrage is spilling out onto the streets from coast to coast. It has been nearly one week since 46-year-old George Flynn died while in police custody. The video of his final moment spread far and wide, inspiring massive protests in dozens of cities. We are hurting. Yes, we, we, you know, we want to go crazy, but we refuse to sit up here and allow to tear up our own homes and everything else, that, that's, that's pointless for us. We wanted to have this as a peaceful manner for us to make a statement, to let everybody know we can come together as a community and as a united front. 
In Minnesota, the governor announced that Attorney General Keith Ellison will be the lead prosecutor in the George Floyd case. The Floyd family had asked that Ellison take over the investigation. And then there was this disturbing moment that interrupted oh protests in Minneapolis. Oh a truck came well, barreling through a group of people who were sitting on a closed interstate. Fortunately, it doesn't seem any protesters were injured. The driver of the truck was arrested and an investigation is underway. And demonstrations turned chaotic in Los Angeles with police cars being set on fire. Authorities say hundreds of people were taken into custody. Meanwhile, in our nation's capital, multiple fires were set not far from the White House. And our own Garrett Haight was there, and here's what happened when he was speaking with MSNBC's Katie Tour just a few hours ago. At 11 o'clock, the White House went out. The curfew officially went into effect. Park police have pushed us back out of Lafayette Park, back up 16th Street. I'm keeping my head on a swivel here to see if they intend to push us back further. You're hearing some of those flashbangs in the distance. I suspect that is the enforcement of the curfew by Metropolitan Police on other streets. I'm trying to keep an eye down the block behind me. Uh, D.C. Fire is attending to the structure fire behind us uh, that became an issue within the last hour or so. And at the moment where I stand right now, ironically, Katie, this is about the most peaceful I've seen this piece of real estate in the last 48 hours. MPD, that's the Metropolitan Police Department of D.C., the main cops here in D.C., are coming in from the east, and they've essentially tried to close off the south towards the White House, the east towards Capitol Hill. You can see fire burning in the distance. I think that's probably another burning car or SUV. We saw some of that last night. And they're going to force everybody west. They're going to force egress into west and northwest in the city. And my God, we're going to end up in a place we don't want to be here if we're not careful, Katie. So, ah, damn it. Ah. Garrett, I'm, uh, just move out of the there side. as quickly as you can. I hit in the side with either, I don't think it was rubber balls. I've had that experience before, rubber bullets or something. I don't want to be like overly dramatic about it. I know what it was. You're cutting out as your friend and as Brian said a moment ago, as somebody yeah. who knows your parents as well, I want you to get to a safe place. Get out of there. Thankfully, Garrett later tweeted that he is fine, but he has some souvenir wealth on his side. Oh, well, cities are reeling after being rocked by destruction. As groups of looters vandalized and set fire to stores, retailers like Target, Walmart, and CVS have closed down some of their stores and adjusted their hours after several were damaged. But with the mayhem came moments of solidarity. In New York, members of the NYPD took a knee with protesters. These moving scenes here also took place elsewhere in the United States, including in Spokane and Santa Cruz. Here's Miguel Almaguer. The nation erupted into scenes of chaos, violence, oh my God. and widespread destruction into the early morning hours. Dozens of American cities up in flames after some protests turned into riots, often followed by looting as a nation simmering with unrest unraveled. How long can you be peaceful? when your people are dying. In Los Angeles, hours before a curfew was ordered, the city became a war zone. After attempting to breach television studios, large groups torched police cruisers as officers fired back with rubber bullets. Before nightfall, the looting began. Department stores, jewelers, and high-end apparel shops trashed by unruly mobs. The mayor calling on the governor to dispatch the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots in 1992. Strikingly similar scenes and issues of injustice, 28 years apart. We've seen this before in Los Angeles. When the violence escalates, no one wins. After nights of protest and violence, the state of emergency in Los Angeles mirrored by pockets of anarchy nationwide described as all hell breaking loose in Seattle when police lost control of downtown, crowds destroyed, then took over their vehicles. This video capturing one man removing a high-powered police rifle before a plainclothes security guard disarmed the man, clearing the magazine. But there was also troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, why so many poured into the streets. We can't peacefully protest in the streets without getting tear gas thrown at us for what? 
With demonstrators out in force again today, a violent takedown in Philadelphia, where a footlocker was looted after more than a dozen officers were injured there last night. With tear gas choking the streets of Miami, police battled protesters to keep control of their headquarters. With banks burned, highways shut down, and City Hall on fire in Nashville, there was more than a thousand arrests. In Salt Lake City, police have identified this man, who may have fired arrows into a crowd from a crossbow, before he was mobbed by a nearby group. In Tallahassee, Florida, someone drove through a protest after their pickup truck was surrounded by a crowd. The National Guard is moving into Chicago after clashes between protesters and police. In this city, we care for each other. This is a time for us to unite. A nation on edge and up in smoke as many plead for peace in the wake of yet another violent night. Miguel Almaguer reporting. Thank you. As fiery protests raged this weekend in Washington, D.C., Secret Service and rushed President House Trump itself. to a White House to bunker you, on Friday night. A senior administration out. official tells NBC News that the president spent nearly an hour inside the complex designed for emergencies like terror attacks. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more from D.C. Days of national outrage at the president's doorstep. More protests near the White House. More than 60 Secret Service officers and agents injured this weekend. The president assigning blame to a militant anti-fascist movement. The United States of America will be designated Antifa as a terrorist organization. A bold but questionable claim, since federal law does not allow for U.S. organizations to be classified as terror groups. Legal experts say the president crossed a line. That is a dangerous authority and power. It is not an authority that exists under current law, and it should not. But as a political matter, the president branded this new adversary. The violence and vandalism is being led by Antifa and other radical left-wing groups. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said tactics separate Antifa from peaceful protesters. Using military-style tactics, using Molotov cocktails, using fireworks, using gasoline, uh, using bricks and, and paving stones to attack. In a statement, Attorney General William Barr points out that criminal conduct, not a specific militant group, can be charged with homegrown terrorism. The violence instigated and carried out by Antifa and other similar groups in connection with the rioting is domestic terrorism and will be treated accordingly. The White House also wants action from the FBI. The president wants to know what the FBI has been doing to surveil, to disrupt, to take down, to prosecute Antifa. Well, those are not constructive tweets. Republican Senator Tim Scott said he spoke with the president and encouraged him to avoid contentious tweets. Mr. President, it is helpful when you leave with compassion. But, but, Mr. President, it helps us when you focus on the death, the unjustified, in my opinion, the criminal death of George Floyd. Senior officials say while the president has offered active duty military police to state and local governments in crisis, right now the president does not intend to put state-led National Guard units under federal control. That keeps governors in charge. And the federal government can provide law enforcement help with agencies like ATF and FBI. Philip? All right, Kelly, thank you. The response from the apparent Democratic nominee standing in stark contrast to the heated rhetoric from the president. Joe Biden posting a picture of himself kneeling with a protester in Wilmington, Delaware, writing, quote, We're a nation in pain right now, but we must not allow this pain to destroy us. As president, I will help lead this conversation, and more importantly, I will listen. The former vice president is expected to meet with community leaders later today. All right, let's get a check of our weather on this first day of June with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. Good to see you both. Good morning, everyone. We're off to a very cool start across the northeast and abnormal temperatures, but we're going to warm up quickly going into the rest of the week. Look right now, Ohio Valley to the Great Lakes. We're sitting in the upper 40s with freeze alerts still in place for northern New England. Daytime highs are still below average uh, this afternoon, where we're about 10 to 15 degrees below average across the northeast. But things are going to start to warm up, even for Texas, all the way to Louisiana. We're expecting storms today back in the lower 90s. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. 
So Columbus today, partly cloudy skies, daytime highs are still in the mid 70s and you can see that cooler air making its way east. This will be short lived as you can see the warmth starting to build up across New Orleans all the way to Montgomery. Pretty slow start to the weather week, but we're also watching the tropics. Talk about that coming up. A few 90s in the south, too. Yeah, it's about that time. Thanks, Janessa. Pope Francis spoke to hundreds at the Vatican for the first time in months. The Pope was met with cheers as he delivered his Sunday address. He said he hoped the world could come together at the end of the coronavirus pandemic, more united, and that people are more important than the economy. Two Atlanta police officers are out of a job this morning and three others placed on desk duty after they were accused of using excessive force during a protest arrest. This incident happened on Saturday. Body cam video shows the officers, investigators Martin Gardner and Ivory Street are both veterans of the department, tasing and pulling two black college students out of a car. An officer at the scene said that they signaled that car to stop because another officer was in the road and the driver didn't comply. The officer also alleges that the driver reached for something in or near his pocket pocket and that the passenger also did not comply with orders. The mayor of Atlanta and the chief of police terminated the two officers after reviewing the body camera footage. The mayor says those charges against the students will be dropped. Former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick has set up a fund offering to help pay for defenses of those arrested in the Minneapolis protests. Kaepernick is accepting donations through his Know Your Rights Camp charity and he tweeted the link to donate on Friday adding we must protect our freedom fighters. NBA legend Michael Jordan is speaking out about the ongoing and widespread protests in the wake of the death of George Floyd as well. In a statement released by his manager and spokeswoman, Jordan says, quote, I see and feel everyone's pain, outrage and frustration. I stand with those who are calling out the ingrained racism and violence in this country happening to people in our country. We have had enough. The six-time NBA champion also called for peaceful protests, saying in part, we need to continue peaceful expressions against injustice and demand accountability. The anger and outrage over the death of George Floyd has sent shockwaves around the world. Protesters in London and Berlin flooded the streets as racial injustice, the calls for racial justice reached beyond U.S. soil. NBC's Kelly Kobe is in Seoul, South Korea with the latest. Hi, Kelly. Good morning. Philip, good morning to you. Yeah, those images, those dramatic images of burning cars and riot police on the streets of so many U.S. cities appeared on front pages around the world over the weekend, and demonstrations were organized in countries that are some of the U.S.'s closest allies, including in Britain, where thousands of people showed up uh, at Trafalgar Square on Sunday, marching, uh, chanting things like no justice, no peace, holding placards uh, with signs in solidarity with the protesters in the United States. At one point, they marched to the U.S. Embassy, which was surrounded by police officers for protection. Uh, there were, it was mostly peaceful. About 23 people were arrested, some of them for breaching lockdown rules. But again, as I said, mostly peaceful there. Slightly different scene in Brazil, though, where there was another demonstration sparked by the events in the United States. Protesters demonstrating it against the treatment of blacks in Rio's favelas in their working class neighborhoods using some of the same slogans like Black Lives Matter. At one point, tear gas uh, was fired at the protesters and some shouted, I can't breathe, those tragic final words of George Floyd. Calmer scenes in different cities in Germany over the weekend, but again, more protests there in solidarity uh, with these protesters in the United States. And this is not ending, Philip. There are more uh, demonstrations planned for London in the coming days. Philip? All right. Kelly Kobea reporting for us this morning. Kelly, thank you. Leading the news, NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley have made history after successfully docking at the International Space Station just 19 hours after blasting off from Kennedy Space Center. The SpaceX Dragon capsule pulled up to the station and docked automatically without assistance. It's the first time a privately built and owned spacecraft has delivered a crew to the orbiting lab. It is also the first launch of American astronauts from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. 
Aggressive thunderstorms tore through northern India on Friday night, leaving the iconic Taj Mahal with visible damage. The main mausoleum was impacted, marble and sandstone were affected, and the garden was also heavily damaged with many trees uprooted. City officials say the uprooting of the trees and the damage to the property during the storm led to the deaths of three people, including a child. This morning, we are remembering a giant in the art world. The artist known as Christo has died, and, he, and his work were larger than life. He was most famous for his monumental works and used miles of fabric to drape landmarks and nature. Among his most well-known, this installation in New York Central Park in 2005. Christo was 84 years old. Good morning, everyone. Let's bring you some positive news as we start off the month of June. Look at this. This is our outlook for most of the nation. We're going to be above average temperature wise. So the heat going to start to build and so the official start to summer only 20 days away. Uh, now what we're seeing here across uh, precipitation wise, we're going to see cooler air making its way in from Texas. And that's going to allow for a few storms to really spark up by mid month. But the good news, it's going to be warm, guys. Appreciate it, Janessa. Like that. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, America faces another crisis, the repeated cycle of racial inequality and police brutality. NBC's Lester Holt reflects on the emotions many are feeling as we hope and pray for peace in the time ahead. Pick your emotion. Chances are it was represented in these jumbled images from America's streets. Rage, hate, disappointment, emptiness, hopelessness, and so much fear. It's hard to comprehend that this was about a singular event. No, no matter how horrific. No, this explosion of raw passion seeming to come from a place far deeper. A primal scream from a country that may just be fed up. Begging for life to be better. Fed up with lockdowns and layoffs. COVID and incivility, racism and power abused, a perfect storm of unmitigated pain, a wound too deep, a racial history too deep for mere gestures to heal. Yet are they a start? A police chief kneeling with citizens in California, other law enforcement in Kansas City and Camden, New Jersey in their own moments of solidarity with protesters. Most of us have not taken to the streets, even as we may privately hold some of the emotions these pictures speak to. These will be the images that will archive this moment in our history. But let these two, the quiet peacemakers, the neighbors, the businesses picking up the pieces, already physically reclaiming and maybe improving all that was lost. That is what we hope for. Lester, thank you. Public outcry and protests over the death of George Floyd have prompted the music industry to take a united stand in the Black Lives Matter movement. Tomorrow, the music industry will observe Blackout Tuesday, touted as a day for unity with black employees, artists, and fans. Uh, record labels like Warner Music Group, Sony Music, Columbia Records, Def Jam Recording, and more all set to take part. Several of the labels and industry leaders have released statements on social media announcing their participation in other measures that they'll be taking to fight uh, against racial injustice and we know artists and musicians have a lot of influence over our, our culture and uh, yes. let's hope that uh, their message of peaceful protests uh takes heat. And resonates. And in a time like this, we do look to uh, not only these leaders of our uh, communities, but also our entertainment leaders uh, for them to talk about these yeah. issues. Again, that Blackout Tuesday is set for tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching early today on this Monday. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, a nation on the brink. Another night of protests in many cities under curfew just one week after the death of George Floyd while in the custody of Minneapolis police. Two Atlanta officers have been fired after they were accused of using unnecessary force when they arrested two college students during protests. To the terrifying scene in Minneapolis where a tanker truck came barreling toward a group of peaceful protesters. The aftermath and what later happened to the driver. 
The past few days have shaken the nation to our core, impacting every American, young and old, from coast to coast, as demonstrations, peaceful and destructive, show no signs of slowing down. And it was one week ago today that George Floyd lost his life while in the hands of Minneapolis police officers. And the warning that these massive protests may lead to a coronavirus surge. It is Monday, June 1st. Early today starts right now. Good morning. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coff, and we continue to follow breaking news. More than a dozen cities imposed curfews overnight as protests continued over the death of George Floyd. Moments after the curfew went into effect in Atlanta, police started firing tear gas. The New York Times reports that the last time curfews were used at this scale was in 1968 in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Two police officers in Atlanta, meanwhile, have been fired after being accused of using excessive force. Video showing them tasing and pulling two college students from a car can be seen here. An officer said the driver didn't comply with orders to stop. In New York, three people have been arrested by the FBI and charged with throwing Molotov cocktails at NYPD vehicles. But there was a lighter moment in Queens in a show of solidarity. That's just one of the many examples of peaceful protests that we have seen during this unrest. A peaceful moment turned dangerous in Minneapolis. A truck came barreling through a group of people who were sitting on a closed interstate. Fortunately, it doesn't seem any protesters were injured. Many of them swarmed the truck driver who was arrested and an investigation is now underway. NBC's Morgan Chesky joins us now from Minnesota with the latest on the protests there. Morgan, good morning. And good morning from a surprisingly quiet Minneapolis. We are here in a street where dozens of protesters were facing off against law enforcement earlier, uh, but little by little they began to dissipate. And right now the only thing we're seeing is this barrier of law enforcement about 50 yards uh, away from me right now. And the clear mark of the National Guard presence are those Humvees. A thousand National Guardsmen arriving in Minneapolis yesterday, uh, really increasing the size of the law enforcement footprint. And that's been one of the biggest differences we've seen with the enforcement of that curfew that lasts from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. And with that in place, uh, there has been a significant reduction in the damage that we've seen in just block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. A countless number of businesses damages, others gutted and burned. It will be a long road of recovery for this city. However, there are still thousands that feel that justice has yet to be served because Derek Chauvin, uh, the police officer who was seen kneeling on the neck of George Floyd, he was arrested. He was charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. However, three other officers connected to the death of George Floyd are not in police custody as of right now. There has been so much tension in this city uh, over the past several days. We know that the FBI tipped off the Minnesota National Guard that there was a credible lethal threat. And because of that alone, National Guardsmen were carrying their rifles, ammunition at the ready, just in case something should happen. However, as we stand here today, a relatively quiet night and morning in Minneapolis. We do know 150 protesters were arrested not too far away from where I'm standing. And so this is a hopeful sign of what's to come for this city that has seen so much damage here over the nearly the past week. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan, thank you. The NYPD says around 700 New York protesters have been arrested over the course of four days of protests in response to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Officials say Sunday's demonstrations were mostly peaceful until the final hours of the night. That's when confrontations between protesters and police erupted. Multiple arrests were made and several officers were hurt. NBC's Ron Allen has more on the unrest in the Big Apple. Across New York with thousands of protesters demanding justice, clashing with police on the streets. Multiple incidents caught on video igniting outrage. A police vehicle accelerating through a crowd. A woman shoved to the ground, unclear why. I wasn't aggressive towards the police officer. And even if I was, he should have had the self-restraint to not hurt the people he's supposed to be protecting. Here, a police officer is seen pulling down a protester's mask and spraying mace. There's tremendous stress uh, on everyone. I've seen those videos, and those videos are truly disturbing. 
Uh, and some of the videos, frankly, are inexplicable. Now, with the state's governor ordering the attorney general to investigate, New York's mayor and police chief are pushing back, insisting overall police have shown restraint while under attack from violent elements within the crowds. Those police vehicles only move forward because they were attacked. There are protests and there are mobs. And I saw a kid closer to a mob. A protest does not involve surrounding and ambushing a marked police car and putting my officers and my detectives' lives at risk. So far, at least 30 officers injured, some 350 arrests Saturday night, including three suspects accused of targeting police with firebombs. Decades of simmering anger exploding in a city with a long history of deadly confrontations. Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, that echo what happened to George Floyd at the hands of police. New York's mayor claims reforms like ending stop and frisk, the widespread roundup of countless young black men, and comprehensive de-escalation training for every officer has improved policing, while admitting the confrontation show NYPD still has work to do. I saw a tremendous amount of restraint, but I also saw things that need to be done better. Clearly, I saw some moments yesterday that were disturbing in terms of the way police handled things. More protests are planned, including this one just getting underway here in Times Square. And while many major cities have imposed curfews to try and bring down the size of the crowds, New York's mayor says that's not necessary here. All right, Ron Allen reporting for us in the Big Apple. Ron, thank you. As fiery protests raged this weekend in Washington, D.C., Secret and Service rushed House President itself. Trump to a White to House you. bunker Friday night. A senior administration official tells NBC News that the president spent nearly an hour inside the complex designed for emergencies like terror attacks. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us now with the latest. And Tracy, the president is blaming an extremist group for the violence in D.C. Yeah, Philip, not only blaming them, but also tweeting that he wants to declare Antifa a terrorist group. And there are some experts who question whether the government can do that with a domestic group that has First Amendment rights. All of this as demonstrations, protests continue in Washington, including right across the street the from the White House in Lafayette Park. Uh, there the were street. there was one small building in that area that was set afire overnight. Uh, we also saw tear gas that was used to try to disperse the crowds after the mayor declared an 11 p.m. curfew uh, with those demonstrations continuing. This was the third straight night of demonstrations and violence in the nation's capital. And NBC's own Garrett Hake got caught right in the middle of it. We're going to end up in a place we don't want to be here if we're not careful, Katie. So, ah, damn it. Ah. Garrett, uh, just move out of the there as quickly side. as you can. I got hit in the side with either, I don't think it was rubber balls. I've had that before, rubber bullets or something. I don't want to be like overly dramatic about it. I know what it was. You're cutting out as your friend and as Brian said a moment ago, as somebody yeah. who knows your parents as well, I want you to get to a safe place. Get out of there. So Garrett is okay. He uh, messaged later that uh, he was okay and he thanked his crew. Uh, but it was a pretty rough scene there, as you could see for a while. In fact, D.C. ended up calling in the National Guard. Also, U.S. Marshals and Drug Enforcement agents were called in to try to clear the streets. Philip? Very, very disturbing scenes there. We are glad Garrett is okay. Tracy, thank you. The response from the apparent Democratic nominee standing in stark contrast to the heated rhetoric from the president. Joe Biden posting a picture of himself kneeling with a protester in Wilmington, Delaware, writing, quote, We are a nation in pain right now, but we must not allow this pain to destroy us. As president, I will help lead this conversation, and more importantly, I will listen. The former vice president is expected to meet with community leaders later today. Turning now to California, where Los Angeles is under a countywide curfew right now. National Guard troops arrived to help restore order after a weekend of violent protests and looting. Meanwhile, shops were burglarized in Santa Monica on Sunday afternoon, and that's where we find NBC's Gotti Schwartz. Gotti? Yeah, here in Santa Monica, it's been a really long night of police chasing down what appear to be looters. You've got uh, some of them that are being arrested over here. And then down here, uh, this is a police 
a paddy wagon, basically, that is going to be loading up people into the back, uh, taking them to jail uh, a little bit later. And it's something that we've seen over and over again. In fact, just a little while ago, they were filling city buses with so many people uh, that had been arrested. And the reason why so many uh, police officers are out here is I want to show you uh, what's been going on. It's uh, very dark out here in Santa Monica. This entire area is now under mandatory curfew, but you've got storefronts that have been vandalized and looted throughout the day. There was about two or three hours earlier where it was absolute pandemonium out here. Police uh, were not on scene. They were dealing with uh, some some agitators that were engaging with them, and they were uh, tr- surrounding a protest, a very peaceful protest over by the Santa Monica Pier, and this was happening. They were uh, There were some other people, some complete separate group of people that were smashing into storefronts, stealing everything they could, and this block by block, what we saw over the course of about an hour to two hours. Back to you. All right, Gotti, thank you for that report. All right, let's pivot a little bit and get a check of your Monday weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to June. And we are talking about freeze alerts across northern New England this morning. So off to a pretty cool start across the northeast. Things will try to warm up uh, this afternoon, but we're still below average. Back in the 70s from Detroit all the way into the Hartford area, upper 60s this afternoon. But the heat will continue to build from the southwest where we're dealing with some heat alerts. And this will expand all the way into Dallas to New Orleans today. Hey, you're back in the 90s. That's a look at the big weather story today. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Detroit this afternoon, you're going to see a little bit of sunshine peeking through those clouds and kind of stormy conditions still affecting Tampa. 92 today, even San Antonio watching those storms this afternoon. Very quiet start to the uh, week, but we're watching the tropics as well, guys. At this point, no news is good news, right? I would think, right? All right. Janessa, thank you so much. We need a breather a little bit. (laughs) We sure do. All right. Coming up next, how the music industry is amplifying its support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Before we go, though, in the wake of the nationwide protests, there are several retailers have announced store closures. Target is one of them. They are based in Minneapolis. They say that more than 200 stores are either temporarily closing or reducing hours. CVS has also announced closures across 20 states. And, uh, of course, Walmart also. Some stores there that were damaged over the weekend will be closed. Rather than rioting, people in Atlanta gathered to shower a powerful moment of silence. Massive crowds came together in solidarity to take a moment to peacefully honor the lives of African Americans everywhere and the Black Lives Matter initiative. And in Oakland, California, police officers joined protesters in taking a knee, calling for justice for George Floyd and showing their support. Meanwhile, companies big and small also showing solidarity, voicing their support for the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole. And now the music industry is taking a stand. Tomorrow, the industry will observe Blackout Tuesday, touted as a day for unity with black employees, artists and fans all coming together. Record labels like Warner Music Group, Sony Music, Columbia Records, Def Jam Recording and more all set to take part. Several of the labels and industry leaders releasing statements on social media announcing their participation and other measures they'll be taking to fight racial injustice. Pope Francis spoke to hundreds at the Vatican for the first time in months. The pontiff was met with cheers as he delivered his Sunday address. He said he hoped the world would come out of the coronavirus pandemic more united and that people are more important than the economy. The anger and outrage over the death of George Floyd has sent shockwaves around the world. Protesters in London and Berlin flooded the streets as calls for racial justice reached beyond U.S. soil. NBC's Kelly Kobayea joining us now from Seoul, South Korea with the very latest. Kelly, good morning. Philip, good morning to you. Yeah, those images are appearing on front pages around the world. Leaders are talking about it, tweeting about it, and people are organizing demonstrations to show their support for these protesters in the United States. In London, for example, thousands turned out on Sunday at Trafalgar Square in London, uh, chanting, no justice, no peace. They were carrying placards, marched to the U.S. Embassy, in fact, where officers were surrounding the building in order to protect it. Now, the demonstration was largely peaceful, but about 23 people 
were arrested there, some for breaching the lockdown rules still in place in the UK. Uh, but most of those arrests have not been specified. Uh, the causes for those arrests have not been specified by Scotland Yard. A different scene in Brazil where there were also protests in support of, uh, of these demonstrators in the US. In, in the case of Brazil, uh, people were not only uh, showing their solidarity with people in the US, but also demonstrating against the treatment of blacks in working class Rio, uh, using the same slogans really, Black Lives Matter. At one point, police firing tear gas into the crowd and some shouted, I can't breathe those tragic last words of George Floyd. Peaceful demonstrations in Germany as well over the weekend in a couple of cities. Again, a show of support for the protesters in the United States. Uh, U.S.'s adversaries are also weighing in on this, though. China, Iran, Russia all talking about this and using it basically as a talking point uh, to show that uh, the U.S. Uh, can't really criticize how they treat their pe people uh, during protests in their countries. Philip? It is truly a global movement now. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Our June weather outlook is in. And look at this. This is some bright news across the Pacific Northwest to the central U.S., even the Northeast. We're going to see warmer than average temperatures. Now, summer is just 20 days away, and so the heat and humidity will continue to build. The outlook for June is going to be slightly wetter for the Midwest. I'm headed to Seattle, where we're going to see drier than average uh, precipitation-wise. Guys. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. As we grapple with the unrest across our country, there is new concern about the spread of coronavirus among those mass gatherings, especially in communities already hard hit by the pandemic. Here's Blaine Alexander. America is locked in battle, waging war against novel coronavirus while fighting a disease that has plagued the country for centuries. Black people are just tired of having to protest for the same thing year after year after year. It's just like consistent and nothing's changed. With more than 1.7 million confirmed COVID-19 cases in the U.S., the numbers continue to rise. But so do the crowds, protesters gathering from city to city, doing exactly what health officials have spent months urging them not to do. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. We have two crises that are sandwiched on top of one another. All of it leaving little room for social distancing. Now health officials are bracing for a possible spike in cases. These protests are almost an incubator for coronavirus for a few reasons. Number one, people are in contact with a lot of other people in very close quarters. And number two, they're in contact for a good deal of time, which means that virus can spread back and forth. On top of that, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming and spitting. The growing unrest is complicating efforts to control the virus. In L.A., testing centers were closed over the weekend as protests raged. The volunteers who staff these centers still do not feel safe coming back to them. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands it's a harsh reality. Thousands pleading, value black lives. The very group COVID-19 is hitting the hardest. If you were out protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week because there's still a pandemic in America that's killing black and brown people at higher numbers. How much of a risk is it for people who are out there, even those who are wearing masks? This is a huge risk, whether you wear a mask or not. Even though it does give you a little bit of protection, it doesn't give you full protection. But many say they're left with little choice. I can go home, clean myself up, go get tested, make sure I take proper precautions and do that. But police brutality, I don't know. I don't know what I can't do to not be harassed. As we look among the crowd, many of the people that I've talked to say they share that feeling. Yes, they say they are concerned about that pandemic. In fact, some people have put on masks trying to protect themselves. But they say that it's equally important that they're here raising their voices in this moment. All right, Blaine Alexander reporting for us. Blaine, thanks. And thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is tough these days. Please, though, stay safe out there. And don't forget to tune in to the Today Show later on this morning. They'll have continuing coverage on those nationwide protests. We'll see you tomorrow.
watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, a nation on the brink. Another night of protests in many cities under curfew just one week after the death of George Floyd while in the custody of Minneapolis police. Two Atlanta officers have been fired after they were accused of using unnecessary force when they arrested two college students during protests. To the terrifying scene in Minneapolis where a tanker truck came barreling toward a group of peaceful protesters. The aftermath and what later happened to the driver. The past few days have shaken the nation to our core, impacting every American, young and old, from coast to coast, as demonstrations, peaceful and destructive, show no signs of slowing down. And it was one week ago today that George Floyd lost his life while in the hands of Minneapolis police officers. And the warning that these massive protests may lead to a coronavirus surge. It is Monday, June 1st. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coff, and we continue to follow breaking news. More than a dozen cities imposed curfews overnight as protests continued over the death of George Floyd. Moments after the curfew went into effect in Atlanta, police started firing tear gas. The New York Times reports that the last time curfews were used at this scale was in 1968 in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Two police officers in Atlanta, meanwhile, have been fired after being accused of using excessive force. Video showing them tasing and pulling two college students from a car can be seen here. An officer said the driver didn't comply with orders to stop. In New York, three people have been arrested by the FBI and charged with throwing Molotov cocktails at NYPD vehicles. But there was a lighter moment in Queens in a show of solidarity. That's just one of the many examples of peaceful protests that we have seen during this unrest. A peaceful moment turned dangerous in Minneapolis. A truck came barreling through a group of people who were sitting on a closed interstate. Fortunately, it doesn't seem any protesters were injured. Many of them swarmed the truck driver who was arrested and an investigation is now underway. NBC's Morgan Chesky joins us now from Minnesota with the latest on the protest there. Morgan, good morning. And good morning from a surprisingly quiet Minneapolis. We are here in a street where dozens of protesters were facing off against law enforcement earlier, uh, but little by little they began to dissipate. And right now the only thing we're seeing is this barrier of law enforcement about 50 yards uh, away from me right now. And the clear mark of the National Guard presence are those Humvees. A thousand National Guardsmen arriving in Minneapolis yesterday, uh, really increasing the size of the law enforcement footprint. And that's been one of the biggest differences we've seen with the enforcement of that curfew that lasts from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. And with that in place, uh, there has been a significant reduction in the damage that we've seen in just block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. A countless number of businesses damages, others gutted and burned. It will be a long road of recovery for this city. However, there are still thousands that feel that justice has yet to be served because Derek Chauvin, uh, the police officer who was seen kneeling on the neck of George Floyd, he was arrested. He was charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. However, three other officers connected to the death of George Floyd are not in police custody as of right now. There has been so much tension in this city uh, over the past several days. We know that the FBI tipped off the Minnesota National Guard that there was a credible lethal threat. And because of that alone, National Guardsmen were carrying their rifles, ammunition at the ready, just in case something should happen. However, as we stand here today, a relatively quiet night and morning in Minneapolis. We do know 150 protesters were arrested not too far away from where I'm standing. And so this is a hopeful sign of what's to come for this city that has seen so much damage here over the nearly the past week. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan, thank you. 
The NYPD says around 700 New York protesters have been arrested over the course of four days of protests in response to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Officials say Sunday's demonstrations were mostly peaceful until the final hours of the night. That's when confrontations between protesters and police erupted. Multiple arrests were made and several officers were hurt. NBC's Ron Allen has more on the unrest in the Big Apple. Across New York with thousands of protesters demanding justice, clashing with police on the streets. Multiple incidents caught on video igniting outrage. A police vehicle accelerating through a crowd. A woman shoved to the ground, unclear why. I wasn't aggressive towards a police officer. And even if I was, he should have had the self-restraint to not hurt the people he's supposed to be protecting. Here, a police officer is seen pulling down a protester's mask and spraying mace. There's tremendous stress uh, on everyone. I've seen those videos, and those videos are truly disturbing. Uh, and some of the videos, frankly, are inexplicable. Now, with the state's governor ordering the attorney general to investigate, New York's mayor and police chief are pushing back, insisting overall police have shown restraint while under attack from violent elements within the crowds. Those police vehicles only move forward because they were attacked. There are protests and there are mobs. And I saw a kin closer to a mob. A protest does not involve surrounding and ambushing a marked police car and putting my officers and my detectives' lives at risk. So far, at least 30 officers injured, some 350 arrests Saturday night, including three suspects accused of targeting police with firebombs. Decades of simmering anger exploding in a city with a long history of deadly confrontations. Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, that echo what happened to George Floyd at the hands of police. New York's mayor claims reforms like ending stop and frisk, the widespread roundup of countless young black men, and comprehensive de-escalation training for every officer has improved policing, while admitting the confrontation show NYPD still has work to do. I saw a tremendous amount of restraint. But I also saw things that need to be done better. Clearly, I saw some moments yesterday that were disturbing in terms of the way police handled things. More protests are planned, including this one just getting underway here in Times Square. And while many major cities have imposed curfews to try and bring down the size of the crowds, New York's mayor says that's not necessary here. All right, Ron Allen reporting for us in the Big Apple. Ron, thank you. As fiery protests raged this weekend in Washington, D.C., Secret and Service rushed House President itself. Trump to a White to House you. bunker Friday night. A senior administration official tells NBC News that the president spent nearly an hour inside the complex designed for emergencies like terror attacks. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us now with the latest. And Tracy, the president is blaming an extremist group for the violence in D.C. Yeah, Philip, not only blaming them, but also tweeting that he wants to declare Antifa a terrorist group. And there are some experts who question whether the government can do that with a domestic group that has First Amendment rights. All of this as demonstrations, protests continue in Washington, including right across the street the White from the White House and Lafayette you, Park. Uh, there, the were, there was one small building in that area that was set afire overnight. Uh, we also saw tear gas that was used to try to disperse the crowds after the mayor declared an 11 p.m. curfew uh, with those demonstrations continuing. This was the third straight night of demonstrations and violence in the nation's capital. And NBC's own Garrett Hake got caught right in the middle of it. We're going to end up in a place we don't want to be here if we're not careful, Katie. So, ah, damn it. Ah. Garrett, uh, just move out of the there side. as quickly as you can. I hit the side with either, I don't think it was rubber balls. I've had that before, rubber bullets or something. I don't want to be like overly dramatic about it. I know what it was. You're cutting out as your friend and as Brian said a moment ago, as somebody yeah. who knows your parents as well, I want you to get to a safe place. Get out of there. So Garrett is okay. He uh, messaged later that uh, he was okay and he thanked his crew. Uh, but it was a pretty rough scene there, as you could see for a while. In fact, D.C. ended up calling in the National Guard. Also, U.S. Marshals and Drug Enforcement agents were called in to try to clear the streets. Philip? Very, very disturbing scenes there. We are glad Garrett is okay. Tracy, thank you.
A response from the apparent Democratic nominee standing in stark contrast to the heated rhetoric from the president. Joe Biden posting a picture of himself kneeling with a protester in Wilmington, Delaware, writing, quote, We are a nation in pain right now, but we must not allow this pain to destroy us. As president, I will help lead this conversation, and more importantly, I will listen. The former vice president is expected to meet with community leaders later today. Turning now to California, where Los Angeles is under a countywide curfew right now. National Guard troops arrive to help restore order after a weekend of violent protests and looting. Meanwhile, shops were burglarized in Santa Monica on Sunday afternoon, and that's where we find NBC's Gotti Schwartz. Gotti? Here in Santa Monica, it's been a really long night of police chasing down what appear to be looters. You've got uh, some of them that are being arrested over here. And then down here, uh, this is a police uh, paddy wagon, basically, that is going to be loading up people into the back, uh, taking them to jail uh, a little bit later. And it's something that we've seen over and over again. In fact, just a little while ago, they were filling city buses with so many people uh, that had been arrested. And the reason why so many uh, police officers are out here is I want to show you uh, what's been going on. It's uh, very dark out here in Santa Monica. This entire area is now under mandatory curfew, but you've got storefronts that have been vandalized and looted throughout the day. There was about two or three hours earlier where it was absolute pandemonium out here. Police uh, were not on scene. They were dealing with uh, some, some agitators that were engaging with them, and they were uh, surrounding a protest, a very peaceful protest, over by the Santa Monica Pier. And this was happening. They were, uh, there were some other people, some complete separate group of people that were smashing into storefronts, stealing everything they could. And this block by block, what we saw over the course of about an hour to two hours. Back to you. All right, Gotti, thank you for that report. All right, let's pivot a little bit and get a check of your Monday weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to June. And we are talking about freeze alerts across northern New England this morning. So off to a pretty cool start across the northeast. Things will try to warm up uh, this afternoon, but we're still below average. Back in the 70s from Detroit all the way into the Hartford area, upper 60s this afternoon. But the heat will continue to build from the southwest where we're dealing with some heat alerts. And this will expand all the way into Dallas to New Orleans today. Hey, you're back in the 90s. That's a look at the big weather story today. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So Detroit this afternoon, you're going to see a little bit of sunshine peeking through those clouds and kind of stormy conditions still affecting Tampa. 92 today, even San Antonio watching those storms this afternoon. Very quiet start to go uh, week, but we're watching the tropics as well, guys. At All this right. point, no news is good news, right? Yes. I would think, right? All right. Janessa, thank you so much. We need a breather <laughs> a little bit. We sure do. All right. Coming up next, how the music industry is amplifying its support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Right, before we go, though, in the wake of the nationwide protest, there are several and retailers have announced store closures. Target is one of them. They're based in Minneapolis. They say that more than 200 stores are either temporarily closing or reducing hours. CVS has also announced closures across 20 states. And, uh, of course, Walmart also. Some stores there that were damaged over the weekend will be closed. So. Rather than rioting, people in Atlanta gathered to shower a powerful moment of silence. Massive crowds came together in solidarity to take a moment to peacefully honor the lives of African Americans everywhere and the Black Lives Matter initiative. And in Oakland, California, police officers join protesters in taking a knee, calling for justice for George Floyd and showing their support. Meanwhile, companies big and small also showing solidarity, voicing their support for the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole. And now the music industry is taking a stand. Tomorrow, the industry will observe Blackout Tuesday, touted as a day for unity with black employees, artists and fans all coming together. Record labels like Warner Music Group, Sony Music, Columbia Records, Def Jam Recording and more all set to take part. Several of the labels and industry leaders releasing statements on social media announcing their participation and other measures they'll be taking to fight racial injustice.
Pope Francis spoke to hundreds at the Vatican for the first time in months. The pontiff was met with cheers as he delivered his Sunday address. He said he hoped the world would come out of the coronavirus pandemic more united and that people are more important than the economy. The anger and outrage over the death of George Floyd has sent shockwaves around the world. Protesters in London and Berlin flooded the streets as calls for racial justice reached beyond U.S. soil. NBC's Kelly Kobayea joining us now from Seoul, South Korea with the very latest. Kelly, good morning. Philip, good morning to you. Yeah, those images are appearing on front pages around the world. Leaders are talking about it, tweeting about it, and people are organizing demonstrations to show their support for these protesters in the United States. In London, for example, thousands turned out on Sunday at Trafalgar Square in London, uh, chanting, no justice, no peace. They were carrying placards, marched to the U.S. Embassy, in fact, where officers were surrounding the building in order to protect it. Now, the demonstration was largely peaceful, but about 23 people were arrested there, some for breaching the lockdown rules still in place in the UK. Uh, but most of those arrests have not been specified. Uh, the causes for those arrests have not been specified by Scotland Yard. A different scene in Brazil, where there were also protests in support of, uh, of these demonstrators in the US. In, in the case of Brazil, uh, people were not only uh, showing their solidarity with people in the US, but also demonstrating against the treatment of blacks in working class Rio, uh, using the same slogans, really, Black Lives Matter. At one point, police firing tear gas into the crowd, and some shouted, I can't breathe, those tragic last words of George Floyd. Peaceful demonstrations in Germany as well over the weekend in a couple of cities. Again, a show of support for the protesters in the United States. Uh, U.S.'s adversaries are also weighing in on this, though. China, Iran, Russia all talking about this and using it basically as a talking point uh, to show that uh, the U.S. Uh, can't really criticize how they treat their people uh, during protests in their countries. Philip? It is truly a global movement now. All right, Kelly, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Our June weather outlook is in. And look at this. This is some bright news across the Pacific Northwest to the central U.S., even the Northeast. We're going to see warmer than average temperatures. Now, summer is just 20 days away, and so the heat and humidity will continue to build. The outlook for June is going to be slightly wetter for the Midwest. I'm headed to Seattle, where we're going to see drier than average uh, precipitation-wise. Okay. As we grapple with the unrest across our country, there is new concern about the spread of coronavirus among those mass gatherings, especially in communities already hard hit by the pandemic. Here's Blaine Alexander. America is locked in battle, waging war against novel coronavirus while fighting a disease that has plagued the country for centuries. Black people are just tired of having to protest for the same thing year after year after year. It's just like consistent and nothing's changed. With more than 1.7 million confirmed COVID-19 cases in the U.S., the numbers continue to rise. But so do the crowds, protesters gathering from city to city, doing exactly what health officials have spent months urging them not to do. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. We have two crises that are sandwiched on top of one another. All of it leaving little room for social distancing. Now health officials are bracing for a possible spike in cases. These protests are almost an incubator for coronavirus for a few reasons. Number one, people are in contact with a lot of other people in very close quarters. And number two, they're in contact for a good deal of time, which means that virus can spread back and forth. On top of that, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming and spitting. The growing unrest is complicating efforts to control the virus. In L.A., testing centers were closed over the weekend as protests raged. The volunteers who staff these centers still do not feel safe coming back to them. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! It's a harsh reality. Thousands pleading, value black lives. The very group COVID-19 is hitting the hardest. If you were out protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week because there's still a pandemic in America that's killing black and brown people at higher numbers. How much of a risk is it for people who are out there, even those who are wearing masks? 
This is a huge risk, whether you wear a mask or not. Even though it does give you a little bit of protection, it doesn't give you full protection. But many say they're left with little choice. I can go home, clean myself up, go get tested, make sure I take proper precautions and do that. But police brutality, I don't know. I don't know what I can't do to not be harassed. As we look among the crowd, many of the people that I've talked to say they share that feeling. Yes, they say they are concerned about that pandemic. In fact, some people have put on masks trying to protect themselves. But they say that it's equally important that they're here raising their voices in this moment. All right, Blaine Alexander reporting for us. Blaine, thanks. And thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is tough these days. Please, though, stay safe out there. And don't forget to tune in to the Today Show later on this morning. They'll have continuing coverage on those nationwide protests. We'll see you tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Good morning. Breaking overnight fire and fury. A sixth night of mayhem and mass protests over the death of George Floyd one week ago. Hands up! In Louisville, one man killed in a shooting between police and protesters near the White House, anger at a boil. And in Minneapolis, this shocking scene, a tractor trailer plowing through a crowd of peaceful demonstrators. The driver arrested, the National Guard now activated in 21 states. This morning, we're live across the country listening to demonstrators. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. And at a dark hour for the nation, some signs of hope. I took the helmet off to lay the batons down. Yeah. I want to make this a parade, yeah. not a protest. This morning, the efforts across the country to find peace and the worries about what mass protests mean in the fight against the pandemic. Today, Monday, June 1st, 2020. From NBC News, this is a special edition of Today. America in Crisis, with Savannah Guthrie, live from New York City, and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. It's nice to have you with us on a Monday morning. We're glad you're with us. Hoda, back in the studio. And I'm here in New York City, just a few miles south of where you are in Union Square, Hoda. Normally, at this time of the morning, this would be a busy, crowded place. It's quiet now because of the pandemic and a lot more quiet than it was even as recently as a few hours ago. This has really been the center of protests here in New York City, here and in Brooklyn, ever since the death of George Floyd at the hands of police officers in Minneapolis. You're seeing just some of the images of the mayhem that went on last night and over the weekend here and all around New York City. And this scene is being repeated, of course, across the country. Protests just like those have erupted in at least 140 cities from coast to coast. Some of those protests did turn violent. And that has prompted officials in at least 21 states to activate the National Guard, Hoda. Overnight, also Derek Chauvin, the fired Minneapolis police officer charged with murder in the death of George Floyd, was moved to a new detention facility. He was scheduled to make his first court appearance today, but that now has been pushed to next Monday, Savannah. And meanwhile, Hoda, the president is set to hold a conference call on safety today with the nation's governors and security officials. We have complete coverage for you this morning. Craig is with us. He's in Washington, D.C. this morning, and he will get our coverage started. Craig, good morning to you. Savannah Hoda, good morning uh, to both of you. We are in Lafayette Park. We are, as you can see behind me, just steps away from the White House. This is the same spot where I stood last night uh, as violence erupted, as chaos erupted. Flashbangs used throughout the night, rubber bullets used throughout the night. Also last night, shortly before 11 o'clock, the lights went dark uh, here at the White House. Those lights used to uh, usually illuminate the outside of the people's house. They went off. I'm going to step over and show you also what's still happening. Fires around Washington, D.C. You can see the top of this small building, bathrooms, small offices here. Uh, that fire just started back up literally three minutes ago, as you see officials working to put that blade 
In fact, here comes a fire truck. Behind this fire truck, this is St. John's Church. It's known as the Church of Presidents because every president, uh, with the exception, I believe, of James Monroe, uh, has worshipped at some point at this church, riddled with graffiti right now. A fire was started in the basement on Sunday night. As the sun came up, uh, city workers came out to clean off the graffiti uh, and try and clean up that church. And meanwhile, across the street from that church, this is a building that actually has significance uh, to me and my family. This is the Hay Adams Hotel. This is actually where I had my, my wedding reception. Riddled with the graffiti, hotels boarded up, and this is the case for businesses in and around New York, in and around Washington, D.C., looting in Georgetown, not far from here throughout the night. Those protests that started last week, those protests that were largely peaceful in the wake of George Floyd's death, have turned into something else entirely. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We're in the midst of an economic crisis. And what you're seeing here is a manifestation of all of that. Overnight, unrest across America. The death of George Floyd in police custody, sparking new protests nationwide. Here in the nation's capital, violence taking place just steps from the White House. You can see that fire uh, that's been set uh, just in front of the White House outside Lafayette Park. In an extraordinary step, U.S. Marshals and DEA agents were deployed to help keep the peace. It comes as NBC News has confirmed the Secret Service was so concerned about President Trump's safety during protests on Friday, they ushered him to a bunker underneath the White House for a very short period of time. More than 100 protests and rallies taking place in cities from coast to coast. In more than a dozen states, the National Guard was called in to help restore order. In Louisville overnight, a man was shot and killed after shots were fired toward the police officers and National Guard members during protests. The chief of police saying officers and soldiers returned fire. The identity of the man who was shot has not been released. In Tampa, smoke and ash filling the sky as businesses burn. Authorities shooting off tear gas. Cars like this police cruiser in Boston incinerated. While looters storm shops, including the small in Arizona. In New York City, this video of two NYPD vehicles ramming into a crowd of protesters sparking outrage. The mayor defending the officers involved. I also want to emphasize that situation was created by a group of protesters blocking and surrounding a police vehicle. On Saturday night, Mayor Bill de Blasio's own daughter arrested during citywide protests, according to a senior NYPD official. In an effort to clear the streets, dozens of cities, including Minneapolis, put curfews in place over the weekend. We cannot afford to lose anyone else. We don't want any more innocent bystanders getting hurt. Please stay home. Chicago's mayor echoing what so many are feeling. We have to turn our pain into purpose in order to get through this moment together and do the work needed to unite our city. The protests were not all violent, though. In Denver, thousands laid on the ground for nine minutes, chanting, I can't breathe. This is what America's built While in for. Iowa, yes. hundreds marched to make their point. We feel it's time for us to stand up and show the nation, show, show the world, even at that with social media, that we can come together in a peaceful manner and state how we feel. You tell us what you need to do. The sheriff in Michigan marching arm in arm with his community. But it was on the streets of Washington, D.C., among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. But it's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. A poignant moment as a nation tries so hard to move forward. Meanwhile, back here in our nation's capital, you can see the firefighters have pulled up again to try and put out the, the latest fire that's broken out here uh, in Washington, D.C. In just a few moments, we'll have an, exclu an exclusive conversation uh, with the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser. We'll ask how the city's preparing for what they expect is going to be another night of protest. Savannah? All right, Craig, thank you. And we are joined now by New York City's Police Commissioner Dermot Shea. Commissioner Shea, good morning. How would you describe the evening last night? We saw a massive police presence, huge crowds, violence, fires. 
Uh, from your perspective, how would you characterize the night? Yeah, Savannah, it was an incredibly challenging and busy weekend. Uh, tens of thousands of protesters all over New York City. Yesterday was a busy day. Um, first 90% of yesterday went very well. Probably about five, 6,000 protesters throughout New York City. Um, less violence, I would categorize it, as, as the days before. The majority of the protesters were peaceful. Um, making that point, when it got dark, it got ugly, and it got ugly quick. Um, we had some violence. Uh, we had another incident, unfortunately, of an individual with a Molotov cocktail in Brooklyn. We had an individual, uh, two officers in a marked car in Queens, um, that a bullet hit their car. That's under investigation. Um, there were no protests in that area. Uh, it, it could be unrelated, but that's clearly uh, alarming to us and under investigation. And then the looting. The looting turned very quickly uh, in portions of the city in Brooklyn. Uh, and primarily in Manhattan, uh, the area of Union Square, 14th Street, Soho. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of arrests in a very short time in that area. And, then, and some, unfortunately, are still going up. So it was a challenging yeah, evening for the police officers. Yeah. Union Square is where we are right now. Yeah. The New York Times reported flames going two stories high. I wanted to ask you about a couple of incidents that are making the rounds on social media, one in which a patrol yeah. car, NYPD car in Brooklyn, appears to roll into a crowd of onlookers yes. or demonstrators, I should say. Um, and, and then another case where an, an NYPD officer appears to shove a woman down to the ground. Are you looking into those incidents? Have you come to any conclusions about whether that those actions were justified in in savannah and i appreciate the question in literally tens of thousands of encounters we have about six that our internal affairs officers are looking at uh, in the process of either identifying the officers i think by now probably when i get my update shortly probably most of the officers will have been identified and there'll be an investigation and in, in the car one anyone that looks at that has to be troubled by what they saw um but there's a couple other incidents in cars that we released to the media and weren't shown. And it shows a similar situation where the cop cars are getting attacked and have to basically get out of there as quickly as possible. So it's, it's a very difficult situation without a good ending either way. Um, that, that is on the heels of uh, Molotov cocktails being thrown at police officers. If you look at that entire video, you see people, um, I would describe it as an ambush physically trying to hold yeah. that police officer's car in check as people are surrounding it. So it, it, it's it's clearly something that no one should want to see, um, but we'll, we'll move forward. It is a difficult situation, no question about it. Do you believe there should be a curfew? New York City doesn't have one. Do you need the National Guard to be here? No, uh, we don't need the National Guard. Uh, we, we got the question on the curfew. I'll be honest with you, Savannah. Uh, we, could, we could impose a curfew today. Uh, the problem is people need to listen to a curfew, and that's not going to happen, first and foremost. If people think it will, they don't understand what's going on. Uh, and the second point is anyone that is on the street during this curfew, we had this discussion last night, could probably already be arrested for five different offenses. So what we are doing is trying to manage an extremely volatile situation. There is a lot of outside influences. How we're going to get through with this is level-headedness, police action for sure, but we also need to come together, and not just as a city, but as a country. Yeah. And that's elected officials, that's community leaders, less inflammatory talk. Criticism is good, but inflammatory talk is not helpful. Commissioner Shea, it, a longer conversation is warranted about all of this and the, and the deeper issues presented here. Unfortunately, we got to leave it there this morning so we can get down to Washington and Craig, who's with the mayor there. But thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Craig, thank I'll send you. it down Please to you. Stay. All right, Savannah, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you as well. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, is, is here with me now. And, and Mayor, as, as we uh, look on, on Lafayette Park, statues riddled with graffiti, trash everywhere. Um, flashbangs went out, went off throughout the night. Oh, what do you make of your city this morning? Well, uh, we're, we're certainly um, very uh, sad and, and angry, quite frankly, about the destruction that was that happened here. Well, we're in Lafayette Park, right in the center of our city, in front of the White House. But we had damage 
uh, in blocks throughout the city. So we want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. Mayor, one of the things that struck me about the protests here last night, as I talked to protesters and, 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 and walked among them for, for a couple of hours, they seem to be really organized. And I've been to a number of pro protests over the years like this. This one seemed to be unusually organized. Well, we know that we have people that came here with tools uh, and supplies, and they re-upped their supplies. They went to different um, parts of the city. Uh, so we think there was a mix of people here, but certainly people here who um, who do this type of protest and demonstration. Professional protesters or demonstrators? Uh, well, we, we've seen some of these tactics before, um, so uh, we, we know that they were among the groups here. Tactics like? Tactics like the types of tools that they use, restocking, setting fires here and there to try to draw in the police to various locations. Uh, the curfew, uh, the National Guard being called in. You were reluctant to do both of those things, uh, but you did. What, what changed your calculation? Um, I think that, uh, you know, our police in all of our intelligence suggested that we were seeing the same type, the same actors, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had every tool at our disposal uh, to keep the city safe. Uh, we saw most of the people peaceably protest. We saw most of the people leave um, at the time of curfew, uh, and that gave the, the authorities the ability to focus on the troublemakers. Are you expecting another night of, of demonstrations? Uh, we're certainly prepared, as we've seen across the country, uh, multiple days of, of demonstrations. Uh, we're working with our intelligence and all of our uh, law enforcement partners uh, to figure out who's coming where. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. Thanks, uh, Mayor, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good luck to you. Thank okay. you. All right, Craig, thank you. Good conversation with the mayor there. We're going to continue our coverage with protests around the country. But first, we're going to pause and we're going to take a check of the weather. And for that, we turn to Mr. Roker. Hey, Al, morning. Hey, hey, good morning, Hoda. And as we look, we've got some severe weather to talk about today. Actually, really more for tomorrow. All across the northern tier of states, from the Dakotas all the way to Wisconsin, we've got 10 million people at risk, damaging winds, tornadoes possible. And look what happens Wednesday. 34 million people from the Dakotas all the way to New Jersey and down just to the north of Washington, D.C., for severe weather possible. Uh, we're going to be watching these storms. They'll be hit or miss, widely scattered today, more of an impact in the great Great Lakes, but then tomorrow, those storms fire up again in the plains. Severe weather for southern Minnesota. Parts of uh, Minneapolis will be affected. Rainfall amounts anywhere from one to three inches, and some of these hourly rainfall rates could be up to an inch per hour. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 7.30 now on this Monday morning. It is June the 1st, 2020. The nation just waking up after another night of protests from coast to coast. That's one week after the death of George Floyd. You're looking at some of the aftermath. This is on the West Coast in Los Angeles where violence and looting led the governor to declare a state of emergency on that coast. On this coast, we have Savannah and Craig. Savannah, New York City. Craig in Washington, D.C. Morning, Savannah and Craig. Morning, guys. It's morning. just so, uh, it's hard to even wrap your, your head around what's going on in our country right now. There's protests like this in 140 cities. 20 states have had to activate the National Guard. I'm here in downtown New York City. This is Union Square. Should be a hub of commuters right now, but we're in the midst of a pandemic. And now we're in the midst of this protest and a real anguish that's going on in this country right now. About a mile south of here is the shopping district of Soho, which a lot of people who visited New York City will certainly remember, was uh, had a lot of vandalism. Some people described it as just being ransacked last night. So, th you know, this is just a moment in our country where we're not only dealing with a pandemic, a, you know, once in a generation pandemic, we're also dealing with the fallout from the incident in Minneapolis that has just broken open some of the tensions here in this country. And Craig in Washington, same story all over again. 
Our, our nation's capital, uh, large swath of it on fire this morning, literally and figuratively, just steps from where I'm standing here in Lafayette Square, a small building, uh, still smoldering, firefighters putting that out, uh, trying to clean up the graffiti all over town as well, looters uh, were in Georgetown, the mayor telling me a short time ago, her chief concern is that tonight, we're going to see it all over again. The question now becomes, how does this play out? What's what's the end game? Not just here in, in Washington, D.C., but what's the end game in dozens of other cities all over this country? Where do we go from here? We're going to uh, dig into that a little bit this hour uh, as well. Hold yeah, on. that is the key question, Craig. We're going to get to that. But we are going to begin this half hour on the West Coast, a volatile situation in Los Angeles. NBC national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is there for us. Hey, Miguel, good morning. Hoda, good morning. This is the reason why so many curfews are in place all across the country. Here in Los Angeles, businesses were damaged and then they were looted. Now the National Guard is out in force from California to Colorado all the way out to the East Coast, mobilizing as protests get more destructive. Overnight, more rage and destructions in cities across the West. On Sunday, angry mobs ignoring mandatory curfews violently clashing with police, overturning cars, torching buildings, and looting stores. I can't breathe. In the shadow of Santa Monica's iconic pier and Third Street promenade, the mayhem unfolded for hours as some peacefully protested. Heads up, heads up, heads up. Others provoked a confrontation. Police here are now pushing forward. They're moving all of these protesters back because the situation here is unraveling. From dawn to dusk, the scene spiraling out of control as both sides clashed and tension rose. Some areas, the looting didn't last long. Here on the promenade, local police and the sheriff's department moved in and made several arrests. That's not okay! In Portland, Oregon, officers took down protesters on the sidewalk. In Seattle, more looting and even more troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, the reason so many poured into the streets. LA's mayor supporting the right to protest, but condemning the destruction, blaming it on extremists. They are hijacking a moment and a movement and changing the conversation. California's governor dispatching the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots nearly 30 years ago. Just like then, businesses and stores paying a heavy price while crowds demanded justice. This is 10 years of a lot of hard work. Amid the chaos, also moments of connection between protesters and police. In California, officers taking a knee joining the crowd in honoring the memory of George Floyd. Another tense night, now followed by an uncertain day. Here in Los Angeles, police remain on scene as they do in so many major cities all across this country. They are bracing for another round of protests. There are many businesses here that have not yet been looted, and that is what they are still trying to protect here today as those curfews remain in place nationwide in so many cities. Craig? Miguel Almoguer for us there in California. Miguel, thank you. Let's go now to where all of this started. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Minneapolis, uh, where officials overnight were by and large able to stop uh, and, and prevent more violence. But there was this, this shocking image that we saw uh, Sunday evening there, this semi-truck driving into a group of protesters. We're going to talk to the mayor of St. Paul in just a moment. But first, NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Minneapolis for us this morning. Gabe, good morning to you. Craig, good morning. Today marks one week since the death of George Floyd. It happened right here, now the site of a growing memorial. This city was much calmer overnight, but emotions are still running high. It was a heart-stopping moment, a semi-truck driving through a crowd of peaceful protesters on an interstate highway. People are pretty shocked, um, and it was a traumatic experience. Some protesters then swarmed the truck and attacked the driver. Hey, Others protected him. him. He was later arrested. Incredibly, no protesters were injured. It's still not clear why he did it.
I think the incident just underscores um, still the volatile situation we have out there. On the sixth night of protests following the death of George Floyd, Minneapolis police surrounded large crowds, making mass arrests. Officer Derek Chauvin, who was seen kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, was arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Demonstrators want the three other fired officers involved in the incident to face charges. Now, security video of what happened moments earlier appears to show a struggle in the backseat of a police vehicle. On live television, the city's police chief spoke directly to the Floyd family for the first time about the inaction of those officers as Floyd was dying. Being silent or not intervening to me, you're complicit. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. That acknowledgement left Floyd's brother sobbing. A new report by NBC News finds that since 2015, officers from the Minneapolis Police Department have used so-called neck restraints, using an arm or leg to compress someone's neck, on suspects more than 200 times. And in at least 44 of those cases, the suspects lost consciousness, according to an NBC News analysis of police records. At a growing makeshift memorial for Floyd, signs of a community reeling in pain. I have kids growing up in this world. I got three beautiful children. They're mixed, but even though they're mixed, they look like me, they look the same, and it could have easily been them, it could have easily been me. Michael Holliday came here from Houston, where Floyd grew up. Imagine if it was your child. How would you feel? Imagine if it was your son on the ground screaming, I can't breathe, help me, please. This community already knows his name, but the world needs to hear his name. So until we have justice, there will be no peace. As protesters demand more charges, they had also wanted the state's attorney general to take over this case from the local prosecutor. That has now happened, Craig. Gabe Gutierrez Force there in Minneapolis, uh, where again all of this started roughly one week ago. Gabe, thank you so much for that. I want to bring in the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. Mayor uh, Melvin Carter joins me now. Mayor, thanks for your time this morning. First of all, how are uh, folks there in, in St. Paul doing right now? Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, folks in St. Paul, just like folks across the country, are traumatized right now. Uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, doubly traumatized as we're in this the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, 40% of low-income workers have lost their job and the economic realities of this year uh, before George Floyd was killed. Uh, but of course, we all woke up a week ago uh, tomorrow uh, to that gruesome, shocking video uh, of seeing the way his life was literally snuffed out uh, by those four officers. Uh, and, you know, I think a, a number of folks were very traumatized by that. Uh, we have the same anger, the same rage, the same sadness as we have all over the country, uh, which I want to point out is really the only human uh, and compassionate response uh, when you see someone killed uh, in such a fashion like that. Uh, we have uh, implemented, as many other cities have, a citywide curfew. And in doing so, our, our invitation to our residents uh, was to channel that pain, channel that energy uh, into doing something constructive for our community. As we've seen around the country, we have two groups operating right now. We have those who are just heartbroken by the loss of George Floyd, who need to scream at the top of their lungs like I do, that he should still be alive, that all four of those officers should be held accountable for their actions, uh, as Chief Arredondo has now said publicly, and that we have a lot of like big systemic level work to do to stop this pattern from happening over and over and over and over and over again, like we've seen not just in the last 10 years on cell phone videos, but for generations. Mayor Carter, let's talk about what's happening there in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I know that last week you said that the protesters were from out of state. You, you apologized after that when it was brought to your attention that that wasn't the case. Uh, we've heard from folks on the right who've said that these are, are four left protesters. We've heard from folks on the left say these are four white protesters, white supremacists. Do we know who's protesting and demonstrating in Minneapolis and in St. Paul? 
Uh, look, our police department, our law enforcement partners are working hard to get to the bottom of who's coordinating this and why. Uh, but this is all this is all part of the problem. This is a distraction from the conversation that we should be having. Uh, whether those folks uh, sleep in another state or sleep in another city or sleep in our city, uh, it, it, it doesn't change the fact that when we have people who are destroying the local pharmacies uh, in a pandemic that our seniors rely on for their life-saving medicine, uh, we have a food shortage shortage right now and our grocery stores uh, have been looted uh, when 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 they are willing to destroy in the midst of an economic crisis the places that our residents rely on not just for products uh, but 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 to be able to go to work and earn a living uh, then it's very clear that there are people operating in our communities who are not operating on the basis of just a, a heartfelt desire uh, to build up our neighborhoods you, if 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 you're one of those folks like I am who just cannot rest while injustices against our black and brown communities uh, are, are, are continue. You cannot exercise that energy by burning black barbershops, uh, by uh, by looting uh, those same communities in a way that just further traumatizes the communities that have already been traumatized by it in the first place. Mayor Carter, really quickly here, 30 seconds. Things seem so very bleak right now. Um, there's, there's concern that these protests are going to continue, that they're going to continue to turn violent as, as well. Where do we go from here? How, how do we make this stop? You know, I think it's clear that the energy that has consumed our country for the last week or so uh, is a raging fire. Uh, figuratively speaking, that could either tear our country apart at the seams or that could bring us together in a way that we've never been together before. Our call is for peace, is for peaceful demonstration, is for the opportunity. Our police department is doing a great job of protecting the right of those legitimate protesters to just say peacefully that this has to change. So we're calling for peace, but it should not be confused with patience. I am not asking for anyone to just sit at home on and wait on the sidelines while we slowly and and uh, you know uh, uh, incrementally slow the tide of black men being killed wrongfully by law enforcement. We're asking our residents, we're asking our communities, we're asking our young people to channel this energy not into destroying our community institutions, but into destroying the systemic racism, into destroying the inequities, and specifically into destroying all of those barriers built in legislation, uh, built in court precedents, uh, built in police union contracts and everywhere else yep. that prevents us and makes it so difficult to hold someone accountable for people like George Floyd, like Eric Garner, who are, whose lives are wrongfully taken at the hands of law enforcement. Mayor Melvin Carter, Mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. Mayor, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Peace, not patience. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back coming up on 747 with In-Depth today. This morning, the outrage being expressed on our nation's streets, all while the coronavirus still is a threat to public health, Savannah. Yeah, we're still in a pandemic and thousands gathering closely together in cities all across the country. has got health officials really worried about the possible impact of that on the outbreak. In a moment, we're going to talk to Dr. John Torres about it. But first, here's NBC's Sam Brock. As America's heartbreak finds a voice. We want change. It's been too long. How long are we going to take this? The nation's health hangs in the balance. National protests against the virus of racism unfolding at the height of a coronavirus crisis disproportionately hitting people of color. With all of these people getting together right now at a time of a pandemic, are you worried about your safety? Yes, but the answer is that um, I'm worried about my safety to both of those viruses. Public officials watching protesters spill onto streets across America 
Many wearing masks but largely ignoring any form of social distancing have sounded the alarm bell. I'm urging uh, everybody uh, to consider their exposure. We have worked very hard to blunt the curve. In Atlanta, a city pulsating with activity, the mayor has taken it a step further. If you were out protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week. But those public pleas, coming as many police forces appear to be failing to set a good example. Atlanta's police chief walked into a crowd with no face covering over the weekend, and LAPD officers without masks arrested demonstrators. Across the country, other officers standing with protesters, but ignoring mask and distancing rules. In Miami, police surround the perimeter of this Sunday protest teeming with thousands. This protester tells me she feels threatened either way, virus or no virus. Because I could be dead tomorrow if I walk on the streets and a cop doesn't like me or I did something or I look like I'm doing something wrong, he can shoot me right there. What do you think when you see all of these protesters coming out and many of them are not wearing masks? Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but when you put other people's safety and health in danger, then that's wrong. Many opinions, but the undeniable threat of a second wave that could disrupt months of progress. For today, Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. Let's bring in our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. And Dr. Torres, it's, I mean, you understand the, the desire for people to get out there and have their voices heard. At the same time, the shots of those crowds so packed together in the middle of a pandemic. Would you expect to see a surge in cases after scenes like this? And Savannah, you're right, I completely understand the rationale behind people wanting to get out there. But at the same time, I think we are going to see a spike over the next five to seven days. You're going to start to see cases up going up. And a lot of these protests are in areas where cases have already started to climb again because of reopening. So that's probably the hugest concern we're having right now, Savannah. And you were talking earlier about how distinctly uh, dangerous, for lack of a better word, these protests can be. Can you explain why? Right, these protests have a issue, unique issues, and part of it's because the longer you're around a lot of people, the more time you spend with those people, the closer you are, the more likely you are to spread coronavirus. On top of that, people here might get it and take it home, spread somewhere else. On top of that, if there's tear gas involved, the tearing, the coughing, the shouting, the screaming that goes on, those respiratory droplets can go even further and contaminate more people. You're seeing people without masks at the same time. And then if people get jailed, they get indoors, which makes it even more likely they're going to catch coronavirus virus in that environment because of the close, tight, packed, packed area they get when they get jailed. And so these are all big concerns. People are going to go home to other patients who are vulnerable. They need to be very, very careful with that, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just uh, hard to even get your, he your head around these, these you know, multiple crises that this country is going through right now, doctor. Thank you very much for your time. Hoda, I'll send it to you. All right, 751. We're going to pause again, switch gears and get a check of the weather from Mr. Roker. Hey, Al. Hey, how are you, Hoda? Well, today marks the beginning of hurricane season, June 1st, and this is the latest. This is just in from the National Hurricane Center, the update. This was Amanda, but now is in the Yucatan Peninsula, and right now 315 miles southwest of Cancun, Mexico. It now has an 80% chance of development over the next five days, two to five days, and so if this reforms, it would become crystal ball, and that would make it the third earliest that we've had three tropical cyclones, three, three tropical storm na named storms by this time. So we're watching it very, very closely. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, breaking overnight chaos coast to coast. <laughs> Violence breaks out for a sixth night in a row over the death of George Floyd. <laughs> in Louisville, one demonstrator shot and killed. And around the country, destruction as looters break in and burn down businesses. They were not here to protest. They were here to destroy Atlanta. This morning, officials urging people to stay home. We cannot afford to lose anyone else. As new images emerge showing some signs of hope and peace. Today, Monday, June 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. And good morning, everybody. Welcome back to today. It's Monday morning, and we're glad to have you with us. A lot of folks are just waking up, and unfortunately, it's a... It's a a morning of sadness in this country. I'm here in New York City's Union Square downtown, which has really been the focal point of protests over the weekend here and in Brooklyn, all around Manhattan, Craig's in Washington, D.C., where the situation was very, very similar, including right outside the White House and Hoda holding down the fort is always in the studio. Good to see you all. Good to see you guys. And Craig, I'm, I'm really excited about Good someone who you interviewed in just a little bit. I don't know if you guys saw the video, but there was a sheriff in Michigan who was kind of nose to nose with protesters and after talking with them, putting his baton down, putting down his, his protective gear, they chanted, walk with us, and he did. And so, uh, Craig, you're gonna have a pretty uh, incredible interview with this, with this sheriff coming up. Well, we, could, uh, we could all use a little hope this morning, <laughs> right? Uh, before we get to all of that, though, how about your news at eight on a Monday morning? Uh, we are just a few feet away from the White House in Lafayette Square. And the cleanup effort has started here after a night of unrest and violence. In fact, the small building was on fire uh, just 30 minutes ago. Firefighters have gotten that under control. Uh, they're also cleaning up the graffiti on one of the oldest churches in this city, St. John's Church, uh, behind this fire truck. And the escalating violence that overshadowed those peaceful demonstrations this weekend were met with curfews, arrests, and massive displays of force. Overnight, unrest across America reaching a boiling point. The death of George Floyd and the conduct of the Minneapolis police officers involved sparking another round of protests nationwide. Here in the nation's capital, violence taking place just steps from the White House. You can see that fire uh, that's been set uh, just in front of the White House outside Lafayette Park. In more than a dozen states, the National Guard was called in to help restore order in Louisville overnight. A man was shot and killed after shots were fired toward the police officers and National Guard members during protests. The chief of police saying officers and soldiers returned fire. The identity of the man who was shot has not been released. So far, thousands of arrests have been made nationwide. Businesses burned to the ground. Police filling the air with tear gas. Cars reduced to smoke and ash as looters stormed shops and stores. More than 100 protests and rallies took place from coast to coast. In Seattle, this video appearing to show an officer put his knee on the neck of someone being taken into custody before another officer steps in. In New York City, this video of two NYPD vehicles ramming into a crowd of protesters sparking outrage. The mayor defending the officers involved. I also want to emphasize that situation was created by a group of protesters blocking and surrounding a police vehicle. On Saturday, Mayor Bill de Blasio's own daughter 
arrested during citywide protests, according to a senior NYPD official. Dozens of cities installing curfews over the weekend, including Minneapolis, an effort to clear the streets and ease tensions. I will beg you, please stay home. Chicago's mayor echoing what so many are feeling. This is a time for us to unite. We have to turn our pain into purpose. That unity on display in Kansas City as an officer and protester shared a warm embrace. While thousands in Denver laid on the ground for nine minutes chanting, I can't breathe in honor of Floyd and tensions running high in the nation's capital. What do they tell you that they want? They just, they want to be fair. They want stuff to be fair. But it was also on these streets of Washington amid the chaos that I found the father trying to teach his son about peace. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. Amen to that. Uh, it should be noted that the a demonstration here in Washington, and this is this is the case around much of the country as well. Those demonstrations were largely peaceful. In fact, it was peaceful here until the sun went down. Uh, this morning, though, there is still that that tear gas in the air. Uh, rubber bullets were used last night. Those those flash bombs also used by police to disperse the crowd. Uh, mayor Bowser, the mayor of Washington D.C., telling me last hour uh, they expect to have another citywide curfew tonight. And they are also expecting more demonstrations as well. Savannah? All right, Craig, thank you. And Santa Monica, California, was placed on overnight curfew last night after a sudden explosion of violence yesterday. And I'm joined now by Police Chief Cynthia Renault to talk about the events that played out and what the future might hold. Uh, Chief, good morning to you. I'm glad you're with us. You know, you had had mostly peaceful protests, but things really devolved in a hurry. What happened? How did it escalate? Yes, we had peaceful protesters in, in large numbers, uh, and we were there to protect their rights to protest and support them in that. Um, there was a separate group that came in, and we ended up with two groups, one of peaceful protesters and one of people that were to loot and conduct crimes in the city. Um, that group was extremely large, and it was both on foot and mobile coming into the city through vehicles. So it was uh, quite a crowd to work with and control, and it took a large deployment of death. You're breaking up a little bit, so forgive me if you if you just answered the question, but there was some criticism that the peaceful protesters faced a larger police presence in Santa Monica than those who were doing the looting and the vandalism and that kind of thing. What do you say to that? So the crowds at the intersections, I don't know how visible it was on the media, but our police officers were taking bottles and were having things thrown at them. So interspersed with that crowd, there was uh, violence in there as well. Um, and we couldn't abandon the intersections and leave that open. I think the best example I can give is um, our community members, our Santa Monicans who were there peacefully protesting, saw what was occurring in the crowd. And at one point early on, they had held hands and formed a line in front of the officers. Um, and so there was definitely violence, both interspersed with them, along with other cars coming into the city with people intent on looting. So it was uh, um, uh, two groups, um, and for, the, for a substantial amount of time, the violence were also in, interspersed with the, uh, the nonviolent protesters as well. You know, Chief, it's such a, a strange situation because, of course, the officers are asking to police a protest that is about police brutality, about racism in the system. When you look at what happened to George Floyd and you see these demonstrators pouring onto your streets and streets around the country, as a police professional, what message do you receive? What are you hearing and learning from this moment? So, as so many police chiefs have done, um, we have 
talked with our communities and been very honest about how we feel about the situation and that we condone what happened and that we understand the grieving and the feelings and we share that with them. Police departments, mine included, have worked very hard to train officers to dialogue with our community, to create relationships, and we'll continue to do that. And so I think here, speaking for California and definitely for Los Angeles County, there has been a strong statement from police chiefs um, as to what happened so many miles away from us um, and that it's not condoned, it's not accepted or permitted here, and uh, we work tirelessly to make sure that that doesn't happen here. Chief Cynthia Renault of Santa Monica, I know you've got a busy day ahead of you. Thank you very much for your time and your perspective. We really appreciate it. Thank Hold you. Hold to you. All right, Savannah, thank you. Uh, we have got the news covered, and I think it's something we could all use right now. How about a little morning boost? We've seen stories from Minneapolis yes. this weekend about people reaching out to each other with acts of kindness. Well, here's what happened when one low-income housing unit put out a call for food donations. Whoever wants it. The donations, they overflowed. People responded. They brought boxes and bags of free groceries. There was so much that the organizers told people to get on social media, tell their friends, come on down. We have what you need. Acts of kindness right there, Savannah. Oh, it's so lovely. And I've got another one that really fits in these times. A man named Sean Dromgoogle. He lived in, has lived in Nashville for a really long time. But because of everything that's been going on, he said he was afraid to just even go outside to walk his dog because he is a black man. Well, he posted about it on his neighborhood social media app. Well, first, one neighbor called and said, I'll walk with you. And then another and another. And before long, about 50 members of his community were out walking with Sean and his dog. He said, I was scared to walk alone. And now look who's behind me. Look who has my back. Oh. We just need to see more of that, don't we? Yeah. By the way, it's a beautiful image we should uh, to leave right there with. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're talking, of course, about that historic rocket launch over the weekend, SpaceX's Dragon capsule. It successfully docked at the International Space Station yesterday, 19 hours after the Falcon 9 took off from Cape Canaveral. Bob and Doug, welcome to the International Space Station after your spectacular rendezvous and docking of the first Crew Dragon vehicle. Uh, that's what you call perfect. Astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin were welcomed aboard by a fellow NASA astronaut, that's Christopher Cassidy, and two Russian cosmonauts. They're expected to uh, stay is somewhere between one and four months. Hurley's message to young Americans, he says, reach for lofty goals, work hard, and look at what you can accomplish. So amidst all the stuff that's going on down here on planet Earth, it's nice to look up and see that happening. Right, guys? I love Absolutely. that so much. You know, my yes. kids watched it, guys, and they um, right after we watched the launch, we went outside in the backyard and Vale and Charlie were yelling up into the sky. <laughs> Can you see us, astronauts? And we're proud of you. You're awesome. And it's just so cute, to, oh, you know, the way something like that lifts spirits. Yeah. Yes, indeed, Savannah. It's beautiful. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Welcome back. As protests have spread in the wake of George Floyd's death, there have been signs of coming together around the country. Yeah, there have, Savannah. I mean, some shows of solidarity between police and the police. NBC's Morgan Radford is in Philadelphia with more on that part of the story. It was good to see it this weekend, Morgan. 
You too, Craig. Craig, Savannah, demonstrators were protesting late into the night here in Philadelphia. You can see the National Guard is here this morning. But even though here and all across the country there were these tense moments between police and protesters, there were also moments of profound unity. Black Lives Matter! With protesters taking to the streets nationwide, some of them are finding support from a surprising place. Y'all chief! Police officers frustrated that George Floyd's death reflects badly on them. Don't think for a second that he represents who these cops are from all over the county and around this nation. We go out there to help people, not do that nonsense. In Flint, Michigan, Sheriff Chris Swanson joining residents as they march. I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. I want to make this a parade, not a protest. In New Jersey, Camden County Police Chief Joseph Wysocki asked an organizer if he could walk with them too. I was welcomed with uh, open arms. Marching front and center, holding a banner of solidarity. At one point, she started the chant, Black Lives Matter. Then she looked at me and said, sorry. And I said, I laughed. I said, it's okay. I said, that's why we're here. On the force for nearly 30 years, Wysocki was disturbed by what happened to Floyd. That video shocked every good cop in, in the United States. Like, that's not just shocking the cops of my police department. It's that shocking cops everywhere. From Georgia's state officers to Houston's police chief. We will march as a department with everybody in this community. To Kansas City, where officers held signs and hugged protesters. Louisville, an embrace that cut through the chaos. Miami officers letting organizers know they have their backs. And nearby in Coral Gables, officers kneeling with protesters in prayer. Keep Scott! Keep Scott! While in Queens, New York, kneeling to remember other lives lost. In Shreveport, Louisiana, emotions overflowing. And back in Flint, the sheriff echoing his heartfelt message to those who are hurting. We want to be with y'all for real. Here in Philadelphia, the city has its first African-American female police commissioner. And after the death of George Floyd, she too spoke out, saying that she understands the pain of the African-American community from a personal perspective. But like other police chiefs and commissioners across the country, she also rededicated herself to serving and protecting this city with fairness and dignity. Craig? Morgan Radford, thank you. Uh, sheriff Christopher Swanson, uh, the sheriff of Genesee County that you just saw there, marching alongside the demonstrators, marching alongside the protester. He joins me now. Uh, sheriff, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, sir. Thanks for having me. Sheriff, on, on Saturday, um, did, did you have it in your mind when you got there as you and your men were getting ready that you would you would lay down your helmet, lay down your baton and march alongside the protesters? Or was that a spontaneous decision? It was a spontaneous decision. And I'll tell you, with all the police agencies there, Flint Township being the, the lead for that area, uh, it, it made the most sense that when I saw the crowd and felt the, the frustration and the fact that we were only accelerating the issue it was time to take the helmet off go to the shot caller the lead organizer give him a big old fat hug and say what do we need to do and that was the tension breaker and then the next question was the one that made history what was the response from those demonstrators from those protesters what did they say to you well, they, they wanted to know what, what I thought. And uh, when I looked at uh, the lead organizer and said, listen, that guy is not who cops are. These police officers love you and we don't accept that. We're horrified. They said the crowd needs to hear it. I said, get the crowd. So when the crowd kind of turned um, and they've already had a fist pump with another officer, they already had a hug. They were open to just listening to, to what we had to say. And when I acknowledged that we don't condone that, that's not who cops are. The second question is, what else do you need? And that's when the crowd shouted, walk with us. And in a second, that turn of events happened when I said, let's walk. And uh, you saw an entire crowd's mindset and heart change because they wanted to be heard. The protesters, had they not listened to the message, we wouldn't be talking, but they were as much a part of that night 
making history in Flint than anybody else. And now we are day two, no arrests, no fires, no injuries. Yeah, Sheriff, one of the things that struck me when I saw that video is that, that that's one of those situations that could have gone yes. could have a whole nother way. Uh, yeah. Had you decided to, <laughs> to lay down your arms and, and the protesters took advantage of the situation, they did not do that. As, right. as, you, as you look at the protests around this country, these protests, yeah. uh, many of which have, have turned violent, You've yeah. got a number of, of, of public officials, law enforcement officers, saying that the solution right now is to crack down on these demonstrators. What do you what do you say to that? It's a great question. To your first point, it was probably the worst tactical decision I could make by taking off all what protects me and going into the crowd. But the benefit far outweighed the risk. And uh, I'm not trying to be a macho or a hero. I, I just tell you that that was the best decision to show that I am not going to create a, a divide. I'm going to show vulnerability and walk in the crowd and make the, make the first move. To your second point, my heart breaks for the city. It breaks for DC and New York and LA and Minneapolis and, and great cities have been built by great people. And so I, I, don't, I can't answer what the next best decision is except for lay down your arms that, that Police and protesters have to work together to say, hey, let's take a night of calm and find out what's happening. Why are we doing this? And, and create the conversation that makes the change. Everybody talks about change. Change comes with action. And I got to believe that there's folks in those communities that want peace and want action. And, uh, man, I feel terrible for police officers injured, people that have been killed, the city's been destroyed. But it's going to take time. And, and, and I, I see what's happening like the world does. And it breaks our heart, but there has to be a first move. There has to be a first step, and that has to come from both sides. Sheriff Christopher Swanson, uh, Sheriff, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for your example on Saturday as well, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. We love you guys, and we love this nation. Appreciate your time. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Oh, welcome back. The reaction to the death of George Floyd has taken many forms in the week that's followed, but one powerful, beautiful, yet heartbreaking performance has grabbed a lot of attention. I'm a young black man. Doing all that I can to stand. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hard to this prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough strong goal. I just want to live. Don't forget that name. This is 12-year-old gospel singer Kedron Bryant. That song, by the way, written by his mom, Jeanette, it's been viewed nearly three million times on his Insta page. It's been reposted by, well, just President Obama, LeBron James, so many others. Kedron and Jeanette are joining us this morning. Good morning, you guys. Good morning. Okay, first of all, we need you today. We need you every day, but we especially need you today. And Kedron, I want to talk to you in a second. But first, Miss Jeanetta. Yes. You wrote this song. It came from deep in your soul. What made you put those words on paper? In light of everything that is going on, um, especially our recent situation, when I heard Mr. Floyd call out for his mom, as a black mother, that really hit me in a deep way. And I began to pray. Um, and so I, I said, God, this world needs help like never before. Uh, so I went into meditation because I needed understanding. I needed, I needed strength because I also knew that I need to be able to give my son some wisdom that's going to help him to be able to live and to um be confident in this world. And I knew that, I, that it could only come from God. 
Um, Because I understand that we are in a spiritual, this this fight is spiritual as well. And so uh, I went into prayer and and God spoke to me and he gave these words to me. And you, you wrote those words down and you gave those words to your son and you told him to go upstairs. Yes. And what did you ask him to do? Um, you know, our kids are home, you know, for the quarantine and I always make a schedule for them to follow, um, as if they're in school. And part of that schedule is devotion. So I sent him up during his devotion time and I said, Kedron, I want you to pray over these words. I want you to meditate on them, allow God to speak to you, uh, so that you may be able to speak to the people. And also get some encouragement for yourself. So um, he went into his own devotion time. Um, and he, yeah, he came back um, after his devotion and he's like, Mom, I'm ready. Oh, you are ready. You are ready, Kadrin. You are ready in that moment. When you sing this song, I, I'm wondering what are you, you feel these words. This isn't about singing a song. This is what you, what are you feeling while you're singing those words? Um, well, I felt sad that I have to sing that because um, it's unfair that we can go out and like the song says, live. I just want to live. We can't go out and enjoy life and not be afraid and fear that something is going to happen to us. So it was really sad um, to have that feeling. Do you, do you, when you ask God for things, and I know you do, what do you ask him for? Um... I ask him to give me anointing, um, to give me power to uh, minister to the people, um, even on my side and on the other side of the phone, um, to touch lives and impact them. Well, you're doing it. You've impacted President Obama. He called you powerful. LeBron James said he loved you. Nas said you were dope. Uh, Janet Jackson, <laughs> Eva Longoria, Beyonce's mom. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You've impressed so many. I don't know if you like to sing in the morning from Florida. Do you? Um, yes, ma'am. Would you sing a little for us? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I just want to leave. God protects me. I just want to leave, I just want to leave. I'm all by myself, but I'm applauding you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kedron. Thank you, Janetta. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, okay? Keep singing. Keep singing. The world needs you. And Janetta, we need you too. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. All right, given everything that's happening in this country right now, a lot of people are looking for words of wisdom and comfort. And one of the people we've turned to in recent years for inspiration is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the most Reverend Michael Curry. Reverend Curry, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Great to be back with you. Boy, I got to say, looking at these images um, of things burning and people looting and all the pain and anguish is really distressing to lots and lots of people. And I read your op-ed in the Washington Post, and you basically said, find love. Um, and you understand the pain, but choosing love is hard in this moment. How do you help people go down that path, Bishop? Well, you know, the first thing is, it's a decision, and it's probably a daily decision uh, to choose to actually live the way of love, which is not about, not a sentiment. Um, I've said for a long time, the opposite of love is is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. Mm. That the way of love is the way of seeking the good, the welfare, and the well-being of others, as well as the self. In the Hebrew scriptures, when Moses talks about love of neighbor in Leviticus, it's in the context of talking about people doing what is just and kind and decent. And when Jesus talks about it in Luke's gospel, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, somebody who helps somebody who is different than they are. So it's a decision, and it's a daily decision that I'm going to live an unselfish life that seeks the good of others as well as my own good. And when we all do that, we win. 
So if you were talking, because I feel like the sides are so far apart, everyone's blaming each other, and there's so much tension, and I keep thinking, like, how does this end? If you were going to speak to the protesters and to the police, like, what would you say to them? Well, uh, first of all, I would say to both protesters and police, every one of us is a child of God. And if we are all children of God, which I think we can all agree on, most of us can, then that means that we are brothers and sisters and siblings of each other. We are related to each other. And so we have got to figure out how can we live together as a family, as a human family of God. Dr. King said a long time ago, we will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. Our choice is chaos or community. And so every one of us, police, what can I do to actually love as a police law enforcement officer who seeks the good of people? Protester, what can I do to seek the good and the welfare of others as I make my protests for a just social order so, so that people are not killed and abused and hurt and harmed? If everybody makes a decision mm -hmm. to work together for the good of others, we all get blessed. But it starts as a decision. And just quickly, Bishop Curry, at the end, are you optimistic? I am optimistic and determined. And let me tell you, I've come up with a symbol for love. Let's see. And it's not the heart, and that's okay. Okay. Got a better symbol. What? It's this. Uh. This mask, the physicians tell us, I don't wear it okay. to protect myself. I wear it to protect you. And you wear it to protect me. And when we all do that, we all win. Bishop Curry, thank you for your language of love. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you. Thanks for being here. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care.
If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Good morning, breaking overnight, fire and fury. A sixth night of mayhem and mass protests over the death of George Floyd one week ago. In Louisville, one man killed in a shooting between police and protesters near the White House, anger at a boil. And in Minneapolis, this shocking scene, a tractor trailer plowing through a crowd of peaceful demonstrators. The driver arrested. The National Guard now activated in 21 states. This morning, we're live across the country listening to demonstrators. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. And at a dark hour for the nation, some signs of hope. I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. Yeah. I want to make this a parade, yeah. not a protest. This morning, the efforts across the country to find peace and the worries about what mass protests mean in the fight against the pandemic. Today, Monday, June 1st, 2020. From NBC News, this is a special edition of Today, America in Crisis. With Savannah Guthrie, live from New York City, and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. It's nice to have you with us on a Monday morning. We're glad you're with us. Hoda back in the studio. And I'm here in New York City, just a few miles south of where you are in Union Square, Hoda. Normally, at this time of the morning, this would be a busy, crowded place. It's quiet now because of the pandemic and a lot more quiet than it was even as recently as a few hours ago. This has really been the center of protests here in New York City, here and in Brooklyn ever since the death of George Floyd at the hands of police officers in Minneapolis. You're seeing some of the images of the mayhem that went on last night and over the weekend here and all around New York City. And this scene is being repeated, of course, across the country. Protests just like those have erupted in at least 140 cities from coast to coast. Some of those protests did turn violent, and that has prompted officials in at least 21 states to activate the National Guard HODA. Overnight, also Derek Chauvin, the fired Minneapolis police officer charged with murder in the death of George Floyd, was moved to a new detention facility. He was scheduled to make his first court appearance today, but that now has been pushed to next Monday, Savannah. And meanwhile, Hoda, the president is set to hold a conference call on safety today with the nation's governors and security officials. We have complete coverage for you this morning. Craig is with us. He's in Washington, D.C. this morning, and he will get our coverage started. Craig, good morning to you. Savannah Hoda, good morning uh, to both of you. We are in Lafayette Park. We are, as you can see behind me, just steps away from the White House. This is the same spot where I stood last night uh, as violence erupted, as chaos erupted. Flashbangs used throughout the night, rubber bullets used throughout the night. Also last night, shortly before 11 o'clock, the lights went dark uh, here at the White House. Those lights used to uh, usually illuminate the outside of the people's house. They went off. I'm going to step over and show you also what's still happening. Fires around Washington, D.C. You can see the top of this small building, it's bathrooms, small offices here. Uh, that fire just started back up literally three minutes ago as you see officials working to put that blade in fact here comes a fire truck behind this fire truck this is saint john's church it's known as the church of presidents because every president uh, with the exception i believe of james monroe uh, has worshiped at some point at this church riddled with graffiti right now a fire was started in the basement on sunday night as the sun came up a city workers came out to clean off the graffiti 
uh, and try and clean up that church. And meanwhile, across the street from that church, this is a building that actually has significance uh, to me and my family. This is the Hay Adams Hotel. This is actually where I had my, my wedding reception. Riddled with the graffiti, hotels boarded up, and this is the case for businesses in and around New York, in and around Washington, D.C., looting in Georgetown, not far from here throughout the night. Those protests that started last week, those protests that were largely peaceful in the wake of George Floyd's death, have turned into something else entirely. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We're in the midst of an economic crisis. And what you're seeing here is a manifestation of all of that. Overnight, unrest across America. The death of George Floyd in police custody, sparking new protests nationwide. Here in the nation's capital, violence taking place just steps from the White House. You can see that fire uh, that's been set uh, just in front of the White House outside Lafayette Park. In an extraordinary step, U.S. Marshals and DEA agents were deployed to help keep the peace. It comes as NBC News has confirmed the Secret Service was so concerned about President Trump's safety during protests on Friday, they ushered him to a bunker underneath the White House for a very short period of time. More than 100 protests and rallies taking place in cities from coast to coast. In more than a dozen states, the National Guard was called in to help restore order. In Louisville overnight, a man was shot and killed after shots were fired toward the police officers and National Guard members during protests. The chief of police saying officers and soldiers returned fire. The identity of the man who was shot has not been released. In Tampa, smoke and ash filling the sky as businesses burn. Authorities shooting off tear gas. Cars like this police cruiser in Boston incinerated. While looters storm shops, including the small in Arizona. In New York City, this video of two NYPD vehicles ramming into a crowd of protesters, sparking outrage. The mayor defending the officers involved. I also want to emphasize that situation was created by a group of protesters blocking and surrounding a police vehicle. On Saturday night, Mayor Bill de Blasio's own daughter arrested during citywide protests, according to a senior NYPD official. In an effort to clear the streets, dozens of cities, including Minneapolis, put curfews in place over the weekend. We cannot afford to lose anyone else. We don't want any more innocent bystanders getting hurt. Please stay home. Chicago's mayor echoing what so many are feeling. We have to turn our pain into purpose in order to get through this moment together and do the work needed to unite our city. The protests were not all violent, though. In Denver, thousands laid on the ground for nine minutes, chanting, I can't breathe. This is what America's built While for. in Iowa, yes. hundreds marched to make their point. We feel it's time for us to stand up and show the nation, show, show the world, even at that with social media, that we can come together in a peaceful manner and state how we feel. You tell us what you need to do. The sheriff in Michigan marching arm in arm with his community. But it was on the streets of Washington, D.C., among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. But it's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. A poignant moment as a nation tries so hard to move forward. Meanwhile, back here in our nation's capital, you can see the firefighters have pulled up again to try and put out the, the latest fire that's broken out here uh, in Washington, D.C. In just a few moments, we'll have an, exclu an exclusive conversation uh, with the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser. We'll ask how the city's preparing for what they expect is going to be another night of protest. Savannah? All right, Craig, thank you. And we are joined now by New York City's Police Commissioner Dermot Shea. Commissioner Shea, good morning. How would you describe the evening last night? We saw a massive police pre presence, huge crowds, violence, fires. Uh, from your perspective, how would you characterize the night? Yeah, Savannah, it was an incredibly challenging and busy weekend. Uh, tens of thousands of protesters all over New York City. Yesterday was a busy day. Um, First 90% of yesterday went very well. Probably about five, 6,000 protesters throughout New York City. Um, less violence, I would categorize it, as, as the days before. 
the majority of the protesters were peaceful, um, making their point. When it got dark, it got ugly, and it got ugly quick. Um, we had some violence. Uh, we had another incident, unfortunately, of an individual with a Molotov cocktail in Brooklyn. We had an individual, uh, two officers in a marked car in Queens, um, that a bullet hit their car. That's under investigation. Um, there were no protests in that area. Uh, it, it could be unrelated, but that's clearly uh, alarming to us and under investigation. And then the looting. The looting turned very quickly uh, in portions of the city in Brooklyn. Uh, and primarily in Manhattan, uh, the area of Union Square, 14th Street, Soho. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of arrests in a very short time in that area. And, they, and some, unfortunately, are still going up. So it was a challenging yeah, evening for the police officers. Yeah. Union Square is where we are right now. And yeah. The New York Times reported flames going two stories high. I wanted to ask you about a couple of incidents that are making the rounds on social media, one in which a patrol yeah. car, NYPD car in Brooklyn, appears to roll into a crowd of onlookers yes. or demonstrators, I should say. Um, and then another case where an NYPD officer appears to shove a woman down to the ground. Are you looking into those incidents? Have you come to any conclusions about whether that those actions were justified? In, in Savannah, and I appreciate the question, in literally tens of thousands of encounters, we have about six that our internal affairs officers are looking at uh, in the process of either identifying the officers. I think by now, probably when I get my update shortly, probably most of the officers will have been identified and there'll be an investigation. And in, in the car one, anyone that looks at that has to be troubled by what they saw. Um, but there's a couple other incidents in cars that we released to the media and weren't shown. And it shows a similar situation where the cop cars are getting attacked and have to basically get out of there as quickly as possible. So it's, it's a very difficult situation without a good ending either way. Um, that, that is on the heels of uh, Molotov cocktails being thrown at police officers. If you look at that entire video, you see people, um, I would describe it as an ambush physically trying to hold yeah. that police officer's car in check as people are surrounding it. So it, it, it's it's clearly something that no one should want to see, um, but we'll, we'll move forward. It is a difficult situation, no question about it. Do you believe there should be a curfew? New York City doesn't have one. Do you need the National Guard to be here? No, uh, we don't need the National Guard. Uh, we, we got the question on the curfew. I'll be honest with you, Savannah. Uh, we, could, we could impose a curfew today. Uh, the problem is people need to listen to a curfew, and that's not going to happen, first and foremost. If people think it will, they don't understand what's going on. Uh, and the second point is anyone that is on the street during this curfew, we had this discussion last night, could probably already be arrested for five different offenses. So what we are doing is trying to manage an extremely volatile situation. There is a lot of outside influences. How we're going to get through with this is level-headedness, police action for sure, but we also need to come together, and not just as a city, but as a country. Yeah. And that's elected officials, that's community leaders, less inflammatory talk. Criticism is good, but inflammatory talk is not helpful. Commissioner Shea, it, a longer conversation is warranted about all of this and the, and the deeper issues presented here. Unfortunately, we got to leave it there this morning so we can get down to Washington and Craig, who's with the mayor there. But thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Craig, thank I'll send you. it down Please to you. Stay. All right, Savannah, thank you. Commissioner, thank you as well. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, is, is here with me now. And, and Mayor, as, as we uh, look on, on Lafayette Park, statues riddled with graffiti, trash everywhere. Um, flashbangs went out, went off throughout the night. Oh, what do you make of your city this morning? Well, uh, we're, we're certainly um, very uh, sad and, and angry, quite frankly, about the destruction that was that happened here. Well, we're in Lafayette Park, right in the center of our city, in front of the White House, but we had damage uh, in blocks throughout the city. So we want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. Mayor, one of the things that struck me about the protests here last night, as I talked to protesters and, 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 and walked among them for, for a couple of hours, they seem to be really organized. And I've been to a number of pro protests over the years like this. This one seemed to be 
unusually organized. Well, we know that we have people that came here with tools uh, and supplies, and they re-upped their supplies. They went to different um, parts of the city. Uh, so we think there was a mix of people here, but certainly people here who um, who do this type of protest and demonstration. Professional protesters or demonstrators? Uh, well, we, we've seen some of these tactics before, um, so uh, we, we know that they were among the groups here. Tactics like? Tactics like the types of tools that they use, restocking, setting fires here and there to try to draw in the police to various locations. Uh, the curfew, uh, the National Guard being called in. You were reluctant to do both of those things, uh, but you did. What, what changed your calculation? Um, I think that, uh, you know, our police in all of our intelligence suggested that we were seeing the same type, the same actors, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had every tool at our disposal uh, to keep the city safe. Uh, we saw most of the people peaceably protest. We saw most of the people leave um, at the time of curfew, uh, and that gave the, the authorities the ability to focus on the troublemakers. Are you expecting another night of, of demonstrations? Uh, we're certainly prepared, as we've seen across the country, uh, multiple days of, of demonstrations. Uh, we're working with our intelligence and all of our uh, law enforcement partners uh, to figure out who's coming where. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. Thanks, uh, Mayor, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right, Craig, thank you. Good conversation with the mayor there. We're going to continue our coverage with protests around the country. But first, we're going to pause and we're going to take a check of the weather. And for that, we turn to Mr. Roker. Hey, Al, morning. Hey, hey, good morning, Hoda. And as we look, we've got some severe weather to talk about today. Actually, really more for tomorrow. All across the northern tier of states, from the Dakotas all the way to Wisconsin, we've got 10 million people at risk, damaging winds, tornadoes possible. And look what happens Wednesday. 34 million people from the Dakotas all the way to New Jersey and down just to the north of Washington, D.C., for severe weather possible. Uh, we're going to be watching these storms. They'll be hit or miss, widely scattered today, more of an impact in the Great Lakes. But then tomorrow, those storms fire up again in the plains. Severe weather for southern Minnesota. Parts of uh, Minneapolis will be affected. Rainfall amounts anywhere from one to three inches. And some of these hourly rainfall rates could be up to an inch per hour. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 7.30 now on this Monday morning. It is June the 1st, 2020. The nation just waking up after another night of protests from coast to coast. That's one week after the death of George Floyd. You're looking at some of the aftermath. This is on the West Coast in Los Angeles where violence and looting led the governor to declare a state of emergency on that coast. On this coast, we have Savannah and Craig. Savannah, New York City. Craig in Washington, D.C. Morning, Savannah and Craig. Morning, guys. It's morning. just so, uh, it's hard to even wrap your, your head around what's going on in our country right now. There's protests like this in 140 cities. 20 states have had to activate the National Guard. I'm here in downtown New York City. This is Union Square. Should be a hub of commuters right now, but we're in the midst of a pandemic. And now we're in the midst of this protest and a real anguish that's going on in this country right now. About a mile south of here is the shopping district of Soho, which a lot of people who visited New York City will certainly remember, was uh, had a lot of vandalism. Some people described it as just being ransacked last night. So, th you know, this is just a moment in our country where we're not only dealing with a pandemic, a, you know, once in a generation pandemic, we're also dealing with the fallout from the incident in Minneapolis that has just broken open some of the tensions here in this country. And Craig in Washington, same story all over again. Our, our nation's capital, uh, large swath of it on fire this morning, literally and figuratively, just steps from where I'm standing here in Lafayette Square, a small building. Uh, still smoldering, firefighters putting that out. Uh, trying to clean up the graffiti all over town as well. Looters uh, were in Georgetown. The mayor telling me a short time ago, her chief concern is that tonight, we're going to see it all over again. The question now becomes, how does this play out? What's, what's the end game? Not just here in, in Washington, D.C., but what's the end game in dozens of other cities 
all over this country. Where do we go from here? We're going to uh, dig into that a little bit this hour uh, as well. Hold yeah, on. that is the key question, Craig. We're going to get to that. But we are going to begin this half hour on the West Coast, a volatile situation in Los Angeles. NBC national correspondent Miguel Almaguer is there for us. Hey, Miguel, good morning. Hoda, good morning. This is the reason why so many curfews are in place all across the country. Here in Los Angeles, businesses were damaged and then they were looted. Now the National Guard is out in force from California to Colorado all the way out to the East Coast, mobilizing as protests get more destructive. Overnight, more rage and destructions in cities across the West. On Sunday, angry mobs ignoring mandatory curfews. <laughs> violently clashing with police, overturning cars, torching buildings, and looting stores. I can't breathe. In the shadow of Santa Monica's iconic pier and 3rd Street promenade, the mayhem unfolded for hours as some peacefully protested. Heads up, heads up, heads up. Others provoked a confrontation. Police here are now pushing forward. They're moving all of these protesters back because the situation here is unraveling. From dawn to dusk, the scene spiraling out of control as both sides clashed and tension rose. Some areas, the looting didn't last long. Here on the promenade, local police and the sheriff's department moved in and made several arrests. That's not okay! In Portland, Oregon, officers took down protesters on the sidewalk. In Seattle, more looting and even more troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, the reason so many poured into the streets. LA's mayor supporting the right to protest, but condemning the destruction, blaming it on extremists. They are hijacking a moment and a movement and changing the conversation. California's governor dispatching the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots nearly 30 years ago. Just like then, businesses and stores paying a heavy price while crowds demanded justice. This is 10 years of a lot of hard work. Amid the chaos, also moments of connection between protesters and police. In California, officers taking a knee joining the crowd in honoring the memory of George Floyd. Another tense night, now followed by an uncertain day. Here in Los Angeles, police remain on scene, as they do in so many major cities all across this country. They are bracing for another round of protests. There are many businesses here that have not yet been looted, and that is what they are still trying to protect here today, as those curfews remain in place nationwide in so many cities. Craig? Miguel Almaguer for us there in California. Miguel, thank you. Let's go now to where all of this started. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Minneapolis, uh, where officials overnight were by and large able to stop uh, and, and prevent more violence. But there was this, this shocking image that we saw uh, Sunday evening there, this semi-truck driving into a group of protesters. We're going to talk to the mayor of St. Paul in just a moment. But first, NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Minneapolis for us this morning. Gabe, good morning to you. Craig, good morning. Today marks one week since the death of George Floyd. It happened right here, now the site of a growing memorial. This city was much calmer overnight, but emotions are still running high. It was a heart-stopping moment, a semi-truck driving through a crowd of peaceful protesters on an interstate highway. People are pretty shocked, um, and it was a traumatic experience. Some protesters then swarmed the truck and attacked the driver. Hey, Others protected him. him. He was later arrested. Incredibly, no protesters were injured. It's still not clear why he did it. I think the incident just underscores um, still the volatile situation we have out there. On the sixth night of protests following the death of George Floyd, Minneapolis police surrounded large crowds making mass arrests. Officer Derek Chauvin, who was seen kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, was arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Demonstrators want the three other fired officers involved in the incident to face charges. Now, security video of what happened moments earlier appears to show a struggle in the backseat of a police vehicle. 
On live television, the city's police chief spoke directly to the Floyd family for the first time about the inaction of those officers as Floyd was dying. Being silent or not intervening to me, you're complicit. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. That acknowledgement left Floyd's brother sobbing. A new report by NBC News finds that since 2015, officers from the Minneapolis Police Department have used so-called neck restraints, using an arm or leg to compress someone's neck, on suspects more than 200 times. And in at least 44 of those cases, the suspects lost consciousness, according to an NBC News analysis of police records. At a growing makeshift memorial for Floyd, signs of a community reeling in pain. I have kids growing up in this world. I got three beautiful children. They're mixed, but even though they're mixed, they look like me, they look the same, and it could have easily been them, it could have easily been me. Michael Holliday came here from Houston, where Floyd grew up. Imagine if it was your child, how would you feel? Imagine if it was your son on the ground, screaming, I can't breathe, help me, please. This community already knows his name, but the world needs to hear his name. So until we have justice, there will be no peace. As protesters demand more charges, they had also wanted the state's attorney general to take over this case from the local prosecutor. That has now happened, Craig. Gabe Gutierrez Force there in Minneapolis, uh, where again all of this started roughly one week ago. Gabe, thank you so much for that. I want to bring in the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. Mayor uh, Melvin Carter joins me now. Mayor, thanks for your time this morning. First of all, how are uh, folks there in, in St. Paul doing right now? Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, folks in St. Paul, just like folks across the country, are traumatized right now. Uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, doubly traumatized as we're in this the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, 40% of low-income workers have lost their job and the economic realities of this year uh, before George Floyd was killed. Uh, but of course, we all woke up a week ago uh, tomorrow uh, to that gruesome, shocking video uh, of seeing the way his life was literally snuffed out uh, by those four officers. Uh, and, you know, I think a, a number of folks were very traumatized by that. Uh, we have the same anger, the same rage, the same sadness as we have all over the country, uh, which I want to point out is really the only human uh, and compassionate response uh, when you see someone killed uh, in such a fashion like that. Uh, we have uh, implemented, as many other cities have, a citywide curfew. And in doing so, our, our invitation to our residents uh, was to channel that pain, channel that energy uh, into doing something constructive for our community. As we've seen around the country, we have two groups operating right now. We have those who are just heartbroken by the loss of George Floyd, who need to scream at the top of their lungs like I do, that he should still be alive, that all four of those officers should be held accountable for their actions, uh, as Chief Arredondo has now said publicly, and that we have a lot of like big systemic level work to do to stop this pattern from happening over and over and over and over and over again, like we've seen not just in the last 10 years on cell phone videos, but for generations. Mayor Carter, let's talk about what's happening there in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I know that last week you said that the protesters were from out of state. You, you apologized after that when it was brought to your attention that that wasn't the case. Uh, we've heard from folks on the right who've said that these are, are four left protesters. We've heard from folks on the left said these are four white protesters, white supremacists. Do we know who's protesting and demonstrating in Minneapolis and in St. Paul? Uh, look, our police department, our law enforcement partners are working hard to get to the bottom of who's coordinating this and why. Uh, but this is all this is all part of the problem. This is a distraction from the conversation that we should be having. Uh, whether those folks uh, sleep in another state or sleep in another city or sleep in our city, uh, it, it, it doesn't change the fact that when we have people who are destroying the local pharmacies uh, in a pandemic that our seniors rely on for their life-saving medicine, uh, we have a food shortage 
shortage right now, and our grocery stores uh, have been looted. Uh, when 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 they are willing to destroy in the midst of an economic crisis the places that our residents rely on, not just for products, uh, but 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 to be able to go to work and earn a living, uh, then it's very clear that there are people operating in our communities who are not operating on the basis of just a, a heartfelt desire uh, to build up our neighborhoods. You, if, if, if you're one of those folks like I am who just cannot rest while injustices against our black and brown communities uh, are, are, are continue, you cannot exercise that energy by burning black barbershops, uh, by, uh, by looting uh, those same communities in a way that just further traumatizes the communities that have already been traumatized by it in the first place. Mayor Carter, really quickly here, 30 seconds. Things seem so very bleak right now. Um, there's, there's concern that these protests are going to continue, that they're going to continue to turn violent as, as well. Where do we go from here? How, how do we make this stop? You know, I think it's clear that the energy that has consumed our country for the last week or so uh, is a raging fire. Uh, figuratively speaking, that could either tear our country apart at the seams or that could bring us together in a way that we've never been together before. Our call is for peace, is for peaceful demonstration, is for the opportunity. Our police department is doing a great job of protecting the right of those legitimate protesters to just say peacefully that this has to change. So we're calling for peace, but it should not be confused with patience. I am not asking for anyone to just sit at home on and wait on the sidelines while we slowly and and uh, you know uh, uh, incrementally slow the tide of black men being killed wrongfully by law enforcement. We're asking our residents, we're asking our communities, we're asking our young people to channel this energy not into destroying our community institutions, but into destroying the systemic racism, into destroying the inequities, and specifically into destroying all of those barriers built in legislation, uh, built in court precedents, uh, built in police union contracts and everywhere else yep. that prevents us and makes it so difficult to hold someone accountable for people like George Floyd, like Eric Garner, who are, whose lives are wrongfully taken at the hands of law enforcement. Mayor Melvin Carter, Mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. Mayor, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having Hold me it. on. Peace, not patience. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back coming up on 747 with In-Depth today. This morning, the outrage being expressed on our nation's streets, all while the coronavirus still is a threat to public health, Savannah. Yeah, we're still in a pandemic and thousands gathering closely together in cities all across the country's got health officials really worried about the possible impact of that on the outbreak. In a moment, we're going to talk to Dr. John Torres about it. But first, here's NBC's Sam Brock. As America's heartbreak finds a voice. We want change. It's been too long. How long are we going to take this? The nation's health hangs in the balance. National protests against the virus of racism unfolding at the height of a coronavirus crisis disproportionately hitting people of color. With all of these people getting together right now at a time of a pandemic, are you worried about your safety? Yes, but the answer is that um, I'm worried about my safety to both of those viruses. Public officials watching protesters spill onto streets across America. Many wearing masks, but largely ignoring any form of social distancing, have sounded the alarm bell. I'm urging uh, everybody uh, to consider their exposure. We have worked very hard to blunt the curve. In Atlanta, a city pulsating with activity, the mayor has taken it a step further. If you were out protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week. But those public pleas, coming as many police forces appear to be failing to set a good example. Atlanta's police chief walked into a crowd with no face covering over the weekend, and LAPD officers without masks arrested demonstrators. Across the country, other officers standing with protesters, but ignoring mask and distancing rules. In Miami, police surround the perimeter of this Sunday protest teeming with thousands, 
This protester tells me she feels threatened either way, virus or no virus. Because I could be dead tomorrow if I walk on the streets and a cop doesn't like me or I did something or I look like I'm doing something wrong, he can shoot me right there. What do you think when you see all of these protesters coming out and many of them are not wearing masks? Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but when you put other people's safety and health in danger, then that's wrong. Many opinions, but the undeniable threat of a second wave that could disrupt months of progress. For today, Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. Let's bring in our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. And Dr. Torres, it's, I mean, you understand the, the desire for people to get out there and have their voices heard. At the same time, the shots of those crowds so packed together in the middle of a pandemic. Would you expect to see a surge in cases after scenes like this? And Savannah, you're right. I completely understand the rationale behind people wanting to get out there. But at the same time, I think we are going to see a spike over the next five to seven days. You're going to start to see cases up going up. And a lot of these protests are in areas where cases have already started to climb again because of reopening. So that's probably the hugest concern we're having right now, Savannah. And you were talking earlier about how distinctly uh, dangerous, for lack of a better word, these protests can be. Can you explain why? Right, these protests have a issue, unique issues, and part of it's because the longer you're around a lot of people, the more time you spend with those people, the closer you are, the more likely you are to spread coronavirus. On top of that, people here might get it and take it home, spread somewhere else. On top of that, if there's tear gas involved, the tearing, the coughing, the shouting, the screaming that goes on, those respiratory droplets can go even further and contaminate more people. You're seeing people without masks at the same time. And then if people get jailed, they get indoors, which makes it even more likely they're going to catch coronavirus virus in that environment because of the close, tight, packed, packed area they get when they get jailed. And so these are all big concerns. People are going to go home to other patients who are vulnerable. They need to be very, very careful with that, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just uh, hard to even get your, he your head around these, these you know, multiple crises that this country is going through right now, Dr. Thank you very much for your time. Hoda, I'll send it to you. All right, 751. We're going to pause again, switch gears and get a check of the weather from Mr. Roker. Hey, Al. Hey, how are you, Hoda? Well, today marks the beginning of hurricane season, June 1st, and this is the latest. This is just in from the National Hurricane Center, the update. This was Amanda, but now is in the Yucatan Peninsula, and right now 315 miles southwest of Cancun, Mexico. It now has an 80% chance of development over the next five days, two to five days, and so if this reforms, it would become crystal ball, and that would make it the third earliest that we've had three tropical cyclones, three, three tropical storm na named storms by this time. So we're watching it very, very closely. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. We're moving. 
stepping into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, breaking overnight chaos coast to coast. <laughs> Violence breaks out for a sixth night in a row over the death of George Floyd. <laughs> In Louisville, one demonstrator shot and killed, and around the country, destruction as looters break in and burn down businesses. They were not here to protest. They were here to destroy Atlanta. This morning, officials urging people to stay home. We cannot afford to lose anyone else. As new images emerge showing some signs of hope and peace. Today, Monday, June 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. And good morning, everybody. Welcome back to today. It's Monday morning, and we're glad to have you with us. A lot of folks are just waking up, and unfortunately, it's a it's a, a morning of sadness in this country. I'm here in New York City's Union Square downtown, which has really been the focal point of protests over the weekend here and in Brooklyn, all around Manhattan, Craig's in Washington, D.C., where the situation was very, very similar, including right outside the White House and Hoda holding down the fort is always in the studio. Good to see you all. Good to see you guys. And Craig, I'm, I'm really excited about this someone who you interviewed in just a little bit. I don't know if you guys saw the video, but there was a sheriff in Michigan who was kind of nose to nose with protesters. And after talking with them, putting his baton down, putting down his, his protective gear, they chanted, walk with us. And he did. And so, uh, Craig, you're going to have a pretty uh, incredible interview with this with this sheriff coming up. Yeah. Well, we could uh, we could all use a little hope this morning, <laughs> right? Uh, before we get to all of that, though, how about your news at eight on a Monday morning? Uh, we are just a few feet away from the White House in Lafayette Square, and the cleanup effort has started here after a night of unrest and violence. In fact, the small building was on fire uh, just 30 minutes ago. Firefighters have gotten that under control. Uh, they're also cleaning up the graffiti on one of the oldest churches in this city, St. John's Church, uh, behind this fire truck. And the escalating violence that overshadowed those peaceful demonstrations this weekend were met with curfews, arrests, and massive displays of force. Overnight, unrest across America reaching a boiling point. The death of George Floyd and the conduct of the Minneapolis police officers involved, sparking another round of protests nationwide. Here in the nation's capital, violence taking place just steps from the White House. You can see that fire uh, that's been set uh, just in front of the White House outside Lafayette Park. In more than a dozen states, the National Guard was called in to help restore order. In Louisville overnight, a man was shot and killed after shots were fired toward the police officers and National Guard members during protests, the chief of police saying officers and soldiers returned fire. The identity of the man who was shot has not been released. So far, thousands of arrests have been made nationwide. Businesses burned to the ground. Police filling the air with tear gas. Cars reduced to smoke and ash as looters storm shops and stores. Black lives matter. More than 100 protests and rallies took place from coast to coast. In Seattle, this video appearing to show an officer put his knee on the neck of someone being taken into custody before another officer steps in. In New York City, this video of two NYPD vehicles ramming into a crowd of protesters sparking outrage. The mayor defending the officers involved. But I also want to emphasize that situation was created by a group of protesters blocking and surrounding a police vehicle. On Saturday, Mayor Bill de Blasio's own daughter arrested during citywide protests, according to a senior NYPD official. Dozens of cities installing curfews over the weekend, including Minneapolis, an effort to clear the streets and ease tensions. I will beg you, please stay home. Chicago's mayor echoing what so many are feeling. This is a time for us to unite. We have to turn our pain 
into purpose. That unity on display in Kansas City as an officer and protester shared a warm embrace. While thousands in Denver laid on the ground for nine minutes chanting, I can't breathe in honor of Floyd and tensions running high in the nation's capital. What do they tell you that they want? They just, they want to be fair. They want stuff to be fair. But it was also on these streets of Washington amid the chaos that I found the father trying to teach his son about peace. But it's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. Amen to that. Uh, it should be noted that the a demonstration here in Washington, and this is this is the case around much of the country as well, those demonstrations were largely peaceful. In fact, it was peaceful here until the sun went down. Uh, this morning, though, there is still that, that tear gas in the air. Uh, rubber bullets were used last night. Those, those flash bombs also used by police to disperse the crowd. Uh, mayor Bowser, the mayor of Washington, D.C., telling me last hour uh, they expect to have another citywide curfew tonight. And they are also expecting more demonstrations as well. Savannah? Mm -hmm. All right, Craig, thank you. And Santa Monica, California, was placed on overnight curfew last night after a sudden explosion of violence yesterday. And I'm joined now by Police Chief Cynthia Renault to talk about the events that played out and what the future might hold. Uh, Chief, good morning to you. I'm glad you're with us. You know, you had had mostly peaceful protests, but things really devolved in a hurry. What happened? How did it escalate? Yes, we had peaceful protesters in, in large numbers, uh, and we were there to protect their rights to protest and support them in that. Um, there was a second group that came in, and we ended up with two groups, one of peaceful protesters and one of people that were to loot and conduct crimes in the city. Um, that group was extremely large, and it was both on foot and mobile coming into the city through vehicles. So it was uh, quite a crowd to work with and control, and it took a large deployment of death. You're breaking up a little bit, so forgive me if you if you just answered the question, but there was some criticism that the peaceful protesters faced a larger police presence in Santa Monica than those who were doing the looting and the vandalism and that kind of thing. What do you say to that? So the crowds at the intersections, I don't know how visible it was on the media, but our police officers were taking bottles and were having things thrown at them. So interspersed with that crowd, there was uh, violence in there as well. Um, and we couldn't abandon the intersections and leave that open. I think the best example I can give is um, our community members, our Santa Monicans who were there peacefully protesting, saw what was occurring in the crowd. And at one point early on, they had held hands and formed a line in front of the officers. Um, and so there was definitely violence, both interspersed with them, along with other cars coming into the city with people intent on looting. So it was uh, um, uh, two groups, um, and for the, for a substantial amount of time, the violence were also in, interspersed with the, uh, the nonviolent protesters as well. You know, Chief, it's such a, a strange situation because, of course, the officers are asking to police a protest that is about police brutality, about racism in the system. When you look at what happened to George Floyd and you see these demonstrators pouring onto your streets and streets around the country, as a police professional, what message do you receive? What are you hearing and learning from this moment? So as so many police chiefs have done, um, we have talked with our communities and been very honest about how we feel about the situation and that we condone what happened and that we understand the grieving and the feelings and we share that with them. Police departments, mine included, have worked very hard to train officers to dialogue with our community, to create relationships, and we'll continue to do that. And so I think here, speaking for California and definitely for Los Angeles County, there has been a strong statement from 
police chiefs um, as to what happened so many miles away from us um, and that it's not condoned, it's not accepted or permitted here, and uh, we work tirelessly to make sure that that doesn't happen here. Chief Cynthia Renault of Santa Monica, I know you've got a busy day ahead of you. Thank you very much for your time and your perspective. We really appreciate it. Thank Hold you. Hold it to you. All right, Savannah, thank you. Uh, we have got the news covered, and I think it's something we could all use right now. How about a little morning boost? We've seen stories from Minneapolis yes. this weekend about people reaching out to each other with acts of kindness. Well, here's what happened when one low-income housing unit put out a call for food donations. Whoever wants it. The donations, they overflowed. People responded. They brought boxes and bags of free groceries. There was so much that the organizers told people to get on social media, tell their friends, come on down. We have what you need. Acts of kindness right there, Savannah. Oh, it's so lovely. And I've got another one that really fits in these times. A man named Sean Dromgoogle. He lived in, has lived in Nashville for a really long time. But because of everything that's been going on, he said he was afraid to just even go outside to walk his dog because he is a black man. Well, he posted about it on his neighborhood social media app. Well, first, one neighbor called and said, I'll walk with you. And then another and another. And before long, about 50 members of his community were out walking with Sean and his dog. He said, I was scared to walk alone. And now look who's behind me. Look who has my back. Oh. We just need to see more of that, don't we? Yeah. By the way, it's a beautiful image we should uh, to leave right there with. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're talking, of course, about that historic rocket launch over the weekend, SpaceX's Dragon capsule. It successfully docked at the International Space Station yesterday, 19 hours after the Falcon 9 took off from Cape Canaveral. Bob and Doug, welcome to the International Space Station after your spectacular rendezvous and docking of the first Crew Dragon vehicle. Uh, that's what you call perfect. Astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin were welcomed aboard by a fellow NASA astronaut, that's Christopher Cassidy, and two Russian cosmonauts. They're expected to uh, stay somewhere between one and four months. Hurley's message to young Americans, he says, reach for lofty goals, work hard, and look at what you can accomplish. So amidst all the stuff that's going on down here on planet Earth, it's nice to look up and see that happening. Right, guys? I love Absolutely. that so much. You know, my yes. kids watched it, guys, and they um, right after we watched the launch, we went outside of the backyard and Vail and Charlie were yelling up into the sky. <laughs> Can you see us, astronauts? <laughs> and we're proud of you. You're awesome. And it's just so cute, to, oh, you know, the way something like that lifts spirits. Yeah. Yes, indeed, Savannah. It's beautiful. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Welcome back. As protests have spread in the wake of George Floyd's death, there have been signs of coming together around the country. Yeah, there have, Savannah. I mean, some shows of solidarity between police and the police. NBC's Morgan Radford is in Philadelphia with more on that part of the story. It was good to see it this weekend, Morgan. You too, Craig. Craig, Savannah, demonstrators were protesting late into the night here in Philadelphia. You can see the National Guard is here this morning. But even though here and all across the country there were these tense moments between police and protesters, there were also moments of profound unity. Black Lives Matter! With protesters taking to the streets nationwide, some of them are finding support from a surprising place. Y'all see the chief! Police officers frustrated that George Floyd's death reflects badly on them. Don't think for a second that he represents who these cops are from all over the county and around this nation. 
We go out there to help people, not do that nonsense. In Flint, Michigan, Sheriff Chris Swanson joining residents as they march. I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. I want to make this a parade, not a protest. In New Jersey, Camden County Police Chief Joseph Wysocki asked an organizer if he could walk with them too. I was welcomed with uh, open arms. Marching front and center, holding a banner of solidarity. At one point, she started the chant, Black Lives Matter. Then she looked at me and said, sorry. And I said, I laughed. I said, it's okay. I said, that's why we're here. On the force for nearly 30 years, Wysocki was disturbed by what happened to Floyd. That video shocked every good cop in, in the United States. Like, that's not just shocking the cops of my police department. It's that shocking cops everywhere. From Georgia's state officers to Houston's police chief. We will march as a department with everybody in this community. To Kansas City, where officers held signs and hugged protesters. Louisville, an embrace that cut through the chaos. Miami officers letting organizers know they have their backs. And nearby in Coral Gables, officers kneeling with protesters in prayer. Keep Scott! Keep Scott! While in Queens, New York, kneeling to remember other lives lost. In Shreveport, Louisiana, emotions overflowing. And back in Flint, the sheriff echoing his heartfelt message to those who are hurting. We want to be with y'all for real. Here in Philadelphia, the city has its first African-American female police commissioner. And after the death of George Floyd, she too spoke out, saying that she understands the pain of the African-American community from a personal perspective. But like other police chiefs and commissioners across the country, she also rededicated herself to serving and protecting this city with fairness and dignity. Craig? Morgan Radford, thank you. Uh, sheriff Christopher Swanson, uh, the sheriff of Genesee County that you just saw there, marching alongside the demonstrators, marching alongside the protester. He joins me now. Uh, sheriff, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, sir. Thanks for having me. Sheriff, on, on Saturday, um, did, did you have it in your mind when you got there as you and your men were getting ready that you would you would lay down your helmet, lay down your baton and march alongside the protesters? Or was that a spontaneous decision? It was a spontaneous decision. And I'll tell you, with all the police agencies there, Flint Township being the, the lead for that area, uh, it, it made the most sense that when I saw the crowd and felt the, the frustration and the fact that we were only accelerating the issue, it was time to take the helmet off, go to the shot caller, the lead organizer, give him a big old fat hug and say, what do we need to do? And that was the tension breaker. And then the next question was the one that made history. What was the response from those demonstrators, from those protesters? What did they say to you? Well, they, they wanted to know what, what I thought. And uh, when I looked at uh, the lead organizer and said, listen, that guy is not who cops are. These police officers love you. And we don't accept that. We're horrified. They said the crowd needs to hear it. I said, get the crowd. So when the crowd tried to turn, um, and they've already had a fist pump with another officer, they already had a hug. They were open to just listening to, to what we had to say. And when I acknowledged that we don't condone that, that's not who cops are. The second question is, what else do you need? And that's when the crowd shouted, walk with us. And in a second, that turn of events happened when I said, let's walk. And uh, you saw an entire crowd's mindset and heart change because they wanted to be heard. The protesters, had they not listened to the message, we wouldn't be talking, but they were as much a part of that night Make it history in Flint than anybody else. And now we are day two, no arrests, no fires, no injuries. Yeah, Sheriff, one of the things that struck me when I saw that video is that, that that's one of those situations that could have gone yes. in a whole nother way. Uh, yeah. Had you decided to, <laughs> to lay down your arms and, and the protesters took advantage of the situation, they did not do that. As, right. you, as you look at the protests around this country, these protests, yeah. uh, many of which have, have turned violent, You've yeah. got a number of, of, of public officials, law enforcement officers, saying that the solution right now is to crack down on these demonstrators. What do you what do you say to that? It's a great question. To your first point, 
it was probably the worst tactical decision I could make by taking off all what protects me and going into the crowd. But the benefit far outweighed the risk. And uh, I'm not trying to be a macho or a hero. I, I just tell you that that was the best decision to show that I am not going to create a a divide. I'm going to show vulnerability and walk in the crowd and make the make the first move. To your second point, my heart breaks for the city. It breaks for D.C. and New York and L.A. and Minneapolis and and great cities have been built by great people. And so I, I don't I can't answer what the next best decision is except for lay down your arms. That that police and protesters have to work together to say, hey, let's take a night of calm and find out what's happening. Why are we doing this? And, and create the conversation that makes the change. Everybody talks about change. Change comes with action. And I got to believe that there's folks in those communities that want peace and want action. And uh, man, I feel terrible for police officers injured, people that have been killed, the city's been destroyed. But it's going to take time. And, and, and I, I see what's happening like the world does. And it breaks our heart, but there has to be a first move. There has to be a first step, and that has to come from both sides. Sheriff Christopher Swanson. Uh, Sheriff, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for your example on Saturday as well, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. We love you guys, and we love this nation. Appreciate your time. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Oh, welcome back. The reaction to the death of George Floyd has taken many forms in the week that's followed, but one powerful, beautiful, yet heartbreaking performance has grabbed a lot of attention. I'm a young black man. Doing all that I can to stand. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hard to this prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough strong goal. I just want to live. Don't forget that name. This is 12-year-old gospel singer Kedron Bryant. That song, by the way, written by his mom, Jeanette, it's been viewed nearly three million times on his Insta page. It's been reposted by, well, just President Obama, LeBron James, so many others. Kedron and Jeanette are joining us this morning. Good morning, you guys. Good morning. Okay, first of all, we need you today. We need you every day, but we especially need you today. And Kedron, I want to talk to you in a second, but first, Miss Jeanetta. Yes. You wrote this song. It came from deep in your soul. What made you put those words on paper? In light of everything that is going on, um, especially our recent situation, when I heard Mr. Floyd call out for his mom, as a black mother, that really hit me in a deep way. And I began to pray. Um, and so I, I said, God, this world needs help like never before. Uh, so I went into meditation because I needed understanding. I needed, I needed strength because I also knew that I need to be able to give my son some wisdom that's going to help him to be able to live and to um be confident in this world. And I knew that, that it could only come from God. Um, cause I understand that we're in a spiritual, this, this fight is spiritual as well. And so, uh, I went into prayer and, and God spoke to me and he gave these words to me. And you, you wrote those words down and then you gave those words to your son and you told him to go upstairs. Yes. And what did yes. you ask him to do? Um, you know, our kids are home, you know, for the quarantine and I always make a schedule for them to follow, um, as if they're in school. And part of that schedule is devotion. So I sent him up during his devotion time and I said, Kedron, I want you to pray over these words. I want you to meditate on them, allow God to speak to you, uh, so that you may be able to speak to the people and also get some encouragement for yourself. So um, he went into his own devotion time. 
Um, and he, yeah, he came back um, after his devotion, and he's like, Mom, I'm ready. Oh, you are ready. You are ready, Kedron. You are ready in that moment. When you sing this song, I, I'm wondering, what are you, you feel these words. This isn't about singing a song. This is what you, what are you feeling while you're singing those words? Um, well, I felt sad that I have to sing that because um, it's unfair that we can go out and, like the song says, live. I just want to live. We can't go out and enjoy life and not be afraid and fear that something's going to happen to us. So it was really sad um, to have that feeling. Do you, do you, when you ask God for things, and I know you do, what do you ask him for? Um... I ask him to give me anointing, um, to give me power to uh, minister to the people, um, even on my side and on the other side of the phone, um, to touch lives and impact them. Well, you're doing it. You've impacted President Obama. He called you powerful. LeBron James said he loved you. Nas said you were dope. Uh, Janet Jackson, <laughs> Eva Longoria, Beyonce's mom. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You've impressed so many. I don't know if you like to sing in the morning from Florida. Do you? Um, yes, ma'am. Would you sing a little for us? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I just want to leave. God protects me. I just wanna leave. I just wanna leave. I'm all by myself, but I'm applauding you here. Thank you. Thank you, Kedron. Thank you, Janetta. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, okay? Keep singing. Keep singing. The world needs you. And Janetta, we need you too. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. All right, given everything that's happening in this country right now, a lot of people are looking for words of wisdom and comfort. And one of the people we've turned to in recent years for inspiration is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the most Reverend Michael Curry. Reverend Curry, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Great to be back with Boy, you. Boy, I got to say, looking at these images um, of things burning and people looting and all the pain and anguish is really distressing to lots and lots of people. And I read your op-ed in the Washington Post, and you basically said, find love. Love, um, and you understand the pain, but choosing love is hard in this moment. How do you help people go down that path, Bishop? Well, you know, the first thing is, it's a decision, and it's probably a daily decision uh, to choose to actually live the way of love, which is not about, not a sentiment. Um, I've said for a long time, the opposite of love is, is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. Mm. That the way of love is the way of seeking the good, the welfare, and the well-being of others, as well as the self. In the Hebrew scriptures, when Moses talks about love of neighbor in Leviticus, it's in the context of talking about people doing what is just and kind and decent. And when Jesus talks about it in Luke's gospel, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, somebody who helps somebody who is different than they are. So it's a decision, and it's a daily decision that I'm going to live an unselfish life that seeks the good of others as well as my own good. And when we all do that, we win. So if you were talking, because I feel like the sides are so far apart, everyone's blaming each other, and there's so much tension, and I keep thinking, like, how does this end? If you were going to speak to the protesters and to the police, like, what would you say to them? Well, first of all, I would say to both protesters and police, every one of us is a child of God. And if we are all children of God, which I think we can all agree on, most of us can, then that means that we are brothers and sisters and siblings of each other. Both in terms of our immediate work addressing this situation and certainly in our work going forward, much that has to be done and must, much that has to change and that we will change. But I want to note that overall, even in a day where thousands of people were out expressing their views, expressing their frustration, their pain, their anger, their deep desire for change. 
in locations all over the city. Overall, what we peaceful demonstrators coming to the fore and establishing a different tone, a different reality. People who are from communities, want change, want it done the right way, the peaceful way, the democratic way. And that was more and more evident yesterday than in the last few days. I spoke to yesterday a number of community leaders. I was out in central Brooklyn talk to elected officials, also talk to community residents. What I heard overwhelmingly was a desire to keep things peaceful, to work on change in a positive construction, a constructive fashion. I heard both with my own ears, saw with my own eyes, community members saying, we are going to set the tone for any protest, not folks who are not from our community, not folks who want to do violence, we, the community members, the community leaders, will set the tone. Saw this, heard about the specifics of it in central Brooklyn, heard examples from Harlem, from southeast Queens, of elected officials, clergy, community leaders, civic leaders, cure violence movement members and leaders, stepping in and setting a different tone. And I think that's very, very important. So I want to commend and thank all of the community Leaders, all the community members who have said it is up to the community to determine how this will go and to ensure that change is made the right way. Thank you, and it's crucial that that good work continue. I also want to say there's some issues to discuss for sure and certain specific situations involving the NYPD that I will discuss that need to be addressed. But overall, our officers showed restraint uh, throughout the day and evening yesterday. Overall, the peaceful protest was handled the way we want it to be handled, with officers staying back and protest allowed to continue in the tradition of this city. In fact, we saw in many cases police leaders and police officers engage protesters, engage community leaders, have a real discussion with them, show empathy, show connection. This is what neighborhood policing is about. And we saw powerful examples of it. There's a video out there, Chief Fausto Pichardo, Chief of Patrol of the NYPD, one of the highest ranking members of the NYPD, proud member of our Dominican community, out there talking face to face with a protest leader saying, we want to keep this peaceful, we want this to be done the right way, we want everyone to be able to express their views the right way. There's the images out there of uh, Chief Della Torre, Chief Madry in Brooklyn, taking a knee, respecting the concerns of the protesters, saying we can work together. There's this very powerful image. I want to thank the Daily News for putting this on the front cover today. Uh, Deputy Inspector Vincent Tavallero uh, in Queens, showing that the NYPD is listening, working with the community. Um, this kind of thing, our police leadership reaching out, connecting with the community. This is the entire concept of neighborhood policing, and that's true in the middle of this difficult moment. In fact, is how we're going to overcome this moment and move forward. So I commend and I thank all the police leaders who found a way to reach out, listen, connect, and the restraint of so many of our officers. Now. There are things that have to be addressed. Uh, later in the evening last night, in, in several locations, particularly lower Manhattan, we saw looting. That is something we do not see typically in this city. That is unacceptable in New York City. It will not be allowed in New York City. We're going to address that very, very aggressively. Again, that phenomenon, rare, and we saw it for the first time in any serious manner last night, did not see that in the other nights. That is being fomented by a very small number of violent protesters. That is not what everyday community people are doing. I want to be very clear about that. And that is also why I am confident in the NYPD's ability to locate those individuals and deal with this problem. 
We also have seen situations where police officers acted inappropriately. And it's rare, I want to be clear, but it must be addressed in every instance. Now, I want to take a step back and talk about a very troubling video uh, from the night before last of two police cars moving through an intersection, moving through a crowd that was so troubling to the people of this city. And I spoke to it, and I spoke from the heart about what I saw, but what I also knew had been happening in that day and the day before, including very dangerous situations where the lives of our officers were in danger. And I tried to express that reality while also saying it's not acceptable for a police car to ever move through a crowd. I don't think I expressed it as well as I should have. So I want to try again to help the people of this city understand. There is no situation where a police vehicle should drive into a crowd of protesters or New Yorkers of any kind. It is dangerous. It is unacceptable. This was an extremely aberrant situation. And there were extenuating circumstances, I believe, because of incidents that had happened earlier. And I understand why the danger that there could have been a much bigger conflict there was looming. But it is still not acceptable for our officers to ever drive into a crowd. This incident is under investigation as we speak, both within the NYPD and by the independent review that I have set up with our Corporation Council and our Department of Investigation Commissioner. Uh, there's going to be, in each and every instance, where an officer did something wrong. And we've all seen the video of an officer pushing a young woman to the ground. We've seen the video of an officer opening a car door and hitting a protester. All of these matters are under review right now. They need to be speedy reviews. Discipline must be meted out in any case where it is merited. We need to show the people of this city that there's one standard that, and I got this when I've talked to community leaders and community members, this is the nagging deep complaint, this sense of double standard and it can't go on. Vast majority of officers do their job, do their job well. The vast majority of officers are trying to connect to communities and do the right thing. They're in this job for the right reason. There are some who do not belong in this job. And there are some that use violence when they shouldn't. There are some that are disrespectful to the people they serve. There are some that harbor racism in their hearts. These people should not be in the police force. And it's our job to get them out. So any situation where an officer does something, even in the context of a protest in a tense situation, they do something offensive and inappropriate, there must be immediate investigation, there must be the appropriate penalty, and that penalty can include all the way up to being removed from the police force. There's a video going around of a police officer in the middle of a situation that admittedly looked chaotic, but where protesters were in front of that police officer, that police officer drew his gun at some point yesterday. That, to me, seeing that video was absolutely unacceptable. Now, I don't know all the circumstances, and we must know all the facts. There will be an immediate full investigation of that incident. But I can say, as a New Yorker, as your mayor, as someone who understands that the vast majority of protesters are there peacefully, and even those who do have that violent intent, are still human beings. We have to always know it is not the place of an officer to pull a gun in the middle of a crowd, knowing that there are peaceful protesters in that crowd. That is unacceptable. That is dangerous. And I want you to note on that video how a superior officer immediately came over and moved that officer away from that crowd. That officer should have his gun and badge taken away today. There will be an investigation immediately to determine the larger consequences. So this, to me, makes clear, as we've known that the work of reform has been going on for years but must deepen. People are demanding more change, and they have every right to, because they're in pain. They feel an injustice is being done to them every single day. I've talked the last few days about what racism means in people's everyday lives. For so many people in so many communities of color, and this particularly afflicts people of African descent, Racism hangs like a cloud every hour of every day. And if their assumption is in their encounters with a police officer that they will not be given fair and equal treatment, that's an unacceptable state of affairs. So how do we change it? In addition to neighborhood policing and body cameras and all the other things that we've tried to do to change policing, what more can we do? 
Here's what we could do immediately. The legislature right now could repeal the 50A legislation, the 50A law that is holding back transparency in police discipline. I have called for this. My police commissioners have called for this. The governor has come out and said he is ready to sign a repeal bill. We need 50A repealed. Let's do that in the month of June. This would be one of the single most important things that we could do to increase trust between police and community. I've been very clear. We must also have legislation that protects the identities of police officers in their personal life, their home address. They deserve that protection. But discipline processes must be transparent. We have a moment now that we can get that done, and that will deepen the trust uh, and deepen our ability to have progress going forward. What else do we have to do? There has to be a faster discipline process. Any time an officer is alleged to have done something inappropriate, there needs to be an immediate investigation, immediate consequences. It always takes too long. It makes people so frustrated and so angry. We can't accept that state of affairs. We have to change. If we have an instance where an officer has done something inappropriate, there needs to be an immediate investigation, consequences quickly. If that officer should not be on the police force, we should remove that officer. If an officer is not right for a community. If an officer has shown that they are unable to work appropriately on the street and with a community, they should be removed from work on the street. If an officer should not be on the police force, they should be removed from the police force. We've done a whole host of other reforms and they have changed policing in the city, but it's time to go to the next level and we have to go there quickly because any officer who should not be wearing that uniform needs to get off this force. And we have to have a way of doing that. So the other officers, the vast majority who are doing their job, respecting communities, honoring the law, serving people, putting their lives on the line, that vast majority of good officers, let their work shine through when we get the bad apples off this police force. My final point before turning to Commissioner Shea, uh, as has been reported, my daughter Chiara was arrested at a protest. I want you first to know, and I think many, many parents uh, can appreciate this, she's 25 years old uh, and did not inform Sherlane of I, and I of her intention uh, to get arrested. I knew of some of her views. I knew she believed in peaceful protest. I knew she had participated a few nights ago, but in a peaceful manner. And when I found out she had been arrested, finally reached her with Sherlane, and we asked her to recount the whole story. And look, I love my daughter deeply. I honor her. She is a, such a good human being. She only wants to do good in the world. She wants to see a better and more peaceful world. She believes a lot of change is needed. I'm proud of her that she cares so much and she was willing to go out there and do something about it. She recounted the story in detail to me. She was acting peacefully. She believes that everything she did was in the spirit of peaceful, respectful protest. And the bottom line is I will let her uh, speak for herself in any way that she wants to, but I admire that she was out there trying to change something that she thought was unjust and doing it in a peaceful manner. It's a, a reality that every parent faces that you never know when your kids become adults how they're going to go about their lives. Sometimes you get surprises. But even though this was a surprise to Sherlane and I, I respect my daughter, I honor her, and I know her heart. I know she appreciates humanity, every kind of humanity. She appreciates the fact that people serve us. She appreciates the fact that we need to change this world and she, in her own way, has tried to do something about it. And for that, I want to just tell her how much I love and respect and admire her. With that, I turn to Commissioner Shea. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So yesterday, over the course of the day, we encountered a number of protests throughout New York City. Um, large crowds um, were taking part in the protests. They were overwhelmingly peaceful uh, throughout the day. They were concentrated in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and to a smaller degree in Queens. Uh, but again, the largest concentrations were in and around the Barclay Center in Brooklyn and then in the area around Union Square, 14th Street in Manhattan. The Manhattan one was a little more mobile. Uh, throughout the day, as I said, uh, overwhelmingly peaceful protests. 
I think there was a different, uh, less tension in the air from my perspective and the reports that we were getting back throughout the day. Um, that changed as the nighttime came. What we saw was a market shift uh, about probably 8.30, 9 p.m. As, as many protesters were leaving for the day, we started to see some criminal activity concentrated uh, more in Manhattan than other areas, and that's some of the looting that was uh, recounted. We're still tallying up the totals in terms of arrests, injuries, or things of that sort. As, as the mayor said, we, we start with the most important thing, loss of life. We did have some dangerous incidents in New York City yesterday uh, attributed to the uh, protests, but thankfully uh, there was no lost life. Um, I, I thank the officers and the protesters, community leaders that came out again. I think this is uh, an ongoing process. We're in day four. We expect more protests throughout the city today. And, and I will tell you that the men and women of this police department will be consistent. They will be out there again. Uh, ensuring the rights of people to peacefully assemble. And we ask all New Yorkers to participate and do it safely. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Let's take some questions from the media and please let me know the name and the outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. The first question Ooh. today goes to Jen Peltz from the AP. Hi, Mr. Mayor, um, how are you? Good, Jen, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask whether you are considering a curfew, and if not, whether you're considering any other steps other than what has been done in the previous nights. Yeah, thank you, Jen. A central question. I appreciate it. Um, to date, we have not believed the curfew was the right strategy, but the commissioner and I are going to talk about it as an option today. We'll discuss it over the next few hours. I'm also going to have a discussion with Governor Cuomo about it. Uh, we have to look at it as an option, but uh, that being said, uh, we have not made a decision. There are uh, advantages and disadvantages, to say the least, uh, to instituting a curfew. Uh, previous nights, um, I think, were different than what we saw last night, so we're weighing that right now. Uh, in terms of the strategies that will be in effect tonight, I'll let the commissioner speak to it, but I can say, having gone all over the areas where there were protests last night, I saw a huge number of NYPD officers, which I think is essential uh, to keeping the peace where there is this kind of attempt at looting. So we have a lot of officers ready to go. I think a lot became clear from last night about how to strategically approach the situation. I feel tremendous confidence the NYPD will know how to deal with it. Commissioner, you want to go into any yeah, further? Well, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I was out there last night throughout the city, saw firsthand some of the, uh, the activities. Um, what a good day that turned bad, uh, unfortunately, and I think it leaves a black mark on everything that's trying to be accomplished. Um, again, I made the reference yesterday, and I, and I think it's, it's appropriate. It's, it's hijacking a cause, and um, you had such good stories coming out, whether it's the cover of today's Daily News or other stories. You saw a lot on social media of all different ranks, um, not always agreeing, but agreeing to see and hear each other and listen to each other and knowing that it's a long journey to get to where we want to be, to working together, <clears throat> to denounce when we see something wrong. Um, that changed last night with the looting. We have to recognize that that is where the protest ended. There was no agenda for a protest last night as breaking into stores and stealing property. We will have a, a robust um, amount of officers, both in plain clothes and uniform out there tonight. Uh, anyone coming to, whether it's at one of the outer boroughs or to Manhattan, with the intent to take advantage of people during this very difficult time, we are going to ensure that we do everything at, that you are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. If we see you driving a car into Manhattan and using it to facilitate that crime, you are going to lose your car. So I encourage everyone again, come out, protest, make yourself heard, enact change but we will have little tolerance for criminal activity. The one thing I will say is I saw increased again numbers last night of New Yorkers, of every faith, of every religion, of every ethnicity, speaking out against it, that they are not speaking for us. Uh, I saw many incidents where I was quite frankly a little worried that it was gonna turn to violence, where people confronting people that are breaking windows on stores, saying that doesn't help us. I saw doormen, I saw residents coming down trying to aid 
Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, we are a significant part of this story, the NYPD and law enforcement, but it's a groundswell that's going to really uh, end this terrible situation that we're in the middle of now. And we encourage all New Yorkers to speak up, speak your cause, whether you agree or disagree, but do it peacefully and, and work with us. Thank you. The next is Dave Evans from ABC. Hi, Mayor. I wanted to ask you um, a couple of things, and forgive me if you addressed this at the very beginning, because I was doing an interview right as you um, began uh, talking. So I Dave, we seem to have a problem with Dave's me. audio two days in a row. Dave, are you there? Dave, do we have Fine. you here? you hear me? Yeah, yeah try again. Start. No, you said you didn't hear the beginning of the press conference. So what, what is your question, Dave? Okay, Dave broken, needs a new broken. cell phone. <laughs> this is what we're learning from the last two days. <laughs> Dave, last call, Dave. We're in Lower Manhattan. It's, it's a dead zone, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could address some of the criticism of you and the police department that you have been too pro-police a couple of days to defuse. I also wanted to ask you, Dave, you gotta get to a better cell zone, so I'll take the first part, and if we can get him back, we'll get the rest of his question. Last call, Dave, can you hear me? Okay. Go ahead. Dave, last call, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. you Stay hear still, Dave, and <laughs> what is the rest of your question? I wanted to see if you thought Kiara had done anything wrong last night. No. Uh, Dave, look, I trust my daughter. Uh, I've known her her whole life. I really, she is an incredibly good human being. She just cares for other people. I've seen this throughout her whole life. Anybody who was hurting in her life, she would try to help. Uh, she was always looking out for the underdog. She was always looking out for the person who wasn't heard. She's just a very good human, did a lot to try and help people in lots of ways. She's also been an activist for years in lots of different ways. Uh, this is not someone who would ever commit any violence. And she recounted in tremendous detail to Charlene and I what happened. And she was very clear that she believed she was following the instructions of police officers and doing what they were asking. Uh, so, again, I'm going to let her speak for herself about the details, but absolutely, she was abundantly clear. She was peacefully protesting, uh, not doing anything that would provoke a negative response. Um, and the criticisms, Dave, look, I have spent the entire time in my public life trying to bring change to the relationship between police and community. And I know we have done something very different in this city in the last six and a half years. I know neighborhood policing alone, and it's just begun, is going to create a transcendent reality where police and community come together. When you look at this, I'm going to show it again because I think it is so powerful. This didn't happen in previous administrations. It just didn't. Let's be very real about that. This is because neighborhood policing says, find a way to connect with communities and work with communities and hear and see them, as Commissioner Shea just said. And you didn't used to have, Dave, a lot of police commissioners sitting here talking about hearing and seeing communities. We are making profound change, but we got to do a lot more. So what I have said these last days is we must, we, the elected officials, the police leadership, we must change more. It is on us to do that. But I'm also going to express my respect for the vast majority of police officers who are doing their job out there. It's very tough circumstances the last few days. They've shown a lot of restraint. I'm always going to respect that. But any officer who does the wrong thing, there need to be consequences and they need to be fast. And we need to show, we need to not talk about it, we need to show it. So communities, we need to see action. That's what people will believe in. The next is Jeff Mays from the New York Times. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. I have two questions. The first one is uh, from my colleague, Ashley Southall. Uh, yesterday, the police counterterrorism commissioner said that investigators knew ahead of the protest that interlopers were planning to use the protest as a foil for violence. But he said the police did not share that information with the public because they feared being seen as trying to sabotage the protest. Do you think it was the right decision not to put the public on heightened alert 
Uh, and then my second question is regarding uh, your daughter's arrest. Um, do you think the uh, SBA or any other police entity violated any privacy rules uh, when they released uh, news of that uh, arrest? Uh, will there be any investigation um, into that um, incident? And should you have informed the public yesterday that your daughter was arrested? Why did you Why did you wait a whole day to Jeff, let the public? I, Jeff, you. Uh... I respect you greatly. I respect your, uh, your news organization. I'm smiling and laughing because uh, I think you misunderstand. If I had known that my daughter was arrested, I would have been the first to let the public know. I found out when my staff got a media inquiry, which gets back to your point about the fact that information was leaked. I have a 25-year-old adult daughter who lives her own life chooses to share information with me if she deems to, but not, not something that's a guarantee when you're dealing with an adult child. So I knew that she had been out peacefully protesting on Thursday night. She had given me her sense of what she was seeing and her critique of things. Never heard from her after that that she was involved in anything. I found out the only reason I found out she had been arrested was there was a media inquiry that then I heard about from my staff I reached out to her immediately and said, where are you? What's going on? I didn't even know if it meant in real time or it happened previously. And finally, uh, she called back and Shirlane and I got in line with her and she went through exactly what happened. And we did not know that it had happened the night before. Uh, and she told us about the experience. So no, uh, the, actually this is a case and this is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The, Media knew about this before I knew about it. Um, no, of course not. The SBA did something unconscionable, and it's not just because it's my daughter. They do this all the time with people's privacy. This is another one of the things that has to change. Look, police unions could be part of the change and the improvement in this city and in this country. They really should reevaluate what they are doing at this moment in history. More and more police officers are speaking up around America and saying that this is an unacceptable state of affairs has to change. Every time a police officer comes forward and says, I want to be part of the change, it is helping us move forward. The unions could play an incredibly positive role if they would just step forward and say, we're ready to be part of that constructive change. But when they leak information on someone, it's absolutely inappropriate. And it's, but I'm not going to tell you that it's only happening to my child. It's happening to people every single day. All the things you often report about, all of you, come from leaked information within the NYPD that's not supposed to be leaked. So uh, I don't want to see anything done more than would be done for anyone else, but I wish the whole phenomenon would stop. I don't think it's fair that people in law enforcement inappropriately provide information that's not supposed to be public on individuals, but they do it every hour of every day, and you all report it every hour of every day, so there's a little bit of a contradiction. Um, and then on the question of alerting the public, Jeff, I, I think it's a very fair question, but I believe that in my comments, the commissioners, we've been saying for days now that we see a violent element, including a violent element from outside the city and outside the communities where the protests are happening, attempting to use the cover of those who are there to peacefully protest to try and foment acts of violence. We've seen acts of violence. We've seen it in this city. We've seen it in cities all over America. It's a very clear pattern. I think we've made that statement very clearly to people. Um, I think it's a very fair question to say going forward, if we see something very specific that we think might be a particular danger to folks coming to it, we need to alert them. I agree with that entirely. But I feel like we did try to say to people, uh, maybe we need to say it more sharply, that uh, there is an element out there that aims to do violence. They will be out there again today. Um, again, I'm hearing from mayors all over the country the exact same pattern we're seeing here. The vast majority of protesters are peaceful, small group, going in the midst of the peaceful protesters, using them as a shield, and then trying to attack officers or trying to attack property. And more and more people are fighting back, Jeff. Look, I'm telling you, I heard from Southeast Queens, Harlem, Central Brooklyn, community leaders, elect officials, clergy, cure violence, saying no. We're going to do this peacefully. We do not want people trying to create violence in our communities. If you're going to do that, you need to get out of a protest in our community. And a lot of times the protesters who are there to do violence left 
because the peaceful protesters, the community-based protesters, took over the situation. Or like what Commissioner Shea said about some of the looting last night, where community members came out and were confronting those who were looting. So there are a very small number of people doing this violence, very small. We have to get them, we have to stop them, but more and more I think the answer will be community members stepping forward and saying, we will not accept this. The next is Nolan from The Post. Uh, Nolan? What is going on with cell phones today? Nolan, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? How you doing? Uh, I'm all right. It it was uh, quite a weekend, and I'm not really sure to begin with uh, all the questions. Um, But maybe let's start here. Um, Things, uh, just by the recounting offered by your own office, uh, it seems like you arrived in Brooklyn at Berkeley Center Saturday night, uh, Sunday night it was on Flatbush, and then, um, well, I guess it was Friday night, Saturday night, Friday night, Friday night, Friday night, all put it together. But I guess basically the premise of the question is, you seem to always come to Brooklyn after things had gotten out of I'm wondering why we are there. No, and repeat that last year. Your conclusion was what? All right, the conclusion was, uh, so this is, I have two questions, so if you'll, if you'll bear with me. What, first question is, it seemed like on Saturday and Sunday, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday, you got to Brooklyn after things had gotten out of hand uh, in Flatbush at Barclays Center on, on all three of those nights. So my first question is, I'm curious, why weren't you out during the day with the protesters, talking to the protesters, trying to emulate what John Lindsay did in 68 to keep the city calm, um, as, as an example? And uh, my second question is to... Um, uh, touch on your daughter's experience. I, I walked with the protesters from Barclays across the Manhattan Bridge last night. And when they arrived on Canal Street, they faced a, a wall of cops um, wearing uh, riot gear, carrying nightsticks. Uh, the crowd was subsequently divided up into sort of a series of smaller protests, some of which did grow violent. Nolan, what All is of your which question, my friend? What's your question? No, no, I, I, I gave you one question, Mr. Mayor, one of which was, you know, why weren't you out? The first one. What's your protesters? second one? What's your second? The, second? the second question is, the second question is, I wonder if everything that I've seen Saturday night and Sunday night doesn't meet sort of a common English definition of de-escalation, doesn't sort of meet a, a common English definition of what you would think community policing has has looked like. I wonder if you think the police in these instances have been too aggressive. Okay. And thank you. you that, and, and and to finish the question, Mr. Mayor. It's a long question, no little come on, brother. Mr. Mayor, it was a very serious weekend. I'm trying to like I know, but no, ask I questions. Respect I just, just give happened. me a question I can answer. Go ahead. I'm wondering if splitting, if, if the police tactics of splitting these large protests, which are fairly good at self-policing, into several smaller groups, hasn't helped to fuel some of this violence. Okay, good, good questions. I appreciate them. Well, obviously, these are questions that I ask all the time. The commissioner's asking. We're talking. Uh, the commissioner and I talked yesterday. Yeah. I'm not making it up. I think about 30 or 40 times in the course of the day. Um, We are asking these questions constantly. If we were dealing with traditional peaceful protest, everything would have been different. And we want to deal with traditional peaceful protest. And my hope, no one, is that more and more that is what's going to happen. I mean, look, people have made a very powerful point, but what we need is for the community to speak more and more and that's what we're seeing elected officials are speaking out, clergy. That is the essence of how we're going to make change. And peaceful protest is what has worked, and violent protest only comes with horrible unintended consequences, and it's the wrong thing to do unto itself. So the reason you saw a mix of different approaches is because you did have violent protesters mixed in, and that has been shown time and time again in these last days and all over the country. If we were dealing with, the commissioner and I have talked about this, I've been in a lot of protests as a protester. I've been there as an elected official. Commissioner has been there as a police officer. 
We have been to protests of 20,000 people, 50,000 people, 100,000 people, all peaceful, where the PD consistently stood back, let the peaceful protest move, simply protected everyone. That's what we believe in. That's what we want. That's not the hand we were dealt the last few days. And that's why there had to be also the ability to deal with those who were violent. So it is a balancing act the commissioner can speak to as well. Uh, clearly, you saw yesterday many police officers working to de-escalate and the community coming to the fore. And I think those are very positive trends. We want to deepen those trends. To the 1968 reality, it's not 1968. Uh, we're in a whole different reality. I constantly think about what is the right way to engage. And what I've found it is to work with community leaders who I'm talking to all the time to figure out what are the best actions we can take to address concerns about each protest. I'm monitoring each and every protest as they're unfolding. When I go somewhere, sometimes it's because I don't like the answers I'm getting and I go there to see for myself and to meet with the police leaders to talk about exactly what's going on. But it's not 1968. We're in a different environment. I think sometimes when a leader puts themselves in the middle of a situation, it actually exacerbates the situation. It doesn't address it when you're talking about a situation like this where there are different kinds of protesters. If we were dealing with community members, I was speaking to community members in central Brooklyn, I do that all the time throughout my life in public service. I'll do that all day long. But when you're dealing with folks who want disruption, who want to create something that will go on video and that becomes their cause to create uh, a visible disruption, I got to be smart about how I handle that. So we're conscious of this all the time. But in my conversations with community leaders, my conversations with community activists, people are working to address this problem at the grassroots, and that's what matters. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just say, uh, generally speaking, um, nothing would make us happier than uh, a, a large group uh, voicing their opinion safely. Um, that happened yesterday at the Barclay Center. There was a large number of people there for many, many hours. And I would describe it as not contentious at all. There were some police officers there. Uh, there was very little hostility at all, if at all. There was also police officers in reserves should things get out of hand, but it, thankfully it didn't come to that. There's another group in Brooklyn yesterday that I got to give them credit. I think they marched uh, halfway around the world. They, they <laughs> walked all over Brooklyn to Manhattan, back. Eventually they, they um, met up with the group at the Barclay Center and all of that was accommodated and that is generally speaking what we would like to happen. Again, peaceful. But we are also fluid and we also go by the conditions on the ground. And just yesterday, there were some occurrences that took place. I'll give you a couple examples where we had to either alter a route or, as you said, divide a route for safety reasons. We had one occurrence in Brooklyn where protesters were actually fighting with other protesters and it got dangerous. We had a very small number, a very small number during that march I described where people made their way into the march and through uh, objects at police officers. That caused some uh, alterations to the route. But again, if we can go in with a surgeon, like a surgeon and a scalpel and make a correction or make a, a couple of arrests and allow the larger group to continue, that's what we look to do. Um, so, and, and the last one I can think of off the top of my head is, we had an occurrence yesterday where people were trying to light fires and burn stores down and we cannot have a large protest moving towards that. So that's one of the situations you described. So uh, I think I would agree with you that we try to be as flexible as possible, let protests march, uh, exercise their right. Uh, that's what we all want. Overwhelmingly, it worked yesterday. We had very minor issues until it got dark yesterday. Amen. The next is Juliet from 1010 Winds. Uh, yes, good morning, Mr. Mayor, and good morning, Commissioner. Uh, my first question is for uh, Police Commissioner Shea and, uh, and then Mr. Mayor for you. Uh, Commissioner, how do you know who these outside agitators are? Uh, who are they? Where are they coming from? Are they identifiable in, in any way? And Mr. Mayor, um, you're calling the looting uh, not acceptable and will not be allowed. Is that the strongest language you can muster for people who are destroying cars and property and stealing merchandise in stores? 
Juliet, I'm not going to fall into the notion of I have to use a certain language that someone wants to hear bluntly. I'm just going to be real with you. And we're not going to allow it. It's illegal. It's wrong. And we're going to go deal with it. Uh, these folks have nothing to do with peaceful protest. What they're doing is criminal. So we're going to go deal with it. That's the bottom line. Commissioner, on the other question. Juliet, on the uh, Deputy Commissioner John Miller's comments yesterday, I think he briefed uh, members of the media yesterday. There are a number of ways that we look at this. We, we obviously have made some arrests, and we have the intelligence from those arrests, who was arrested. There's also a variety of open source um, advertisements, if you will, uh, that are put out uh, for the public to see. Um, some of this is not unique to this environment that we're in right now, unfortunately, where you have outside agitators coming in and trying to rally up people to do some bad things. That's done under the cloak of a greater cause. And, and again, this is what we're dealing with. It makes it a little bit difficult right now, but um, we are working with our federal partners. We're working with uh, local authorities and just trying to, number one, first and foremost, as we start everyone, uh, make sure that we don't have loss of life or, or we keep people safe. Then we quickly go to property. Uh, what we saw yesterday, we never want to see, and we're going to do everything we can to stop it, whether it's committed by somebody coming from outside or somebody within New York City. The next is Rosa from the city. Hi, uh, Mr. Mayor. So you're taking kind of a, a bad apples frame to violent behavior by police, that, that was your worst, and, and I think by protesters too. But there are more sort of systematic ways to think about how police handle protests. There's a whole body of literature on how the kind of uniforms people wear, whether they wear helmets or not, whether they split crowds, whether they're on bicycles as opposed to bringing SUVs onto the street, and how that influences what happens. Um, and so my question is for you and for the for Commissioner Shea, like, has the PD changed its model for crowd control in 20 years? What is the philosophy here? Does it need uh, updating or is this all kind of reactive uh, kind of individual responses? If you get my question. Yes. Yeah. No, Rose, that's a great question. I'll start and turn to the commissioner. There's a really good point you're making, and I appreciate in Nolan's question, too, about whether there are parts of the tactics that have the reverse impact. And I would say if we were dealing with consistently peaceful protest, it would be immediately clear that we do not want uh, riot gear. We do not want a large number of police officers. We want a de-escalation approach, just like we are showing in everyday policing. And I know that de-escalation training has had a huge impact on how police encounter a situation because we've seen uh, the reduction in gun discharges. We've seen the reduction in incidents that turn violent because of de-escalation strategies. And I think you're right also to say, even how police present themselves to the community, it is structural. It's not just about talking about bad apples. I agree with you. The culture of policing has to change. And that's what, at least from the policy level, we've been trying to do with the de-escalation training, with implicit bias training, with neighborhood policing, with a whole set of strategies that I think are being felt on the ground in many ways, but we got a lot more to do. I think when you're dealing with a protest that mixes a small number of dedicated violent protesters with a, a group of peaceful protesters, it creates a deep complexity that has to be addressed. The, we see it. Rosa, we see it. We have, I wish we didn't, but we have the examples of the violent protesters. We've seen their instructions to people of how to attack property, of how to bring weaponry with them. We've seen the weaponry that's been uh, recovered. It, we know there is a small subset doing this, and that changes the whole nature of the police approach. So. I think your question leads to a really powerful point. Are we trying to get to the day where it looks very different and when there's a protest and the amount of police, the look of the police, the approach of the police? Absolutely. And I think we were doing that in many ways. Recent protests I've been at, like uh, the climate strike, the police presence was very, very uh, subdued. But this one is just a different 
reality. Commissioner, you want to speak to it? Yeah, the short, the short answer is we, we evolve constantly. Um, from year, many years ago with our uh, disorder control unit to where we are with strategic response today, every element of what you said from uniforms to deployment to bicycles constantly changes and it is a fluid situation. I, I, think that, I think that many New Yorkers would be surprised at some of the reports that we get on a daily basis within the police department. Forget the current climate of what we're going through right now or even the months before with the pandemic. On an average day in New York City, you could have six protests that go off and many New Yorkers have no idea about that. And they go off flawlessly. Each one is evaluated daily. Um, and, and we work with the details that are in front of us. But we have certainly changed over the years and continue to and, and always look to learn, but it's, it's changed quite a bit. And we recognize exactly what you said, how we, how we line up, uh, how many officers we have, how are they dressed. All of these things are important and we look to do the best that we can. I will say to echo the mayor's words, be careful how you identify here. Um, it, the earlier question was, what did you know about this earlier? We had some intelligence, but how would it look also balancing out in this difficult time? If we told New Yorkers with this exact situation, don't come out, we think there's gonna be problems. Um, and I also don't think that that's anything new because we've had some of these agitators come out many times before, and I think the media is aware of that. I think ultimately, everyone is accountable for their own decisions here. And I think New Yorkers are wise beyond sure. anyone. And they know that we're in the midst of a protest uh, if something is amiss and if there are people looking to do bad things. I just ask, really I plead with people in that, in that circumstance. The last thing I want you to, to do is try to dissuade people from coming out, especially now, and, and voicing your concern. But also you have to be careful and be alert of what's going on around you. And, and if something doesn't look right, if you think people are planning something, please let the police know or please make sure you take care of yourself and keep yourself out of that dangerous situation. Thank you. The next is Andrew Siff from NBC. Hi, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Hope you're doing well. Good. How you doing, Andrew? I'm okay. Um, we're nearly an hour into this news conference and to my knowledge, no one has even mentioned the pandemic. So what I'm wondering is, first of all, do you have any concerns about all of these crowds gathering regardless of the purpose and regardless of the passion in terms of public health. I'd love it also if one of your public health experts who's on this call could answer as well. How much are you concerned that there will be a rise in COVID cases as a result of all of these crowds? And why have you not made public health statements over the last couple of days reminding people about social distancing? Yeah. Andrew, excellent questions. We've been talking about this. I don't think we have our public health folks on now, but they can certainly speak to it later. Uh, Andrew, this is, I have to say, and I want to just express this openly to everyone. Just a few days ago, what we were entirely focused on, all of us, was one of the greatest challenges this city has ever, ever faced, this pandemic, this, you know, painful, horrible crisis taking the lives of so many New Yorkers. When I was out in central Brooklyn yesterday, maybe I had, you know, 15, 20 conversations with just everyday people on the street. Overwhelmingly, people were talking about their concerns about their health, about their kids, about the fact they were running out of money or they had not gotten checks from the federal government. Some people, of course, raised concerns about criminal justice but most people are dealing with this crisis. They're scared. They're scared for their health. They're scared for their fa family's health. They're worried that they don't know where things are going with this coronavirus. That hasn't stopped. Andrew, I think the honest truth is we are dealing with, right in the middle of that, another absolutely unforeseen moment that's vast in its scale, that if it, you know, there had not been the coronavirus now, this last few days would stand out in American history uh, as a painful, profound moment. And you're seeing it happening literally in cities big and small. It looks like entirely all over the country. So I think we've got two almost you know, exact opposite realities, if you will, that are colliding at the same time. Now, the disparities 
pervade both. Let me hasten to say the disparities, the racism that is inherent in what happened with the pandemic is also inherent in all the concerns running through the policing debate. We've got to address them across the board. We've been trying to for years. We have to do a lot more. But to your central point, uh, it's very hard to say to people, you, you know, when there's such pain, there's such anger, that if you say, don't come out because of the pandemic, and I think that this is something we grapple with all the time, we don't want people to hear that as we are not hearing your concerns or your concerns are not valid or we don't have to change things. And it's a very tough balance. And again, this is happening on a, 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 such a painful, intense national scale. This is not like, a, before this we had small protests and I kept saying whatever, whether you're left, right or center, I wish people would stay home, not protest, do it virtually. But this moment is the outpouring of such pain and frustration, years and years, decades, generations of pain and frustration outpouring. This is a different reality. We've had to adapt to it. We've had to try and understand it and address it. And I am very worried about the health impact to the core of your question. I would urge everyone to think about this. And I do think that for those who have made their presence felt, made their voices heard, the safest thing from this point is to stay home, obviously, because we don't want people in close proximity to each other. We don't want people out there where they might catch this disease or spread this disease. Uh, and I think more and more people are from do I know that I and we will be your partner in rebuilding. We will not let our city be in shambles. When I appeared on the west side last October to announce our Invest Southwest initiative, 750 million city dollars that I committed to make sure that we were reversing the decades of neglect and lack of investment in these communities. My resolve was certain and clear. It is no less, no less now. And if anything, I'm even more determined because I know the need is even more great after what we've seen over the last 24 and 48 hours. We will rebuild and the city of Chicago government will lead those rebuilding efforts. We are not going to leave our neighborhoods behind. That will not happen on my watch. Now, I've heard some folks imply that police services and resources weren't distributed equally yesterday, or that somehow we chose to protect the downtown at the expense of the communities. Putting aside how deeply offensive that is for me as a black woman, for the superintendent as a black man, and these other officers of high rank who grew up in these neighborhoods and communities and proudly serve them every single day. The fact of the matter is exactly the opposite was true. The strategy yesterday was to add add more personnel and services to the neighborhoods on the south and west side. And that's what happened. The fact is that the violence that we saw and the looting that we saw spread like a wild fire. Let me just share with you how I know this to be true. Yesterday, the 911 center received 65,000 calls in one 24 hour period. And about 50,000 more than what you normally receive in a typical day. 50,000 more calls for service across the city. Of course, nothing is typical about these times. And to be clear, as the day wore on, every half hour, there were a thousand calls every 30 minutes. And in some periods, in the late afternoon and evening, those calls reach over 2,000 calls per 30 minute, all far exceeding 
normal call volumes. And between Friday and Sunday, there were over 10,000 calls for looting alone. Now the superintendent will speak more to what the specific deployments were and what we were seeing yesterday, but be clear, we, the police department, was responding to these calls as best they could with a significant amount of additional resources on the south and the west side. The challenge was, it was everywhere, everywhere. So if we had a police department three times the size, it would have been difficult to keep up with the calls for service yesterday. Now I know that's cold comfort, but I want to be clear that we didn't stand by and let the South and the West Side burn, as unfortunately some people are propagating. That's just simply not true. This is an all hands on deck moment, and not just for law enforcement, but for all of city government, but also for all of you. As we've been saying over the last couple days, we need all people of goodwill, from the faith community, from community leaders, to stand up and rise with us and not allow the criminal element to overwhelm the hard work and sacrifice of so many all over the city. We can't allow that to happen and we will not allow that to happen we will come together as a community linked arm in arm fates join together to make sure that we speak with one voice that in chicago we will stand strong and united together i want to talk a little bit about the specifics that what residents can expect today there will be street closures along commercial neighborhoods and designated hotspots so that we can allow for businesses to be boarded up, debris to be cleaned. And we will do that in conjunction with ward superintendents and aldermen. In respect to our public transit, our citywide CTA train and bus service resumed earlier this morning. However, we will continue to bypass uh, stops located near the central business district. Residents, employees, in need of the latest transit information can visit the CTA's website, transitchicago.com. Now, Dr. Artie will also provide details on this in a moment, but I ask her to be here to specifically speak to the other danger that we cannot lose sight of, and that is the fact that what we have seen over these last few days is people abandoning the very public health guidance, social distancing, staying home, that we have taken and made progress during the midst of this pandemic. I said this before and I'll say it again. COVID-19 has not disappeared from Chicago. It is very much our present. And we worry about the thousands of people that have been out in the streets over the last few days Please, in exercising your First Amendment rights, or if you were out for any other reason, you have now put yourself at risk. And we need you to isolate yourself. We need you to think about and be conscious of whether or not you are experiencing any signs or symptoms of COVID-19. God forbid that we see a spike that overwhelms our healthcare resources, just as we saw light at the end of the tunnel. But we need now to be careful and to take precautions, and Dr. Artie will speak more to that in a moment. I want to take this moment again to applaud the men and women of the Chicago Police Department and the men and women of the Chicago Fire Department. Bodies are weary, people are tired, but you've been doing heroic work. Now, there have been some reports of misconduct on a part of our personnel, and if that is so, 
we will investigate and we will get to the bottom of it. We will not spare any resource to do so. And if you believe that you've been mistreated by the police, I urge you to file a, a complaint. You can reach COPA, Civilian Office of Police Accountability, by dialing 311. We are not going to abandon our values around police reform and accountability and holding officers responsible. The superintendent has said it multiple times. Now is the time for us to double down on our training around constitutional policing and understanding that respectful constitutional engagement with the people we are all sworn to serve is the most powerful tool beyond your gun and your badge. And I believe in my heart that the vast majority of police officers understand that. But if someone has crossed the line, we will hold them accountable, even in this moment. No excuses. I also want to thank the call takers and dispatchers and police and fire that have been handling these unprecedented volumes with tremendous calm and grace. They are often the unsung heroes of our first responders, and I want to make sure that they get their due. They hear your stress. They hear your trauma, and they take that home with them. So the fact that they are managing and doing their job in these unprecedented times is something we cannot lose sight of. I want to thank the streets and sanitation workers. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern question of closing, opening, countries have gone through this before. There is a body of knowledge to know, and uh, where we also go to global experts who we've enlisted who have gone through this with other countries where they closed, they opened, they got into trouble, they had to close again. Uh, but uh, they're looking at it now. We want to make sure they get the latest data. We'll have a final announcement later this afternoon for Western New York. but. Uh, the conversations I've had with them are all good, and we expect Western New York to go to phase two tomorrow. The Capital District region is uh, moving to go into phase two on Wednesday. Again, all the numbers look good there. Uh, we're going to run them by our global team to make sure they are as good as we think they are. But uh, at this point, the capital region is also on track to go into phase two on Wednesday. Uh, what we have done with this COVID virus is a really amazing accomplishment, if you take a step back. And it was all done by the people of this state. They did it. 19 million people did what they never did before. They responded with a level of determination and discipline that uh, I was amazed with, frankly. Uh, and I am a lifelong New Yorker, but what they did uh, was unlike anything I've seen. Remember where we were. We had 800 people die in one day. We had the worst situation in the United States of America. At one point, we had the worst situation on the globe. And we're now reopening in less than 50 days. Now, it was a long 50 days. Uh, I can recount every one of them. But we went from a really internationally terrible situation to where we're talking about reopening today. Even New York City, where we're planning to reopen uh, June 8th. And that was just 50 days. The whole closure period has been about 93 days. Uh, yes, it was a disruptive 93 days. I know. But look at what we did in 93 days. We went from the worst situation on the globe to actually reopening. That's where we are. We should be very proud of what we've done. Just don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory.
we're talking about reopening in one week in New York City. And now we're seeing these mass, mass gatherings over the past several nights that could, in fact, exacerbate the COVID-19 spread. We spent all this time closed down, locked down, masked, socially distanced. And then you turn on the TV and you see these mass gatherings that uh, could potentially be infecting hundreds and hundreds of people after everything that we have done. We have to take a minute and ask ourselves, what are we doing here? What are we trying to accomplish? We had protests across the state that continued last night. They continued across the nation. Uh, upstate, we worked with the cities very closely. The state police did a great job. We had uh, basically a few scattered arrests upstate New York, but the uh, local governments did a great job. The people did a great job. Uh, law enforcement did a great job. The protesters uh, were responsible. And uh, it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either, upstate. And I said from day one, I share the outrage, and I stand with the protesters. You look at that video of the killing of an unarmed man, Mr. Floyd, it is horrendous, horrendous. It's frightening. It, it perverts everything you believe about this country. It does. And there's no excuse for it. And no right-minded American would make an excuse for it. So protest, yes. Frustrate, be frustrated, yes. Outraged, yes, of course. And is there a larger problem? Of course. It's not just Mr. Floyd. It goes back, there are 50 cases that are just like Mr. Floyd. We've had them here in New York City. What's different, the difference between Mr. Floyd and Amadou Diallo? Or Abner Lawima? or Eric Garner. What is the difference? What have we learned? Nothing? So yes, we should be outraged. And yes, there's a bigger point to make. It is uh, abuse by police. But it's something worse. It is racism. It is discrimination. It is fundamental inequality and injustice. My father spoke about it in 1984 in a speech called The Tale of Two Cities. People still talk about it. The point of The Tale of Two Cities is there's two Americas, two sets of rules, two sets of outcomes, two sets of expectations. And it's true. It was true then. It's true now. Look at our prisons and tell me there's not inherent injustice in society. Look at public housing. Tell me there's not inherent injustice. Look at what happened with this COVID infection rate nationwide. More African Americans infected, more African Americans dead proportionately than white Americans. Of course, this chronic institutionalization, institutionalized discrimination, there is no doubt. There is no doubt. And there's no doubt that it's been going on for a long time and people are frustrated and it has to be corrected and it has to be corrected now. And there's no doubt that this nation, as great as it is, has had the continuing sin of discrimination. From before the nation was formed and it started with slavery and it has had different faces over the decades, but it is still the same sin. That is true. That is true. So let's use this moment as a moment of change. Yes. When does change come? When the stars align and society focuses and the people focus and they focus to such an extent that the politicians follow the people. 
That's when change comes. Well, the leaders lead. Baloney. The people lead. And then the politicians see the people moving, and the politicians run to catch up with the people. How did we pass marriage equality in this state? Giving a new civil right to the LGBTQ community. Because the, po the people said enough is enough. How can you say only heterosexual people can marry, but the LGBTQ community, they can't marry? How is that constitutional? How is that legal? You have your own preference, God bless you. But how in the law do you discriminate between two classes of people? We passed marriage equality. After the Sandy Hook massacre, all those years we tried to pass common sense gun safety. Do you really need an assault weapon to kill a deer? But then the Sandy Hook massacre happened, and the people said, enough. You're killing children, young children in schools with an assault weapon in the Sandy Hook massacre? Enough. And in that moment, we passed common sense gun safety in the state of New York. Record income inequality. People said enough and passed a real minimum wage in this state that went all across the nation. There's a moment for change. And is there a moment here? Yes. If we're constructive and if we're smart and if we know what we're asking for. It's not enough to come out and say, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. OK. And what? Well, I don't know, but I'm angry and I'm frustrated. And you want what done? You need the answer. Well, I want common sense gun reform. OK, what does it look like? Here it is, three points. Well, I want to address income inequality. OK, what do you want? Here's what I want. Minimum wage of $15, free college tuition. What do you want? You want to make that moment work. Yes, you express the outrage. But then you say, and here's my agenda. Here's what I want. That's what we have to be doing in this moment. And the protesters are making a point, And most of them are making a smart, sensible point. But you have to add the positive reform agenda that every voice calls for so the government, the politicians, know what to do. And there is a positive reform agenda here. There should be a national ban on excessive force by police officers. There should be a national ban on chokeholds, period. There should be independent investigations of police abuse. When you have the local district attorney doing the investigation, I don't care how good they are. There is the suggestion of a conflict of interest. Why? Because that DA works with that police department every day. And now that prosecutor is going to do the investigation of the police department that they work with every day? Conflict of interest can be real or perceived. How can people believe that the local prosecutor who works with that police department is going to be fair in the investigation? And it shouldn't be state by state. Minnesota Governor Waltz put the attorney general in charge. Good. In this state, I put the attorney general in charge of investigations where police kill an unarmed person. Good. But it shouldn't be the exception. It should be the rule. There is no self-policing. There's an allegation, independent investigation. Give people comfort that the investigation is real. If a police officer is being investigated, how is their disciplinary records not relevant? Once a police officer is being investigated, if they have disciplinary records that show this was a repeat pattern, how is that not relevant? And by the way, the disciplinary records can also be used to exonerate. If they have disciplinary records that say he never, she never did anything like this before, 
fine. That's relevant too. We still have two education systems in this country. Everybody knows it. Your education is decided by your zip code. Poorer schools and poorer communities have a different level of funding than richer schools. In this state, $36,000 per year we spend in a rich district, $13,000 in a poor district. How do you justify that? If anything, the children in a poorer community need more services in a school, not less. How do you justify that? You can't. Do something about it. You still have children living in poverty in this nation, where when we had to, we found a trillion dollars to handle the COVID virus. But you can't find funding to help children who live in poverty? No, you can find it, United States. You just don't want to. It's political will. When you need to find the money, you can find it. Let's be honest, the federal government has a printing press in their basement. When they have the political will, they find the money. The federal government went out of the housing business and never re-entered it. We have a national affordable housing crisis. Of course you do. You don't fund affordable housing. I'm the former HUD secretary. I know better than anyone what the federal government used to do in terms of affordable housing with Section 8 and building new public housing. And we just stopped. And we left it to the market, and now you have an affordable housing plan. That's what we should be addressing in this moment. And we should be saying to our federal officials, there's, a, there's an election this year, a few months away. Here's my agenda. Where do you stand? Say to the Congress, the House and the Senate, where's your bill on this? I heard some congressional people talking, saying, well, maybe they'll do a resolution. Yeah, resolutions are nice. Resolutions say, in theory, I support this. Pass a law. That's what we want, a law that actually changes the reality, where something actually happens. That's government's job is to actually make change. Make change. You're in a position to make change. Make change. Use this moment to galvanize public support. Use that outrage to actually make a change and have the intelligence to say what changes you actually want. Otherwise, it's just screaming into the wind if you don't know exactly what changes we need to make. And we have to be smart in this moment. The violence in these protests obscures the righteousness of the message. The people who are exploiting the situation, the looting, that's not protesting. That's not righteous indignation. That's criminality. And it plays into the hands of the people and the forces that don't want to make the changes in the first place. Because then they get to dismiss the entire effort. I'll tell you what they're going to say. They're going to say the first thing the president said when this happened. He, they're going to say, these are looters. Remember when the president put out that incendiary tweet? We start shooting when they start looting, or they start looting, we start shooting. That's an old 60s uh, uh, call. The violence, the looting, the criminality plays right into those people who don't want progressive change. And you mark my words, they're going to say today, oh, you see, they're criminals. They're looters. Did you see what they did, breaking the store windows and going in and stealing? And they're going to try to paint this whole protest movement that they're all criminals, they're all looters. That's what they're going to do. Why? Because they don't want to talk about Mr. Floyd's death. 
They don't want people seeing that video. They want people seeing the video of the looting. And when people see the video of the looting, they say, oh, yeah, they're, that's scary. They're criminals. No. Look at the video of the police officer killing Mr. Floyd. That's the video we want people watching. Now, I don't even believe it's the protesters. I believe there are people who are using this moment and using the protest for their own purpose. There are people who want to sow the seeds of anarchy, who want to disrupt. By the way, there are people who want to steal. And here's a moment that you can use this moment to steal. You can use this moment to spread chaos. I hear the same thing from all the local officials. They have people in their communities who are there to quote unquote protest. They're not from their community. They don't know where they're from. Extremist groups. Some people are going to blame the left. Some people will blame the right. It'll become politicized. But there's no doubt there are outside groups that come in to disrupt. There is no doubt that there are people who just use this moment to steal. Why, is it coincidence that they broke into a Rolex watch company? That was a coincidence? High-end stores? Chanel? That was a coincidence? That was random? That was not random. So can you have a legitimate protest movement hijacked? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And there are people and forces who will exploit that moment. And I believe that's happening. But we ha still have to be smart. And at the same time, we have a fundamental issue, which is we just spent 93 days limiting behavior, closing down, no school, no business, Thousands of small businesses destroyed. People will have lost their jobs. People wiped out their savings. And now, mass gatherings with thousands of people in close proximity? One week before we're going to reopen New York City? What sense does this make? Control the spread, control the spread, control the spread. We don't even know the consequence for the COVID virus of those mass gatherings. We don't even know. We won't know possibly for weeks the nature of the virus. How many super spreaders were in that crowd? Well, they were mostly young people. How many young people went home and kissed their mother hello or shook hands with their father or hugged their father or their grandfather or their grandmother or their brother or their sister and spread a virus? New York City opens next week. It took us 93 days to get here. Is this smart? New York tough. We went from the worst situation to reopening. From the worst situation to 54 deaths in 50 days. We went from the worst situation to reopening in 93 days. We did that because we were New York tough. New York tough was smart. We were smart. We were smart for 93 days. We were united. We were respectful of each other. We were disciplined, wearing the mask. It's just discipline. It's just discipline. Remembering to put it on, remembering to pick it up, remembering to 
put it on when you see someone. It's just discipline. But it was also about love. We did it because we love one another. It's what a community is. We love one another. And yes, you can be loving even in New York, even with the New York toughness, even with the New York accent, even with the New York swagger. We're loving. And that's what we've done for 93 days in a way we've never done it before. Never in my lifetime. Never in my lifetime has this city and this state come together in the way we have. I don't think it ever will again in my lifetime. Now you can say maybe it takes a global pandemic for it to happen. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. And I don't know that the power of what it was like when it came together might not be so beautiful that people want to do it again. Remember when we all acted together during coronavirus and we rallied and we knocked coronavirus on its rear end. Remember when we all wore masks and we all had that hand sanitizer? Remember what we did? Wow. When we come together, we can do anything. And it's true. It's true for our state. It's true for our nation. When you come together and you have one agenda, you can do anything. You want to change society? You want to end the tale of two cities? You want to make it one America? You can do that. Just the way you, you knocked coronavirus on its rear end. People united can do anything. We showed that. We just showed that the past 93 days. We can end the injustice and the discrimination and the intolerance and the police abuse. We have to be smart. And we have to be smart right now. Right now in this state. And we have to be smart tonight in this city. Because this is not advancing a reform agenda. This is not persuading government officials to change. This is not helping end coronavirus. We have to be smart. Questions? Governor, do you think this is, the NYPD tactics have in any way exacerbated tensions here? I think you'd probably agree things hit a new level with the widespread looting we saw last night. Have you lost confidence in the city's ability to handle this crisis? There's obviously not a communication that's effective between the protesters and the NYPD. Do you need to call in the National Guard, impose a curfew? And secondly, do you think the repeal of 50A will go a long way toward healing? Uh, a few things, Zach. Uh, first, I think this has been counterproductive for New York City in many ways. Uh, we're battling the coronavirus. Uh, we had a lot of people who are New York City people move out during this. We're one week away from reopening. We're looking to revitalize New York City, uh, get people back, get businesses back. We're going forward. Uh, what they saw on TV the past couple of nights is not helpful to that, number one. Uh, number two, in terms of how New York City is handling it, uh, you're right, there was looting, there was criminality. People have seen that. Uh, that's very destructive on a number of levels. As I said, it uh, reduces the credibility of the protests in the first place. It will allow the critics to now say they're all criminals and uh, uh, try to color the whole protest with the looting to, uh, to change the image from the real issue, which was Mr. Floyd's death, to now the looting. Uh, the critics will do that. They'll start today, uh, full-throated. We haven't articulated what the protests are about besides just unhappiness, outrage. We haven't said this is what we want done. 
government, this is what we want, here is the agenda. Uh, that's all true. The, I'm going to be speaking to the mayor today about a curfew. Uh, we've done it in other cities. Uh, in New York, it has worked better. Curfew is not a silver bullet, by the way. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, last night was not good. So uh, what can we do differently? What can we do better? I'm going to speak to the mayor about a curfew. We have the National Guard on standby. Uh, I've told mayors all across the state that I can call out the National Guard. Uh, New York City should have enough personnel with the NYPD. It's one of the largest police forces uh, in the country. Uh, and it's uh, taxpayers pay a lot of money for the NYPD. Uh, I don't know that it's a manpower, person power issue. But if it is, we have the National Guard who are also <laughs> trained to do this. Uh, I think some of the actions of the NYPD have exacerbated the anger. Uh, there are videos of some NYPD actions that are very disturbing. Uh, there are videos of NYPD cars driving into a crowd that are very disturbing, pulling a mask down off a person to pepper spray them, throwing a woman to the ground. It's on video. It's on video. The looting is on video, yeah. So is uh, NYPD activity on video. Uh, I asked the Attorney General for a report. I want that report done 30 days from when I asked her, just two days ago. Uh, but uh, I'm going to speak to the mayor about, uh, in the meantime, what is the response to those police actions on video, right? doesn't mean you have to send the police officer out there tomorrow after these actions. I understand we have to review them. I understand the law. Uh, you know, if I was just Andrew Cuomo from Queens, it would be simple. I would say that guy should be fired. Drives the car into a crowd, he should be fired. That's what Andrew Cuomo in Queens says. As governor, there's law, there's processes, there's going to be lawsuits. I get it. So the attorney general review, yes. But it doesn't mean you do nothing in the interim. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking to the mayor about that. Uh, but there's no doubt that this situation uh, has done a lot of damage on a lot of levels and has not advanced the cause of the protesters, which I agree with. I believe, look, you've watched my administration. I am frustrated perpetually by how difficult it is to make changes. I am perpetually frustrated about how hard it is to get that political machine, that governmental machine, to turn. It's like a big freighter coming down the river. And you can take the rudder and turn it all the way to one side, but the freighter has such a mass in and of itself that it just continues on its course and slowly starts to turn. I battle that every day. So, I look for moments where the people can actually rise up to make changes so the government officials say, oops, we better do something. Oops. Because the easiest thing to do is always nothing. It's the easiest thing to do. The old expression, the legislator who does nothing does nothing wrong, right? Every action on a big problem is controversial. It's easier to do nothing. Then you don't get criticized. And when they say, well, why did you do this? Well, I wanted to, but I couldn't because. So I look for moments to overcome the inertia, to overcome the status quo. Marriage equality, guns, minimum wage. You, Every one of those things they talked about for decades. But 
when the people rose up, I was there to use the power of the people. I believe there's a moment here to use the power of the people to get things done. So I said from day one, I'm with them. I am with them. But that, even that has to be smart, right? Uh, you remember how we, we focused people on passing gun reform and what the bill actually looked like, right? Because the, de the devil's in the details. You have to write a bill. What do you mean gun reform? What is gun reform to you? Okay, we're mad about Mr. Floyd. We should be. And we're la mad about the whole litany. We should be. And here's what we want, X, Y, Z. We have not been effective targeting the popular energy. And we should be. So I'm frustrated at that. And then I believe you're going to have people who don't want change. So they're going to look to distract and discredit this moment. And the looting and those things will play right into their hands. Because this will all become about looters now. This will become, they'll try to make it all about criminality. Which I don't, which I believe was a perversion of the protest. I believe there are outside people who exploited the opportunity of the protest. Because look, all across the state, we had uh, police officers taking a knee in unity with the protesters. By the way, there is no police officer who is going to defend what happened to Mr. Floyd. They're not. And there is no police officer who doesn't want to have a good relationship with the community. And if there is, there shouldn't be a police officer. It's that simple. But this was just negative. It was not advancing a positive reform agenda. It was bad for the city. It was bad in the efforts to battle COVID. It was bad for our efforts to be ramping up towards the reopening, right? I said last week, this week was about focusing on the hospitals, focusing on the hotspot areas in the outer borough, and start ramping up the MTA for the reopening. Here we are. We're coming back. Celebrate the accomplishment. What a beautiful accomplishment. We don't even appreciate how beautiful it is because we're not really there yet. But when you get on the other side of this, when you start to reopen next week and you look back, we handled the global pandemic in the, one of the most dense cities that had the highest number of infections, 100 days. And you know, in retrospect, the 100 days doesn't even look that long, right? Three months. Now, going through it, it was hell. Get it? I've been in hell. We've all been in hell. But in retrospect, global pandemic, 100 days in this city with this diversity, beautiful. I have a Sith. question about uh, the, the risk of uh, new COVID cases as a result of these gatherings, and maybe we can get Dr. Zucker to weigh in as well. Is it mitigated at all by the fact that these folks are outdoors? And if you don't see a spike in a couple of weeks after all of these people out there, does that perhaps tell you something that Italian doctors have begun to speculate on, that in some small way COVID has become a tiny bit less lethal? I'll ask the doctor to answer, but let me just... The outside is a, is a good fact. The younger people is a good fact. The best fact is we have already gotten the infection rate down. See, that's the best fact. The best fact is we did 50,000 tests yesterday with only 1,000 positives. So a few, a lower percentage of those people out there last night were infected. If that happened 60 days ago, Andrew, forget it. Because more people would have been infected. 
and we're going through it this morning. The only good news is, with that low infection rate, there were not that many people infected. And, in a really cruel irony, many of them were actually wearing masks. But, Dr. Irvine. I would echo the governor's words that the infection rate is down, but, but as much as uh, we say that we support peaceful protests, um, the bottom line is we do want to push the public health message that people should wear masks as the people were wearing masks, that they should try to social distance they, themselves as much as possible. And uh, as much as the uh, emotions are high, we as the government has said we need to be smart. And being smart means uh, hand sanitizer, keeping a distance, and doing the best you can uh, to uh, socially distance. Do you expect to see a spike based on the images you've seen? I, I'm concerned about that, and we're going to track those numbers because when you gather a lot of people together, as we've always said, uh, that is a concern. So we're looking at this, and we're going to keep a very uh, a close eye on every day. Governor, Governor if, we, if we see infections go up, it seems like people are done with distancing the masks. You go out, you see it. Can you go back? And what concerns do you have about that? Can you go back? Yes. Many places have gone back. That's why we use these global experts. You know, what they keep saying to me is uh, there are many, many, many examples of opening too fast, and not just opening too fast, but the discipline comes down. And I'm talking about the public. I understand what you're saying. The, there are many examples of that. And if you start to overwhelm the hospitals again, you have to close again. You can't allow, what is the, where were we that was the real danger point? People dying because they don't get medical attention. That was the Italy situation. You die on a gurney in a hallway because the doctors and the nurses are too busy. It overwhelmed the hospital system. That's what we were looking at. We were in danger of overwhelming the health system. If that happens, you have to close again. You'd have to. Well, people won't listen. Well, you know, then you'd have a phenomenal death rate and an international uh, crisis. Now, again, the only good news is the infection rate was already so low. You know, we wouldn't be reopening next Monday. We're one week from reopening. If this had to happen, this was the best time for it to happen since this whole thing has started because the infection rate is down. Second positive factor is they were younger people. You know, there were not a lot of 65-year-olds in the crowd, the best I could tell. Uh, but those are two positive factors. And many people were wearing masks, which was also a positive factor. So those are the positives. Would you suggest people not go out and protest? No, I think you can protest, but do it smartly and intelligently, and many places have. You know, you look at places around the country, there were protests all across the country. Protest, just be smart about it. With this virus, you can do many things now as long as you're smart about it. Right? You can reopen. You can go into a store. You can do a lot of things. Just be smart. So what's the difference between protesting and a business, say, in the city who wants to reopen smartly if it's not at the phase yet that they're technically allowed to? Well, that's where we're at. But it has to be a business where you can be smart. Be smart meaning socially distant. Uh, you don't conduct business in a way where you have people within six feet. You have to wear the mask. You have to do the hand sanitizer. That's where we're going to be. So is that okay then for businesses in the city? To, if well, they we're can starting in phase one because, remember, you have congregate situations that you have to account for. It's not that people come from a helicopter and go into a business, right? People get on a bus. People get on a subway. People are on a sidewalk. That's where all these things are difficult. If you could just parachute into a business on Fifth Avenue, it'd be a different story. So follow up on the Friday briefing, you said that we don't have a public 
hospital system, and then you announced the surgeon flex approach. If you can um, elaborate that, since we have the commissioner here, and also a follow up on the uh, the community, Albanian American community is interested in the medical data, more specifically the death number of Albanians in the state. If you have that, I appreciate it. Yes, you did say that Friday. Did we get that number yet? So it's actually not broken out that way. The, the way the hospitals report, they, per, they report Caucasian, African American, Hispanic, Asian, and other. What we've asked the health department to do following your question on Friday is a way, is if there's a way to go back and discuss with the specific hospitals and see if there's a way to break down that number further. And we're working on that right now. The, in terms of the hospitals, people didn't under, this is one of the lessons, right? Lessons learned from this terrible situation. Our public health system, we all talk about a public health system. Yeah, except there really is no public health system. Where is the public health system? Well, the hospitals. Hospitals are not a public health system. The mayor talks about a public health system because there is a system called H&H, &H, Health and Hospitals, which are 11 hospitals in New York City. Those are 11 public hospitals that the city runs. Though the 11 hospitals that the mayor controls are nowhere near the ability to manage a health problem in the city. There are 100 hospitals in the New York City area but they're private, and they've never really worked together. You know, NYU Langone is one hospital, Columbia Presbyterian is another hospital, Northwell is another hospital, and they're separate hospitals. They don't share patients, they don't share material, they don't share resources, they're separate individual hospitals. <coughs> what we were forced to do because when you have a public health crisis, let's say New York City, you can't just say to those 11 hospitals, you handle it. Those 11 hospitals are uh, battling every day just to deal with they deal with what they deal with. The first crisis we had was at Elmhurst, which was one of the public hospitals. We need those 100 private hospitals. Now, they're technically regulated by the state, but the state has never said to those private hospitals, I need you to respond to a public crisis and I need you to allow us to coordinate operation of your hospital. That never happened before. We institute, instituted that immediately in the middle of this situation. After we saw some hospitals getting overwhelmed, right? Elmhurst gets overwhelmed as a hospital. All right, Elmhurst. First, there are 10 other public hospitals. How do we distribute patients among those 10 publics? And if the publics can't handle it, because there's only 11, then we have to figure out how to get these 100 privates to actually operate as a system. That's what we call surge and flex. First, I said to all of them, you all have to increase your capacity 50%. They said, what? I said, yes. You have to increase your capacity 50%. You have 100 hospital beds, you have to have 150. That was the surge. And then we increased the capacity, then we said to them, and by the way, when one of you gets overwhelmed, or one of you doesn't have the staff, or one of you doesn't have the PPE, or one of you doesn't have enough reagents, we're going to share among and coordinate among all 100 private hospitals. And by the way, those 11 publics also. That had never been done before. And when you talk about a worst case scenario, worst case scenario is you exceed your hospital capacity what is your hospital capacity? Your hospital capacity is theoretically, if you maximize all 100 hospitals and shifted the patient <coughs> burden so they were all at 100%. And 
every hospital was at 100% capacity. That's your maximum capacity. That had never been thought of. And that's what we developed during the coronavirus, but we did it very quickly. And we're now codifying that and refining that. Because it's also very disruptive to the private hospitals. Governor, you said you're going to be discussing with the mayor the possibility of curfew. Can you clarify whether that's something you actually are inclined to support uh, and forward? And likewise, you said uh, the National Guard is, is somewhat on standby. Uh, as you assess the situation here over the past few nights, uh, the way those, those tactics have, have worked or not worked in Minneapolis and elsewhere, uh, can you give us more of a sense of, of you know, what you need to see uh, and what, what you plan to, to activate when? Look, I think Governor Walls uh, in Minneapolis did a good job last night. I think they got caught initially, which is understandable. Uh, but I think he did a good job. The uh, many cities use a curfew. Again, it's people will argue both ways. Uh, but my basic point is last night was bad, right? Uh, the criminality, the looting was the most egregious. The people exploiting the circumstance. Uh, there is an anger, because I hear about it, from people who say, uh, we saw the police officer on tape uh, in Minneapolis. We have police officers in New York City who didn't do anything like what we've seen other police officers do, but it's seriously questionable behavior. Uh, the video of the car driving into the crowd, the video of the paper, uh, pepper spray after removing the mask, the woman getting thrown, that is uh, apparently egregious conduct and nothing has been done. Now, I feel comfortable saying the Attorney General is looking at it and we'll get a report and if, and it's only 30 days, this is not kick the can. And if that report says, whatever that report says, I will do, right? Uh, but in the interim, nothing has been done. I get that too. And I'm going to speak to the mayor about that. The National Guard we have on standby. They are trained to do this. But I don't know that it's a person power issue in New York City. In uh, Minneapolis, it was a person power. They just don't have a police force large enough to handle it. Uh, I don't know that that is the situation. I don't know that the NYPD isn't big enough. Uh, I don't think that's the problem. But are you inclined to, to uh, ask for or to strongly suggest a curfew or, or Look, curfew I could impose a curfew. You could? Yeah, legally I can impose a curfew. Uh, so I'm not at that point, uh, but I know something has to be done because last night was not acceptable and the night before was not acceptable on any level. Okay, quick follow up on, on 50A and just to clarify your position, whether you support amending it, uh, repealing it altogether. Uh, the mayor said they want to, uh, mayor and then YPD said they want to uh, amend it, but sort of maintain some of the 50A restrictions on access to disciplinary records. Reformers say the state essentially it can already sufficiently shield uh, officers' personal information. Uh, what's, what's your position? Amend, appeal, leave alone? Look, my position is what I said in a council's letter to New York City and the other local governments. I don't believe today 50A stops them from releasing disciplinary records. Today, I don't believe the law does it. I said to the mayors across the city, 50A does not stop you from releasing disciplinary records. I said that to every mayor. They, I gave them a legal opinion that said the law doesn't apply. Now, if a mayor wanted to release the records, you know what they would do? Release the records and say, I have a governor's council opinion that says the law doesn't say I can't release them. That's what a governor, that's what any mayor would do, right? Mayors all day long take positions against my interpretation of the law. Here, I said, the law doesn't say that. Release the records. They haven't released the records because politically they don't want to. 
because the police don't want the records released, which I understand their position. But if a person is being investigated, you're not going to tell me what their past disciplinary uh, results were? And by the way, if they're not bad, then release them to help the person and exonerate the person. But I don't believe the law ever stopped the mayor from releasing it. I believe politically they didn't want to. So now, use the moment. Uh, either release the records because the law doesn't stop you, or if that's not enough, then the legislature, legislature should repeal the law. If it's not a man, if it's not a man. By the way, excuse me one second. Remember, New York City used to release the records with the same law. The law didn't change. How did you used to be able to do it with 50A, but now all of a sudden you can't do it because of 50A? Or how does that make any sense? I did it for many years, and 50A was in existence. Then all of a sudden they decided they can't do it because of 50A. I give them a legal opinion that says you can do it just like you used to do it, and the law doesn't stop it. Come on. If it's, if it's not manpower, what is it then? It sounds like you're questioning police tactics. And that's what I want to talk to the mayor about. If you think they've been up to the task. I think what happened last night was not good. I think some of the police activity on videos have inflamed uh, the community. I believe uh, the protesters have been infiltrated by people with their own motives, and the protests have been exploited. Uh, there's criminality that some people have uh, used this moment to pursue. So there's a lot going on. But uh, I understand that. But we have to do something different because this is not acceptable. If you do impose a curfew, how exactly is that enforced? And then what is your message to these businesses who they've been destroyed the last few nights, to them and to New Yorkers who don't feel safe, even police officers who said this is like a war zone I've never experienced? Yeah, this. that's why it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for anyone. It's not acceptable for anyone. So it's not, there are no sides here. Last night was bad for everyone. It was bad for business owners. It was bad for the police. It's bad for the community. It's bad for everyone. And it accomplishes nothing because we're losing the moment. And we're not even making the political point that the protesters want to make, which is a good point. Tale of two cities. My father said in 1984, this is 20. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. So. National Guard, State Patrol, police departments, sheriff's departments, as well as those who are out there making sure we maintain utilities and, and everything else. Um, also, speaking of and watching yesterday, uh, the whole nature of why we do these things is to allow for that peaceful expression. We saw large, peaceful protests focusing on the systemic changes that get to the heart of why we're in this situation. And when I say we, Minneapolis-St. Paul, the state of Minnesota, nationally, and as we've seen over the last 24 hours, internationally, a society that does not put equity and inclusion at the center of it is certainly going to uh, eventually uh, come to the places where we're at. Uh, this is a moment of inflection. It's a moment of real change. It's a moment that those folks who are out there demanding this are, are not going to take a, a commission or a report. Um, they're going to want fundamental change. And, and that is what I think, uh, that's one of the exciting things in the midst of all this. You can feel a sense of optimism coming back. Um, I, I just want to say, you, you'll hear from some of the things in the updates where we're at. I don't want to paint a picture that this is over, but I do want to paint a picture that I think we as Minnesotans have regrounded ourselves in the values that we care about. It looks to me like there's a clear delineation between the folks who are rightfully pained and angered 
wanting to see change and expressing it in lawful ways and what we witnessed on several days earlier in the week, those that are bent on wanton destruction of the very communities that are most pained. I think as citizens, as, uh, as residents of Minnesota, we can continue to maintain that. And this gives us a space now for, for a time of unprecedented opportunity to address things that have been around in, in many cases, decades or since the founding or prior to that. Uh, so in moving forward and in that light, I want to talk a little bit about the posture we're in, um, in terms of, uh, of law enforcement and on, on the streets. I signed an executive order in consultation and leadership with the mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We will be extending the curfew for two days, but the times will change. It will go from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And one of the reasons in this is, is, is Minnesotans have taken charge of this. The only way these things work is what we've seen the last two nights. The vast majority of people abide by this. Those that not are able to uh, to address this. I do want to mention something. Uh, some of you witnessed this on on many of your stations and live TV. Um, there were protesters that that stayed out past the curfew. I think in some cases because of the tragic uh, near miss with the truck, it disrupted some of their schedules. Some of them, I think, were very intent on going home and doing that because it was very clear. Uh, they were articulating very clearly a uh, peaceful right to demonstrate, but they also understood once they got out past that time, um, the interaction with the police that some of you witnessed, a, and it was, uh, it was gratifying, I think, to see how citizens approached it and how um, our law enforcement approached it. The very humanized way, the very orderly way that people were processed and treated and some of the interactions between the two to understand each other. Um, was for me the way I think people expect to be expect this to happen. So um, that curfew will will go in place. We'll also think about the strategic uh, levels of what we have. I will have uh, General Jensen will be speaking about a transition to um, our National Guard troops back to their homes and their jobs because that's what they are. They take time out of their jobs, and many of them will be going back. Some of them working as news reporters. Some of them working as camera operators, some of them working as teachers. Uh, that will begin to, to happen, and that will be done, as General Jensen will talk about, in a very uh, orderly and organized way. Our strategy we need to continue to keep in place. The, uh, the multi-agency command center that stood up will stay in place because we are managing communications. I think some of you now have witnessed um, the complexity of something like this. It doesn't look like the movies. You have to get everybody on the same frequencies. You have to have communications to move people. And when you see an operation move in unison like you've seen the last few days with no prior training together, uh, that's a testament to the leadership of all of these different agencies, and that is the MAC. They'll continue to operate until the time comes when we transition back out of that. I do think it is worth noting that this week there will be, uh, at least as we understand right now, a significant event with the, the funeral memorial of uh, of George Floyd I believe is scheduled for Thursday it will be an important event both for the city of Minneapolis for Minnesota and for the nation um, to watch that process of celebrating a life that was taken in front of us an opportunity for leadership and when I say leadership what we're seeing now is where there are voids of leadership at certain levels you're certainly seeing leaders in communities that have always been there put their voices forward. So that will be uh, in conjunction of making sure, as we said yesterday, the idea of protecting peaceful protesters. And that brings me to yesterday, and you'll hear a little more detail on this, the incident with the, the truck that I, I think will live for many of us forever. I was watching that on the, the MnDOT cameras in the State Emergency Operations Center in live time when it happened, and uh, I, I was breathless as I watched it because I thought I was going to witness dozens or hundreds killed in the immediate crash and then my fear was the intentional thought of detonating that um, that truck as it turned out and I, I don't want to speak ahead of this but the preliminary with the interviews of the driver was frustrated they'll talk about how you close in sections and he got ahead of that and why they were exiting people and I'll let them talk about the details of that but from the driver's perspective he went around it saw the crowd went around the other cars. He did break is what you see. But I think the amazing thing in this story was, first of all, that no one was hurt. The crowd then responding, in, in many cases, just I'm sure adrenaline and fear and everything else was happening. But the driver noted afterwards, after he was told it didn't kill anybody, uh, he noted that the crowd, the vast majority, were protecting him. 
the protesters were protecting the driver who they had just seen appear to run into the crowd because they realized how dangerous the situation was. And for those of you who are old enough to remember that horrific scene on that Los Angeles road during the Rodney King events where the driver was pulled from the vehicle and severely injured, um, peaceful protesters in Minneapolis and St. Paul protected this person even after what we saw was appeared at the time to be an attempt to kill them. Um, I think that speaks volumes again, and I'm just I'm grateful to be able to tell that because I, I still am in shock of what I thought we might have to be talking about. I will note that that event did uh, have some disruptive uh, impact on movement of folks last night, but it still worked out, uh, I, I think, uh, again, an amazing thing of no deaths, no injuries, and last night, report of one fire that is still under investigation so can't be confirmed it was by this and it was immediately extinguished so um, we've got an opportunity here we've changed the direction of where this has gone we've opened up incredibly important conversations I uh, yesterday we saw Attorney General Ellison assume the lead in uh, in the case to start with um, many more things that need to be done at this point in time but but Minnesota uh, this is our chance and I would I would say this um, with that curfew it's June 1st we're still in the middle of a pandemic we are working simultaneously with this I'll give you a little bit of an update at the end uh, where we will talk about number of tests we're doing are still very up we tested 22 long-term care facilities uh, we are planning for massive mobile testing in the cities for folks I would tell those of you who are out there peacefully protesting again if you're starting to get symptoms of COVID-19 please isolate um, we will have to do some contact tracing which I, I have not wrapped my mind around what that would look like in this size um, but we want to massively test you we want to get you in and get the help we want to get a handle on that but June 1st we're having restaurants open up outside um, it's going to be 85 degrees this afternoon. We've got restaurants uh, across the state that are ready to do that. Um, this is a time for community to gather outside, gather outside uh, in the early evening, uh, experience what Minnesota has to offer, and let's, let's have some of that happen. Let's get some of those things back going again. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Harrington, Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Governor. John Harrington, Department of Public Safety. Uh, we watched yesterday afternoon, as many of you did, uh, uh, two really uh, startling events. Uh, we watched uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon as between five and 7,000 people came to demonstrate uh, at U.S. Bank. We saw moms with their kids. We saw, uh, we saw elders from the community. We saw young people all coming together uh, in what was a a very large uh, and a very peaceful uh, demonstration at U.S. Bank Stadium. Uh, we also saw that that group um, move on to the freeway, uh, and then we saw what ha can only be described as that, that moment, well, I can't use that term in front of polite company, but of uh, when you saw the truck going into that crowd and you just winced because what you imagined you were going to see was bodies under the tires of that truck. Uh, and when you didn't see the bodies under the tires of the truck, um, it was, frankly, possibly a miracle. Because um, the driver was doing 70 miles an hour, as we understand it, or in that range. Uh, and even with hitting the brakes uh, and even with dry pavement, uh, we, were, we got lucky. Uh, or there was something miraculous happening there. Uh, once that happened, we uh, continued our operational posture in terms of our working through the curfew and working through our protest uh, prevention, uh, our riot prevention model. Uh, uh, the rapid response team moved, uh, and you could literally see it in real time. You can see the rapid response team, bikes and cars and trucks moving in to the protest area, around the truck, making sure that we could control uh, what we thought might turn into another really bad situation. Uh, and the peace officers that responded to that responded uh, with restraint, and they responded with care, and they were able to contain this situation in such a way that we really did feel like we had some control over it. It took hours to continue to move that along. Uh, and at the end of the night, uh, we really did feel like the interaction uh, was uh, right at the right tone. We were having moms with their kids leave uh, because they, 
really uh, were that was early on in this that were not curfew it was a, there was an opportunity for us to sort this out um, we had folks who didn't want to leave and who were clearly there by design um, and we made I think good decisions throughout uh, Today, we started the morning out, um, 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, looking at the intel, looking uh, for additional information, looking for signs that we were going to have disruption. Uh, we have a preventative patrol model that is operating today, very similar to what we've had the last few days. It's a combination of National Guard, uh, local municipalities, primarily Minneapolis and St. Paul, Ramsey and Hennepin County, that are out working the streets today. Uh, prepared to rapidly respond if we have disruption or riots, uh, and also prepared to protect people's First Amendment rights if folks are coming to protest. Uh, and we have been working with community, we continue to work with community, uh, whether it's at the Memorial at 38th in Chicago or at Little Earth or all over the Twin Cities area. Uh, peace officers have been working with community to keep the peace. That's what the community wants, and that's what we want. Um, this afternoon, we will move back into our more multi-agency coordinated uh, presence. Uh, we'll bring more folks in from suburbs and other sheriff's departments, and we'll continue to integrate them with the Minnesota State Patrol, Minnesota De uh, De Department of Natural Resources, and the Minnesota National Guard. Uh, and we will once again go out to patrol uh, to make sure that the curfew is enforced, uh, to make sure that lawful and peaceful demonstrations, their First Amendment rights are protected, and to make sure that um, riotous behavior, arson, uh, violence, robbery, looting is not allowed to be the story of the day. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to Major General John Jensen of the Minnesota National Guard. Good morning, everyone. Major General John Jensen. I'm the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard. And as Governor Walls just announced, this morning we received guidance from the governor as it relates to the demobilization of the Minnesota National Guard and the return of part of the Minnesota National Guard back to their hometown and back to their uh, armories. This is not an order to return the entire organization back home. Any redeployment is coordinated with the MAC and approved by the governor. Our plan will remain flexible and have a scalable tempo that we can accelerate as the security situation improves, delay, or even stop if the security situation uh, worsens. With over 7,000 Minnesota National Guardsmen currently mobilized, I am confident that we can reduce our presence while meeting the needs of the mission taskings received by the MAC, the State Patrol, and the Department of Safety. You may see movement begin as early as this afternoon as we take uh, units who are not required to uh, respond in St. Paul or uh, Minneapolis and allow them to return home and begin the process of returning back to their normal status as a, as a citizen soldier. In addition, I'd like to report that last night at 9.48 p.m. in the vicinity of Interstate I-35 and Washington Avenue, an unknown vehicle driving at a high rate of speed toward a Minnesota National Guardsman and their police counterparts. The rapidly approaching vehicle refused to slow down as it approached our Guardsmen and our police officers. Initial questioning into our National Guardsmen indicate that this element responded with verbal and nonverbal signals for the vehicle to stop. The vehicle continued at a high rate of speed. Non-lethal methods were engaged on the vehicle to again to have the vehicle stop. The vehicle continued at a high rate of speed. At that time, in accordance with the escalation of, of uh, force, our soldier fired three rounds from his rifle in response to a perceived and legitimate threat to him and the Minnesota police officers that he was in direct support of. The vehicle changed course and fled the scene. At this time, no injuries have been reported. We have followed our procedures and reported this event to both the governor's office and the chief of the National Guard Bureau. 
As is required by regulation, any time a service member discharges their we weapon, regardless of reason, we have assigned an investigating officer for this incident. And finally, this week, uh, and specifically this weekend, for sure, the Minnesota National Guard has seen the best and the worst of Minnesota. We have seen the devastation of a community, and we have seen great citizens coming back out, picking up the pieces with their friends, with their neighbors, and strangers. And we've had a small part of that. We've had the privilege and the honor to, to be a small part of that. Because Minneapolis and St. Paul are our communities too. We live here, we work here, and the Minnesota National Guard is here for you. And now be followed by Colonel Langer. Thanks, General. My name is Matt Langer, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief of the Minnesota State Patrol. I'll be brief. Uh, last night was kind of the textbook civil disobedience issue that we are training to deal with on a regular basis, and I think people saw a very different strategy. Frankly, a strategy that law enforcement likes much better than using chemical munitions and some of the actions that we saw last week that were absolutely necessary, but not our first choice. So last night, I think people saw a much slower development of a crowd control strategy and a tactic with dispersal warnings and then an encirclement strategy that works uh, in a very careful, methodical, safe, uh, and easier way to take people into custody, most of which tend to want to be taken into custody uh, for their actions for various reasons. Uh, I echo the sentiment, and I was proud to see the law enforcement officers, whether it was the troopers, the DNR conservation officers, the sheriff's deputies, and the police officers, you know, this is a multi-hour interaction, and I think what you'll see if you watch the news and see various reports, uh, it warmed my heart to see all of those peace officers interacting with all of those protesters under arrest, communicating, talking, laughing, and being human together. Uh, that is exactly what I like to see and what we like to see and what makes us proud. Uh, enough was said about the semi on the 35W bridge. I had the same uh, visceral reaction as a traffic safety professional about what that could have been versus what it was. And one of the things we've said all along is that the freeway is just a very dangerous place to be when you're protesting. And so there's many places to exercise your First Amendment right. We continue to facilitate that along with other law enforcement agencies. The freeway is just not the place to do it. And although we try as hard as we can to keep people safe, it's just really, really difficult. And yesterday was a shining example of what we said for a long, long time about the danger of those events on the freeways. Uh, I tend to agree nothing short of a miracle in terms of the lack of injury involved there, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, last but not least, we're prepared. We have our staffing and our resources, and as the governor said, the multi-agency response is still there. The curfew adjustment uh, has been announced. And oftentimes you hear law enforcement directing like 10 o'clock, and the, and the requirement is that, that you obey the curfew, and that's an order. But sometimes you don't hear what I'd like to say is, uh, I'd like to ask people to cooperate with that 10 o'clock curfew. And maybe that's different, maybe that's not common, but that's our ask, and I'm speaking collectively on behalf of law enforcement. We'd like, we'd like you to cooperate with that, and that's helpful for us. We'll be there and ready, and we're willing and able to deal with what we have to, but we know absolutely the vast, vast majority of Minnesotans and those who live around Minneapolis and St. Paul are helping and they're trying, and we just hope and pray for peaceful, genuine uh, expression of First Amendment right and enough with the violence, enough with the property destruction, and, and we look forward to that, and that's my ask for the future here, is that we get back to who we are in this state in Minnesota, and we exercise those rights appropriately and cooperate much better than what we saw last week. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mayor Jacob Fry. Thank you. This has clearly been a crisis unlike any our city or state has ever seen, and I think it's becoming increasingly clear that it's one that demanded a state-supported and guard-sized response. And the governor mentioned just a little bit ago that we have not seen this kind of mobilization since World War II. Uh, and I really do want to thank the governor for the support that we've gotten over the last several days. It has been absolutely essential for the safety uh, and the welfare of the people in Minneapolis. I'm not going to get too much into the tanker truck, as people who have previously spoke uh, already have laid out the facts. But I, I do want to say that this just terrifying instance 
uh, also shows a whole lot of bravery. Bravery by the protesters that were willing to look out for those around them. Bravery by the peaceful protesters that were willing to help uh, the individual driving the truck. Our police officers made uh, very quick and clear action to, to remove protesters from the bridge because we did not know what was on that tanker. We did not know if it was explosives. We did not know the intent of the individual driving. And by their willingness to clear people from the bridge, we could very quickly get first responders to the action. Uh, there was also an, an early morning fire, suspected arson over in North Minneapolis. Uh, and it's a reminder that we certainly ha still have a very long way to go. And although North Minneapolis has not been the center of a whole lot of mobilization, some beautiful things are happening there as communities are rallying around one another. They're making sure to provide free food, looking out for your neighbor. And any time a single instance happens over there, I get 35 text messages and calls, and, and I think what that says to me is that North Minneapolis is strong uh, and they are well cared for. Uh, you know, but we also can't lose sight of the fact that throughout the day, yesterday, uh, yesterday and today, we've seen peaceful uh, protests all around the city. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit Lake and Bloomington uh, as well as the memorial for George Floyd on 38th in Chicago. And it did provide a sense of, of therapeutic measure for me uh, to see people in community loving one another, uh, looking out for their neighbor, celebrating peace and celebrating a beautiful life that was George Floyd was heartwarming even in the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, it was heavy. Uh, people are obviously sad uh, and angry, but their commitment to seeing change going forward is inspirational. These cannot be half measures. Uh, there can be no tokenization. This has to be done well uh, and thoroughly. And I can tell you that I and I know uh, the governor and mayor and others are entirely uh, committed to that. And to call this a, a painful chapter in our city's history is clearly an understatement. The mur murder of George Floyd has made very clear the systemic racism and issues that need to be confronted in our society, not tomorrow, but right now. So let's retain order, let's keep the peace, but let's keep that sense of urgency and lack of patience going forward because it is needed. Those need to be the overriding goals of both tonight and the days ahead. Mayor Carter. Thank you. Many of you know that I have uh, almost three month old at home. Her name is Amila, and she was born uh, on March 3rd. Uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, already canceled my uh, parenting leave. Uh, and so, you know, I've, 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 I haven't gotten a chance to, to do the fatherhood leave that I had initially planned on doing. Uh, but I look at her uh, every morning. I look at her every day. And I know that she's going to have some questions for all of us. You know, growing up, I think about the conversations I've had with my grandparents and my parents uh, about those days, like, uh, you know, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, those moments like Freedom Summer, uh, those defining moments uh, in our history uh, that we look at our grandparents and our parents and say this was a really uh, important moment and we ask them to account to us for where they were and what they did. To the governor's point, when we've asked our, our, our grandparents about uh, those historic moments, a commission and a task force report uh, is unsatisfactory. The point is every generation I know has those moments that uh, call us to be bigger than our biggest selves, that call us to work, that call us to action, that call us to do something. And in just the ways that we've asked our uh, generations to account for those moments, uh, my daughter, our children, all of our children and grandchildren will ask us to account uh, for what we did right now, how we acted right now, how we answered this moment right now. Uh, yesterday in St. Paul was a day that I'll look forward to telling them about. Uh, yesterday in St. Paul, uh, our day was marked by the local business owners who, despite having boarded up windows and trying to figure out when they'll get their employees back to work, 
held supply drives to collect diapers uh, and formula and food and the type of essential supplies that our families need but don't have access to because our grocery stores are closed. Uh, yesterday, uh, was marked by neighbors showing up on University Avenue in the Midway area and walking our neighborhoods, just organizing organically on the internet to show up and walk down the street with a garbage can, a garbage bag, a shovel, and a broom. And yesterday in St. Paul was certainly marked by the thousands and thousands of individuals who came out, just like they did in Minneapolis, who came out to peacefully march, who came out and gathered at the Capitol, uh, to say what our focus ought to have been on all of this past week and what our focus must be on going forward. That George Floyd should never have died. He should still be alive. He should still be with us today. That the officers responsible for his death must be held accountable. And that as we do this short-term work, we must commit ourselves to the long-term work of ensuring that we stop this pattern that has recurred uh, in our community and in our country far too many times for far too long. Their work, all of those actions were peaceful, but they were not patient. All of those actions were peaceful, but they were not quiet. And as we think about how we respond to this moment, as we think about what we'll tell our children and grandchildren about how we used this moment, how this moment was different than all of those other moments we've seen over the last 10 years. I'm confident that it'll be because we can say that we restored our peace, but that we never restored our quiet, that we never restored our patience, that we didn't, we didn't uh, satisfy, we didn't satisfy ourselves uh, or settle for waiting patiently for someone else to do this, but that we redoubled our commitment to humanity, we doubled our commitment to life and our value for the lives of all of our community, and particularly, in particularly for those black and brown young men who we have too often seen lose their lives at the hands of law enforcement. We have shifted, it seems, our approach in Minnesota and in the Twin Cities on the how. That's what's given us a chance to change the law enforcement tactics that we already heard about today. The how has shifted. Our community has said loud and clear that they're ready to work with us to dismantle all of those systems that cause these incidents to keep recurring and dismantle all of those systems that make it so difficult to hold someone accountable when they do. It's up to us. I'm looking forward to being able to share with my daughters, with our children, with our grandchildren that in this moment we met it with peace, but never again quiet. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Minnesotans, be absolutely clear, the mayor's right. We will be defined by how we respond to what happened to George Floyd last Monday night. And that work is beginning. It is, uh, it is going to be, uh, it is going to be a long road, but it is one that, uh, it, it's our work. It's the work ahead of us. And we have to get after it. With that, questions. Tom? What do we know about the truck driver? Was this accidental and not intentional? Can you give us more detail about sure. where that investigation stands? Sure. John Harrington. Uh, so we have gone back. We've been working with MnDOT with uh, uh, Margaret Keller Anderson, the commissioner there, uh, State Patrol, and the BCA are all uh, working together on this investigation. What we know uh, thus far is that uh, MnDOT and the MAC uh, and uh, the, the state patrol had planned to close the freeway at about 8 o'clock in, in keeping with the curfew, which was what we were originally do, set up to do. Uh, so we've been working to plan for that closure, and that takes a bit of time to get that done. At about 4.30, 16.30 hours yesterday, as we were monitoring the, the, the group over at U.S. Bank, and we started seeing that movement toward the freeway, we asked MnDOT to can you lock it down now? Uh, and MnDOT said, as quick as we can, we will. And they started the process of shutting down entrance ramps and things along that lines. From the traffic cams, we know that uh, the driver of the tanker truck was on the freeway already. 
He was on 94 already, and he turned on to 35 before we got uh, barricades or trucks there to block off his access to 35. Uh, he, we know that he was, this was his second run of the day. He was running empty. Uh, there, was no, there was no fuel in that tanker truck. Uh, and this was his second run back. Um, that this is a route he had taken. And he was, uh, from what we understand, he was speeding. Uh, so we do have some information that he was speeding. Uh, we do have some information um, that uh, he saw the crowd. And initially, uh, what it looks like, he panicked. Uh, and he just kept barreling forward, and then he saw what he describes, and this is what I'm hearing, uh, uh, a young woman on a bike fall down in front of him, and he slammed on the brakes. And he slid for a certain period of time until he, until he, until the, the vehicle stopped. Uh, from what we can tell from our interviews, uh, we have not had any information, and it's still an open investigation. Uh, we don't have any information that makes this seem like this was an intentional act. It wasn't that he went around the barricades to get to the protest. It's not that from where he started, he even necessarily, he knew the protest was going on, but he, it doesn't appear that he was driving to try and intersect the protest at this point. Uh, so we have interviewed them, uh, interviewed him. Uh, we are continuing the investigation. Uh, and that will be the kind of that process will will move on at this point. Hey, Governor, I have a follow up to sure. you. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, House Majority Leader Ryan Winkler has since deleted this tweet. But in the immediate aftermath of that truck incident, he wrote on Twitter, protesters I know are saying truck driver drove into a crowd and intentionally ran into them. Confederate flags and white supremacist insignia. Protesters stopped the truck. Minneapolis police have shut down the bridge. Uh, we know now that none of that is true. Should one of the top political leaders in Minnesota be tweeting something like that in an already tense and chaotic situation? Yeah, certainly not. I think it's, a, it's an example, again, I, I don't think we should do civic leadership via Twitter. Um, I think we've seen these situations uh, happen. It's, it's chaotic for people. There's a lot of emotions. I think that's why it's really important. And, and I will just say it, uh, we, we have a void of really positive, cohesive messaging and and we've seen this uh with COVID and some of the other things and i think it's creating this so i would encourage everyone out there no it's not helpful um you know as it as it turns out in this and we'll see how it goes that i i think you had somebody did something really stupid uh got in a dangerous situation by people on the highway feels incredibly lucky that he did not kill someone and is really lucky that Minnesotans showed their better angels and he did not get killed in this after he got pulled off. I mean, I thought we were witnessing that again. So, no, I would encourage everyone, please, please do not do that. It, it is not helpful. And I think apology. I'll go. Yes, go ahead. Isabel. the National Guard um, pulling back. Sure. Um, first of all, or General, it, it feels kind of soon for, I think, a lot of well, people, the way they may read it. And how many National Guardsmen, I heard a figure of 4,000 or 5,000, this is yeah no Esme right and this is this is where communication and messaging matters. Um, there's a lot of folks that anticipate and know and I watch. You've got to fill the airspace. Are are kind of commentating and quarterbacking as this goes, and they don't understand exactly. I saw one yesterday. Somebody we had troops down at the armory and they were uh, they were warming their engines a very common thing and troops are ready to go and they were just laying on the floor they got ready to go that became a political issue that we were not funding the national guard and they needed cots that's stupid if people were around this so i would tell you on this is please know the professionals who know this is not a switch and there is no way we will put ourselves in this. When you deploy a unit of National Guard, and I'll let General Jensen talk about this, there are all kinds of structures of support, all kinds of folks who are on the front end, all kinds of ways that you can maintain an operation without some of those support elements that aren't directly out there. So I think what the uh, General Jensen's going to tell you, the forces that you've seen and able to respond will not change. Some of those other things, you're not seeing most of what's happening behind the scenes. That's what's going on. So General, I will... I will go. I did that for 24 years of experience. You did that well, You've sir. Got more, I, so. <laughs> uh, I, I don't like the term pulling back. Yeah. What happened here early on, admittedly, we made mistakes. Is it is it is it uh, related to troops on the ground and even tactics? So we had to get ahead of the curve, and so Governor Walls said full mobilization of the guard in order to get ahead of that violence curve. And so we brought in over 7,000 guardsmen 
to meet this. And the governor is absolutely right. Some of these are administrative logistics, food preparers, truck drivers. They were not on the ground inside of St. Paul and inside of Minneapolis. They were supporting those troops as well as we were preparing to possibly have to go to other places in Minnesota. At this time, remember, the curve of the violence was going up, and we didn't know how far that was going to go, go up. What we're seeing now is a much more stable position. So the Minnesota National Guard in law enforcement operations is always the last agency in, right? We are not primarily a law enforcement agency. We support our law enforcement brothers and sisters. We are never the lead agency. So if we're the last agency in, we should be the first agency out. And that's exactly what the governor's authorized. So what we'll see is a very small movement of those units that have been supporting the, uh, the tactical units on the ground in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Our initial guidance is that our presence that we have had on uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, that will be the minimum presence. We have to always be able to have that presence available to public safety and to the MAC. And we've seen Saturday and Sunday night to be very successful as it relates uh, to the techniques and the tactics uh, used. So that's a little bit of background as it relates to uh, the Minnesota National Guard and the return of some of our citizen soldiers back to their home and their home armories. Thank you. Thank you. Governor, so, uh, I have a question on, on, uh, on the letter earlier, and I think this could actually go to a few different people. Um, but what do you make of Lieutenant Bob Crow's letter that he published it, that came out today, who claimed he was uh, coordinating with Senator Guzelka on National Guard deployments? Um, and similarly, given that letter, a related follow-up question to that is, how, how, how do people uh, have law, trust in law enforcement given the tone of that letter? And I, I just... I mean, well, I've not read it. I can only speak about the lawful orders of the state of Minnesota and my authority as governor in the National Guard. Um, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. And uh, at this point in time, I don't think I can comment any further. I don't have any more information on it, but... Governor, uh, there's a call with the president uh, today, and uh, there's some reports that he urged you and other governors to use more force to uh, stop the, the unrest and the disorder. What, is it, what was your reaction to that? Yeah, this, is, this has been a, an ongoing call around COVID, um, and the president came on and, uh, and gave his assessment of the situation. These are governors from all across the country, and I remind folks, um, much like maybe Washington State or more importantly New York where we were all watching them what happened to them with COVID-19 that was us so governors have been calling me and asking me about this because this hit us first the the president gave his assessment of this I he called on me to to speak and and one of the things I noted and, and tried to tell that this action that we're taking and I just want to be very clear I'm incredibly proud of what this group put together but I will also tell you, I pray to God we never, ever have to do this again. I hope that I never see this type of organization put together ever again. And, and my point to him was is, is that um, it, it's not, you know, saying the world was, was laughing at the states who aren't taking action. I said, uh, no one's laughing here. We're in pain. We're crying. We saw a man lose his life in front of them and our challenge is is that this is about social trust social compacts and reestablishing faith in the people who are there to serve them and I just mentioned that I thank the president um, for the support specifically with Secretary Esper and uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, Milley were on with us to help us talk about assess this and I also shared with the president that that a posture of um, a force on the ground is both unsustainable militarily, it's also unsustainable socially because it's the antithesis of how we live. It's the antithesis of civilian control. So I express that on the call. Well, was he urging governors to, to uh, crack down on these demonstrations and these... Uh, I don't know the exact words. I think there is a, you know, they're certainly making a point, and I think how you articulate that is very, very important. We've talked about using this... Uh, police presence and uh, public safety presence to separate the legitimate and visceral pain and problems that we need from the people who are causing problems. And I think without the nuance in that, and I would just say that 
the nuance to this message is everything. Um, I tried to explain that to them, and I used the experience that I had. I think it's really important, and I've been on the phone every minute of every day, especially with local elected officials, mayors, and things like that, calling me. They, if they don't know and they didn't grow up in this, seeing someone in a military uniform on the streets of, of America, if it's not in a flood or something, is terrifying, and it should be in a democracy, in a republic. Explaining to them the role of a, of, of a citizen soldier being out there, and I took my time to tell those other governors, um, you're going to need your forces on this. You are going to need, and as the general said, we had established the largest presence ever on Friday night, and it wasn't enough. And then we went to the next one because this takes time. So I, I explained to them as why you're, why you're doing the, this side of things. The solution is not going to be with what we built here. This is not the solution to our problem. This is the solution to the short-term violence pause and then what we do from there. So that's what I explained, and I think that was, that was maybe more nuanced than the message that was coming. Did he call you and the other governors weak? That, that's the headline that's come out of this, is the quote, weak. And that he wanted you to dominate. I think that's correct. I don't have the tape in front of me, but I think those were the were the uh, were the words. I would I would not quote that on there. And I I, I did. I, I got in, engaged in this conversation, as I said, because again, there has been helpful conversations with uh, with strategic and and when you think of somebody like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Department of Defense, they work on America's soft power. Those two people, the last thing they want to do is put a weapon in someone's hand. They would rather diffuse this through diplomacy. They'd rather diffuse it through economics. They'd rather diffuse it in other ways. And those were the conversations. So when you hear me talking, saying I was talking to the Secretary of Defense with uh, General Jensen and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were talking about the fundamental problems of, uh, of systemic racism in some of our institutions. So. Um, it was a hard conversation today, and, and I want to tell you this. It, it's much like, I think, us looking at New York City in COVID. The rest of the country looked at us, and they just got so spooked. They're wondering, like, they're calling me, what do we do? What should I do? And I'm, and I'm telling them some of the lessons we've already learned, but, but nobody's experienced this before. And I, I just, this is where I hope, wish again, and it's just my hope, going back to what Tom asked about the tweets, we need to be really careful here, and we're in this together. And, and I'll be the first one that we've seen it here. This type of joint operation is very stressful for all of us. They are elected officials in their cities and have ideas. And, and for me and my responsibility in trying to understand where that laps. So. About outside agitating groups possibly coming in and causing some of the more destructive stuff going on this week. Um, I think in the absence of more information, at least people in my neighborhood group have their own theories about people driving around trying to intimidate people. I think people are looking for more information just about what's going on. Yeah. There's cars without license plates. There's been these, this talk about flammable things being put around. Yeah. Um, I think people are just looking we for We can maybe information. get some information. Yeah, and I, I think this one, and there's lessons learned in this. I, would, I have talked about this a week. I think this is a very legitimate question. I think we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, this is going to be a focal point for years, decades, of how we look at different things in operations. I think it's fair to say, certainly, the way when I speak about it, it's it's speaking for a larger group. I, I got out over my skis a little bit on this, and as I said, I think it was probably the hard for me to fathom that this was coming internally. Uh, you cannot have that blind spot. You cannot have that blind spot if that is amongst us and it's here. This is why that, that sense of vigilance about what led to it, who did some of these things. So I do think there's a lot more investigating to be done on this. I think the data of arrests is one thing, but I think that data set has to be much broader. I think seeing some of the Facebook posts and, and you know some of that social media things that are happening, we need to get a better understanding of this, of, of how deep this is. And I say that not to you know a conspiracy theory or it's something really big we need to actually know who it was and who it is and I don't know John if you've got some specifics but what I would add, what I would add to the governor's comments is is a couple things and and the and the social media piece is certainly part of that uh, we get all kinds of tips and information and posts that say this is happening over here this is happening over here. And then what we've discovered is, is when we actually send officers or investigators to check that out, uh, it's not happening over there. And it's not, there's no sign that that was happening. But for a period of time, when we first get those posts and we see those posts, we act on them as if they're real things that are really happening. Uh, and so there, then there becomes, that becomes, has a life of its own that, well, the cops were sent to North Minneapolis to check out reports of this. 
Well, they were sent to North Minneapolis, but nobody was there. And there wasn't any posters. And there wasn't a group of people. I was hearing crazy stuff about, you know, the Klan marching down the street. And it, it, we've got traffic cams. We've got none of that happened. So at some point, we, we struggle with what is said and what is actually happening. And then somewhere in between that, you're getting the same social media, you're getting all, you're getting all that. And some of it looks like it is deliberately being planted as disinformation. Uh, and, and that is something, but I don't know how much of the, how much of the stuff that's on social media sh are you supposed to believe Anyway, uh, I guess is a, is a question for, for my folks. Uh, we tend to deal in, in evidence, uh, so we're going backwards from there to try and get a sense of what is actual evidence. So stories about, well, we've seen this. I go back to the chiefs and the sheriffs. I go back to the BCA and go, how many cars got towed in that didn't have license plates? I want to know that, okay, because that will tell me whether or not this is actually a thing or if it's just a new creation of, of the social media world. Uh, when I hear there are people that are hiding flammables, I want to know where are the pictures, where are the bottles, where's the evidence, because if you sent me to a place where there's a bunch of flammables and bottles, I, as a cop, pick them up and I turn them in as evidence. So I should be able to validate those stories, and I think as we do that, we will have better information for you that confirms or denies uh, the social media posts that we've been working through. Well, sure. Do you still believe that the unmarked cars and the flammables is some aspect of this? People are seeing a lot of uh, or unlicensed plated cars. I have at least two confirmed reports from local law enforcement of cars, no license plates. Uh, so I have those two clear episodes uh, Henman County and Bloomington both have given me actual reports that I could get my hands on that make some sense about that. Uh, some of the others I'm still working through trying to get reports and get factual data to back it up. Commissioner, one thing that you have factual data on now is with the number of arrests made, are you still finding that the majority of the people you're arresting and putting in jail for curfew or whatever are from Minnesota with a, with a minority of them being from elsewhere? That, is, that would be accurate, yes. And I have a follow-up for the governor and the sure. mayors. Today is June 1st, and a lot of hair salons and bars uh, allowed to open across the state. And many, though, in Minneapolis and St. Paul are either finding it impossible to open because of what's going on, or they don't feel it's right to open. Yeah. What can you tell them? What kind of help yeah, might be on the way for them that are now being doubled down on? Yeah, that's a thing. And I think the conversation, I heard somebody talk about this, the conversation around um, the unfinished work of the, the legislature that'll convene more than likely here by June 12th, that's going to be critically important to talk about that type of thing. I think the one thing is with business owners that now have this ability, as it's been throughout the whole COVID-19, it doesn't mean you have to open. It means you adjust. And what we knew all along is, I think, again, I, I, I'm not going to encourage someone to go into a, an unsafe situation, but we're going to try and provide, as law enforcement always does, a safe civic environment that if it makes sense for you to open your restaurant or have your salon, we want, we want that happening. But I would say need to be thoughtful. I think it's probably, again, I will let the mayor say this, um, watching locally what the situation with Minneapolis St. Paul, because I think what you'd see is in, in greater Minnesota, uh, I'm guessing of most of them will open and, and try and do what they need to do. So, Mayor, if you want to comment on we knew starting with COVID-19 that we were going to need to help businesses recover in some form from a fiscal standpoint after the economy began to reopen. Now, in addition to uh, providing uh, help from a fiscal standpoint, we've got entire corridors in Minneapolis where buildings have been destroyed. Uh, we need to have help to replace those buildings to get people back on track. And I know the governor and mayor are committed to, to helping to provide that necessary support. I mean, it's, it's important to remember that these are, these are communities that have in some parts been burned, uh, both fiscally as well as the buildings themselves. These are barber shops, these are grocery stores, these are mom and pop shops that are going to need substantial assistance as we get back. And I can say that, you know, we are committed to it. Last question. Can I just ask about the National Guard again? Because I'm unclear if just the support people are being pulled or will there be National Guard troops on the ground in the Twin Cities tonight? And if you, if you can tell me how many. Yes. And, and be specific. because. 
The National Guard has got a, got a lot of attention, and I yeah, think a lot yeah. of people are very grateful no, for them. No, thank you very much to, to, to allow me to be very specific about this. On Saturday and Sunday, uh, I would say the assessment of uh, the, the tactics employed by the, by the MAC, by the State Patrol, by the two police departments were very effective. We were part of that. We were a small part of that. We were part of that team. Okay? That level of effort I have guaranteed to the governor for an unspecified amount of time. He knows what it is. I've, I've laid it out for him. I'm not going to lay it out here. But what we had on the ground last night will be in Minneapolis and St. Paul, guaranteed. That is what I told the governor. As we begin peeling pieces off of this, that presence will remain through that time that I've given the governor. But the violence didn't continue to accelerate at a very rapid rate. So what we did is we created capacity that we didn't necessarily need because we started, started on, uh, stabilizing the uh, security environment in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So I don't think any citizen of Minnesota wants thousands of guardsmen to be sitting in their armory, away from their homes, away from their families, away from their employers, just waiting for what we believe and what we hope is a downturn on violence. Why, why, did, we, why did we lower the curfew today? It wasn't because violence increased. That's not why we lowered uh, the curfew, right? We, we lowered it because our citizens responded to us. Our citizens responded to the pleas of the law enforcement and our, and our elected officials over here. I, I think it would be wasteful if we just left these men and women sitting somewhere hoping that it gets worse so we can use them. That's, that's, not, that, that's not fair to them. It, it's not prudent and, and, and it's not the advice I gave to the governor and he he agreed to that, so thank you. And I would just, thank you, General, and I would just say uh, we are not going to live in fear. We're going to live with the future being possibilities. We don't fear the future. We create it here. We know we've got work to do. We will not leave citizens unprotected. Now this is where we gather back out. This is where folks make some choices. Um, I will say this. I think we need to watch very carefully around the COVID-19 issue, but I think we need to make movements. We're seeing some good flat numbers. I know Jan will... Uh, Malcolm will talk about that. Um, but this is our opportunity. So we got work to do. We'll come back, keep updates today, and uh, grateful. Thank, Thank you. you what, what about the, uh, is there going to be a curfew tonight? What about Metro Transit and the interstate? That information will come out sooner as well as the, the freeway situation. So they're clarifying now. Thank you, Officer. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Overnight, unrest across America. The death of George Floyd in police custody, sparking new protests nationwide. Here in the nation's capital, violence taking place just steps from the White House. You can see that fire uh, that's been set uh, just in front of the White House outside Lafayette Park. In an extraordinary step, U.S. Marshals and DEA agents were deployed to help keep the peace. It comes as NBC News has confirmed the Secret Service was so concerned about President Trump's safety during protests on Friday, they ushered him to a bunker underneath the White House for a very short period of time. More than 100 protests and rallies taking place in cities from coast to coast. In more than a dozen states, the National Guard was called in to help restore order. In Louisville overnight, a man was shot and killed after shots were fired toward the police officers and National Guard members during protests. The chief of police saying officers and soldiers returned fire. The identity of the man who was shot has not been released. In Tampa, smoke and ash filling the sky as businesses burn. Authorities shooting off tear gas. Cars like this police cruiser in Boston incinerated. While looters storm shops, including the small in Arizona. In New York City, this video of two NYPD vehicles ramming into a crowd of protesters, sparking outrage. The mayor defending the officers involved. I also want to emphasize that situation was created by a group of protesters blocking and surrounding a police vehicle. On Saturday night, Mayor Bill de Blasio's own daughter 
arrested during citywide protests, according to a senior NYPD official. In an effort to clear the streets, dozens of cities, including Minneapolis, put curfews in place over the weekend. We cannot afford to lose anyone else. We don't want any more innocent bystanders getting hurt. Please stay home. Chicago's mayor echoing what so many are feeling. We have to turn our pain into purpose in order to get through this moment together and do the work needed to unite our city. The protests were not all violent, though. In Denver, thousands laid on the ground for nine minutes, chanting, I can't breathe. This is what America's built While in on. Iowa, yes. hundreds marched to make their point. We feel it's time for us to stand up and show the nation, show, show the world, even at that with social media, that we can come together in a peaceful manner and state how we feel. You tell us what you need to do. The sheriff in Michigan marching arm in arm with his community. But it was on the streets of Washington, D.C., among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. But it's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. A poignant moment as a nation tries so hard to move forward. Meanwhile, back here in our nation's capital, you can see the firefighters have pulled out again to try and put out the, the latest fire that's broken out here uh, in Washington, D.C. In just a few moments, we'll have an, exclu an exclusive conversation uh, with the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser. We'll ask how the city's preparing for what they expect is going to be another night of protest. We are in Lafayette Park. We are, as you can see behind me, just steps away from the White House. This is the same spot where I stood last night uh, as violence erupted, as chaos erupted. Flashbangs used throughout the night, rubber bullets used throughout the night. Also last night, shortly before 11 o'clock, the lights went dark uh, here at the White House. Those lights used to uh, usually illuminate the outside of the people's house. They went off. I'm going to step over and show you also what's still happening. Fires around Washington, D.C. You can see the top of this small building, bathrooms, small offices here. Uh, that fire just started back up literally three minutes ago as you see officials working to put that blade down. In fact, here comes a fire truck. Behind this fire truck, this is St. John's Church. It's known as the Church of Presidents because every president uh, with the exception, I believe, of James Monroe, uh, has worshipped at some point at this church, riddled with graffiti right now. A fire was started in the basement on Sunday night. As the sun came up, a city workers came out to clean off the graffiti uh, and try and clean up that church. And meanwhile, across the street from that church, this is a building that actually has significance uh, to me and my family. This is the Hay Adams Hotel. This is actually where I had my, my wedding reception. Riddled with the graffiti, hotels boarded up, and this is the case for businesses in and around New York, in and around Washington, D.C., looting in Georgetown, not far from here throughout the night. Those protests that started last week, those protests that were largely peaceful in the wake of George Floyd's death, have turned into something else entirely. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We're in the midst of an economic crisis. And what you're seeing here is a manifestation of all of that. And we are joined now by New York City's Police Commissioner Dermot Shea. Commissioner Shea, good morning. How would you describe the evening last night? We saw a massive police pre presence, huge crowds, violence, fires. Uh, from your perspective, how would you characterize the night? Yeah, Savannah, it was an incredibly challenging and busy weekend. Uh, tens of thousands of protesters all over New York City. Yesterday was a busy day. Um, first 90 percent of yesterday went very well. Probably about five, six thousand protesters throughout New York City. Um, less violence, I would categorize it, as, as the days before. The majority of the protesters were peaceful, um, making their point. When it got dark, it got ugly, and it got ugly quick. Um, we had some violence. Uh, we had another incident, unfortunately, of an individual with a Molotov cocktail in Brooklyn. We had an individual, uh, two officers in a marked car in Queens, um, that a bullet hit their car. That's under investigation. Um, there were no protests 
in that area. Uh, it, it could be unrelated, but that's clearly uh, alarming to us and under investigation. And then the looting. The looting turned very quickly uh, in portions of the city in Brooklyn uh, and primarily in Manhattan, uh, the area of Union Square, 14th Street, Soho. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of arrests in a very short time in that area. And, then, and some, unfortunately, are still going on. So it was a challenging yeah, evening for the police officers. Yeah. Union Square is where we are right now. Yeah. The New York Times reported flames going two stories high. I wanted to ask you about a couple of incidents that are making the rounds on social media, one in which a patrol yeah. car, NYPD car in Brooklyn, appears to roll into a crowd of onlookers yes. or demonstrators, I should say. Um, and then another case where an NYPD officer appears to shove a woman down to the ground. Are you looking into those incidents? Have you come to any conclusions about whether that those actions were justified? In, in Savannah, and I appreciate the question, in literally tens of thousands of encounters, we have about six that our internal affairs officers are looking at uh, in the process of either identifying the officers. I think by now, probably when I get my update shortly, probably most of the officers will have been identified and there'll be an investigation. In, in the car one, anyone that looks at that has to be troubled by what they saw. Um, but there's a couple other incidents in cars that we released to the media and weren't shown. And it shows a similar situation where the cop cars are getting attacked and have to basically get out of there as quickly as possible. So it's, it's a very difficult situation without a good ending either way. Um, that, that is on the heels of uh, Molotov cocktails being thrown at police officers. If you look at that entire video, you see people, um, I would describe it as an ambush, physically trying to hold yeah. that police officer's car in check as people are surrounding it. So it, it, it's it's clearly something that no one should want to see, um, but we'll, we'll move forward. It is difficult situation, no question about it. Do you believe there should be a curfew? New York City doesn't have one. Do you need the National Guard to be here? No, uh, we don't need the National Guard. Uh, we, we got the question on the curfew. I'll be honest with you, Savannah. Uh, we, could, we could impose a curfew today. Uh, the problem is people need to listen to a curfew, and that's not going to happen, first and foremost. If people think it will, they don't understand what's going on. And the second point is anyone that is on the street during this curfew, we had this discussion last night, could probably already be arrested for five different offenses. So what we are doing is trying to manage an extremely volatile situation. There is a lot of outside influences. How we're going to get through with this is level-headedness, police action for sure. But we also need to come together, and not just as a city, but as a country. Yeah. And that's elected officials, that's community leaders, Less inflammatory talk, criticism is good, but inflammatory talk is not helpful. Commissioner Shea, it, a longer conversation is warranted about all Absolutely. of this and the, and the deeper issues presented here. Unfortunately, we got to leave it there this morning so we can get down to Washington and Craig, who's with the mayor there. But thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Craig, thank I'll send you. it down Stay to you. Safe. Well, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, is, is here with me now. And, and Mayor, as, as we uh, look on, on Lafayette Park, statues riddled with graffiti, trash everywhere. Um, flashbangs went out, went off throughout the night. Uh, what do you make of your city this morning? Well, uh, we're, we're certainly um, very uh, sad and, and angry, quite frankly, about the destruction that was that happened here. Well, we're in Lafayette Park, right in the center of our city, in front of the White House, but we had damage uh, in blocks throughout the city. So we want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. Mayor, one of the things that struck me about the protests here last night, as I talked to protesters and, 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 and walked among them for, for a couple of hours, they seem to be really organized. And I've been to a number of pro protests over the years like this. This one seemed to be unusually organized. Well, we know that we have people that came here with tools uh, and supplies, and they re-upped their supplies. They went to different um, parts of the city. Uh, so we think there was a mix of people here, but certainly people here who um, 
who do this type of protest and demonstration. Professional protesters or demonstrators? Uh, well, we, we've seen some of these tactics before, um, so uh, we, we know that they were among the groups here. Tactics like? Tactics like the types of tools that they use, restocking, setting fires here and there to try to draw in the police to various locations. Uh, the curfew, uh, the National Guard being called in. You were reluctant to do both of those things, uh, but you did. What, what changed your calculation? Um, I think that, uh, you know, our police in all of our intelligence suggested that we were seeing the same type, the same actors, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had every tool at our disposal uh, to keep the city safe. Uh, we saw most of the people peaceably protest. We saw most of the people leave um, at the time of curfew, uh, and that gave the, the authorities the ability to focus on the troublemakers. Are you expecting another night of, of demonstrations? Uh, we're certainly prepared, as we've seen across the country, uh, multiple days of, of demonstrations. Uh, we're working with our intelligence and all of our uh, law enforcement partners uh, to figure out who's coming where. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. Thanks, uh, Mayor, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good luck to you. Thank okay. you. Overnight, more rage and destructions in cities across the West. On Sunday, angry mobs ignoring mandatory curfews, violently clashing with police, overturning cars, torching buildings, and looting stores. I can't breathe. In the shadow of Santa Monica's iconic pier and Third Street promenade, the mayhem unfolded for hours as some peacefully protested. Heads up, heads up, heads up. Others provoked a confrontation. Police here are now pushing forward. They're moving all of these protesters back because the situation here is unraveling. From dawn to dusk, the scene spiraling out of control as both sides clashed and tension rose. Some areas, the looting didn't last long. Here on the promenade, local police and the sheriff's department moved in and made several arrests. That's not okay! In Portland, Oregon, officers took down protesters on the sidewalk. In Seattle, more looting and even more troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, the reason so many poured into the streets. LA's mayor supporting the right to protest, but condemning the destruction, blaming it on extremists. They are hijacking a moment and a movement and changing the conversation. California's governor dispatching the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots nearly 30 years ago. Just like then, businesses and stores paying a heavy price while crowds demanded justice. This is 10 years of a lot of hard work. Amid the chaos, also moments of connection between protesters and police. In California, officers taking a knee, joining the crowd in honoring the memory of George Floyd. Another tense night, now followed by an uncertain day. Here in Los Angeles, police remain on scene as they do in so many major cities all across this country. They are bracing for another round of protests. There are many businesses here that have not yet been looted, and that is what they are still trying to protect here today as those curfews remain in place nationwide in so many cities. It was a heart-stopping moment, a semi-truck driving through a crowd of peaceful protesters on an interstate highway. People are pretty shocked, um, and it was a traumatic experience. Some protesters then swarmed the truck and attacked the driver. Hey, Others protected him. him. He was later arrested. Incredibly, no protesters were injured. It's still not clear why he did it. I think the incident just underscores um, still the volatile situation we have out there. On the sixth night of protests following the death of George Floyd, Minneapolis police surrounded large crowds, making mass arrests. Officer Derek Chauvin, who was seen kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, was arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Demonstrators want the three other fired officers involved in the incident to face charges. Now, security video of what happened moments earlier appears to show a struggle in the backseat of a police vehicle. 
On live television, the city's police chief spoke directly to the Floyd family for the first time about the inaction of those officers as Floyd was dying. Being silent or not intervening, to me, you're complicit. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. That acknowledgement left Floyd's brother sobbing. A new report by NBC News finds that since 2015, officers from the Minneapolis Police Department have used so-called neck restraints, using an arm or leg to compress someone's neck, on suspects more than 200 times. And in at least 44 of those cases, the suspects lost consciousness, according to an NBC News analysis of police records. At a growing makeshift memorial for Floyd, signs of a community reeling in pain. I have kids growing up in this world. I got three beautiful children. They're mixed, but even though they're mixed, they look like me. They look the same, and it could have easily been them. It could have easily been me. Michael Holliday came here from Houston, where Floyd grew up. Imagine if it was your child. How would you feel? Imagine if it was your son on the ground screaming, I can't breathe. Help me. Please. This community already knows his name, but the world needs to hear his name. So until we have justice, there will be no peace. As protesters demand more charges, they had also wanted the state's attorney general to take over this case from the local prosecutor. That has now happened, Craig. Now, security video of what happened moments earlier appears to show a struggle in the backseat of a police vehicle. On live television, the city's police chief spoke directly to the Floyd family for the first time about the inaction of those officers as Floyd was dying. Being silent or not intervening, to me, you're complicit. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. That acknowledgement left Floyd's brother sobbing. A new report by NBC News finds that since 2015, officers from the Minneapolis Police Department have used so-called neck restraints, using an arm or leg to compress someone's neck, on suspects more than 200 times. And in at least 44 of those cases, the suspects lost consciousness, according to an NBC News analysis of police records. At a growing makeshift memorial for Floyd, signs of a community reeling in pain. I have kids growing up in this world. I got three beautiful children. They're mixed, but even though they're mixed, they look like me, they look the same, and it could have easily been them, it could have easily been me. Michael Holliday came here from Houston, where Floyd grew up. Imagine if it was your child. How would you feel? Imagine if it was your son on the ground screaming, I can't breathe, help me, please. This community already knows his name, but the world needs to hear his name. So until we have justice, there will be no peace. Also Sunday, Chanel, in, in Minnesota, the governor there announcing that it would be that state's attorney general, Keith Ellison, who would be leading the investigation into George Floyd's death. And the attorney general, Keith Ellison, joins us this morning. Uh, Mr. Ellison, good to have you, sir. Thank you so much for your time. As I understand it, uh, you did not expect to be uh, the lead in this case. The county attorney had been leading the investigation. What changed on Sunday? Well, we, we need the resources of the whole state to make we do an effective, fair, thorough investigation and prosecution. So we will be working with the Hennepin County attorney, the Hennepin County attorney, uh, led, has led the only successful prosecution for murder against a police officer. What they know, their resources, their knowledge and experience are very valuable. But we do need uh, to have a statewide perspective on this. So the governor has asked me to step in and the county attorney has asked me the same thing. So uh, I am going to be uh, working with um, the, uh, the, the county attorney, my staff, and of course, uh, we will be cooperating with the federal authorities as well. I, I understand that uh, Mr. Floyd's family also asked for your involvement as well. I want to extend my heartfelt condolences to them. Uh, I feel so bad for for uh, their family, Mr. Floyd, 
uh, was beloved by a lot of people here in, in Minnesota. I know he was originally from Houston, but he uh, generated a lot of good energy while he was here. And people, uh, you know, his employers and other folks uh, had a lot of nice things to say about him. And so I'm so sad about it. And I'm sad for us because this problem has been so historic and has been so widespread. And that's why people are so outraged. You, you, you spent some time on Sunday talking about how <clears throat> difficult it is uh, to prosecute police officers. There has been so much video that has already surfaced. Cell phone video, surveillance video, body cam video. What, what makes you think that this is going to be one of those cases that's so difficult to prosecute when there seems to already be such an abundance of evidence? You know, that's an excellent question. But I mean, if you're old enough to remember Rodney King, I mean, that jury acquitted, uh, the Simi Valley jury acquitted, that took a federal conviction uh, prosecution to get hold those guys accountable. The Walter Scott case in South Carolina, uh, that jury hung. Uh, the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore. Uh, there was no, nobody has been held accountable for the death of Freddie Gray. Uh, and although uh, um, um, Trayvon Martin was not a police case, it was a, you know, a quasi police case because Zimmerman was uh, kind of clicked into the local law enforcement authorities. Uh, and of course, that case ended uh, in a way that none of us expected that it would. So I'm not really commenting on the evidence at all. What I'm really saying is <clears throat> that, you know, it's not it's hard to convict the police. And uh, even when the criminal wrongdoing appears to be uh, in front of your eyes. And so it takes uh, preparation. It takes planning, it takes uh, time. And so that's what I'm trying to prepare people for. Uh, you know, look, I didn't ask for this case. I've been brought into this case and I view my role as me doing my duty to the people of my state and my country, and I'm gonna do it. But I wanna just tell everybody, if if they think this thing's gone, there's gonna be some uh, conviction by this weekend, that's just not true. And, I, and I'd rather uh, give people the, the straight story early rather than have them uh, be, you know, seriously disappointed. I can assure them uh, their trust in me is is illegitimate. But I but I ask them to give me the the space that we need to do a convict a prosecution and conviction and an investigation, which is going to stick. Mr. Ellison, as it stands now, Derek Chauvin is charged with third degree murder uh, and second degree manslaughter. George Floyd's family has repeatedly asked. Uh, for a first degree murder charge. Uh, you've talked about the fact that it, it's hard to charge police officers in this case. I think the bottom line is there are so many protesters that we've talked with who have said you will not see peace until those other officers are in jail. Bottom line to the people who are watching this morning all around the country, they want to know that those officers will be held accountable and they want it now. What would you say? What I say is that uh, we are, we, I got into this case last night. We are moving swiftly. We are moving effectively. We are meeting today. Uh, and we are uh, going to be as, uh, we are going to hold all those who, vi who uh, uh, all those accountable who have uh, led, did contribute to the death of, of uh, George Floyd. Uh, but I'm asking them to trust me uh, on this and that, uh, we're we're working as uh, expeditiously as we can, but one thing I'm not going to do is 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 move faster than the evidence and the law will allow, uh, because that is that's not fair either, right? And um, we want to make sure that this prosecution is just and fair, um, and we're going to do that. And so uh, I just uh, or you people ask me to do this case, I'm doing it, and I'm doing it to the best of my ability. And they asked me based on years and years of my dedication to civil rights. And so I'm asking them to, to walk with me on this one and to trust that I am going to do justice in this case. I know it's been a challenging time for, for all of us. Attorney General Ellison, thank you uh, for your time this morning. Uh, sheriff Christopher Swanson, uh, the sheriff of Genesee County that you just saw there, marching alongside the demonstrators, marching alongside the protester. He joins me now. Uh, Sheriff, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, sir. Thanks for having me. 
Chef, on, on Saturday, um, did, did you have it in your mind when you got there as you and your men were getting ready that you would you would lay down your helmet, lay down your baton and march alongside the protesters? Or was that a spontaneous decision? It was a spontaneous decision. And I'll tell you, with all the police agencies there, Flint Township being the, the lead for that area, uh, it, it made the most sense that when I saw the crowd and felt the, the, the frustration and the fact that we were only accelerating the issue, it was time to take the helmet off, go to the shot caller, the lead organizer, give him a big old fat hug and say, what do we need to do? And that was the tension breaker. And then the next question was the one that made history. What was the response from those demonstrators, from those protesters? What did they say to you? Well, they, they wanted to know what, what I thought. And uh, when I looked at uh, the lead organizer and said, listen, that guy is not who cops are. These police officers love you and we don't accept that. We're horrified. They said the crowd needs to hear it. I said, get the crowd. So when the crowd kind of turned um, and they've already had a fist pump with another officer, they already had a hug. They were open to just listening to, to what we had to say. And when I acknowledged that we don't condone that, that's not who cops are. The second question is, what else do you need? And that's when the crowd shouted, walk with us. And in a second, that turn of events happened when I said, let's walk. And uh, you saw an entire crowd's mindset and heart change because they wanted to be heard. The protesters, had they not listened to the message, we wouldn't be talking, but they were as much a part of that night make it history in Flint than anybody else. And now we are day two, no arrests, no fires, no injuries. You know, Sheriff, one of the things that struck me when I saw that video is that, that that's one of those situations that could have gone yes. in a whole nother way. Uh, yeah. Had you decided to, <laughs> to lay down your arms and, and the protesters took advantage of the situation, they did not do that. As, right. as, you, as you look at the protests around this country, these protests, uh, many of which have, have turned violent, You've yeah. got a number of, of, of public officials, law enforcement officers saying that the solution right now is to crack down on these demonstrators. What do you what do you say to that? That's a great question. To your first point, it was probably the worst tactical decision I could make by taking off all what protects me and going into the crowd. But the benefit far outweighed the risk. And uh, I'm not trying to be a macho or a hero. I, I just tell you that that was the best decision to show that I am not going to create a, a divide. I'm going to show vulnerability and walk in the crowd and make the, make the first move. To your second point, my heart breaks for the city. It breaks for DC and New York and LA and Minneapolis and, and great cities have been built by great people. And so I, I, don't, I can't answer what the next best decision is except for lay down your arms that, that Police and protesters have to work together to say, hey, let's take a night of calm and find out what's happening. Why are we doing this? And, and create the conversation that makes the change. Everybody talks about change. Change comes with action. And I got to believe that there's folks in those communities that want peace and want action. And, uh, man, I feel terrible for police officers injured, people that have been killed, the city's been destroyed. But it's going to take time. And, and, and I, I see what's happening like the world does and it breaks our heart, but there has to be a first move. There has to be a first step, and that has to come from both sides. Sheriff Christopher Swanson. Uh, Sheriff, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for your example on Saturday as well, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you, we love you guys, and we love this nation. Appreciate your time. Black Lives Matter! With protesters taking to the streets nationwide. Some of them are finding support from a surprising place. Y'all see the chief! Police officers frustrated that George Floyd's death reflects badly on them. Don't think for a second that he represents who these cops are from all over the county and around this nation. We go out there to help people, not do that nonsense. In Flint, Michigan, Sheriff Chris Swanson joining residents as they march. I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. I want to make this a parade, not a protest. In New Jersey, Camden County Police Chief Joseph Wysocki asked an organizer if he could walk with them too. I was welcomed with uh, open arms. 
marching front and center, holding a banner of solidarity. At one point, she started the chant, Black Lives Matter. Then she looked at me and said, sorry. And I said, I laughed. I said, it's okay. I said, that's why we're here. On the force for nearly 30 years, Wysocki was disturbed by what happened to Floyd. That video shocked every good cop in, in the United States. Like, that's not just shocking the cops of my police department. It's that shocking cops everywhere. From Georgia's state officers to Houston's police chief. We will march as a department with everybody in this community. To Kansas City, where officers held signs and hugged protesters. Louisville, an embrace that cut through the chaos. Miami officers letting organizers know they have their backs. And nearby in Coral Gables, officers kneeling with protesters in prayer. Keep Scott! Keep Scott! While in Queens, New York, kneeling to remember other lives lost. In Shreveport, Louisiana, emotions overflowing. And back in Flint, the sheriff echoing his heartfelt message to those who are hurting. We want to be with y'all for real. Here in Philadelphia, the city has its first African-American female police commissioner. And after the death of George Floyd, she too spoke out, saying that she understands the pain of the African-American community from a personal perspective. But like other police chiefs and commissioners across the country, she also rededicated herself to serving and protecting this city with fairness and dignity. Santa Monica, California, was placed on overnight curfew last night after a sudden explosion of violence yesterday. And I'm joined now by Police Chief Cynthia Renault to talk about the events that played out and what the future might hold. Uh, Chief, good morning to you. I'm glad you're with us. You know, you had had mostly peaceful protests, but things really devolved in a hurry. What happened? How did it escalate? Yes, we had peaceful protesters in the city in large numbers, uh, and we were there to protect their rights to protest and support them in that. Um, there was a second group that came in, and we ended up with two groups, one of peaceful protesters and one of people that were to loot and conduct crimes in the city. Um, that group was extremely large, and it was both on foot and mobile coming into the city through vehicles. So it was uh, quite a crowd to work with and control, and it took a large deployment of death. You're breaking up a little bit, so forgive me if you if you just answered the question, but there was some criticism that the peaceful protesters faced
Love you. Thank you for the flowers. Thank you for the memorials. Thank you. Now, before I go, I just want to hear this again. What's his name? George!
assaults on innocent people which go without jail. Only then will we see this terrible scourge of police brutality in this country end. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No peace. No peace. We walk into the other yeah. memorial. We ask that you make a way for him, for us to be able to walk to the other memorial that's right here. Yeah. And let us say, peace on the left, justice on the right. Peace on the left, justice on the right. Peace on the left, justice on the right. 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 I want to bring in the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. Mayor uh, Melvin Carter joins me now. Mayor, thanks for your time this morning. First of all, how are uh, folks there in, in St. Paul doing right now? Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, folks in St. Paul, just like folks across the country, are traumatized right now. Uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, doubly traumatized as we're in this the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, 40% of low-income workers have lost their job in the economic realities of this year uh, before George Floyd was killed. Uh, but of course, we all woke up a week ago uh, tomorrow uh, to that gruesome, shocking video uh, of seeing the way his life was literally snuffed out uh, by those four officers. Uh, and, you know, I think a, a number of folks were very traumatized by that. Uh, we have the same anger, the same rage, the same sadness as we have all over the country, uh, which I want to point out is really the only human uh, and compassionate response uh, when you see someone killed uh, in such a fashion like that. Uh, we have uh, implemented, as many other cities have, a citywide curfew. And in doing so, our, our invitation to our residents uh, was to channel that pain, channel that energy uh, into doing something constructive for our community. As we've seen around the country, we have two groups operating right now. We have those who are just heartbroken by the loss of George Floyd, who need to scream at the top of their lungs like I do, that he should still be alive, that all four of those officers should be held accountable for their actions, uh, as Chief Arredondo has now said publicly, and that we have a lot of like big systemic level work to do to stop this pattern from happening over and over and over and over and over again, like we've seen not just in the last 10 years on cell phone videos, but for generations. Mayor Carter, let's talk about what's happening there in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I know that last week you said that the protesters were from out of state. You, you apologized after that when it was brought to your attention that that wasn't the case. Uh, we've heard from folks on the right who've said that these are, are four left protesters. We've heard from folks on the left said these are four white protesters, white supremacists. Do we know who's protesting and demonstrating in Minneapolis and in St. Paul? Uh, look, our police department, our law enforcement partners are working hard to get to the bottom of who's coordinating this and why. Uh, but this is all this is all part of the problem. This is a distraction from the conversation that we should be having. Uh, whether those folks uh, sleep in another state or sleep in another city or sleep in our city, uh, it, it, it doesn't change the fact that when we have people who are destroying the local pharmacies uh, in a pandemic that our seniors rely on for their life-saving medicine, uh, we have a food shortage shortage right now and our grocery stores uh, have been looted uh, when 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 they are willing to destroy in the midst of an economic crisis the places that our residents rely on not just for products uh, but 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 to be able to go to work and earn a living uh, then it's very clear that there are people operating in our communities who are not operating on the basis of just a, a heartfelt desire
desire uh, to build up our neighborhoods. You, if, if, if you're one of those folks like I am who just cannot rest while injustices against our black and brown communities uh, are, are, are continue, you cannot exercise that energy by burning black barbershops, uh, by, uh, by looting uh, those same communities in a way that just further traumatizes the communities that have already been traumatized by it in the first place. Mayor Carter, really quickly here, 30 seconds. Things seem so very bleak right now. Um, there's, there's concern that these protests are going to continue, that they're going to continue to turn violent as, as well. Where do we go from here? How, how do we make this stop? You know, I think it's clear that the energy that has consumed our country for the last week or so uh, is a raging fire. Uh, figuratively speaking, that could either tear our country apart at the seams or that could bring us together in a way that we've never been together before. Our call is for peace, is for peaceful demonstration, is for the opportunity. Our police department is doing a great job of protecting the right of those legitimate protesters to just say peacefully that this has to change. So we're calling for peace, but it should not be confused. Good afternoon, everyone. The president has made clear that what we are seeing on America's streets is unacceptable. Violence, looting, anarchy, lawlessness are not to be tolerated. Plain and simple. These criminal acts are not protest. They are not statements. These are crimes that harm innocent American citizens. The First Amendment guarantees the right of the people to peaceably assemble. What we saw last night in Washington and across the country was not that. To that end, President Trump is demanding action to protect American citizens, to protect American businesses. 17,000 National Guard are deployed in 24 states, but according to General Milley, only two states have deployed more than 1,000. There are 350,000 National Guard available overall, and for the lawlessness we are seeing, far more needs to be done. Governors across the country must act, deploy the National Guard as it's fit, and protect American communities. As President Trump has said repeatedly, it's very important that we have peaceful protesters and support the right of peaceful protesters, but we cannot allow a situation like what happened in Minneapolis to descend further into lawless anarchy and chaos. And we understand that very well. And with that, I'll take questions. Yes. Uh, to your point, the country is in crisis. There's a global pandemic that has claimed more than 100,000 lives. At least 40 million people are unemployed. There are now protests and, and, and racial tension ripping apart many cities. Where is the president? Why has he not delivered an address to the nation as many of his predecessors have in a time of domestic crisis? So the president has delivered multiple statements on this. Um, the president, as recently as 48 hours ago, uh, was out talking about what a tragedy uh, the death of George Floyd was, how it has weighed on his heart, uh, and how he encourages peace and lawfulness in our streets and, and peaceful protests. So he has said that repeatedly. He's met, made many statements to this effect. But what I would note is continual statements, as he's made day and day and day and day again, uh, they don't stop anarchy. What stops anarchy is action, and that's what the president is working on right now. To that point about the anarchists, uh, you said this morning that the president is focused right now on rooting out Antifa. George Floyd did not die in Antifa custody. He died in police custody. What's the president doing to reform policing tactics? And, and excessive use of force by police? Yeah, so it's an important question for sure. And, and this president, if you look at the actions his DOJ has taken, there's a civil rights investigation into the death of Ahmed Arbery. There's a civil rights investigation into the death of George Floyd. It is a tragedy what we saw. I, I mentioned to you that the president was extremely upset when he saw that video. Um, and, and he continues to, the DOJ continues to pursue those charges. Um, and he's recognized injustices um, for a long time. Since he was a candidate, he talked about um, uh, Sandra Bland and what a terrible video that was, too. So he recognizes injustices where they are. But at the same time, he also recognizes that we can't allow organized groups like Antifa uh, to commit some of the heinous acts that we've seen. John. Yes, Billy, in this call with the governors, the president said that he had put General Milley in charge of all this. What does that mean? Yeah, so. In charge of policing American streets. What, what, what did he mean? 
So I'm not going to get ahead of any actions that will be announced, but what I will say to you is this, that he has had two briefings today uh, with Secretary Esper and AG Barr and General Milley was there, and there will be additional federal assets deployed across the nation. There will be a central command center in conjunction with the state and local governments that will include General Milley, Secretary Esper, and AG Barr, but I won't go any further in announcing what actions. Can you explain what the president meant when he told the governors, I am put General Milley in charge? What what does that mean? Because that, that sounds like a total break here. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff being in charge of a domestic issue. And, and ensuring that, as the president has said, and this has been taken out of context, by the way, that our streets what are is? dominated with a police force and with a National Guard presence. So that, let me explain a little bit about how this works. If there's a peaceful protest, police will form a line. And what we've seen are those lines have been overwhelmed um, by massive protests that have turned into riots, the peaceful protests to be distinguished from the riots we've seen. And when those lines are overwhelmed, law enforcement gets on the defense. So what the president has said is he wants to dominate the streets with National Guard, with a police presence. Um, and what studies have shown, as General Mel Milley noted, he was in that government governor's call, and uh, his, his points all pertain to the National Guard, and he noted that there are several studies that when there's an overwhelming National Guard presence, it actually de-escalates the situation and causes less civil unrest. So General Milley has really been on point um, in talking about the National Guard, the effectiveness, and ensuring that they're utilized to great effect across the country. What's been taken out of context? Because I, I, I mean, I have the, the exact quote. He, it's a very simple one. He just says, uh, that he has put General Milley in charge. No, not, I, I wasn't suggesting that quote was out of context. The dominate. Um, I've seen some oh, networks oh, that have oh. talked about dominating protesters, and I've been around the president all day. Yeah. Anytime he's used the word dominate, it was with regard to dominating the streets and ensuring that we have peace in our streets. Yes. Okay. Yes, Scott. Okay. Thanks. In addition to the tough talk the president has been talking about uh, taking action against looters and some of the violent elements in the protests that we've seen, why isn't he also uh, supplementing that message by calling on these people to remain calm, to go home, to not destroy property, businesses, so on? Yeah, he has done that repeatedly. Look, he talked about understanding the pain that people are feeling, and he does understand that pain. He's talked several times about the right to peacefully protest, and I've seen some of these peaceful protests, some of these sit-ins, and it's a real shame uh, when you have anarchy and anarchists come in and you have Antifa come in, and it really dilutes the message of the protesters, and it's a legitimate reason they're protesting. So he hates to see um, Antifa come in and really dampen that message, which has been, in many cases, peaceful, but has been overtaken and overwhelmed by an organized effort of people from out of state coming in and causing havoc. Is he traveling on Friday? Is he going to Maine? He still plans on going to Maine. I haven't heard any other changes to that effect. Yeah. We just. Thank you. Thank you. I like your mask. Thank That's really you. cool. Um, I have a quick follow-up about police reform. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien says he does not think there is systemic racism among law enforcement in the U.S. Does President Trump share that view? Look, I think where the president stands is he does not believe, he fundamentally rejects the idea that these egregious actions of these four Minnesota officers are representative of our police force as a whole. Most of our officers in this country are good, hardworking men and women who work every day to police our streets. Um, he's recognized cases of injustice. Um, I noted Sandra Bland back when he was in the primary. I've noted more recently um, Ahmed Arbery uh, and then George Floyd. So he recognizes these injustices. He puts a focus on them, but he also recognizes our valiant police officers who have taken to the streets each and every night over the last six nights and protected our communities. Uh, and on Antifa, can you explain what the legal authority the president has is for designating Antifa as a terrorist organization? And can you also talk about why he does not want to label white supremacist groups that are domestically um, located as terrorist organizations as well. So let me address the first part about legal authority. Title 18, Section 2331 allows that the term, uh, it defines domestic terrorism as involving acts dangerous to human life that appear intended to influence the policy of a government and other elements are laid out. And it allows the Department of Justice, when utilizing this statute, to invoke greater investigatory authority um, and to invoke harsher, harsher penalties. I would note that um, the Justice Department has in the past um, used 
use domestic terrorism in consultation with acts of white supremacy or what were racially motivated acts. Like in April 2020, a Florida man pled guilty to threatening an African-American Charlottesville City Council candidate. Um, and at that time, the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force was utilized. Same in the case of February 2020, um, where it was used in connection to four racially motivated violent extremists. And I would also note the president's long history of condemning white supremacy and racism. There is no place in society for these egregious, egregious, despicable ideologies. Jen. Why haven't he designated any white nationalist groups as terrorist organizations? But it has been used, I explained how in this case that domestic terrorism will be used as a way that the crime is prosecuted. It's um, a, a prosecutorial method and it was utilized in the same exact way with regard to white supremacy. Yes. Kaylee, on the Minnesota police officers, is he suggesting that they should be charged as well as the officer who's already been charged, the other three? And also on Antifa, can you explain a little bit about how, how would he know or how is he talking about how you would identify members of Antifa? Since they're a very loose organization, it would be very difficult to tell who is part of Antifa. So first, I was just on the call with the president where he expressed his dismay with those three officers who watched. Um, I'll leave it to the state uh, to pursue those charges if they decide to. Um, it was the state that pursued the initial charge, but the president has expressed his complete dismay with those actions. Um, with Antifa, I do think it's important to note that they are a, a big element of this protest. AG Barr has noted that. Um, o Ambassador O'Brien has noted that. We have ample evidence um, that DOJ has received indicating that Antifa is responsible for that unrest, but as to exactly how Antifa is identified, that would be more of a question for DOJ. Yes. Uh, when you talk about additional federal assets, does the president have authority to deploy forces across the country beyond the National Guard? He does. Um, and look, we're looking at every tool in the in the federal toolkit available to us. You know, ideally, this would have been resolved at the state level. The states, after all, have the police power embedded in the Tenth Amendment, and it is their responsibility to patrol their their streets. But you're right to say that there are many federal authorities, including the one you cited, available to us. Did you bring this up with the governors in the phone call today? The the focus of the call with the governors was really the National Guard, um, not that specific. Uh, tool and the toolkit that you mentioned, but um, the National Guard and how it should be utilized much stronger than it's currently being utilized. Uh, yes, I will go to, uh, let's see, Jeff. Okay, thanks. Um, following up on, on uh, what John was asking earlier, Governor Whitmer, she said she found the president's call today deeply disturbing, and she said the president told the governors they need to put it down or they would be overridden. So what, I mean, is it a specific authority he's using? Because as you know, Posse Donatatis really prevents the use of the army to put down domestic insurrection of anybody. Yeah, I don't know why Governor Whitner, Whitmer would be dismayed at the president telling governors to do their job. Uh, it is their responsibility to police their streets. They have the police power embedded in the Constitution. They have quite clearly, many of them, failed to do their job. Look at the scenes we have seen. And it's gotten to the point where today the president has said, enough is enough. You know, there are tools I can use, namely deploying National Guard, um, many others that Steve cited one, the Insurrection Act. It's one of the tools available. Whether the president decides to pursue that, that's his prerogative. Right now, we're looking at a focus on the National Guard. That's where it currently stands. Um, and, you know, there's a distinction between the National Guard and military forces in the street, I would note. The National Guard are the friends and neighbors in these communities um, who are used, and as I noted, the study from General Milley uh, used to great effect when they are deployed. So the focus of the call was the National Guard encouraging the deployment, far more than the 17,000 out there, um, and utilizing them this evening, certainly. <laughs> Would you like to see 100,000 National Guard on the street or 200,000? I, right I won't put a number on it. I think it's incumbent on governors to look at the situation. You know, a case in Texas might not merit the same thing as, you know, New York City. So uh, he's encouraging the governors to up those levels, but there's not a specific number that he has in mind. David. So the, Kaylee, there is a perception that the, the president is hiding in the bunker on the you know, racial protest issue. He was literally put in a bunker on Friday night by the Secret Service. I mean, would you agree that he is hiding out on this issue, and is that a good posture to be in? I would not. I would not agree with that at all. Look, I was on the 
the phone with the president at least half a dozen times yesterday. And every time I talked to him, he was telling me about a different action he had taken, whether it was talking to a governor about this or a foreign leader, uh, about ventilators. Uh, this president has been leading. He met with generals yesterday. Um, he's each and every moment um, taking another action to try to solve and resolve what we've seen in our streets where the governors have failed. He stepped in. Um, he's acting. He's hard at work. You've heard from him on this issue any number of times. Um, and he's working because that's the job of the president is to keep this country safe. We haven't heard him on camera that, that much. Is he going to give some kind of speech or specific event about you know, all these disturbances no. in hundreds of cities? I really think that that's a misnomer in the media. You know, it was really appalling some of the coverage I saw, like the New York Times yesterday made no no mention of the myriad times that the president has spoken on this issue instead. In paragraph 14, they made a cursory mention of his remarks at Space Force, most of which, at least half of which, pertain to George Floyd. There was a Washington Post article with an egregious headline about Trump staying silent. Uh, he hasn't been silent on this. I have a whole list of his remarks there. And instead, paragraph 23, they note, oh, wait, we're contradicting our own headline. The president did, in fact, make remarks. Contrary to the silent headline, you had Don Lemon on CNN saying at 9.38 p.m. on Saturday night, the president's been silent. Ironically, that comment came four afters after the president was quite audibly speaking at this issue. I was there for the remarks. And then you had CNN double down the next day, Sunday afternoon, saying the president was silent. And, you know, I don't want to bore you with reading out all of the statements, but it sounds like I should read a few, like the president saying it's a grave tragedy that filled Americans all over the country with horror, anger, and grief. And I stand before you as a friend and ally to every American seeking justice. Um, he said, I understand the pain the people are feeling. I can go on and on, but I would just be repeating what the president has already said, because make no mistake, this president has not been silent. And at this moment, he is acting to protect this country from the lawlessness we saw just out here in Lafayette Park last night. Yes. In a uh, particularly egregious act, St. John's Church, uh, Church of the Presidents, was targeted last night. Uh, graffiti all over, set on fire. What is the president's reaction to that, please? It's hurtful, honestly. I think it's hurtful on a number of levels. Look, the VA was defaced. Literally the word veteran spray painted out of the placard in front of the Department of Veteran Affairs. The Lincoln De Memorial defaced. How does that make much sense? The place where the March on Washington began, that, mo that momentous occasion in the history of civil rights, that memorial was defaced last night. That doesn't honor the legacy of George Floyd. It doesn't. And certainly not the burning of St. John's Church. Look, the St. John's, I think it's important to go through a little bit of this, but Reverend John C. Harper was the St. John's rector many centuries ago, at least decades, centuries and a few decades ago. And here's what he was told. He was told he needed to close St. John's because he couldn't leave it open for the March on Washington because, quote, it might be a bloodbath. But he stood boldly. He stood boldly and he stood on the side of justice. And on the day the March on Washington happened, here's what was sung from that church. One family on earth are we throughout its widest span. Oh, help us everywhere to see the brotherhood of man. And of course, we know that the March on Washington ended with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. giving that incredible speech, I have a dream. And that church, the same church that was burning last night, here is what they said, taking that bold stance to support Martin Luther King. They said this, this church building is open as it has always been. So all who want to worship here, the ministry of this parish is extended to any who seek it. Our fellowship with one another has no limitations whatsoever. That church supported the bold civil rights moment of the March on Washington, which began at the Lincoln Memorial. That doesn't honor the legacy of George Floyd. It doesn't further the cause. And those are violent anarchists, Antifa, who are taking advantage of the pain of people, the pain of the peaceful protesters. It's inexcusable, and we have to stand as one America against the burning of the church and the defacement of the Lincoln Memorial. Chanel. Haley, is it possible that D.C. will be placed under martial law in order to protect these national monuments from further destruction? And second, on the, under the Civil Rights Act of 68, um, will this administration investigate either members of Congress or political organizations who are funding or tied to Antifa moving forward? Yeah, you know, on Antifa, I think at this point we're pursuing the domestic terrorism angle. That's what the DOJ has decided. And what was your first question was about martial law? Martial law to protect national monuments in D.C. Yes, so I, I have not heard that discussed. 
Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can you confirm a uh, phone call earlier today between Presidents Trump and Putin? And if so, considering what the president said to governors later in the day, did he ask uh, President Putin for advice on how to quell unrest in his own country? I don't have any details on that call. Um, I wasn't a part of it, um, but in, I, I'm not entirely certain what was discussed, but the call did take place. Yes. Does the, um, does the president regret using phrases like uh, when the shooting starts, the looting starts, looting starts, the shooting starts, and uh, phrases like vicious dogs? Is he considering apologizing? Um, so the president on the, the looting point, he was taken wildly out of context. Twitter, it's interesting to watch. I've seen multiple instances of real incitement of violence on Twitter, but they've never penalized uh, those users. Like, for instance, um, Iran. We've seen horrific tweets from the Iranian regime about the elimination of the Zionist regime, to quote them, and they, that was never flagged. Interesting that their gut instinct was to flag the president, and they did so in an inaccurate way, the president very clearly laid out what he meant by that tweet, that looting leads to shooting. And we have seen the unfortunate killing of one person in Minneapolis. There were seven people shot in a St. Louis uh, riot a few nights ago, and the president clearly laid out what he meant. But it is interesting to watch the gut instinct of Twitter to go ahead um, and label uh, what the president said as somehow inciting violence, which it absolutely was not. Um, but look, I want to say this. We cannot let violence and we cannot let looting and a few bad actors divide us as an American people. Um, the American spirit is defined by love and mutual acceptance and kindness. And despite the horrific scenes we've seen play throughout the media, there's some things that we haven't seen, and I think it's important for the American people to see them. And um, Judd, I'm going to call for that sound by now of some video that I think it's very important for us all to watch. We want to be with y'all for real. So I took my helmet off. They laid the batons down. Yeah. I want to make this a parade, yeah. not a protest. Not one ounce of damage. Nobody's arrested. Nobody got hurt. This is the way it's supposed to be. Protecting an officer separated from his unit. Across the country, we've seen examples of police protecting protesters and protesters embracing police. And it's been beautiful to watch, though those images have not been played all that often. Um, and I just want to leave you with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Overnight, unrest across America. The death of George Floyd in police custody, sparking new protests nationwide. Here in the nation's capital, violence taking place just steps from the White House. You can see that fire uh, that's been set uh, just in front of the White House, outside Lafayette Park. In an extraordinary step, U.S. Marshals and DEA agents were deployed to help keep the peace. It comes as NBC News has confirmed the Secret Service 
was so concerned about President Trump's safety during protests on Friday, they ushered him to a bunker underneath the White House for a very short period of time. More than 100 protests and rallies taking place in cities from coast to coast. In more than a dozen states, the National Guard was called in to help restore order. In Louisville overnight, a man was shot and killed after shots were fired toward the police officers and National Guard members during protests. The chief of police saying officers and soldiers returned fire. The identity of the man who was shot has not been released. In Tampa, smoke and ash filling the sky as businesses burn. Authorities shooting off tear gas. Cars like this police cruiser in Boston incinerated. While looters storm shops, including the small in Arizona. In New York City, this video of two NYPD vehicles ramming into a crowd of protesters, sparking outrage. The mayor defending the officers involved. I also want to emphasize that situation was created by a group of protesters blocking and surrounding a police vehicle. On Saturday night, Mayor Bill de Blasio's own daughter arrested during citywide protests, according to a senior NYPD official. In an effort to clear the streets, dozens of cities, including Minneapolis, put curfews in place over the weekend. We cannot afford to lose anyone else. We don't want any more innocent bystanders getting hurt. Please stay home. Chicago's mayor echoing what so many are feeling. We have to turn our pain into purpose in order to get through this moment together and do the work needed to unite our city. The protests were not all violent, though. In Denver, thousands laid on the ground for nine minutes, chanting, I can't breathe. This is what America's built While in for. Iowa, yes. hundreds marched to make their point. We feel it's time for us to stand up and show the nation Show, show the world, even at that with social media, that we can come together in a peaceful manner and state how we feel. You tell us what you need to do. The sheriff in Michigan marching arm in arm with his community. But it was on the streets of Washington, D.C., among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. But it's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. A poignant moment as a nation tries so hard to move forward. Meanwhile, back here in our nation's capital, you can see the firefighters have pulled up again to try and put out the, the latest fire that's broken out here uh, in Washington, D.C. In just a few moments, we'll have an, exclu an exclusive conversation uh, with the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser. We'll ask how the city's preparing for what they expect is going to be another night of protest. We are in Lafayette Park. We are, as you can see behind me, just steps away from the White House. This is the same spot where I stood last night uh, as violence erupted, as chaos erupted. Flashbangs used throughout the night, rubber bullets used throughout the night. Also last night, shortly before 11 o'clock, the lights went dark uh, here at the White House. Those lights used to uh, usually illuminate the outside of the people's house. They went off. I'm going to step over and show you also what's still happening. Fires around Washington, D.C. You can see the top of this small building, bathrooms, small offices here. Uh, that fire just started back up literally three minutes ago, as you see officials working to put that blade on. In fact, here comes a fire truck. Behind this fire truck, this is St. John's Church. It's known as the Church of Presidents because every president, uh, with the exception, I believe, of James Monroe, uh, has worshipped at some point at this church, riddled with graffiti right now. A fire was started in the basement on Sunday night as the sun came up. Uh, city workers came out to clean off the graffiti uh, and try and clean up that church. And meanwhile, across the street from that church, this is a building that actually has significance uh, to me and my family. This is the Hay Adams Hotel. This is actually where I had my, my wedding reception. Riddled with the graffiti, hotels boarded up, and this is the case for businesses in and around New York, in and around Washington, D.C., looting in Georgetown, not far from here throughout the night. Those protests that started last week, those protests that were largely peaceful in the wake of George Floyd's death, have turned into something else entirely. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We're in the midst of an economic crisis. And what you're seeing here 
as a manifestation of all of that. We are joined now by New York City's Police Commissioner Dermot Shea. Commissioner Shea, good morning. How would you describe the evening last night? We saw a massive police pre presence, huge crowds, violence, fires. Uh, from your perspective, how would you characterize the night? Yeah, Savannah, it was an incredibly challenging and busy weekend. Uh, tens of thousands of protesters all over New York City. Yesterday was a busy day. Um, first 90 percent of yesterday went very well. Probably about five, six thousand protesters throughout New York City. Um, less violence, I would categorize it, as, as the days before. The majority of the protesters were peaceful, um, making their point. When it got dark, it got ugly, and it got ugly quick. Um, we had some violence. Uh, we had another incident, unfortunately, of an individual with a Molotov cocktail in Brooklyn. We had an individual, uh, two officers in a marked car in Queens. Um, that a bullet hit that car, that's under investigation. Uh, there were no protests in that area. Uh, it, it could be unrelated, but that's clearly uh, alarming to us and under investigation. And then the looting. The looting turned very quickly uh, in portions of the city in Brooklyn uh, and primarily in Manhattan, uh, the area of Union Square, 14th Street, Soho. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of arrests in a very short time in that area. And they, and some, unfortunately, are still going up. So it was a challenging yeah, evening for the police officers. Yeah. Union Square is where we are right now. Yeah. The New York Times reported flames going two stories high. I wanted to ask you about a couple of incidents that are making the rounds on social media, one in which a patrol yeah. car, NYPD car in Brooklyn, appears to roll into a crowd of onlookers yes. or demonstrators, I should say. Um, and then another case where an NYPD officer appears to shove a woman down to the ground. Are you looking into those incidents? Have you come to any conclusions about whether that those actions were justified? In, in Savannah, and I appreciate the question, in literally tens of thousands of encounters, we have about six that our internal affairs officers are looking at. Uh, in the process of either identifying the officers, I think by now probably when I get my update shortly, Probably most of the officers will have been identified and there'll be an investigation. And in the car one, anyone that looks at that has to be troubled by what they saw. Um, but there's a couple other incidents in cars that we released to the media and weren't shown. And it shows a similar situation where the cop cars are getting attacked and have to basically get out of there as quickly as possible. So it's, it's a very difficult situation without a good ending either way. Um, that, that is on the heels of uh, Molotov cocktails being thrown at police officers. If you look at that entire video, you see people, um, I would describe it as an ambush, physically trying to hold yeah. that police officer's car in check as people are surrounding it. So it, it, it's it's clearly something that no one should want to see, um, but we'll, we'll move forward. It is difficult situation, no question about it. Do you believe there should be a curfew? New York City doesn't have one. Do you need the National Guard to be here? No, uh, we don't need the National Guard. Uh, we, we got the question on the curfew. I'll be honest with you, Savannah. Uh, we, could, we could impose a curfew today. Uh, the problem is people need to listen to a curfew, and that's not going to happen, first and foremost. If people think it will, they don't understand what's going on. And the second point is anyone that is on the street during this curfew, we had this discussion last night, could probably already be arrested for five different offenses. So what we are doing is trying to manage an extremely volatile situation. There is a lot of outside influences. How we're going to get through with this is level-headedness, police action for sure, but we also need to come together, and not just as a city, but as a country. Yeah. And that's elected officials, that's community leaders, Less inflammatory talk, criticism is good, but inflammatory talk is not helpful. Commissioner Shea, a longer conversation is warranted about all Absolutely. of this and the, and the deeper issues presented here. Unfortunately, we got to leave it there this morning so we can get down to Washington and Craig, who's with the mayor there. But thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Craig, thank I'll send you. it down Stay to you. Safe. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Well, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, is, is here with me now. And, and Mayor, as, as we uh, look on, on Lafayette Park, statues riddled with graffiti, trash everywhere. Uh, flashbangs went out, went off throughout the night. Oh, what do you make of your city this morning? Well, uh, we're, we're certainly um, very uh, sad and, and angry, quite frankly, about the destruction that was that happened here. Well, we're in Lafayette Park, right in the center of our city, in front of the White House, but we had damage uh, in blocks throughout the city. So we want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. Mayor, one of the things that struck me about the protests here last night, as I talked to protesters and, 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 and walked among them for, for a couple of hours, they seem to be really organized. And I've been to a number of pro protests over the years like this. This one seemed to be unusually organized. Well, we know that we have people that came here with tools uh, and supplies, and they re-upped their supplies. They went to different um, parts of the city. Uh, so we think there was a mix of people here, but certainly people here who um, who do this type of protest and demonstration. Professional protesters or demonstrators? Uh, well, we, we've seen some of these tactics before, um, so uh, we, we know that they were among the groups here. Tactics like? Tactics like the types of tools that they use, restocking, setting fires here and there to try to draw in the police to various locations. Uh, the curfew, uh, the National Guard being called in. You were reluctant to do both of those things, uh, but you did. What, what changed your calculation? Um, I think that, uh, you know, our police and all of our intelligence suggested that we were seeing the same type, the same actors, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had every tool at our disposal uh, to keep the city safe. Uh, we saw most of the people peaceably protest. We saw most of the people leave um, at the time of curfew, uh, and that gave the, the authorities the ability to focus on the troublemakers. Are you expecting another night of, of demonstrations? Uh, we're certainly prepared, as we've seen across the country, uh, multiple days of, of demonstrations. Uh, we're working with our intelligence and all of our uh, law enforcement partners uh, to figure out who's coming where. DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. Thank you, uh, Mayor, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good luck to you. Thank you. Overnight, more rage and destructions in cities across the West. On Sunday, angry mobs ignoring mandatory curfews, violently clashing with police, overturning cars, 
torching buildings and looting stores. I can't breathe. In the shadow of Santa Monica's iconic pier and Third Street promenade, the mayhem unfolded for hours as some peacefully protested. Heads up, heads up, heads up. Others provoked a confrontation. Police here are now pushing forward. They're moving all of these protesters back because the situation here is unraveling. From dawn to dusk, the scene spiraling out of control as both sides clashed and tension rose. Some areas, the looting didn't last long. Here on the promenade, local police and the sheriff's department moved in and made several arrests. That's not okay! In Portland, Oregon, officers took down protesters on the sidewalk. In Seattle, more looting and even more troubling scenes caught on camera at the hands of police. This video appearing to show an officer putting his knee on the neck of someone taken into custody before another officer pulls his leg off. A shocking scene after the death of George Floyd, the reason so many poured into the streets. LA's mayor supporting the right to protest, but condemning the destruction, blaming it on extremists. They are hijacking a moment and a movement and changing the conversation. California's governor dispatching the National Guard for the first time since the Rodney King riots nearly 30 years ago. Just like then, businesses and stores paying a heavy price while crowds demanded justice. This is 10 years of a lot of hard work. Amid the chaos, also moments of connection between protesters and police. In California, officers taking a knee, joining the crowd in honoring the memory of George Floyd. Another tense night, now followed by an uncertain day. Here in Los Angeles, police remain on scene as they do in so many major cities all across this country. They are bracing for another round of protests. There are many businesses here that have not yet been looted, and that is what they are still trying to protect here today as those curfews remain in place nationwide in so many cities. It was a heart-stopping moment, a semi-truck driving through a crowd of peaceful protesters on an interstate highway. People are pretty shocked, um, and it was a traumatic experience. Some protesters then swarmed the truck and attacked the driver. Hey, Others protected him. him. He was later arrested. Incredibly, no protesters were injured. It's still not clear why he did it. I think the incident just underscores um, still the volatile situation we have out there. On the sixth night of protests following the death of George Floyd, Minneapolis police surrounded large crowds making mass arrests. Officer Derek Chauvin, who was seen kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, was arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Demonstrators want the three other fired officers involved in the incident to face charges. Now, security video of what happened moments earlier appears to show a struggle in the backseat of a police vehicle. On live television, the city's police chief spoke directly to the Floyd family for the first time about the inaction of those officers as Floyd was dying. Being silent or not intervening to me, you're complicit. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. That acknowledgement left Floyd's brother sobbing. A new report by NBC News finds that since 2015, officers from the Minneapolis Police Department have used so-called neck restraints, using an arm or leg to compress someone's neck, on suspects more than 200 times. And in at least 44 of those cases, the suspects lost consciousness, according to an NBC News analysis of police records. At a growing makeshift memorial for Floyd, signs of a community reeling in pain. I have kids growing up in this world. I got three beautiful children. They're mixed, but even though they're mixed, they look like me, they look the same, and it could have easily been them, it could have easily been me. Michael Holliday came here from Houston, where Floyd grew up. Imagine if it was your child. How would you feel? Imagine if it was your son on the ground, screaming, I can't breathe, help me, please. This community already knows his name, but the world needs to hear his name. So until we have justice, there will be no peace. As protesters demand more charges, they had also wanted the state's attorney general to take over this case from the local prosecutor. That has now happened, Craig.
Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. country was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Pick your emotion. Chances are it was represented in these jumbled images from America's streets. Rage, hate, disappointment, emptiness, hopelessness, and so much fear. It's hard to comprehend that this was about a singular event. No, peace. no matter how horrific. No, peace. This explosion of raw passion seeming to come from a place far deeper a primal scream from a country that may just be fed up, begging for life to be better, fed up with lockdowns and layoffs, COVID and incivility, racism and power abused, a perfect storm of unmitigated pain, a wound too deep, a racial history too deep for mere gestures to heal. Yet are they a start? A police chief kneeling with citizens in California other law enforcement in Kansas City and Camden, New Jersey in their own moments of solidarity with protesters. Most of us have not taken to the streets, even as we may privately hold some of the emotions these pictures speak to. These will be the images that will archive this moment in our history. But let these two, the quiet peacemakers, the neighbors, the businesses picking up the pieces, already physically reclaiming and maybe improving all that was lost. NBC News Now, we have a lot of important news to get to today, so let's go right over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She's following the latest headlines for us from NBC News. Alexa, how about an update? Hey, Allison. Lots of news, as you mentioned, in this hour. First, from NBC's Jeff Bennett, President Trump berated governors in a video conference today, saying, quote, most of you are weak. This, of course, follows widespread unrest in cities over the weekend. Now, according to a source on the call, the president told state leaders, quote, you have to dominate. If you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. On Twitter, the president has called for a tougher stance on protesters, tweeting yesterday, quote, where are the arrests and long-term jail sentences? Meanwhile, after a weekend of marches and demonstrations following the death of George Floyd, some Americans took to the streets to help clean up the damage in their communities. Cities like Chicago are deploying resources to help with the efforts. Take a listen to Mayor Lori Lightfoot. I know that for many of you, your life's work went into developing these businesses and commercial centers. I know that for many of you, your blood, sweat, and tears went into recruiting businesses to come support the vibrancy of your communities. 
And I want you to hear from me. Not only do I know that, I and we will be your partner in rebuilding. Now, former President Barack Obama in a Medium post today wrote that the wave of demonstrations represent, quote, a genuine and legitimate frustration over a decades long failure to reform police practices and the broader criminal justice system in the United States. The former president added that the violence by a small minority of people jeopardized innocent lives and further hurt local businesses. He added, quote, let's not excuse violence or rationalize it or participate in it. Now, experts fear the nationwide protests over Floyd's death could increase the spread of coronavirus, reversing the gains from social distancing over the last few months. That's the latest from NBC's Erica Edwards. The large gatherings in major cities across the country go against public health, avi- health advice on how to curb the spread of COVID-19, which has now claimed the lives of nearly 105,000 people in the United States, with, w- with more than 1.7 million confirmed cases. Atlanta's mayor had this to say on Sunday protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week. Because there's still a pandemic in America that's killing black and brown people at higher numbers. Now from NBC's Ben Kesslin, a man was shot dead in a demonstration in Louisville, Kentucky, early Monday as protests as the city mourns the death of 26-year-old Breonna Taylor. In a statement this morning, Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear said that after being fired at, quote, the LMPD and the Kentucky National Guard returned fire, resulting in a death. He added an investigation was underway by the Kentucky State Police. Those are the headlines for this hour. Lots and lots of news there, Allison. And we'll be back, as always, a little later with more. Yeah, so much going on. Alexa, thanks for staying on top of it. We'll talk to you in just a little while. The mayor of Washington, D.C., imposing a two-day curfew that starts tonight after three nights of protests outside the White House. Here's what Mayor Bowser told MSNBC anchor Craig Melvin this morning on The Today Show. We want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. MSNBC correspondent Garrett Haig joining me now from Washington, D.C. And Garrett, last night we saw fires just blocks from the White House. What is it like there in D.C. today? Allison, I've been here for a couple hours today, and it's been largely a small, peaceful protest out here on the street just a few minutes ago. Most of the protesters who you see behind me were sitting here on H Street, literally sitting in the street, uh, just north of Lafayette Park, the parts that is on the north side of the White House, protesting peacefully. Then we have this bizarre, profoundly provocative decision, quite honestly, uh, by the U.S. Park Police and Secret Service who protect this park to decide to come out and take up this position in their full riot gear for absolutely no reason. There was no police presence here whatsoever until about 10 minutes ago. And now we've got a line of more than 100 officers in their full body armor. It's an interesting decision, to say the least, perhaps colored by the way things turned out last night, where late in the evening, as the curfew went into effect around 11 o'clock last night, uh, the situation devolved uh, pretty dramatically here in Washington, including with a fire lit in the basement of the famous St. John Church, just over my shoulder here. Here's what the pastor of that church said this morning to NBC's Craig Melvin. We know that emotions are high, and we know that there are a lot of elements here that um, it's not all one unified voice, and there are going to be all kinds of messages, and our church walls represented a lot of different messages, in fact. Um, And I I also noticed that... um, Compared to a lot of the nearby buildings, it was an interesting thing to be aware of. I felt grateful that actually we were spared some of the worst stuff that I saw nearby. And, Allison, that's certainly the case in the blocks fanning out here from downtown D.C. Yeah. and in some other parts of the city. There was pretty widespread destruction last night with uh, windows smashed, fires lit, ATMs torn out of walls and things like that. About 80 arrests made, according to the Metro Police Department. Uh, hoping for a much calmer night tonight with that earlier starting curfew. All right, Garrett Haken, D.C., thank you so much. You bet. 
In New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo said he'll speak with City Mayor Bill de Blasio about a curfew. There are also concerns that the protests in New York City could cause an increase in coronavirus cases. The governor calling that his major concern as the city prepares to reopen. We just spent 93 days limiting behavior, closing down, no school, no business, thousands of small businesses destroyed. People will have lost their jobs. People wiped out their savings. And now, mass gatherings with thousands of people in close proximity? one week before we're going to reopen New York City? What sense does this make? And NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joining me now from Union Square in New York City. Kathy, we know New York City was the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak here in the U.S. What's going on there today? And are people concerned about spreading the virus? Well, Allison, we are here at Union Square, and we have uh, a group of demonstrators behind me gathered. It's been peaceful pretty much all afternoon. Um, but they've been out here since Thursday, and they say they will continue to be out here to, to make their voices heard. Um, but like I said, it's been pretty calm. However, in, in the past couple of minutes or so, I, wa I do want to show you the, the shift in the dynamics here as far as the law enforcement presence go. You see a lot of officers um, just kind of standing guard. You also have the, the barricades that are up. Meanwhile, you have uh, businesses like the Whole Foods here boarded up, preparing for potential unrest later on this afternoon. Uh, but Allison, I think it's really important to point out that usually uh, the way that these uh, demonstrations have gone in the afternoon, like right now, things have been relatively calm. Uh, the, the crowds continue to grow. Right. They're, they're on the move throughout the city, um, but they're not destructive. You know, the 10 o'clock hour and beyond when, when we have noticed um, the aggression, the looting. Um, not sure if you can see this, but over to my left, there is a GameStop. And uh, there was social media video that was posted of people who live in the community uh, high up in the apartments. They were recording the, the looting live. Um, and they were calling out these looters, saying, you know what, stop doing this to our community. This is not for George Floyd. Um, so they're, they're frustrated uh, about the violence and, you know, Officials have said that this is just a small minority, that at least the looters, uh, there's a small group, uh, the fringe groups that are creating a lot of chaos um, in, in New York City. Uh, you mentioned social distancing, though. Uh, I'll go back to that. I mean, we have a large crowd here. I would say the majority of people have their masks on, yeah. but they're, they're pretty, you know, packed in. Um, but, you know, this group will, yeah. the way that things have been going, um, they start here, this is kind of like a meeting area, and then they kind of shift and they, and they take, um, make, make their way throughout the city. I understand there is another protest uh, or demonstration, I'd say, near the Times Square area, but it kind of goes on uh, throughout the day. But then there is that potential shift. Uh, but right now, um, the mayor uh, earlier said that they'll be in discussion with the governor as well as with police to kind of figure out if they do implement that curfew. But as of right now, there isn't one. Allison? Kathy, besides the curfew, any other plans, anything they're saying about what they're going to do to try to keep things under control as the day hours turn into night? Yeah, they, you know what, they, I think as, as far as our perspective goes, because we've been out here for a couple of days, mm -hmm. uh, we have definitely seen the stepped up presence. Um, a lot more uh, officers on yeah. control. They have their riot gear. Uh, they, they have those ties, I guess, if uh, they, they need to use them um, on the protesters who do get a little unruly. Um, but, but that's the thing. It's, you know, they obviously condemn the violence. They uh, acknowledge the fact that people have the right to protest uh, freely, but, but do it safely. And, you know, don't don't turn to violence. And, and that seems to be the message here. Uh, but, yeah, I, I would say something that I haven't seen before uh, is just the, the heightened police presence. Also, the businesses are a bit on edge because they yeah. just don't know what to expect. So we were in Soho earlier th this afternoon where there was some massive uh, destruction. And, and if you know the Soho area, it's a big shopping district, a lot of high end luxury stores. And a lot of those businesses were looted. Uh, they just broke through the glass. They, they smashed into everything, grabbed the merchandise and, and ran out. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say exactly where things will go, but obviously the messages do not turn this into a violent event. Allison.
Yeah, we have seen those images. We have heard uh, about the looting and the violence. Uh, Kathy Park, thanks for your reporting, and please stay safe out there tonight. Yep. A deadly shooting in Louisville overnight while police were enforcing a curfew during protests there. One man, David McAtee, died when police and the National Guard were shot at and returned fire on a crowd. It is not clear, though, who fired the deadly shot. Protesters in Louisville outraged over the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. She was shot and killed during a police raid in March. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry joining me now. And Cal, you have been in the city all weekend. What is it like there today? It's very, very tense. You talked about David McAtee. His body was just removed about an hour ago. I can show you the scene. Protesters have stayed in this area. The police have uh, removed themselves from the area, which I think, frankly, was the smart thing to do as it was getting very, very tense. On Thursday night, seven people were shot protesting in the city. On Friday night, there was violence. Saturday night, at least five police officers were targeted by gunfire. And last night, as you said, that deadly shooting of David McAtee. He's a man, 53 years old, who lived in the neighborhood. He was known to everybody here. He sold barbecue. People in the neighborhood said he gave barbecue away for free to a lot of the police officers. So this is an area that is deeply hurt by what happened last night. They're wondering how it's going to go today. And I have to tell you, when you talk to people here, they'll say that the presence of the National Guard, such a heavy handed presence, is what is starting some of this violence. During the day, you have these very peaceful protests. During the evening, you start getting those those pepper rounds, you start getting some of that tear gas, some of those rubber bullets. And then at night, unfortunately, it's turning very, very deadly uh, in this city, Alice. Yeah, uh, do we know, Cal, uh, more about the plans, say, how the city is going to try to keep things uh, from getting violent tonight, how they're trying to protect everybody? You know, we don't. We heard the governor, Governor Bashir, say that he wants all the videotapes yeah. of what happened last night in the shooting to be released before midnight so people can see it. I think that would make a huge difference, just that transparency. When you look at some of what has happened in the past year, it's been a lack of transparency. Brianna uh, Taylor, who was killed in her apartment, there was very little transparency about why that police raid took place, what led to that warrant. Uh, those officers who were involved in that shooting are still on an administrative reassignment. The public here doesn't believe they've been punished. So hopefully transparency will help that. The curfew will be in place from dusk until dawn. We'll have to see how the National Guard reacts. Last night they reacted very hard and very swiftly. Tonight we'll have to see because the city, as, as we've sort of been saying, Allison, is very, very upset. Absolutely. Cal, hope everyone stays safe there. You as well. Thanks so much. Thanks, Allison. Here are the latest developments out of Minnesota and in the George Floyd case. Newly released surveillance video showing another angle of George Floyd's arrest. He appears to be struggling with officers while in the backseat of a police car. Meanwhile, there are more protests in Minneapolis. This video is from Sunday. A truck barreled through a crowd of peaceful protesters on a bridge in Minneapolis. Police say that truck driver was injured and is under arrest. Officials say, though, it doesn't look like the truck hit any protest. Testers. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz extended the state's curfew. We will be extending the curfew for two days, but the times will change. It will go from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And one of the reasons in this is, is, is Minnesotans have taken charge of this. The only way these things work is what we've seen the last two nights. The vast majority of people abide by this. NBC News reporter Shaq Brewster is in Minneapolis. Shaq, you're at the George Floyd prayer vigil. Uh, describe for us, tell us what the mood is like there, what it has been there, like there today, and who have you heard from? Allison, it's been really emotional, really emotional scene, and that's because the brother yeah. of George Floyd, Terrence Floyd, came over, he had flowers, he sat with the group, prayed, and then spoke to the crowd. And in that speech, he really was at a plea for peace. He said that he didn't want to see the looting and violence. He wanted to see people peacefully protesting. There was a large crowd here. The crowd got bigger as he stayed longer. Listen to a little bit of what the brother of George Floyd, Mr. Terrence Floyd, had to say. I understand y'all upset. But like it was already said, I doubt y'all uh, half as upset as I am. So if I'm not over here wilding out, if I'm not over here blowing up stuff, if I'm not over here messing up my community, 
Now what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing. Because that's not gonna bring my brother back at all. Allison, I'll tell you, as people were listening, they were crying, people were clapping. The brother, when he got out of the car, he actually was visibly shaken by the people that were here. He had to be helped yeah. up and stayed up. And he came over and he stopped at multiple of these vigil locations. And I'll let you look at one of the one of them. You see that mural that says George Floyd? That's a new mural. Obviously, George Floyd died here a week ago in this okay. intersection. And you see the flowers yeah. that are there, the signs that are there, the candles. People coming over, that lady leaving a sign right there, Black Lives Matter, and you've been seeing that happen all day long. Just in this intersection, there's three of these scenes like that. And I'll take you over to the second one, as close as we can get, because in the middle, there's a Native American group doing a prayer circle. And that's something that you've been seeing, sense of community, Native American, black, white. It's a very diverse group of people here. Allison, I'm going to hold this up really yeah. quickly just to let John, our photographer, give you a look inside. And actually, that group has just left. But you see, this is the second of three, at least three large memorials, large vigil locations where people are just leaving flowers, paying their respect. After we saw Terrence Floyd come over yeah. and speak to the press and uh, speak to the supporters that are here, he then came over here and had a moment here where he just paid his respects to his brother. Allison? Jack, for those of us watching from home, it was so moving. Uh, everything you've said, from the murals, uh, listening to Terrence Floyd speak about his brother, I can only imagine what the emotions are like there today. Uh, it, just incredible uh, to, to see that today. Uh, could you give us the latest as well on the Floyd case, where we are with that uh, this Monday? Yeah, there's a few different updates, even in the past couple of minutes, Allison, and I'll read down as I'm doing this. But just to give you an idea, the family and their attorneys have done their, all, their own autopsy. So the results, they're announcing the results of the autopsy in a press conference that's going on right now. But one thing that they found, and I'm reading here, it says that they, uh, what they found is consistent with what people saw. There is no other health issue that could cause or contribute to the death of Mr. Floyd. This is in bold in the press release of, that they have sent out. They said, from all the evidence, the doctors now say it appears Mr. Floyd died at the scene, that he died after Officer Chauvin put his knee in his neck and kept it, kept it there for several minutes before anything broke up. And we also know that the autopsy is saying it was due to asphyxia from uh, sustained forceful pressure to his neck and to his back. So that's what the family is saying right now in their own independent autopsy. But what we know from the official side and the prosecution side is that the case is now in the hands of the uh, state and federal investigators. We still have that dual track investigation, but... Here in Minneapolis and in Minnesota, Attorney General Keith Ellison is now leading the prosecution against those officers. We know that Officer Chauvin, he's been charged and arrested and he's being held right now, now in a state uh, jail at this point. But the other three officers are still out. They're still being investigated at this point. Attorney General Ellison said a couple days ago, before he took control of this case, he said that he would expect those other officers to be charged. He's not saying that exact language now, not using that language now, but he's saying he will do a thorough investigation. He will complete the investigation, and it will be a fair investigation for the family of Mr. Floyd. One thing and one chant that Terrence Floyd, the brother of Mr. Floyd, led mm -hmm. while he was here was he said, one down, three to go. He's saying that the one officer was charged. He wants the other three officers charged. As he said that, and you heard what he said earlier, that call for peace. He said that there's justice on the left, peace on the right. He wants justice to happen, but he wants it to happen peacefully. And for him and for many people here, justice looks like charges for the remaining fired Minneapolis Police Department officers. Allison. Yeah. Shaq Brewster in Minneapolis. Thank you so much. No problem. Have a good one. You too. As protests rage across the country, President Trump unloaded on the nation's governors on a conference call earlier today, calling them, quote, weak and demanding that they crack down on the protests more aggressively. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joins me now. And Carol, what specifically is the president asking the governors to do? Well, his big thing, Allison, is that he wants them to use the National Guard more aggressively. That's his big complaint. And we heard it mm -hmm. from the president on this call. And then we heard it from White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany afterwards. And 
And, and their argument is that governors have this tool. They can deploy the National Guard to assist in situations like this, and they're not using it to its fullest extent. And so that was his big frustration. The National Guard is deployed in do more than two dozen states, but they're saying that only a very small number of states are actually using large numbers of National Guard members. And the president saying in this call where he said, we need to dominate um, on the streets of Otherwise, as you said, he noted, you'll look weak, you're going to look like fools. At one point, he said, if you don't do this, you'll look like jerks. Um, and so what he's leaning on is this National Guard issue. And 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 they're backing it up by with a sort of threat of that they'll take other federal actions if this isn't if done to the president's satisfaction. We heard that from the press secretary saying there are other things uh, under consideration to deploy additional federal assets. We don't know exactly what she means by that. Um, but she also said that they are going to announce some sort of what she called a central command center that involves the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, the defense secretary, Mark Esper, and Attorney General Barr, and that that would be uh, something that coordinates with state and local governments. Um, but again, we don't know exactly what the details of that are, but they're using that and the threat of other additional federal moves to try to get governors to do what the president says they're not doing doing in terms of deploying the National Guard. So, Carol, I have to ask, what kind of reaction is all of that getting from the governors? Well, it was uh, an interesting phone call uh, where we heard some yeah. of the governors really, uh, you know, particularly the governor of Illinois, who said um, that she thought the president's words, his rhetoric so far has been inflammatory. Um, she was concerned about that. And, you know, he listened to her and then he responded, well, you know, I don't really like your rhetoric either, and noted that she had been critical of him um, during the, uh, the his response to cor the coronavirus pandemic which is obviously still ongoing. And then we heard from the governor of Michigan say that she was disturbed by what the president was saying at the call on the call. And then, you know, there are also governors who obviously really support the president and didn't take that point of view. All right, Carol Lee, uh, an interesting, as you said, uh, conference call this morning, to say the least. Thanks yeah. for walking us through it. Thank you. The protests over George Floyd's death are happening not just in Minneapolis and major cities here in the U.S., but there have been rallies, vigils and protests in more than 250 cities, big and small, across the entire country. Some of those protests, as we know, turn violent, and in some cities, outsiders are being blamed for that violence. On Saturday, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz originally estimated that about 80 percent of the arrests in the Twin Cities were people coming from outside the state. Yesterday, though, he walked that back. I just think candidly, um, I certainly think I want to believe it's outside more, and that might go to the problem that we have of saying can't be Minnesotans. I've been very clear, and I'll say it again this morning, the catalyst that started all of this was the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota, and that was our problem. So who is responsible for the violence? It is an important and it is also a complicated question. Joining me now to discuss this MSNBC correspondent and host of NBC News podcast Into America, Tremaine Lee, and NBC News reporter Brandy Zadrozny. Uh, thanks to both of you uh, for being here to talk about this with us. Tremaine, let me start with you. Uh, we are hearing very different things about where the violence is coming from at these protests. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison echoed the claims that it's coming from outsiders this morning on MSNBC. Take a listen to what he said. The protesters are protesting for justice for George Floyd. They're, they've been peaceful. But these other folks who have another agenda, and I don't know where they're from, and I don't know what their ideology is, uh, have been active. But we know they're there, uh, and we need to learn a whole lot more about them. Jermaine, you have been talking with black activist groups. What are they seeing and what are they telling you? 
Allison, I'll tell you what, there is very real concern that this movement and the protest uh, built after the death of George Floyd and calling for justice in that case, uh, mm -hmm. that it's being infiltrated by, quote, and I want to say what one activist said, by white anarchists and white communists. And what they say is what they're seeing mm -hmm. across the country, certainly there's uh, enough rage spread around and anger, and we've seen a, a rebellion and uprising, but you've also seen many instances uh, of white protesters, some with masks on, breaking windows, setting fires, and a number that have been caught um, on social media, you have black activists or black protesters, you know, urging them not to do that. But you've seen it time and again. So their concern right. is that, you know, if there's going to be any trouble, let us earn our own trouble. Because what happens is after those uh, white activists or white um, agitators depart, then these black folks are left to deal uh, with whatever the police and whatever the system right. heaps upon them. And that's the big concern. Brandy, we have seen extremist groups show up at civil rights protests many times in the past. You report on the online space, and that's where bad actors notoriously organize violent unrest. This week, you reported there is not a lot of evidence that, of that this time around. What have you found? Well, protests like this are really messy. Um, like any breaking news situation, whether it's like a natural disaster or a shooting or, or anything else where we just don't know a lot, um, it just takes time to figure out just what's going on. And um, initially, the thing that we think is happening isn't always a thing that's happening. So we are definitely seeing outside groups in the spaces that I and extremist researchers um, look at. We're seeing outsiders, whether that's outside of the location or ideologically outside, we're seeing them show up at these protests. That's right. You know, we've seen something called a boogaloo, uh, members that are sort of libertarian, far-right gun extremists, and they hate the government and the police, and they want to incite a second civil war. There are them. Those, are, those people are there. We haven't necessarily seen violence on their end yet. And we've also seen some Proud Boys. They're a racist, sexist fraternity of Western chauvinists, and they've been known to be violent in the past. Um, some who are have been impersonating even people that are considered uh, Antifa, right? So, but we haven't seen any proof of white supremacists mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, we're just seeing a really messy thing play out and a lot of organizations and a lot of groups saying that we don't want to be associated with that messy element. We're still trying to figure out what it is. Brandy, have you also gotten a sense, I mean, you mentioned all of these different potential uh, anarchist groups uh, that may have been there. Uh, are are, are you getting a sense, and I know it's a tough question to answer, whether there is any organized effort here, if it's just random individuals popping up, or is that still what you're trying to piece together here? Yeah, so again, that's talking about like the far left, the Antifa, which is just really this really nebulous sort of, um, it's a boogeyman that conservatives have used to demonize, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Right, nebulous groups of uh, people that are against the far right. But it doesn't really have a robust organizational structure. So um, it can be used to label sort of any white rabble rouser in black. Um, and, but what it does, it, it does mean, yeah. Antifa does mean a group of radicals that rely on direct action, not police or the court system to shut down the far right and fascism. Sometimes that can turn into violence for sure. And there may very well be an anti-fascist uh, coalition of groups who are coming to the protests and causing harm. The fact is we don't know that yet. And all of the authorities who've made that yeah. claim have yet to provide any evidence, and that's a problem. Trumaine, I know we still do have a lot of questions here, but if there are outsiders instigating violence and looting, whether they are part of a coordinated effort or not, can we talk about the broader implications of that and what black leaders are doing to keep the attention on their very important message? You know, these activists, many of them are already uh, kind of trapped in a, a kind of a divide here. They understand the anger and rage of, of black youth who don't have a voice and are lashing out, uh, setting fires and sometimes looting and breaking into to buildings. Uh, but then you add this extra element. Uh, their concern is that it threatens to undermine uh, the entire momentum and energy behind the movement. Because then you see them saying, hey, look what's happening at the Black Lives Matter protest. It must look at look what happened to Antifa. You have to classify these groups as terrorist organizations. So the problem is that it redirects the energy, it redirects the focus and attention uh, where it's not needed. And so these activists say, 
say uh, they need to stay focused and they want their constituents, other activists, to just be on the lookout and to point it out when they see it and to call it out, but also to remain steadfast and focused uh, on what the mission is, which is ultimately justice for George Floyd and justice for other, uh, you know, unarmed black people, especially who are killed by the police. Absolutely. Tremaine, Brandy, uh, there has been so much going on. Uh, very complex issues here. Thankful to both of you for walking us through them. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up we hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together i'm lester holt and for all my colleagues at nbc news take care if it's asking the tough questions would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown if it's asking for accountability respirators and ventilators has the federal government stepped up enough if it's navigating the new normal in america and if it's sunday it's meet the press the coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Benjamin Crump, the attorney for George Floyd's family, is holding a news conference to release the findings of the independent autopsy of Mr. Floyd. Let's listen in. Three officers. Attorney Ramanucci will take that question. So in terms of criminal charges, there, there is no doubt that those, are, that those police officers are, are criminally liable also. We will leave it up to Attorney General Ellison to be transparent, to be fair, to review the evidence in the totality of the circumstances. But I urge anyone who looks at that video and reviews the entire evidence that not only were constitutional violations abound here, but this was criminal. They knew that they were employing restraints that could or might cause death. And by having that knowledge, 
and by continuing to mount the pressure on his body, restricting his airway and cutting off blood to his brain, they knew that they would cause death. To be culpable of murder or homicide, you only need to know that what you are doing could lead to death. They were trained, supposedly, that those restraints could or might cause death. They need to be charged criminally. They are criminally liable because they knew that what they were doing could lead to death. And indeed, we know that it did cause his death. Raina S. from CARE. Thank, thank you, Attorney Ramanucci. And just to be clear, George Floyd family wants first degree murder for mm -hmm. Officer Chauvin and the other officers to be charged to the full extent of the law because George was their blood. Imagine someone who is your family and during the last moments of his life on this earth, begging for humanity, begging to be treated like a human being, begging to be treated like one of God's children. They want a first degree murder charge. They want equal justice for African-Americans because black lives matter and George Floyd life mattered. Rena S from Care 11 News asks, do the doctors believe the information about underlying conditions Oh, I apologize. Rena S. from CARE 11 News asks, and are, are the doctors basing the cause of death solely on the video and not the autopsy? When looking at the case, the entire in investigation, including the autopsy, are very important. The determination of cause and manner of death are based on the circumstances surrounding the death, which does include the video, but also additional findings that were determined at our autopsy. We do have physical evidence that supports that there was pressure applied to his neck. And it's in this combination with the additional medical information that we have, including examination of all of the other organs that were available to us, in making our determination of cause of death. And Dr. Bowden, could you speak just to the physical abrasions to his head and face and how that contributed to your determinations? Yeah, yes, as Dr. Wilson said, we take everything we have into consideration. The forensic autopsy starts at the scene. Much time in most homicide cases is uh, relates to reconstructing the, the scene. Detectives going out and interviewing people, all kinds of forensic science uh, uh, work, picking up trace evidence. In this instance, the video tells you what the scene is. The video is real. The multiple videos are real. And those multiple videos show pressure that can cause death and his calling out, like Eric Garner, but also including calling out for his mother, who had been dead for three years. None of this caused a release of the pressure. And that is very disturbing. Now, what was abrasions to his <laughs> Thank you. There were, abra there were rough abrasions around the left eye and the left cheek and a little bit in the front of the, uh, on the nose and mouth areas that are due, as we can see in the video, to the left side of his face being rubbed against the pavement while the left knee of the officer is squeezing down on the left side of the neck, which would be, the, the neck is a small area with many vital organs arteries, veins, nerves, and the windpipe, all of which are compressed with the knee uh, 
activity as seen on the video. So that the abrasions on the side of the neck and the nose and a, would also indicate that a, a component of the interference with breathing uh, could be, uh, it was also some pressures that were placed on the nose and mouth. And uh, these are also very painful kinds of scrape marks. There was also severe scrape marks on the back of his left shoulder, which is part of the activity that was uh, uh, causing him uh, to uh, rub against his knee, the officer's knee as well as the face being on the ground. And that, that those occurred while he was uh, still alive and breathing. And is that evidence of pressure? That is evidence of severe pressure on the face, large areas of, of uh, scraping abrasions on the face in particular, the left side of the face, which is evidence of his face being rubbed severely against the ground. What Dr. Bodden said is also very important for the prior question of the criminal charges, because what was happening on that video um, is, is extremely important because when, when, when the brave young man that you're gonna hear from tomorrow was trying to uh, attempt life-saving um, statements to the police officers, or when George Floyd was calling out that he can't breathe or for his mother, you could see, at least from one of the angles, the, the first angle that was released, that Officer Chauvin was readjusting his knee in order to further compress that tight area of the neck. That is an expression of knowledge. That taunt of readjusting his knee in order to further compress the airway and hold him down with that sustained pressure is evidence of criminal conduct. Liz Navratil from the Star Tribune asks the doctors, if your autopsy found any evidence of the heart disease or other underlying conditions. Dr. Biden or Dr. Wilson. As I've mentioned previously, um, certain parts of the organs have been retained by the original pathologist. In the sections that we have and in the specimens that we examine, there is no significant underlying disease of the heart. The sections of the vessels um, that we examined were clear of atherosclerosis. Um, the sections that have been retained, we will examine once they can be avail made available to us. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I'd just, I just like to, to add on in my coronavirus uh, uh, susceptible age group, that I wish I had the same coronary arteries that uh, Mr. Floyd had that we saw at the autopsy. Thank you for putting that in context for us, Dr. Bodden. Yamichi at PBS NewsHour asks, can the doctors determine at this time how long it took Mr. Floyd to die? Yeah, I counted, I counted the, uh, the video from the time the video started, which was a few seconds apparently after uh, uh, Mr. Floyd was pushed on the ground and the uh, knee put on the neck, counts about three minutes and 50 seconds between the time he's on the ground and the time he becomes motionless at a time when the uh, uh, passers-by, the persons, the, the civilians who were watching and photographing, yelled out that he was dying, that he was lifeless, that he should be permitted to get up, that he's, that he's dying, that he's gonna be dead. From the, the moment, uh, three minutes and uh, plus seconds, uh, he was motionless. He had no evidence of breathing, of uh, struggling and remained that way for another four or five minutes with the knee on his neck until the EMS people arrived and found he had no pulse, he had a cardiac arrest, 
they tried CPR, they tried uh, shock to, to the heart, nothing worked and he did not recover. He, in my opinion, he died, he was dead after about four or five minutes. He was pronounced dead sometime later when he gets to a hospital, a person's alive in this country until a proper physician, usually a physician, pronounces him dead, but he was, he appears to be dead very, before the EMT people get there, certainly. And it's, it's important to note the two EM, EMT, it's important to note that the two EMT members, once they got to the scene, they had Lucas device working on an unresponsive, postless male. They concluded in the ambulance, they performed post checks several times, finding none, and delivered one shock by their monitor. The patient's condition did not change. He remained unresponsive and postless. And that's why I said the ambulance that we see arrive on the scene was George Wilson's hearse. I'm sorry, the ambulance that we see arrive on the scene was George Floyd's hearse. Question from Andrew Tangle from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, do the medical examiner's results um, differ in professional opinion from the county, county medical examiner, or is that information you don't have yet? At this time, we have not had the opportunity to review the actual preliminary report from the medical examiner who performed the autopsy. We have seen accounts from the complaint. Um, and based on that, yes, our findings do differ. Some of the information I read from that complaint um, state that there was no evidence of traumatic asphyxia. This is the point in which we do disagree that there is evidence in this case of mechanical or traumatic asphyxia. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for explaining that. Next question. Oh, Dr. Bobby. Okay. If you could speak louder with the questions. Five minutes left. There are no further questions. Okay. Thank you all. We will continue to keep you informed as we continue to move forward to getting justice for George Floyd. Thank you and God bless. And let's remember to take a breath, America. Let's take a breath for George. Let's take a breath for peace. Let's take a breath for justice. And let's take a breath to heal our country. Thank you. George Floyd's family making funeral arrangements in Houston, his hometown, as the vigils and rallies in his honor continue around the city this week. Some of those rallies have turned violent with anti-police protests, but in some cases, police and protesters are taking a different approach. This moment here, a hug between a Houston protester and police officers is inspiring hope. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joining me now from Houston. And Priscilla, you spoke to the woman hugging the police officer officer in that photo. What did she tell you about that touching moment? Yeah. 
Well, Allison, that photo was taken here on Friday, and that was the day where these robust protests really began to pick up. And while they started peacefully, tensions did escalate throughout the night, and a number of folks were arrested that night. But that woman that you see in that photo, Tiara Johnson, I, I spoke with her, and she t described to me an incident where she saw the police officer standing there, and he was surrounded by a number of protesters who were shouting at him and expressing their concerns. And she says that she saw him begin to nod. And that's when she walked over to him. And I want you to take a listen to what she told me happened next. I like stepped up to him and I, I leaned in and I was like, I just want to let you know, like, you're not alone. Like, we got your back. Like, as long as you're for the people, we're going to be for you. And he was like, thank you. Um, and then I was like, sometimes people really just need a hug and you look like you need one. So I leaned in, I gave him a hug and he said, thanks. And we're seeing instances like this across the country with police officers marching with protesters and taking a knee. And while some people I've spoken to have said that this makes them feel hopeful, it feels like a turning point, I've also heard from others who are concerned that it may just be you know, are concerned about how genuine those efforts are and tell me that they really want to see actionable change behind those uh, moments of solidarity. Absolutely, Priscilla, we all do want to see actionable change, but these uh, small moments of humanity uh, really mean so much these days. Uh, could you also tell us as well the latest uh, on the funeral plans for George Floyd? I know his family is working on those right now. Yeah. So the latest thing we've actually learned, and I just spoke with a Houston rapper here, Trey The Truth, that is going to be organizing a rally tomorrow mm -hmm. ahead of George Floyd's body returning to the city. Um, and so and they're expecting thousands of folks to turn out for that rally. But he told me that it was really important for him to find a way to support the city and so, uh, support the family and really welcome George Floyd back to the city where he grew up. And so we've been in touch with the funeral home and we do know that services are being planned and we expect to have more details here in the next 24 hours. We believe there's going to be some sort of service held in Minnesota before the body is brought back here to be laid to rest. Um, and we also just recently learned that the police chief here has spoken with the family and offered them a police escort for the body when he is brought back here, Allison. All right, Priscilla Thompson with the latest on the funeral arrangements for George Floyd in Houston. Thank you so much. A new earlier curfew is now in place in Santa Monica, California, after another night of protests, vandalism and clashes with police. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins me now from Santa Monica. And Aaron, what can you tell us about this new curfew and what is the situation there right now? Well, right now here in Santa Monica, they're very much trying to clean up the situation, as you can see here. Yesterday was a scene of incredible looting and rioting. Let me just let the camera pan over to show you Jack's Jewelers. Rioters entered the space, completely smashed it. Joining me now to talk about what happened is the owner of this jewelry store. Jack, what can you tell me about what happened here yesterday? Um, I was here yesterday around early afternoon. I came in just to check around because uh, I heard the demonstration was happening in Santa Monica. So when I got here, uh, the demonstration was happening around here on um, second, and uh, so I was inside. Uh, I felt people were running around, and I just uh, stood and uh, took some of my other stuff, uh, safe place. Uh, but I kept uh, seeing people in front of my store uh, knocking. They want to break in with a few people together. And I waved them, I told them, just leave, please, and they, they did. And another uh, set of guys came in, they wanted the same thing. So um, I felt like my life was in danger to sit here and protect my store. I couldn't anymore. I heard the banging store probably next door. They broke in the next door. So I just put my alarm and went home. So you went home knowing that your store was being destroyed. That must have been absolutely right. terrifying exactly. for you. Right after I, I left home, uh, it was around uh, 2 o'clock, I got a call from my alarm company uh, saying the, the door has been compromised. 
And I couldn't do anything. Uh, just uh, let uh, let them call the police, uh, dispatch the police to check on the store. Uh, I was counting on them to come and protect it at least. Uh, time went by about uh, another half an hour, 45 minutes. I got another call that uh, the looters were in the store because my uh, sensors were getting them all over the stores. So uh, I felt like that was it. They broke in and I called them uh, to see if they sent any police. They said they have no call back from the police department. So. Now, you've been in Santa Monica for 40 years. This is a relatively new location, right. though. You've been here for about a year. Right. We've seen today the entire community come out right. and show their support and help you clean up. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel very, very good and, and comfortable right now. But also, I'm going through the pain. I'm suffering right now, a total loss of my store. And the whole neighbor, neighborhood is in chaos, so uh, I'm not the only one. So we're just going to wait and see uh, this rebuild reopen as soon as we can. Jack Sarkeesian, thank you so much. And Allison, just to give you a perspective of the magnitude of the damage done to this city, 400, over 400 arrests were made yesterday. 95% of those people were from outside of Santa Monica. Allison. All right, Aaron, uh, thank you so much, and I hope everyone there stays safe uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Forty-four. That's how many people the Minneapolis Police Department have rendered unconscious with neck restraints in just five years. That is according to an NBC News analysis of police records. That is the same tactic that led to George Floyd's death. Friday, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was charged with third degree murder and manslaughter for kneeling on Floyd's neck for eight minutes. Tom Winter, NBC News correspondent for investigations, has more on this. And Tom, tell us about this analysis. Uh, Allison, so basically uh, our data team, uh, Emily Siegel and Andrew Laren, uh, were able to find this data on the Minneapolis uh, uh, through through normal means through the Minneapolis' various website, um, put it together, compile it, do a little bit of analysis on it, and they found some very interesting uh, statistics. So 237 uses of this uh, since 2015, as you said, 44 times uh, that they used this uh, neck restraint is what it's officially called. The person uh, uh, slipped into unconsciousness. Um, so that's about 16 percent, mostly male. Three fifths of the people that uh, had the neck restraint on them were black. Seventy five percent were under the age of 40. Uh, so a, a little bit of a detailed analysis there, not only how many times it was used, but also who it was used on, Allison. Uh, Tom, Minneapolis police, as you said, have used this neck restraint 237 times since 2015. How would you characterize that? Is there a frame of comparison here to get a sense of whether that is uh, excessive or not? Well, law enforcement experts that we talked to, Allison, uh, called it, and I'll just quote it, extraordinary, uh, an extraordinarily high yeah. amount of uses of this restraint. This is a use of force uh, that if you looked at and you yeah. spoke to law enforcement uh, agencies around the country, uh, spoke to these experts, uh, including we spoke to one expert who ran the investigation mm -hmm. into the LAPD beating of Rodney King. So these are people that understand use of force. We talked to people that are currently yeah. in law enforcement, and they said, look, this is a really high number number. It's important to remember here, Allison, that there's not a lot of statistics about the use of this particular type of force, the neck restraint, because so few police departments allow it. It's mostly prohibited. Uh, it's one of the few times where if there is use of force uh, and, and you want to use this neck restraint, it really should only be used if, if your life is in danger as a police officer. I don't think the image that you just showed in the video that we just saw uh, involving George Floyd yeah. indicated a police officer who thought his life was in imminent danger. So uh, this is a high amount, according to law enforcement experts that we spoke yeah. to. We should let everybody know that we reached out to the Minneapolis Police Department for a response, and we never received one. Uh, Tom
Tom, that just says so much that there aren't uh, as many statistics on it because it just isn't something uh, that is or or should be happening uh, among law enforcement uh, across the country. Law enforcement officials told NBC News that the tactic that killed George Floyd, kneeling on his neck, is not taught or sanctioned by police agencies. Over the weekend in Seattle, though, a video surfaced of a police officer removing his colleague's knee from a protester's neck. Uh, how comment, I mean, it, it's hard to make sense of this, right? Because on one hand, uh, we're saying that this is not a common restraint for police. They shouldn't be using it. But then we're seeing examples of it happening. Well, it depends on when it's used, right? So in certain circumstances, uh, yeah. like in this, in, in this instance, for example, uh, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong in this particular instance, but you're looking yep, at yep. Uh, a video there where somebody is not c currently under arrest. They are trying to get that person under arrest. We don't know if they're resisting. We don't know if the officer was assaulted before. We don't know if it is excessive force. Uh, we only have a certain portion of this video. Uh, but that's different than when somebody already has their hands behind their back in handcuffs. And that's the thing that is so incensed law enforcement. You want to look up. Uh, you want to look up the uh, the neck restraint uh, in the New York Police Department patrol guide. You're not going to find it. This is not something that is that common. I understand that we just saw it there, but really, what what the key thing is here is you had somebody who is already in custody, already had their hands behind their back in handcuffs, in this potentially lethal use of force, and in this case it wasn't potential, it became real, that this use of force was used for somebody who was already in custody, and it was used for almost nine minutes and almost three minutes after another officer said, hey, you know, I don't have a pulse on George Floyd. So I think that there's, you know, different ways to look at it. Um, but it is not something that's commonly taught, and it's something that the Justice Department has already flagged police departments and told them, hey, this is a, this is a type of a hold or a type of use of force uh, that could get you in a lot of trouble because without you knowing it, uh, you could be really harming the person that you're trying to arrest or take into custody. NBC News Now. We have a lot of important news to get to today. So let's go right over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She's following the latest headlines for us from NBC News. Alexa, how about an update? Hey, Allison. Lots of news, as you mentioned, in this hour. First, from NBC's Jeff Bennett, President Trump berated governors in a video conference today, saying, quote, most of you are weak. This, of course, follows widespread unrest in cities over the weekend. Now, according to a source on the call, the president told state leaders, quote, you have to dominate. If you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. On Twitter, the president has called for a tougher stance on protesters, tweeting yesterday, quote, where are the arrests and long-term jail sentences? Meanwhile, after a weekend of marches and demonstrations following the death of George Floyd, some Americans took to the streets to help clean up the damage in their communities. Cities like Chicago are deploying resources to help with the efforts. Take a listen to Mayor Lori Lightfoot. I know that for many of you, your life's work went into developing these businesses and commercial centers. I know that for many of you, your blood, sweat, and tears went into recruiting businesses to come support the vibrancy of your communities. And I want you to hear from me. Not only do I know that, I and we will be your partner in rebuilding Now, former President Barack Obama in a Medium post today wrote that the wave of demonstrations represent, quote, a genuine and legitimate frustration over a decades long failure to reform police practices and the broader criminal justice system in the United States. The former president added that the violence by a small minority of people jeopardized innocent lives and further hurt local businesses. He added, quote, let's not excuse violence or rationalize it or participate in it. Now, experts fear the nationwide protests over Floyd's death could increase the spread of coronavirus, reversing the gains from social distancing over the last few months. That's the latest from NBC's Erica Edwards. The large gatherings in major cities across the country go against public health, health advice on how to curb the spread of COVID-19, which has now claimed the lives of nearly 105,000 people in the United States, with, with more than 1.7 million confirmed cases. Atlanta's mayor had this to say on Sunday protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week because there's still a pandemic 
in America that's killing black and brown people at higher numbers. Now from NBC's Ben Kesslin, a man was shot dead in a demonstration in Louisville, Kentucky, early Monday as protests as the city mourns the death of 26-year-old Breonna Taylor. In a statement this morning, Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear said that after being fired at, quote, the LMPD and the Kentucky National Guard returned fire, resulting in a death. He added an investigation was underway by the Kentucky State Police. Those are the headlines for this hour. Lots and lots of news there, Allison. And we'll be back, as always, a little later with more. Yeah, so much going on. Alexa, thanks for staying on top of it. We'll talk to you in just a little while. Here are the latest developments out of Minnesota and in the George Floyd case. Newly released surveillance video showing another angle of George Floyd's arrest. He appears to be struggling with officers while in the backseat of a police car. Meanwhile, there are more protests in Minneapolis. This video is from Sunday. A truck barreled through a crowd of peaceful protesters on a bridge in Minneapolis. Police say that truck driver was injured and is under arrest. Officials say, though, it doesn't look like the truck hit any protests. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz extended the state's curfew. We will be extending the curfew for two days, but the times will change. It will go from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And one of the reasons in this is, is, is Minnesotans have taken charge of this. The only way these things work is what we've seen the last two nights. The vast majority of people abide by this. NBC News reporter Shaq Brewster is in Minneapolis. Shaq, you're at the George Floyd prayer vigil. Uh, describe for us, tell us what the mood is like there, what it has been there, like there today, and who have you heard from? Allison, it's been really emotional, really emotional scene, and that's because the brother yeah. of George Floyd, Terrence Floyd, came over, he had flowers, he sat with the group, prayed, and then spoke to the crowd. And in that speech, he really was at a plea for peace. He said that he didn't want to see the looting and violence. He wanted to see people peacefully protesting. There was a large crowd here. The crowd got bigger as he stayed longer. Listen to a little bit of what the brother of George Floyd, Mr. Terrence Floyd, had to say. I understand y'all upset. But like it was already said, I doubt y'all uh, half as upset as I am. So if I'm not over here wilding out, if I'm not over here blowing up stuff, if I'm not over here messing up my community, come on. Then what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. Allison, I'll tell you, as people were listening, they were crying. People were clapping. The brother, when he got out of the car, he actually was visibly shaken by the people that were here. He had to be helped yeah. up and stayed up. And he came over and he stopped at multiple of these visual locations. And I'll let you look at one of the one of them. You see that mural? That says George Floyd. That's a new mural. Obviously, George Floyd died here a week ago in this okay. intersection. And you see the flowers yeah. that are there, the signs that are there, the candles, people coming over, that lady leaving a sign right there, Black Lives Matter. And you've been seeing that happen all day long. Just in this intersection, there's three of these scenes like that. And I'll take you over to the second one as close as we can get, because in the middle, there's a Native American group doing a prayer circle. And that's something that you've been seeing, sense of community, Native American, black, white. It's a very diverse group of people here. Allison, I'm going to hold this up really yeah. quickly just to let John, our photographer, give you a look inside. And, and actually, that group has just left. But you see, this is the second of three, at least three large memorials, large visual locations where people are just leaving flowers, paying their respect. After we saw Terrence Floyd come over yeah. and speak to the press and uh, speak to the supporters that are here, he then came over here and had a moment here where he just paid his respects to his brother. Allison? Shaq, for those of us watching from home, it was so moving. Uh, everything you've said, from the murals, uh, listening to Terrence Floyd speak about his brother, I can only imagine what the emotions are like there today. Uh, it, just incredible uh, to, to see that today. Uh, could you give us the latest as well on the Floyd case, where we are with that uh, this Monday? 
Yeah, there's a few different updates, even in the past couple of minutes, Allison, and I'll read down as I'm doing this, but just to give you an idea, the family and their attorneys have done their, all, their own autopsy. So the results, they're announcing the results of the autopsy in a press conference that's going on right now, but one thing that they found, and I'm reading here, it says that they, uh, what they found is consistent what people saw. There is no other health issue that could cause or contribute to the death of Mr. Floyd. This is in bold in the press release of, that they have sent out. They said, from all the evidence, doctors now say it appears Mr. Floyd died at the scene, that he died after Officer Chauvin put his knee in his neck and kept it, kept it there for several minutes before anything broke up. And we also know that the autopsy is saying it was due to asphyxia from uh, sustained forceful pressure to his neck and to his back. So that's what the family is saying right now in their own independent eye autopsy. But what we know from the official side and the prosecution side is that the case is now in the hands of the uh, state and federal investigators. We still have that dual track investigation. But here in Minneapolis and in Minnesota, Attorney General Keith Ellison is now leading the prosecution against those officers. We know that Officer Chauvin, he's been charged and arrested and he's being held right now, now in a state uh, jail at this point. But the other three officers are still out. They're still being investigated at this point. Attorney General Ellison said a couple of days ago, before he took control of this case, he said that he would expect those other officers to be charged. He's not saying that exact language now, not using that language now, but he's saying he will do a thorough investigation. He will complete the investigation and it will be a fair investigation for the family of Mr. Floyd. One thing and one chant that Terrence Floyd, the brother of Mr. Floyd, led mm -hmm. while he was here was he said one down, three to go. He's saying that the one officer was charged. He wants the other three officers charged. As he said that, and you heard what he said earlier, that call for peace. He said that there's justice on the left, peace on the right. He wants justice to happen, but he wants it to happen peacefully. And for him and for many people here, justice looks like charges for the remaining fired Minneapolis Police Department officers. Allison. Yeah. Shaq Brewster in Minneapolis. Thank you so much. No problem. Have a good one. Protesters taking to the streets for a third day in Philadelphia. The National Guard got there this morning to help local enforcement after they were outnumbered by protesters. The weekend, uh, there was looting and vandalism and over 400 arrests in Philly. The city will also have a curfew tonight for a third straight night. MSNBC host Eamon Royal Dean is in Philadelphia. And Eamon, protesters back out again. What is it like there today? Yeah, Allison, in fact, we met up with the protesters here outside of the Philadelphia police headquarters not too long ago. The march, as you can see, making its way through the streets of Philadelphia. We are now on one of the major roads, Market Street, making our way uh, into the iconic City Hall area, the center city as it is known here. Uh, this has been a very peaceful demonstration, multi-generational, multi-racial, people from all walks of life. Uh, as I mentioned, expressing solidarity uh, with Black Lives Matter, expressing their desire to have accountability. Some I'm calling for the defunding of police. But as I mentioned, this has been a very peaceful protest. There is a strong police presence on some of the side streets, making sure the crowd moves in a certain direction. And that's certainly what has happened. You have some news helicopters above. You have a police helicopter above. But as I mentioned, this has been uh, by far a very large uh, protest, very peaceful. And as we continue to make our way into the city center, you continue to hear the demands of the protesters, uh, as I mentioned, calling for police reform, police accountability for the killing of George Floyd and others, uh, and in some cases, as I said, defunding of the police. You talked about the curfew. That is going to take place again this evening starting at 6 p.m., so not too uh, long from now. Tomorrow, a very important day. You have a primary that is going to take place in uh, Pennsylvania. So again, officials trying to maintain the peace, making sure tomorrow goes off as well very smoothly, given everything that is playing out here. Allison? Even uh, during a conference call with the nation's governors earlier today, the president singled out Philadelphia as, quote, a mess. Uh, what kind of a reaction is that getting there, if any? Well, we heard today from the mayor of Philadelphia, Jim Kenney, who pretty much replied very point blankly, saying President Trump is a mess. He said he is not contributing to any solution here. Uh, his words, his Twitter feed, 
very divisive, the rhetoric very inflammatory. So obviously, uh, officials here in Pennsylvania, certainly those officials here in Philadelphia, trying to ignore what is coming out of Washington, trying to make sure they maintain a peaceful protest, making sure that those that are demonstrating here continue to exercise their rights, but also making sure there is a clear distinction between these peaceful protests that are taking place and some of the looting that has taken place in other parts. This is not what we're seeing here. This is very peaceful, uh, a very consistent march, well organized, and there has been no confrontation with the police so far. A little bit of antagonistic chance every once in a while in the direction of the police, but by no means is this involved uh, in any way, shape, or form of the violence. And you can see some of the police continuing to make their way here along the periphery uh, of the march. But uh, you asked about the president's tweets. His tweets, according to the mayor, very divisive. He has called uh, President Trump a mess. All right. Eamon Wildeen in Philadelphia. Glad to hear that at least so far, it seems like the protests today are going much better than over the weekend. We hope that continues and that you guys stay safe out there. The mayor of Washington, D.C., imposing a two-day curfew that starts tonight after three nights of protests outside the White House. Here's what Mayor Bowser told MSNBC anchor Craig Melvin this morning on The Today Show. We want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. MSNBC correspondent Garrett Haig joining me now from Washington, D.C. And Garrett, last night we saw fires just blocks from the White House. What is it like there in D.C. today? Allison, I've been here for a couple hours today, and it's been largely a small, peaceful protest out here on the street just a few minutes ago. Most of the protesters who you see behind me were sitting here on H Street, literally sitting in the street uh, just north of Lafayette Park, the parts that is on the north side of the White House, protesting peacefully. Then we have this bizarre, profoundly provocative decision, quite honestly, uh, by the U.S. Park Police and Secret Service who protect this park to decide to come out and take up this position in their full riot gear for absolutely no reason. There was no police presence here whatsoever until about 10 minutes ago. And now we've got a line of more than 100 officers in their full body armor. It's an interesting decision, to say the least, perhaps colored by the way things turned out last night, where late in the evening, as the curfew went into effect around 11 o'clock last night, uh, the situation devolved uh, pretty dramatically here in Washington, including with a fire lit in the basement of the famous St. John Church, just over my shoulder here. Here's what the pastor of that church said this morning to NBC's Craig Melvin. We know that emotions are high, and we know that there are a lot of elements here that um, it's not all one unified voice, and there are going to be all kinds of messages in our church walls represented, a lot of different messages, in fact. Um, and I, I also noticed that um, compared to a lot of the nearby buildings, it was an interesting thing to be aware of. I felt grateful that actually we were spared some of the worst stuff that I saw nearby. And, Allison, that's certainly the case in the blocks fanning out here from downtown D.C. Yeah. and in some other parts of the city. There was pretty widespread destruction last night with uh, windows smashed, fires lit, ATMs torn out of walls and things like that. About 80 arrests made, according to the Metro Police Department, uh, hoping for a much calmer night tonight with that earlier starting curfew. All right, Garrett Haken, D.C., thank you so much. You bet. The protests over George Floyd's death are happening not just in Minneapolis and major cities here in the U.S., but there have been rallies, vigils and protests in more than 250 cities, big and small, across the entire country. Some of those protests, as we know, turned violent. And in some cities, outsiders are being blamed for that violence. On Saturday, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz originally estimated that about 80 percent of the arrests in the Twin Cities were people coming from outside the state. Yesterday, though, he walked that back. I just think candidly, um, I certainly think I want to believe it's outside more, and that might go to the problem that we have of saying can't be Minnesotans. I've been very clear, and I'll say it again this morning, the catalyst that started all of this was the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota, and that was our problem. 
So who is responsible for the violence? It is an important and it is also a complicated question. Joining me now to discuss this MSNBC correspondent and host of NBC News podcast Into America, Tremaine Lee, and NBC News reporter Brandy Zadrozny. Uh, thanks to both of you uh, for being here to talk about this with us. Tremaine, let me start with you. Uh, we are hearing very different things about where the violence is coming from at these protests. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison echoed the claims that it's coming from outsiders this morning on MSNBC. Take a listen to what he said. The protesters are protesting for justice for George Floyd. They're, they've been peaceful. But these other folks who have another agenda, and I don't know where they're from, and I don't know what their ideology is, uh, have been active, but we know they're there, uh, and we need to learn a whole lot more about them. Tremaine, you have been talking with black activist groups. What are they seeing and what are they telling you? Allison, I'll tell you what, there is very real concern that this movement and the protests uh, built after the death of George Floyd and calling for justice in that case, uh, mm -hmm. that it's being infiltrated by, quote, and I want to say what one activist said, by white anarchists and white communists. And what they say is what they're seeing mm -hmm. across the country, certainly there's uh, enough rage spread around and anger, and we've seen a, a rebellion and uprising, but you've also seen many instances uh, of white protesters, some with masks on, breaking windows, setting fires. And and a number that have been caught um, on social media, you have black activists or black protesters, you know, urging them not to do that. But you've seen it time and again. So their concern right. is that, you know, if there's going to be any trouble, let us earn our own trouble. Because what happens is after those uh, white activists or white um, agitators depart, then these black folks are left to deal uh, with whatever the police and whatever the system right. heaps upon them. And that's the big concern. Brandy, we have seen extremist groups show up at civil rights protests many times in the past. You report on the online space, and that's where bad actors notoriously organize violent unrest. This week, you reported there is not a lot of evidence that, of that this time around. What have you found? Well, protests like this are really messy. Um, like any breaking news situation, whether it's like a natural disaster or a shooting or, or anything else where we just don't know a lot, um, it just takes time to figure out just what's going on. And um, initially, the thing that we think is happening isn't always a thing that's happening. So we are definitely seeing outside groups in the spaces that I and extremist researchers um, look at. We're seeing outsiders, whether that's outside of the location or ideologically outside, we're seeing them show up at these protests. That's right. You know, we've seen something called a boogaloo, uh, members that are sort of libertarian, far-right gun extremists, and they hate the government and the police, and they want to incite a second civil war. There are them. Those, are, those people are there. We haven't necessarily seen violence on their end yet. And we've also seen some Proud Boys. They're a racist, sexist fraternity of Western chauvinists, and they've been known to be violent in the past. Um, some who are been impersonating even people that are considered uh, Antifa, right? So, but we haven't seen any proof of white supremacists mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, we're just seeing a really messy thing play out and a lot of organizations and a lot of groups saying that we don't want to be associated with that messy element. We're still trying to figure out what it is. Brandy, have you also gotten a sense, I mean, you mentioned all of these different potential uh, anarchist groups uh, that may have been there. Uh, are are, are you getting a sense, and I know it's a tough question to answer, whether there is any organized effort here, if it's just random individuals popping up, or is that still what you're trying to piece together here? Yeah, so again, that's talking about like the far left, the Antifa, which is just really this really nebulous sort of, um, it's a boogeyman that conservatives have used to demonize, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Right, nebulous groups of uh, people that are against the far right. But it doesn't really have a robust organizational structure. So um, it can be used to label sort of any white rabble rouser in black. Um, but what it does, it, it does mean, yeah. Antifa does mean a group of radicals that rely on direct action, not police or the court system to shut down the far right and fascism. Sometimes that can turn into violence for sure. And there may very well be an anti-fascist uh, coalition of groups who are coming to the protests and causing harm. The fact is we don't know that yet. And all of the authorities who've made that yeah. claim have yet to provide any evidence, and that's a problem. 
Karine, I know we still do have a lot of questions here, but if there are outsiders instigating violence and looting, whether they are part of a coordinated effort or not, can we talk about the broader implications of that and what black leaders are doing to keep the attention on their very important message? You know, these activists, many of them are already uh, kind of trapped in a, a kind of a divide here. They understand the anger and rage of, of black youth who don't have a voice and are lashing out, uh, setting fires and sometimes looting and breaking into to buildings. Uh, but then you add this extra element. Uh, their concern is that it threatens to undermine uh, the entire momentum and energy behind the movement. Because then you see them saying, hey, look what's happening at the Black Lives Matter protest. It must look at look what happened to Antifa. You have to classify these groups as terrorist organizations. So the problem is that it redirects the energy, it redirects the focus and attention uh, where it's not needed. And so these activists say, uh, they need to stay focused and they want their constituents, other activists, to just be on the lookout and to point it out when they see it and to call it out, but also to remain steadfast and focused uh, on what the mission is, which is ultimately justice for George Floyd and justice for other, uh, you know, unarmed black people, especially who are killed by the police. Absolutely. Tremaine, Brandy, uh, there has been so much going on, uh, very complex issues here. Thankful to both of you for walking us through them. Thank you. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up we hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together i'm lester holt and for all my colleagues at nbc news take care if it's asking the tough questions would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown if it's asking for accountability respirators and ventilators has the federal government stepped up enough if it's navigating the new normal in america and if it's sunday it's meet the press the coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. 
The deadly shooting in Louisville overnight while police were enforcing a curfew during protests there. One man, David McAtee, died when police and the National Guard were shot at and returned fire on a crowd. It is not clear, though, who fired the deadly shot. Protesters in Louisville outraged over the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. She was shot and killed during a police raid in March. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry joining me now. And Cal, you have been in the city all weekend. What is it like there today? It's very, very tense. You talked about David McAtee. His body was just removed about an hour ago. I can show you the scene. Protesters have stayed in this area. The police have uh, removed themselves from the area, which I think, frankly, was the smart thing to do as it was getting very, very tense. On Thursday night, seven people were shot protesting in the city. On Friday night, there was violence. Saturday night, at least five police officers were targeted by gunfire. And last night, as you said, that deadly shooting of David McAtee. He's a man, 53 years old, who lived in the neighborhood. He was known to everybody here. He sold barbecue. People in the neighborhood said he gave barbecue away for free to a lot of the police officers. So this is an area that is deeply hurt by what happened last night. They're wondering how it's going to go today. And I have to tell you, when you talk to people here, they'll say that the presence of the National Guard, such a heavy-handed presence, is what is starting some of this violence. During the day, you have these very peaceful protests. During the evening, you start getting those those pepper rounds, you start getting some of that tear gas, some of those rubber bullets. And then at night, unfortunately, it's turning very, very deadly uh, in this city, Allison. Yeah, uh, do we know, Cal, uh, more about the plans tonight, how the city is going to try to keep things uh, from getting violent tonight, how they're trying to protect everybody? You know, we don't. We heard the governor, Governor Bashir, say that he wants all the videotapes of what happened last night in the shooting to be released before midnight so people can see it. I think that would make a huge difference, just that transparency. When you look at some of what has happened in the past year, it's been a lack of transparency. Brianna uh, Taylor, who was killed in her apartment, there was very little transparency about why that police raid took place, what led to that warrant. Uh, those officers who were involved in that shooting are still on an administrative reassignment. The public here doesn't believe they've been punished. So hopefully transparency will help that. The curfew will be in place from dusk until dawn. We'll have to see how the National Guard reacts. Last night they reacted very hard and very swiftly. Tonight we'll have to see because the city, as, as we've sort of been saying, Allison, is very, very upset. Absolutely. Cal, hope everyone stays safe there. You as well. Thanks so much. Thanks, Allison. As protests rage across the country, President Trump unloaded on the nation's governors on a conference call earlier today, calling them, quote, weak and demanding that they crack down on the protests more aggressively. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joins me now. And Carol, what specifically is the president asking the governors to do? Well, his big thing, Allison, is that he wants them to use the National Guard more aggressively. That's his big complaint. And we heard it mm -hmm. from the president on this call. And then we heard it from White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany afterwards. And and, and their argument is that governors have this tool. They can deploy the National Guard to assist in situations like this, and they're not using it to its fullest extent. And so that was his big frustration. The National Guard is deployed in do more than two dozen states, but they're saying that only a very small number of states are actually using large numbers of National Guard members. And the president saying in this call where he said, we need to dominate um, on the streets, Otherwise, as you said, he noted, you'll look weak, you're going to look like fools. At one point, he said, if you don't do this, you'll look like jerks. Um, and so what he's leaning on is this National Guard issue. And 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 they're backing it up by with a sort of threat of that they'll take other federal actions if this isn't if done to the president's satisfaction. We heard that from the press secretary saying there are other things uh, under consideration to deploy additional federal assets. We don't know exactly what she means by that. Um, but she also said that they are going to announce some sort of what she called a central command center that involves the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, the defense secretary, Mark Esper, and Attorney General Barr, and that that would be uh, something that coordinates with state and local governments. Um, but again, we don't know exactly what the details of that are, but they're using that and the threat of other additional federal moves to try to get governors to do what the president says they're not doing doing in terms of deploying the National Guard. So, Carol, I have to ask, what kind of reaction is all of that getting from the governors? 
Well, it was uh, an interesting phone call uh, where we heard some yeah. of the governors really, uh, you know, particularly the governor of Illinois, who said um, that she thought the president's words, his rhetoric so far has been inflammatory. Um, she was concerned about that. And, you know, he listened to her and then he responded, well, you know, I don't really like your rhetoric either, and noted that she had been critical of him um, during the, uh, the his response to cor the coronavirus pandemic, which is obviously still ongoing. And then we heard from the governor of Michigan say that she was disturbed by what the president was saying at the call on the call. And then, you know, there are also governors who obviously really support the president and didn't take that point of view. All right, Carol Lee, uh, an interesting, as you said, uh, conference call this morning, to say the least. Thanks yeah. for walking us through it. Thank you. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? Yeah. If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. George Floyd's family making funeral arrangements in Houston, his hometown, as the vigils and rallies in his honor continue around the city this week. Some of those rallies have turned violent with anti-police protests, but in some cases, police and protesters are taking a different approach. This moment here, a hug between a Houston protester and police officers is inspiring hope. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joining me now from Houston. And Priscilla, you spoke to the woman hugging the police officer officer in that photo. What did she tell you about that touching moment? Yeah. Well, Allison, that photo was taken here on Friday, and that was the day where these robust protests really began to pick up. And while they started peacefully, tensions did escalate throughout the night, and a number of folks were arrested that night. But that woman that you see in that photo, Tiara Johnson, I, I spoke with her, and she t described to me an incident where she saw the police officer standing there and he was surrounded by a number of protesters who were shouting at him and expressing their concerns. And she says that she saw him begin to nod. And that's when she walked over to him. And I want you to take a listen to what she told me happened next. I like stepped up to him and I, I leaned in and I was like, I just want to let you know, like, you're not alone. Like, we got your back. Like, as long as you're for the people, we're going to be for you. And he was like, thank you. Um, and then I was like, sometimes people really just need a hug and you look like you need one. So I linked in, I gave him a hug and he said, thanks. And we're seeing instances like this across the country with police officers marching with protesters and taking a knee. And while some people I've spoken to have said that this makes them feel hopeful, it feels like a turning point. I've also heard from others who are concerned that it may just be you know, are concerned about how genuine those efforts are and tell me that they really want to see actionable change behind those uh, moments of solidarity. 
Absolutely, Priscilla. We all do want to see actionable change, but these uh, small moments of humanity uh, really mean so much these days. Uh, could you also tell us as well the latest uh, on the funeral plans for George Floyd? I know his family is working on those right now. Yeah. So the latest thing we've actually learned, and I just spoke with a Houston rapper here, Trey The Truth, that is going to be organizing a rally tomorrow ahead of George Floyd's body returning to the city. Um, and so and they're expecting thousands of folks to turn out for that rally. But he told me that it was really important for him to find a way to support the city and so, uh, support the family and really welcome George Floyd back to the city where he grew up. And so we've been in touch with the funeral home and we do know that services are being planned and we expect to have more details here in the next 24 hours. We believe there's going to be some sort of service held in Minnesota before the body is brought back here to be laid to rest. Um, and we also just recently learned that the police chief here has spoken with the family and offered them a police escort for the body when he is brought back here, Allison. All right, Priscilla Thompson with the latest on the funeral arrangements for George Floyd in Houston. Thank you so much. 44. That's how many people the Minneapolis Police Department have rendered unconscious with neck restraints in just five years. That is according to an NBC News analysis of police records. That is the same tactic that led to George Floyd's death. Friday, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was charged with third degree murder and manslaughter for kneeling on Floyd's neck for eight minutes. Tom Winter, NBC News correspondent for investigations, has more on this. And Tom, tell us about this analysis. Uh, Allison, so basically uh, our data team, uh, Emily Siegel and Andrew Laren, uh, were able to find this data on the Minneapolis uh, uh, through through normal means through the Minneapolis's various website, um, put it together, compile it, do a little bit of analysis on it, and they found some very interesting uh, statistics. So 237 uses of this uh, since 2015, as you said, 44 times uh, that they used this uh, neck restraint is what it's officially called. The person uh, uh, slipped into unconsciousness. Um, so that's about 16 percent, mostly male. Three fifths of the people that uh, had the neck restraint on them were black. Seventy five percent were under the age of 40. Uh, so a, a little bit of a detailed analysis there, not only how many times it was used, but also who it was used on, Allison. Uh, Tom, Minneapolis police, as you said, have used this neck restraint 237 times since 2015. How would you characterize that? Is there a frame of comparison here to get a sense of whether that is uh, excessive or not? Well, law enforcement experts that we talked to, Allison, uh, called it, and I'll just quote it, extraordinary, uh, an extraordinarily high amount yeah. of uses of this restraint. This is a use of force uh, that if you looked at and you yeah. spoke to law enforcement uh, agencies around the country, uh, spoke to these experts, uh, including we spoke to one expert who ran the investigation mm -hmm. into the LAPD beating of Rodney King. So these are people that understand use of force. We talked to people that are currently yeah. in law enforcement, and they said, look, this is a really high number. It's important to remember here, Allison, that there's not a lot of statistics about the use of this particular type of force, the neck restraint, because so few police departments allow it. It's mostly prohibited. Uh, it's one of the few times where if there is use of force uh, and you want to use this neck restraint, it really should only be used if, if your life is in danger as a police officer. I don't think the image that you just showed in the video that we just saw uh, involving George Floyd yeah. indicated a police officer who thought his life was in imminent danger. So uh, this is a high amount, according to law enforcement experts that we spoke yeah. to. We should let everybody know that we reached out to the Minneapolis Police Department for a response, and we never received one. Uh, Tom, that just says so much that there aren't uh, as many statistics on it because it just isn't something uh, that is or, or should be happening uh, among law enforcement uh, across the country. Law enforcement officials told NBC News that the tactic that killed George Floyd kneeling on his neck is not taught or sanctioned by police agencies. Over the weekend in Seattle, though, a video surfaced of a police officer removing his colleague's knee from a protester's neck. Uh, how Comment. I mean, it, it's hard to make sense of this, right? Because on one hand, uh, we're saying that this is not a common restraint for police. They shouldn't be using it. But then we're seeing examples of it happening. Well, it depends on when it's used, right? So in certain circumstances, 
yeah. like in this in, in this instance, for example, uh, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong in this particular instance, but you're looking yep, at yep. Uh, a video there where somebody is not c currently under arrest. They are trying to get that person under arrest. We don't know if they're resisting. We don't know if the officer was assaulted before. We don't know if it is excessive force. Uh, we only have a certain portion of this video, uh, but that's different than when somebody already has their hands behind their back in handcuffs. And that's the thing that is so incensed law enforcement. You want to look up. Uh, you want to look up the uh, the neck restraint uh, in the New York Police Department patrol guide. You're not going to find it. This is not something that is that common. I understand that we just saw it there, but really, what what the key thing is here is you had somebody who is already in custody, already had their hands behind their back in handcuffs, in this potentially lethal use of force, and in this case it wasn't potential, it became real, that this use of force was used for somebody who was already in custody, and it was used for almost nine minutes and almost three minutes after another officer said, hey, you know, I don't have a pulse on George Floyd. So I think that there's, you know, different ways to look at it. Um, but it is not something that's commonly taught, and it's something that the Justice Department has already flagged police departments and told them, hey, this is a, this is a type of a hold or a type of use of force uh, that could get you in a lot of trouble because without you knowing it, uh, you could be really harming the person that you're trying to arrest or take into custody. A new earlier curfew is now in place in Santa Monica, California, after another night of protests, vandalism, and clashes with police. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins me now from Santa Monica. And Aaron, what can you tell us about this new curfew and what is the situation there right now? Well, right now here in Santa Monica, they're very much trying to clean up the situations you can see here. Yesterday was a scene of incredible looting and rioting. Let me just let the camera pan over to show you Jack's Jewelers. Rioters entered this space, completely smashed it. Joining me now to talk about what happened is the owner of this jewelry store. Jack, what can you tell me about what happened here yesterday? Um, I was here yesterday around early afternoon. I came in just to check around because uh, I heard the demonstration was happening in Santa Monica. So when I got here, uh, the demonstration was happening around here on um, second, and uh, so I was inside. Uh, I felt people were running around, and I just uh, stood and uh, took some of my other stuff uh, safe place. Uh, but I kept uh, seeing people in front of my store uh, knocking. They want to break in with a few people together. And I waved them, I told them, just leave, please, and they, they did. And another uh, set of guys came in, they wanted the same thing. So um, I felt like my life was in danger to sit here and protect my store. I couldn't anymore. I heard the banging store probably next door. They broke in the next door. So I just put my alarm and went home. So you went home knowing that your store was being destroyed. That must have been absolutely terrifying right, exactly. for you. Exactly. Right after I, I left home, uh, it was around uh, 2 o'clock, I got a call from my alarm company uh, saying the, the door has been compromised. And I couldn't do anything. Uh, just uh, let, uh, let them call the police, uh, dispatch the police to check on the store. Uh, I was counting on them to come and protect it at least. Uh, time went by, about uh, another half an hour, 45 minutes, I got another call that uh, the looters were in the store because my uh, sensors were getting them all over the stores. So uh, I felt like that was it. They broke in and I called them uh, to see if they sent any police. They said they have no call back from the police department. So. Now, you've been in Santa Monica for 40 years. This is a relatively new location, right. though. You've been here for about a year. Right. We've seen today the entire community come out right. and show their support and help you clean up. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel very, very good and, and comfortable right now. But also, I'm going through the pain. I'm suffering right now, total loss of my store. And the whole neighbor, neighborhood is in chaos, so uh, I'm not the only one. So we're just going to wait and see uh, this rebuild reopen as soon as we can. 
Jack Sarkeesian, thank you so much. And Allison, just to give you a perspective of the magnitude of the damage done to this city, 400, over 400 arrests were made yesterday. 95% of those people were from outside of Santa Monica. Allison. All right, Aaron, uh, thank you so much. And I hope everyone there stays safe uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Lawmakers across the country moved by the protests and the need for change in America. Here's what some of them are saying about the rallies, the violence and police reform. We have those who are just heartbroken by the loss of George Floyd, who need to scream at the top of their lungs like I do, that he should still be alive, that all four of those officers should be held accountable for their actions, uh, as Chief Arredondo has now said publicly, and that we have a lot of like big systemic level work to do to stop this pattern from happening over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, you know, when nothing happened, when this thing looked like it was gonna be swept up the rug, just like all other or many other cases uh, involving police brutality just get swept under the rug. Uh, this time, uh, young people across the country weren't having it, so they took to the streets. And uh, the result is that we do have some provocateurs among us. Uh, there are some people whose motives are not the same. They're not interested in protesting for justice. They're interested in creating conditions for a race war. The lack of willingness for leaders to openly talk about this and try and address those societal issues that spring from it, I think uh, it has caused a lot of folks in our country to just decide we've got to elevate this discussion and raise awareness around it, and, and they're doing so very successfully. We have got not to stay focused on what us brought what brought us here in the first place. We can talk about the looting, we can talk about the rioting, we can talk about the destruction, but why are we at this point? We're at this point because we say the preservation of human life is our top priority. I know that people are frustrated by the pacing, but I want to assure them that as a person who uh, has, been, has dedicated my whole life to civil rights and justice, uh, I am going to pursue justice vigorously, relentlessly, uncompromisingly. It's not just Mr. Floyd. It goes back, there are 50 cases that are just like Mr. Floyd. We've had them here in New York City. What's different? the difference between Mr. Floyd and Amadou Diallo? Or Admiral Louima? or Eric Garner, what is the difference? What have we learned? Nothing? So yes, we should be outraged. We're certainly um, very uh, sad and, and angry, quite frankly, about the destruction that was that happened here. Well, we're in Lafayette Park, right in the center of our city, in front of the White House, but we had damage uh, in blocks throughout the city. So we want people to be able, and we recognize that people are frustrated and mad, but tearing up um, our beautiful city is not the way uh, to bring attention to uh, what is a righteous cause. When we are watching the protest, it is an expression of deep pain. We are talking about somebody, some mother's child, and, and it's happening throughout our country, and it has been happening for generations. We must come together, we must enact laws, we must be forceful, and we must do that if we are going to truly be invested in making a difference and saving lives. In Europe, thousands of people are marching in solidarity with the protesters in the U.S. NBC News correspondent Carl Nassman is in Berlin with more. Hey there, Allison. Three straight days now of protests here in Europe over the death of George Floyd. We're seeing demonstrations popping up in front of U.S. embassies. Protesters blocking roads, demonstrating peacefully in several cities, including in London and in Paris and right here in Berlin. And you can see a visual 
part of that movement here behind me. This is actually a former piece of the Berlin Wall. I'll step out of the way so you can take a look. This is a memorial to George Floyd. You can see the large letters there. I can't breathe. And several people passing by now taking pictures and wanting to take a look at this uh, memorial as well. You know, many protesters here say they see their own experiences mirrored in the life and in the death of George Floyd. I spoke with two prominent voices, one in London and one in Berlin, to hear their perspective. Here's just part of that conversation. Take a listen. It does feel like this time we're at a tipping point and that people's desire to take to the streets in protest might be about to launch a global moment, a global moment that I don't think we've seen in the global communities since the 1960s. People recognized it in their own communities. They were like, oh, this may be the US context, but I'm German and I've seen that before. I'm French, I've seen that before. I'm British, I've seen that before. I think this is as old as time. What can you do? Organize, protest, resist. There is a really powerful sense, not only of anger, but of an unending fury and a sense that this time it is too much. My message to Donald Trump is that his opponents are not just in the United States, that the vast majority of the global community of 7.8 billion people stand alongside those African-Americans experiencing such great injustice. I feel like this is another surge in progressive activism. I'm not sure how long it will last. It's about momentum, it's about maintaining something here in Germany, but it definitely felt like a new moment. And it felt like an anger I haven't seen since my arrival in Germany. This definitely felt new. Allison, those issues of racism and of police brutality are resonating and playing out in communities of color here in Europe, just like they do in cities across the United States. And just like in the U.S., this seems to be a movement now that will not be fading away anytime soon. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. A lot to get to, so let's head straight to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the very latest headlines for us from NBC News. Alexa, how about an update? Hey, Allison, lots of news in this hour. First, former Vice President Joe Biden met with several African-American leaders today to address the nationwide unrest following the death of George Floyd, Biden's first in-person campaign event in more than two months. The presumptive, de presumptive Democratic nominee vowed to take on systemic racism in his first 100 days in office, specifically pledging to set up a national police oversight board. Take a listen. We also have to fundamentally change the way in which police are trained. Police are trained much more. Now, and by the way, there are a lot of people, overwhelmingly, it's African Americans who have been victimized, shot, and there's been a lot of other people who shot and killed in the Hispanic community and the white community. Now from NBC's Courtney QB, the number of National Guardsmen activated to address the unrest following Floyd's death has more than tripled since Sunday. Just over 17,000 National Guardsmen have now been activated in 23 states and D.C., compared to 5,000 on Sunday morning. In total, nearly 67,000 National Guard soldiers and airmen are activated to address the demonstrations as well as COVID-19. Governor Andrew Cuomo and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio are imposing a curfew for New York City tonight following a weekend of protests at times that turned violent. The curfew will take effect at 11 p.m. this evening until 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. The announcement also mentions the NYPD doubling its presence to, quote, prevents violence and prevent violence and property damage. In a statement, Mayor de Blasio said, quote, we can't let violence undermine the message of this moment. 
Some Facebook employees are staging a virtual walkout in protest of the company's response to President Trump's controversial posts from last week. That's the latest from CNBC's Salvador Rodriguez. This follows a number of Facebook employees publicly criticizing the company's decision to not moderate the president's posts, in which he says, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. A Facebook spokesperson told CNBC that they, quote, encourage employees to speak openly when they disagree with leadership. Uber, Lyft, and other services like DoorDash are suspending their services in some cities to comply with the newly imposed curfews. That's the latest from CNBC's Deirdre Boza. Uber said it has halted its services in Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, and parts of Minneapolis during the curfew hours, while Lyft said it was also complying with local guidelines. The demonstrations following the death of George Floyd continued over the weekend across the country, some of them turning violent as looting erupted and protesters clashed with law enforcement. Those are the latest headlines for this hour. Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, thank you so much. Here is the latest from Minnesota and in the George Floyd case. Floyd's brother Terrence talking to supporters at a prayer vigil in Minneapolis today, asking them to end the violent protests. I understand y'all upset. But like it was already said, I doubt y'all uh, half as upset as I am. So if I'm not over here wilding out, if I'm not over here blowing up stuff, if I'm not over here messing up my community, then what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. Terrence Floyd got emotional at that vigil as supporters chanted his brother's name. Meanwhile, Minnesota Governor Tim Wall says the state is extending its curfew for another two days from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. to curb violence and looting overnight. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. Morgan, we heard Terrence Floyd there calling for peace. What is the mood like in Minneapolis right now? Hey, Allison, the mood is certainly shifting because we're starting to see two very distinct messages being carried forward. On the one hand, you have officials, as you mentioned, the Minnesota governor keeping that curfew in place and to enforce that uh, a much larger footprint, as you mentioned, with those National Guardsmen and state police here in this city, not only being a visible force, but an acting one as well, making sure that those crowds that ran rampant through this city earlier this week are no longer damaging those buildings after seeing just so much uh, pain created by the, the burned out buildings and the vandalism and looting that took place just within the past few days. On the other hand, when it comes to that group of people uh, that you saw gathered alongside uh, the brother of George Floyd, Terrence, that's the message that they're really trying to push forward is one of peaceful protest, uh, one for justice. And I want you to listen into a chant uh, that came out just a few moments uh, after the brother of George Floyd spoke. Take a listen. One down, three to go. Of course, that group referring uh, to the three other officers that have yet to be taken into custody in the death of George Floyd. We do know that Derek Chauvin was arrested several days ago. He faces third degree murder charges and manslaughter. We do know Terrence Floyd, the brother of George, has already come out and said that a third degree murder charge is not sufficient. He wants first degree murder charges, Allison, and that many of the supporters that surrounded him today in that crowd told us uh, wow. justice has yet to be met uh, with now, those like, other officers still not taken said, into custody. Allison? Peace on the left. Justice on the right. Y'all forgot already? <laughs> George Floyd's cause of death. What does it say? Uh, Allison, uh, we do know that the family ordered an independent autopsy uh, completely separate from the one that law enforcement held. And it came to the conclusion that George Floyd died from asphyxiation due uh, to the neck area, the uh, loss of uh, the ability to breathe and loss of blood flow, blood flow to the brain. 
and that corresponds, the family says, with that eight to nine minute video that is so painful to watch. The attorney for the family, Ben Crump, had this to say shortly after releasing its findings. Take a listen. The knee to the neck and the knees to his back both contributed to him not being able to get breath. And what those officers did there that we see on the video is the cause of his death, not some underlying unknown health condition. And the medical examiner who conducted that independent autopsy for the family of George Floyd was uh, the same individual who conducted the autopsy for the family of Eric Garner, who passed away back in 2014 after police arrested him for selling untaxed cigarettes. Of course, it was Garner's death that made the rallying cry, I can't breathe, uh, basically a, a message, a motto rather, uh, yeah. for this movement of, uh, against police brutality. Uh, so as it stands right now, Allison, peaceful protests throughout the city of Minneapolis today, although we have seen in days past that that, of course, changes when the sun goes down. And we'll be keeping a very close eye on what transpires later today. Allison. Morgan, I hope things remain peaceful there tonight and that you stay safe. Thanks for your reporting today and also your terrific reporting over the weekend. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Allison. New York City under curfew tonight, starting at 11 p.m., and there have already been protests in the city throughout the day. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joining me now from Union Square in New York City, where those protesters are gathering. And Kathy, what's going on there? What are you hearing from protesters there today? So, Allison, we have seen, uh, I would say, thousands of people coming through here. Uh, they started off in Times Square. There was a large gathering there, and we're told that they started marching this way. We asked them where they are headed. It's unclear. They're going to continue to march. But for the most part, they have been peaceful, orderly. Um, we spoke with an organizer earlier today. Uh, here's a little bit more about the message that she hopes that the public will, will uh, hear because of their presence. Take a listen. has turned out in the afternoon hours during the day. It's, it's relatively peaceful and calm like it is currently, um, but it, it takes a shift at night. And, and a lot of uh, officials have come out, the mayor, the governor, asking for peace. Uh, they have said that the looters are just a select few uh, that's creating the violence, stirring up the violence. Um, I do want to point out a couple of things, because you mentioned the curfew goes into effect tonight at 11 o'clock. Um, and, and so the police presence has, has definitely um, expanded. You see uh, several officers behind the protesters right now. They have zip ties. They have riot gear. Uh, but this is what we have seen throughout the day. The, the reinforcement has definitely uh, stepped up. Uh, you know, we heard from the governor. He issued a press conference. And um, he said that they will be doubling up the, the presence of officers in areas where there was a lot of looting. Soho was one of the areas. We were there earlier today. We saw a lot of the, the vandalism in a lot of the luxury stores. So obviously, they don't want a repeat of that. Um, something else to point out. This is a Whole Foods here. Uh, we were told that this business was not vandalized. However, they have boarded up the storefronts in preparation for what could be another um, long night, potentially. And just a few blocks from here, there was a, a lot of looting in other stores as well. So uh, definitely tense. Um, and that, sorry, that's that's. That was not uh, part of the, the demonstration. Um, but in any case, the, the, the demonstrators, it looks like they, they have moved on. They're, they're heading in an unclear direction. Uh, but, you know, yesterday they, they shut down the Manhattan Bridge, but they are on the move and they're growing. But once again, they are peaceful. Allison? All right, Kathy Park in New York City, where there is an 11 p.m. curfew for the first time tonight. Kathy, stay safe. Yep, you got it.
watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. More than 900 people were arrested in protests across Chicago this weekend. Many of those arrests were for looting and vandalism. More than 130 police officers were also hurt. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joining us now uh, from what appears to be a much quieter Chicago today. Steve, what's it like there? Much quieter, but I have to say it's still very eerie because of what's going on in the city as a protective yeah. measure and one we saw implemented last night. Look, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Detroit. Uh, my first market as a local reporter was Grand Rapids right across uh, Lake Michigan. I've got a lot of friends and family here. So I spent a lot of time in Chicago and I got to say there's a lot of things that you can see. One of them right behind me. Uh, that I've never seen in this city. First of all, yeah, these bridges are all up uh, coming into yep. the central business district, into the central loop. That's something I've never seen before. That is being done in conjunction yeah. with a few other things to try to keep people out of the core of Chicago. Take a look over here. Uh, all of these businesses boarded up. When's the last time you've seen plywood on Soul Cycle? If you go into the Mag Mile, uh, you can almost stand in the middle of the street and there's barely any traffic. There's plywood just like that wild. on places like Tiffany's and Saks Fifth Avenue. It is wild, but guess what? It worked. Uh, a lot of the fortification from the mayor was to try to prevent unrest in the downtown area. So she called in the National Guard, 375 National Guardsmen bringing in their heavy tanks into the city, not as a patrol, not as a police uh, sort of unit to assist with the police, 
but just as a support unit to try to keep this perimeter almost perfectly around the loop so that uh, people can't come in to cause problems. As mentioned, it did work. I, I mean, we were rolling around all night last night, kind of looking for where there could be problem spots. There really were none. That is, however, to say or not to say that there were not issues throughout the city of Chicago. In fact, there were almost just as many issues. The fact is they were just spread out because they were kept out of the downtown area. So if you went to places like West Chicago, the south side of Chicago, the adjoining neighborhoods around those, or even to the suburbs, uh, Aurora, for instance, some of these other suburbs had uh, lots yeah. of looting, lots of fires, lots of civil unrest. We saw that evidence of that this morning where there were businesses that were just trashed in the south side of Chicago. Spent a lot of time there. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of black owned businesses were hit last night. Entire strip malls where you saw just like the insides of the store turned inside out. All the waste on the ground. Oh. One of the biggest, one of the most positive things that will stick with me, though, with all of this is the entire community there in South Shore. It's a neighborhood uh, almost entering into the south side of Chicago where everybody grabbed a broom, everybody grabbed a mop, everybody grabbed a piece of debris off the ground or a piece of trash from those stores and cleaned up their own neighborhood. There wasn't a cop car or a fire truck or a city official on site. These were people that lived in these communities, saw that something was wrong and wanted to make a difference. One of the most heartening things I've seen uh, so far in all of this. Despite that too, and all the unrest we were talking about, most of the protesting, the actual protesting, I know we've been drawing that line because it's so important because people are out here doing the job of protesting the death of George Floyd, protesting what they see as injustice across the United States. All of that has been peaceful. There was one in Hyde Park that went all the way into the city center. Uh, police let that happen because nobody was causing any problems. Uh, and so that is mostly what we've seen here, a really eerie sense of calm throughout the central city and then some unrest on the outskirts. What's gonna happen tonight remains to be seen, although you see the strategy remains in place. Keep this area blocked off as much as possible, but hopefully they can disperse more of those preventative measures into the different various neighborhoods and then adjoining suburbs because what happened last night shouldn't happen again, Allison. Back to you. Yeah, Steve, hoping there is not a repeat for those folks who, who cleaned up, uh, came together, uh, tried to get their community back in better shape today. Steve Patterson in Chicago, thank you so much. Thank you. A third straight day of protests in Philadelphia. The National Guard is now patrolling the streets after protesters outnumbered city and state police there over the weekend. MSNBC host Eamon Weldine in Philadelphia. And Eamon, uh, what is it like there now? So, Alison, let me uh, set the scene for you a little bit. We're at the very tail end of a very large march that has been taking place now for a better part uh, of the hour. This is a protest that started outside the uh, police uh, headquarters of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and at this time, you can actually see the demonstrators very peaceful, uh, extremely uh, Calm, I would say there have definitely been some moments uh, of tension when they were in the city center a little bit. Their police there has been kind of shepherding this crowd to make them go in a certain direction. But outside of the uh, Pennsylvania Convention Center, there was a tense moment a little bit where the protesters gathered uh, together, took a knee and encouraged the police to take a knee with them. Now, the protests, as I mentioned, been very peaceful, multiracial. We've seen young and old. In fact, I've seen some folks out here with uh, their kids out here demonstrating against police brutality, demanding justice and accountability for the killing of unarmed black people, including George Floyd. Uh, so that has been uh, the scene that we've witnessed. Now, it comes against the backdrop of a tense few days in Philadelphia. The city has imposed a curfew for another night that is expected to take place at around 6 p.m. Uh, the commissioner here is saying there have been about 429 uh, arrest. There have been some acts of vandalism as well. Obviously, the major concern has been uh, the looting. And that has been the challenge uh, for both officials as well as the protesters to try to keep those two groups of people very different. The large peaceful demonstration that you see here continuing to march peacefully, but then there is always concern about the looting, and that is the concern when night falls. So we'll see what happens tonight if, in fact, the curfew uh, is abided by by a lot of the folks here. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, 
everything we've seen today with the exception of that 10 standoff that I mentioned uh, and an incident where a vehicle uh, drove through the crowds was a very scary moment. Not sure exactly what happened there, but certainly something that agitated the protesters when a vehicle apparently refused to stop. As you can see, they're marching right through a lot of the major roads uh, in the heart of Philadelphia. So, Allison, yeah. a, a very peaceful march that continues, as you can see. Eamon, we hope that it stays that way. I'd like to ask a question about the president. He singled out Philadelphia as a mess on a conference call with the nation's governors earlier today. How is the mayor of Philly, re Philly reacting to that? Yeah, the mayor of Philadelphia was very straightforward. He just said President Trump is a mess. He did not. He did, and you can hear some of the crowd here as well. Not too happy with President Trump. So, uh, yeah, to echo what you were asking about, though, the president tweeting out that Philadelphia was a mess uh, and the mayor and the mayor did not mince his words, saying President Trump's tweet, his rhetoric was not helpful. Uh, and right now it's officials here concerned about the city of Philadelphia. It almost seemed as if they were pretty much tuning the president out. All right, Eamon Moyle, Dean of Philadelphia, thank you so much. It has been one week since George, George Floyd was killed. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged with third degree murder after kneeling on Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes. Analysis done by NBC News found that Minneapolis police used neck restraints like the one that killed Floyd 237 times over the last five years. Of those 237 times, 44 people were rendered unconscious. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams joins me now. And Pete, what can you tell us about this analysis? Well, it's surprisingly uh, consistent with the policy of the Minneapolis Police Department. Their policy explicitly says that officers can use neck restraints as long as it's not on the front and as long as it doesn't impact the windpipe but that uh, force can be applied to the back of the neck or the side of the neck or to the back, uh, either to get somebody into a position where they're, where they're compliant, where they're no longer resisting, or if there is a physical danger, even to the point of rendering that person unconscious. Now, uh, the, uh, the police department has made it very clear that it did not teach or sanction or approve in any way of the technique that was used by the officer who's now been charged with murder and manslaughter in this Floyd case of putting a knee on his neck. Uh, you know, for 25 years, the Justice Department has urged police not to put pressure on people's backs or their necks, uh, even though arresting people and putting them face down and then handcuffing them is very common. It probably happens half a million times every year for police around the country to try to get people under control. But the advice to police is, once you have them under control, once they're on the ground and cuffed, roll them over or get them to sit up so you don't impact their breathing. Uh, Pete, an independent autopsy out today showed that George Floyd died of asphyxiation. Uh, you mentioned this, but law enforcement officials told NBC News that restraining people by kneeling on their necks is not taught or sanctioned by police. Uh, how are law enforcement officials characterizing this tactic? Well, uh, you've got two factors here in the Floyd case. You've got the officer himself, mm -hmm. which you can, you know, we've clearly know. seen that repeatedly in this video. What you can't see from this view is the other officers that are next to the officer with his knee on Floyd's neck, who are also putting pressure on the on his back. You combine all that together, yeah. and that is uh, uh, what the independent autopsy said today undoubtedly contributed to the fact that he was having trouble breathing. So you've got somebody in this prone position, nearly flat on their stomachs, uh, with somebody with pressure on the neck and then pressure on the back, and all of that adds up to making it very hard for someone to breathe. Now, the original autopsy that results that were cited in the criminal complaint against the police officer you see there with his knee on Floyd's neck said that they couldn't determine that it was as a fix asphyxia, which is, you know, somebody can't breathe, but there may mm -hmm. have been other, other contributing causes like underlying health concerns, this independent autopsy today said, no, no, it wasn't underlying health concerns. It was the fact that he couldn't breathe. 
Pete, I'd like to ask you about uh, the prosecution in this case. Minnesota's attorney general is taking over. Uh, one officer, as we've said, Derek Chauvin, has been charged with third degree murder, but three other officers were involved. What does it mean now that this has been elevated to the state level? So he's taking over because the governor has ordered him to take uh, the case over. Uh, he is, of course, the former congressman, uh, and he is somebody that the family and the community wanted to take this case. Uh, rightly or wrongly, they said they did not trust the local county prosecutor. They felt that the county prosecutor had a record of not very aggressively pursuing police misconduct. So they wanted this case to be handled by someone else. Um, you know, even the local prosecutor was saying that these other police officers might uh, face charges. And experts on policing right. that I have talked to say it's it's really quite surprising that none of them, uh, even not only the people kneeling there, but none of the ones that were standing around tried to intervene and tried to say to the officer, OK, enough, back off. Pete Williams, always great to have you with us. Thank you so much for walking us through that analysis. You bet. And a programming note for you tomorrow, NBC News Now and NBC BLK present Can You Hear Us Now, a conversation hosted by MSNBC's Tremaine Lee after the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. And with the backdrop of the protests, the riots and the civil unrest across our country, Tremaine will moderate discussions on race, what being black in America means today and how America can help heal the divide. Watch tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern on NBC News Now. The president's critics say he's failed to lead the nation during a time of crisis, but the White House doesn't see it that way. Here's how Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany defended the president. The president has made clear that what we are seeing on America's streets is unacceptable. Violence, looting, anarchy, lawlessness are not to be tolerated. Plain and simple. These criminal acts are not protest. They are not statements. These are crimes that harm innocent American citizens. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joining me now. And Carol, uh, the president has treated, tweeted frequently. He's also made remarks on camera to reporters, but he hasn't given a formal address to the nation yet. Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, and people around him have said that they don't necessarily think it's a good idea for him to speak in a sort of address to the nation format, particularly if he doesn't have something new to announce. So we know that uh, the White House has been looking at different things that the president potentially could announce. And at that time, then he may uh, choose to speak to the, the country. But he he also, they kind of have a little bit, uh, remember, they remember very well the president's address to the nation in the Oval Office in March about on the coronavirus pandemic. And it was widely panned and did not go well. It's not something that they see as a good venue for him. Um, and this, so you factor that in. And then on top of the fact that they think he doesn't necessarily, he shouldn't just speak for speaking's sake, which is, you can argue one way or the other, whether that's um, a wise decision. But that's that's their argument that he needs to actually have something to announce, some sort of policy, some sort of change. Um, and this is also just not, there are people around him who are concerned that he could just, he's better to just not say anything. Thing because what he said so far has really fanned the flames. Uh, speaking of things that the president has said, Carol, President Trump was on a call with governors today. It has been described as very contentious. Could you tell us about it? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, this was a call with uh, the president and some of his cabinet members, the attorney general, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they, they he basically laid into the governor saying, you guys are looking weak. I'm not, you know, he's not happy with the way they've handled the protests in their cities. Um, he said, you need to dominate on the streets. And if you don't, you'll wind up looking like jerks at one point. That's a quote. Um, and he really just, and he complained that they are not using the National Guard to the extent that they should and could be, in his view, and also can. Uh, the National Guard's obviously been deployed into more than two dozen states, or called up in more than two dozen states, but he's saying that 
these governors are not using them to the fullest extent, and that's fueled his frustrations for these protests that he sees as getting out of control. And, you know, one of the governors, the governor of Illinois, pushed back on him and said that she was unhappy with some of the rhetoric that he's had lately. Um, you know, he countered with him saying that he's unhappy with some of her rhetoric about his handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and then interestingly, the governor of Maine said that she was worried about his trip to her state later this week and that it was going to cause more problems. But the White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany says that that trip is still a go. Carol, uh, many protesters, George Floyd's family, they want to see the three other officers involved in Floyd's death arrested and charged. Do we know how the president feels about this? Yeah, Allison, uh, Kayleigh McEnany, the press secretary, was asked about this today at the White House briefing, and she, you know, didn't go full, lean fully into it, but essentially said that that's a decision that's going to be left up to the local authorities, um, and but that the president clearly feels as though uh, there's more justice that needs to be carried out here. So if you can read between the lines there, and she was essentially saying that the president thinks that those officers uh, potentially should face some charges. Last question for you, Carol. The president says he's designating Antifa as a terrorist organization, uh, getting a lot of attention there. Can he do that? Yeah, there's no statute, domestic statute for the president to designate a terrorist organization domestically. So, you know, the White House is pointing, saying that they do have the authority, but it's really, there, it, there's not really a lot that they can do here. And it's this seems to be one of the instances in which the president wants to do something and got out ahead of that. And, and they're trying to sort of reverse engineer an explanation for how and what he actually is going to do, and we haven't seen that entirely yet. All right, Carol Lee, thank you so much. Thank you. The mayor of Washington, D.C., imposing a two-day curfew as the city braces for more protests. Police arrested about 80 people as the protests turned violent over the weekend. Many of D.C.'s most famous monuments defaced and damaged. MSNBC uh, News correspondent Garrett Haig joining us now from Washington, D.C. Uh, Garrett, the protests have already picked up today. What's it like there right now? Hey, Allison. The protest here is large, it is vocal, and it is peaceful, though, although it is uh, less large and I would say less vocal than yesterday's protest, which is probably a good sign towards how things might turn out later tonight. Folks here are angry, they're upset, they're frustrated, and frankly, they're exhausted that this topic, this cause, this idea that something as simple as Black Lives Matter is a point that they still feel like they have to come to the streets and make in our nation's capital city. Uh, but tonight, we've probably got several hundred people in, the, in Lafayette Square across the street from the White House. Last night at this time, we probably had more than a thousand. Um, you can see in the park behind me the patchwork of federal policing agencies that defend this park and the White House behind it are prepared once again uh, for what we don't yet know. This is park police, uniformed secret service and D.C. National Guard even behind them. You mentioned that seven o'clock curfew. That's the X factor here. Last night, the curfew didn't go into effect till 11 yeah. o'clock at night. Uh, police enforced it aggressively. Nobody knows exactly what they're going to do when seven o'clock happens here. And I think that'll be the tell as to what kind of situation we find ourselves in here in D.C. tonight. Absolutely. Uh, Garrett, how about uh, the coronavirus? Are there concerns there? I mean, D.C. just lifted its stay at home orders on Friday. Now you have folks out protesting in large groups. Is that something that people are talking about and that you're hearing about? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's striking. This is a city that was on complete lockdown until Friday. And there was probably about six hours Friday where things started to feel like they were normalizing in D.C., which had been very cautious about not reopening until it had seen 14 days of decreased spread in the city. The first protest started late Friday night, then all day Saturday, all day Sunday, we've had these large gatherings. The mayor and the top public health official for Washington, D.C. addressed this earlier today. They said they are concerned about so many people gathering in such tight quarters. I would say the majority of people out here are wearing masks, but social distancing is absolutely impossible. And I will say that one of the things that has become a staple of these large protests, which if you cover them all the time, you see 
There's oftentimes people walking around trying to be helpful, handling, handing out things like water and snacks. In 2020, they're also handing out hand sanitizer to the folks. The hands up, don't shoot, uh, with clean hands at the very least. These are definitely uh, signs of the times. And Garrett, before I let you go, I just have to ask, how are you doing? I know uh, yesterday, over the weekend it was, you got hit with either a, a rubber bullet or some kind of a beanbag while you were covering the protests. H how are you doing today? I'm good. Our crew's good. These are the things that happen. We, I you know, got hit with a rubber bullet last night. Uh, one of our security guys did as well. Um, you know, it's it's a tricky thing, but everybody is fine, and we're hoping everybody getting uh, everybody everybody gets home safe tonight. Thank you. We are as well, Garrett. Glad to hear that you guys are doing okay. Los Angeles under a curfew again tonight as the city braces for another night of protests. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz joining me now from L.A. And Gotti, you have been in L.A. and Santa Monica covering the protests. It sounds pretty loud there. What has it been like so far today? Yeah, so we've moved from Santa Monica, which right now is under a 1 p.m. curfew to here in L.A. This is near UCLA. This is Westwood. Uh, and you can see there's a peaceful protest here. People standing in solidarity, they are chanting, they've got signs. And so they actually have taken positions on each side of the street here. We've got more protesters over on this side. Uh, you can see that building right there, just for reference, that is the federal building here in Los Angeles. That's also the headquarters for the FBI field offices here in Los Angeles. I'm going to take you this way real fast, too, because I want to show you uh, this, again, this, this protest has been extremely peaceful for what we've seen. In fact, we've heard some of the organizers say that uh, that they should disperse at four o'clock. However, uh, people in this community are not taking any chances. Uh, take a look here. Uh, they're boarding up a lot of these windows. They're boarding up uh, some of the storefronts. And this isn't just uh, directly uh, behind the protests that we're seeing. It's also going on a little bit closer to UCLA. So those are storefronts that are about uh, maybe uh, a uh, half a mile away. This protest is expected to march. In fact, we've been hearing conflicting reports all day. We've heard that protests have been canceled, and then they spontaneously pop back up. So we're not sure exactly how big this protest is going to be. Uh, but Allison, let me just take you out here real fast and uh, give you a, a shot as to how many people there are right now. You've got people on that side of the street, and you've got people on that side of the street, you got people on this side of the street. So it is growing. We've seen it grow over the last uh, about half an hour or so, and we'll stay with this protest and follow it uh, wherever it goes. Allison? Yeah, Gotti, certainly the loudest uh, protest we have heard in our coverage today. I know you were showing us folks there boarding up. I know there's going to be a curfew. Are there other things that officials, police are planning to do to try to keep things under control tonight? Listen, just a little while ago, about uh, five minutes ago, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here, which is weird because this is, that way is UCLA. I mean, this is a college uh, a okay. place where there's a very uh, a college vibe, if you will. And to see the military yeah. rolling through here in Humvees uh, and, and large convoys was a little bit disconcerting for uh, the people that were watching. Uh, some of them started chanting, the National Guard is here, the military is here. Uh, but at this point, uh, it appears as though they are headed elsewhere, possibly taking up uh, pos positions in front of some other storefronts or uh, some areas where they fear that there may be looting. Uh, but I will say that uh, what we saw yesterday in Santa Monica earlier in the day was very similar to this. And these types of peaceful protests are happening in Los Angeles. And these are not the people, these protesters are not the people uh, that we've seen uh, go around uh, looting. In fact, what we've seen is uh, online what appears to be somewhat of a concerted effort by some uh, criminal groups, for lack of a better word, uh, kind of seeing what's going on, seeing the helicopter feeds, knowing that there is a, a heavy police presence in this area, and then using that as somewhat of a distraction to pick targets. However, uh, we haven't seen a concentrated uh, police presence here, so they may have learned from what they saw yesterday uh, in Santa Monica. But again, right now, this crowd here, extremely uh, uh, peaceful and Definitely expressing their anger about what happened in Minnesota.
Minnesota. Allison? Got it. We hope things stay passionate but peaceful tonight. Thanks for your reporting. Stay safe. Sure. Look at this. Look at this, Allison. Just, just what I was just telling you about. The National Guard here in Westwood. Yeah. It's wild, Gotti. Uh, for people, I've, I've been to L.A., I've been to that area. For people who know it, it, it is not something you would expect to see right by UCLA. Absolutely. The governor of Washington state has activated the National Guard after a weekend of violent protests there. Several police cars set on fire near Seattle and dozens of businesses were looted. NBC News correspondent Jolene Kent is in Seattle. She joins us now from Bellevue, actually, in Washington. And Joe, what are you seeing in that area right now? What's going on? Hey, Allison, things are moving pretty fast. We actually came from Bellevue back over to downtown Seattle. We're here at Westlake Park where you can see there is a small demonstration right now in support of Black Lives Matter. You've got folks making signs, giving speeches here, assembling for yet another day in what we are seeing so far as a peaceful protest. And the demonstration here is a small fraction of what we saw last night where this entire place was completely full. I want to show you where the police presence is right now. You've got the Seattle police lined up here getting ready for what they expect to be an evening of protest. Across the way, you can see Westlake Center there, a popular retail destination is lined with cops. Folks are pretty law enforcement looking um, a little bit more relaxed than they did last night at this time. I can tell you last night we were in this square and completely surrounded by law enforcement um, all the way around. Now, what we do know is that Governor Inslee is giving a press conference shortly about his response to President Trump's conference call with the governors that we've been reporting on today. I'm going to read you a tweet here of what he says that he plans to say. Sorry, my phone is, uh, here we go. He says, Governor Jay Inslee saying, these are the rantings of an insecure man. He's referring to President Trump trying to look strong after building his entire political career on racism and lie of birtherism. He goes on to say he is, again, failing to address the underlying injustices facing black Americans. You can hear behind me now, this is very much the sentiment shared by this group of demonstrators. Now, Allison, the curfew here is going to go into effect in about uh, two hours and 15 minutes, but it does not mean that these demonstrators are going to be disappearing anytime soon. We were out here till uh, past around midnight last night uh, as protesters and police had a face, uh, a peaceful face off all across the city. They've been marching from downtown up to Capitol Hill and then back again. Uh, so it's been overall peaceful compared to what we saw a couple of nights ago. There still has been, though, some looting in the Bellevue and Seattle area. A lot of volunteers out today uh, making their voices heard by participating in the cleanup, scrubbing graffiti off of uh, public spaces and retail stores. So you can see it's a very spirited but peaceful situation here in Seattle. We expect this to only grow tonight, Allison. Yeah, Joe, it is heartbreaking to see uh, the damage in some of those communities, heartwarming to see how they come together to clean things up uh, and help each other out. Uh, Joe Lincoln Kent in, in Bellevue, Washington, thank you so much. Thanks. Former Vice President Joe Biden harnessing the energy of the moment and using it against President Trump. Today, Biden visited an AME church in Wilmington, Delaware, reaching out to communities impacted by police violence and the coronavirus. I think what's happened, one of you, maybe you, Norm, said it. I'll use a different phrase. The Band-Aid has been ripped off by this pandemic and this president. Nobody can pretend any longer what this is all about. Nobody can pretend who has been carrying this on their back. It's been minorities, it's been blacks, it's been Hispanics. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli joining me now. And uh, Mike, could you tell us more about what Joe Biden uh, did in Delaware today? 
Yeah, Allison. Well, first, let's just remind everybody for two months, more than two months, we hadn't seen Joe Biden anywhere other than from his home here in Wilmington. And it's now t uh, three times right. in the last week, last week on Memorial Day, yesterday on the streets of Wilmington, meeting with some demonstrators. And then today uh, with uh, community leaders, about 14 of them at a local church, uh, Vice President Biden out once again in public as the campaign begins to come back somewhat slowly to normal. So what was this conversation about? The former vice president talked about his roots here in politics in Wilmington, Delaware. He says he came up through the civil rights movement. That was what motivated him to get back into politics in the first place. He made clear, he said, listen, I don't take anything from grant for granted in terms of the African-American vote and how important it is. I don't expect anything from them. I have to earn their vote. So an important conversation that he was leading. But I was more interested in some of the things that were being directed to the former vice president more so than what he was talking about. You heard some questions to him about his role in the 1994 crime bill, of course, which was uh, has become very controversial. Uh, some people saying led to the mass incarceration that we're seeing some of these demonstrations about right now. He was asked about why the Obama administration did not do more uh, to help economically empower, especially communities of color. Uh, at a time when the economy began in a recession but ended up thriving by the end of the Obama administration. He was also asked what he would do in his first 100 days of, of office to acknowledge the important role of the most bedrock part of the Democratic Party. Let's take a listen to at least how he answered that part of the conversation. The change that I think has to take place now is reestablish and maintain but significantly increase, significantly increase economic opportunity. That's across the world in a way that hadn't existed. We have it, that had been the focus in the past. And so I think that's going to be a really very, very important part of whether or not we're going to end up making a difference. And I will be setting up in the, uh, we announced in these as we go, in the first 100 days, uh, police oversight. So you heard him there talk about in the first 100 days of his administration, he intends to appoint some sort of police oversight board. A lot of questions, though, about what that means. This is not something the campaign has followed up with in terms of whether it's a real policy proposal or something he just raised on the spot. And Allison, I think we just talked about this on Friday. In fact, the Obama administration held a 21st century policing task force in the second term of President Obama that former Vice President Biden had a big role in. So the question, of course, is, is this just going back to a task force when a lot of people want more serious and substantive answers at this point? Biden also had a virtual roundtable with big city mayors today. Atlanta Mayor Keisha, Keisha Lance Bottoms participated. She is on the VP shortlist. Uh, what was the conversation like at that roundtable today? So this is an interesting moment. The campaign, of course, trying to highlight the contrast with President Trump, who is on a phone call with governors today, demanding that they do more while he's uh, stuck in the White House. Uh, somewhat seeming like a bystander in all this. So the, the Biden campaign clearly wanting to show the former vice president engaging with some of these leaders who are on the very front lines of these demonstrations. The Biden expressing some empathy for the position that these mayors are in, having to balance the very real and, and legitimate concerns of those protesting, but with a, a very important need for public safety and, and trying to prevent the kind of destruction we're seeing. But you mentioned Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Her profile is again on the rise based on how she's responding to some of those demonstrations uh, in Atlanta and the former vice president heaping praise on her. I should mention, uh, and when we talk about this conversation about the vice presidential search, one of the other mayors who was part of this discussion with Joe Biden today was the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. He happens to be one of the four people leading Joe Biden's vice presidential search process. So once again, we're sort of seeing in very much public view, Biden practically interviewing the potential women he might choose as his running mate. Earlier in that conversation mm -hmm. here in downtown Wilmington, uh, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester was also part of that discussion. She is another one of those members of the vice president's VP vetting team. So uh, we're seeing him today in conversation with two of the four people heading that search. Another indication of how that process is moving along now. Mike, uh, looking ahead, uh, I know that uh, Joe Biden has spent a lot of time uh, in his home state. Quite frankly, he's been spending a lot of time uh, broadcasting out either from his basement or his porch because of the coronavirus. Do you expect him to start traveling again anytime soon and taking the campaign back on the road? 
Allison, the question you just asked me is the question I ask Biden's campaign staff every single day. When are we going to go back to a more regular <laughs> uh, campaign schedule? And I think the answer is we'll see. Frankly, they're still um, what may weighing a number of the factors. Number one, of course, their continued concern about the public health crisis we're still facing. They always had right. envisioned the Biden campaign that Delaware stay at home order being sort of one milestone and when we might see him more often. Well, today, June 1st is the first day of Delaware moving into what they call phase one, the sort of beginning of that reopening process. But we saw, as I mentioned before, think about the conversation that we've had around this campaign for the last two months. It was about Joe Biden being stuck in his basement while the president was enjoying the spotlight of the White House, but also beginning to push the envelope by traveling around the country to key swing states. And what have we seen now in the last 48 hours and what is the Biden campaign really eager to present as a contrast? It's Joe Biden out on the streets of Wilmington as he was on Sunday. It's Joe Biden meeting with community leaders today. It's Joe Biden talking with mayors today while the president was stuck in the White House, was in fact in the bunker. And so we're seeing the, the Biden campaign at least try to begin to flip the script uh, on the president. But it's unclear still just how sustained this kind of public appearance from Joe Biden will be over time. Mike, I know you will continue to ask them uh, every single day until you get an answer. You are persistent. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. As mass protests grip the United States, China is criticizing President Trump, Chinese state media, comparing the unrest to the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. NBC News correspondent Tessa Arcelia reports. Well, Allison, Hong Kong is a city that's seen almost 12 months of protests, so all eyes are on America's streets and how authorities are handling the protests there, especially with the heavy-handed police approach and what is being seen as police brutality in general. And we're standing in front of the Hong Kong police headquarters. They have also been accused of abusing their power. There's a lot of anger towards the police. You can see barricades put up in front of that building to prevent protesters from getting anywhere near that. But we spoke to the co-founder of the Africa Center in Hong Kong, and he says there's a lot of empathy from Hong Kong protesters. 
because of what's been happening right now in, in Hong Kong, people are, 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 you know, their empathy instincts have been sharpened a little bit more. Uh, so it's easier for them to sort of empathize with the, you know, with the crisis that's going with what's happening to the African American man in, 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 the, in, in, in the U.S. So I, I do see that people are going to come out, people are going to support. Well, the Chinese government is not biting its tongue and taking this chance to point the finger at the U.S. Hypocrisy, double standards, these are the words being used in editorials and commentaries, essentially accusing the U.S. of doing exactly what it is accusing China of doing. And there are some voices, Allison, on social media that say that the Hong Kong police are actually restrained in comparison. Now, there's clearly a war of narratives going on. And all of this is happening on the back of Hong Kong officials having hit back at the U.S. The Justice Secretary here calling it unacceptable after President Trump said he would strip Hong Kong of its special economic status over China's approval of that national security law. And China, for its part, though, it's holding its fire, essentially waiting to see if this threat is all bark and no bite. Buildings torched, businesses looted, heartbreaking images of violent protests are gripping the nation. But among the unrest, signs of hope and people united in grief. Take a look. My family is a peaceful family. My family is God-fearing. Yeah, we upset. But we're not going to take it. We're not going to be repetitious. In every case of police brutality, the same thing has been happening. Y'all protest. Y'all destroy stuff. And if they don't move, you know why they don't move? Because it's not their stuff, it's our stuff. So they want us to destroy our stuff. Come on, God. They're not going to move. We want to be with y'all for real. So I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. Yeah. I want to make this a parade, not a protest. NBC News Now. We have a lot of important news to get to today. So let's go right over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She's following the latest headlines for us from NBC News. Alexa, how about an update? Hey, Allison. Lots of news, as you mentioned, in this hour. First, from NBC's Jeff Bennett, President Trump berated governors in a video conference today, saying, quote, most of you are weak. This, of course, follows widespread unrest in cities over the weekend. Now, according to a source on the call, the president told state leaders, quote, you have to dominate. If you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. On Twitter, the president has called for a tougher stance on protesters, tweeting yesterday, quote, where are the arrests and long-term jail sentences? 
Meanwhile, after a weekend of marches and demonstrations following the death of George Floyd, some Americans took to the streets to help clean up the damage in their communities. Cities like Chicago are deploying resources to help with the efforts. Take a listen to Mayor Lori Lightfoot. I know that for many of you, your life's work went into developing these businesses and commercial centers. I know that for many of you, your blood, sweat, and tears went into recruiting businesses to come support the vibrancy of your communities. And I want you to hear from me. Not only do I know that, I and we will be your partner in rebuilding Now, former President Barack Obama in a Medium post today wrote that the wave of demonstrations represent, quote, a genuine and legitimate frustration over a decades long failure to reform police practices and the broader criminal justice system in the United States. The former president added that the violence by a small minority of people jeopardized innocent lives and further hurt local businesses. He added, quote, let's not excuse violence or rationalize it or participate in it. Now, experts fear the nationwide protests over Floyd's death could increase the spread of coronavirus, reversing the gains from social distancing over the last few months. That's the latest from NBC's Erica Edwards. The large gatherings in major cities across the country go against public health, health advice on how to curb the spread of COVID-19, which has now claimed the lives of nearly 105,000 people in the United States, with, with more than 1.7 million confirmed cases. Atlanta's mayor had this to say on Sunday protesting last night, you probably need to go get a COVID test this week. Because there's still a pandemic in America that's killing black and brown people at higher numbers. Now from NBC's Ben Kesslin, a man was shot dead in a demonstration in Louisville, Kentucky, early Monday as protests as the city mourns the death of 26-year-old Breonna Taylor. In a statement this morning, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir said that after being fired at, quote, the LMPD and the Kentucky National Guard returned fire, resulting in a death. He added an investigation was underway by the Kentucky State Police. Those are the headlines for this hour. Lots and lots of news there, Allison. And we'll be back, as always, a little later with more. Yeah, so much going on. Alexa, thanks for staying on top of it. We'll talk to you in just a little while. Here is the latest from Minnesota and in the George Floyd case. Floyd's brother Terrence talking to supporters at a prayer vigil in Minneapolis today, asking them to end the violent protests. I understand y'all upset. But like it was already said, I doubt y'all uh, half as upset as I am. So if I'm not over here wilding out, if I'm not over here blowing up stuff, if I'm not over here messing up my community, come on. Then what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Y'all doing nothing because that's not going to bring my brother back at all. Terrence Floyd got emotional at that vigil as supporters chanted his brother's name. Meanwhile, Minnesota Governor Tim Wall says the state is extending its curfew for another two days from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. to curb violence and looting overnight. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. Morgan, we heard Terrence Floyd there calling for peace. What is the mood like in Minneapolis right now? Hey, Allison, the mood is certainly shifting because we're starting to see two very distinct messages being carried forward. On the one hand, you have officials, as you mentioned, the Minnesota governor keeping that curfew in place and to enforce that uh, a much larger footprint, as you mentioned, with those National Guardsmen and state police here in this city, not only being a visible force, but an acting one as well, making sure that those crowds that ran rampant through this city earlier this week are no longer damaging those buildings after seeing just so much uh, pain created by the, the burned out buildings and the vandalism and looting that took place just within the past few days. On the other hand, when it comes to that group of people uh, that you saw gathering 
gathered alongside uh, the brother of George Floyd, Terrence. That's the message that they're really trying to push forward is one of peaceful protest, uh, one for justice. And I want you to listen into a chant uh, that came out just a few moments uh, after the brother of George Floyd spoke. Take a listen. One down, three to go. Of course, that group referring uh, to the three other officers that have yet to be taken into custody in the death of George Floyd. We do know that Derek Chauvin was arrested several days ago. He faces third degree murder charges and manslaughter. We do know Terrence Floyd, the brother of George, has already come out and said that a third degree murder charge is not sufficient. He wants first degree murder charges, Allison, and that many of the supporters that surrounded him today in that crowd told us uh, justice has yet to be met uh, with now, those like other officers still Reverend not taken into custody. Allison? Peace on the left. Justice on the right. Y'all forgot already? <laughs> George Floyd's cause of death. What does it say? Uh, Allison, uh, we do know that the family ordered an independent autopsy uh, completely separate from the one that law enforcement held. And it came to the conclusion that George Floyd died from asphyxiation due uh, to the neck area, the uh, loss of uh, the ability to breathe and loss of blood flow, blood flow to the brain. And that corresponds, the family says, with that eight to nine minute video that is so painful to watch. The attorney for the family, Ben Crump, had this to say shortly after releasing its findings. Take a listen. The knee to the neck and the knees to his back both contributed to him not being able to get breath. And what those officers did there that we see on the video is the cause of his death, not some underlying unknown health condition. And the medical examiner who conducted that independent autopsy for the family of George Floyd was uh, the same individual who conducted the autopsy for the family of Eric Garner, uh, who passed away back in 2014 after police arrested him for selling untaxed cigarettes. Of course, it was Garner's death that made the rallying cry, I can't breathe, uh, basically a, a message, a motto rather, uh, yeah. for this movement of uh, against police brutality. Uh, so as it stands right now, Allison, Peaceful protests throughout the city of Minneapolis today, although we have seen in days past that that, of course, changes when the sun goes down. And we'll be keeping a very close eye on what transpires later today. Allison. Morgan, I hope things remain peaceful there tonight and that you stay safe. Thanks for your reporting today and also your terrific reporting over the weekend. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Allison. A third straight day of protests in Philadelphia. The National Guard is now patrolling the streets after protesters outnumbered city and state police there over the weekend. MSNBC host Eamon Weldine in Philadelphia. And Eamon, uh, what is it like there now? So, Alison, let me uh, set the scene for you a little bit. We're at the very tail end of a very large march that has been taking place now for a better part uh, of the hour. This is a protest that started outside the uh, police uh, headquarters of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and at this time, you can actually see the demonstrators very peaceful, uh, extremely uh, calm, I would say. There have definitely been some moments uh, of tension when they were in the city center a little bit. Their police there has been kind of shepherding this crowd to make them go in a certain direction. But outside of the uh, Pennsylvania Convention Center, there was a tense moment a little bit where the protesters gathered uh, together, took a knee and encouraged the police to take a knee with them. Now, the protest, as I mentioned, been very peaceful, multiracial. We've seen young and old. In fact, I've seen some folks out here with uh, their kids out here demonstrating against police brutality, demanding justice and accountability for the killing of unarmed black people, including George Floyd. Uh, so that has been uh, the scene that we've witnessed. Now, it comes against the backdrop of a tense few days in Philadelphia. The city has imposed a curfew for another night. That is expected to take place at around 6 p.m. Uh, the commissioner here is saying there have been about 429 uh, arrests. There have been some acts of vandalism as well. Obviously, the major concern has been uh, the looting. And that has been the challenge 
uh, for both officials as well as the protesters to try to keep those two groups of people very different. The large peaceful demonstration that you see here continuing to march peacefully, but then there is always concern about the looting, and that is the concern when night falls. So we'll see what happens tonight if, in fact, the curfew uh, is abided by by a lot of the folks here. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, everything we've seen today, with the exception of that tent standoff that I mentioned, uh, and an incident where a vehicle uh, drove through the crowds was a very scary moment. Not sure exactly what happened there, but certainly something that agitated the protesters when a vehicle apparently refused to stop. As you can see, they're marching right through a lot of the major mm -hmm. roads uh, in the heart of Philadelphia. So. Allison, yeah. a, a very peaceful march that continues, as you can see. Amen. we hope that it stays that way. I'd like to ask you a question about the president. He singled out Philadelphia as a mess on a conference call with the nation's governors earlier today. How is the mayor of Philly, Philly reacting to that? Yeah, the mayor of Philadelphia was very straightforward. He just said President Trump is a mess. He did not. He did, and you can hear some of the crowd here as well. Not just